The Philosophy of Symbolic Forms Volume Mythical Thinking A Critique of Mythical Consciousness, in the sense in which it is attempted in this second volume of the Philosophy of Symbolic Forms, must appear not only as a precarious venture but even as a paradoxical one given the present state of critical and systematic philosophy. For, since Kant, the term critique has contained in itself the precondition that a factum is given, for leaked, to which philosophical questioning turns, a factum whose distinctive significance and mode of validity philosophy does not create but once it has been encountered is examined for the condition of its possibility. Is the world of myth, however, a factum of this kind, in any way comparable to the world of theoretical cognition, the world of art, or the world of ethical consciousness? Or does this world not belong from the beginning to the domain of semblance, to that semblance from which philosophy, as a doctrine of being, Vazen, ought to remain aloof, in which it should not lose itself but from which, on the contrary, it should ever more clearly and sharply isolate itself? Indeed, the entire history of systematic philosophy may be regarded as a single continuous struggle to effect an isolation and detachment from this domain. No matter how much the forms of this struggle may change, its basic direction and general tendency clearly and explicitly emerge depending on the stage that theoretical self-consciousness has achieved. And it is especially in philosophical idealism that this opposition first acquired its full sharpness. In the moment, Augenblick, in which idealism arrived at its own concept, in the moment it became conscious of the thought of being as its basic and originary problem, the world of myth vanished into the domain of non-being. And ever since ancient times, Parmenides' dictum has warned pure thought against entering into this domain, with having any contact with non-being or being preoccupied with it, restrain your thought from this way of inquiry. It is as if even though Philosophy had long abandoned this warning in its view of the world of empirical perception, it continued to heed it in its view of the world of myth. Ever since thought had conquered its own realm and its own autonomy, the world of myth would appear to have been overcome and forgotten. Of course, a change seems to have taken place, for in the last century, Romanticism has rediscovered this lost world and since Schelling has attempted to give myth a fixed place within the system of philosophy. The newly awakened interest in myth and in the basic problems of comparative mythology was, however, of greater benefit to the research into its material content than it was to a philosophical analysis of its form. Thanks to the work done in this domain by systematic religious science, the history of religions, and ethnology, we have abundant material at our disposal. Today, however, the systematic problem of the unity of this manifold and heterogeneous material is seldom raised or if it is raised, one attempts to solve it exclusively with the methods of developmental psychology and general ethnic psychology. Myth is considered as comprehended if it is possible to render its source intelligible from certain basic specific predispositions of human nature and to demonstrate the psychological rules that it follows in its unfolding from this original germ. If logic ethics, and aesthetics have been able to assert their own systematic independence against such forms of explanation and deduction, it is because they have been able to evoke an independent principle of objective validity that resisted being reduced to psychology. Myth, by contrast, seems to lack any such support and thus appears to have been consigned and abandoned once and for all to psychology but also to psychologism. Insight into the conditions of its origin seems here to be synonymous with the negation of its independent existence, B. Stand. To understand its content, Gehalt, this would seem to signify nothing else than to prove its subjective nullity, Nichtigkeit, and to see through the general, but nevertheless wholly subjective, illusion to which it owes its existence. And yet in this illusionism that keeps cropping up, not only in the theory of mythical representing but also in the attempts at a foundation for aesthetics and a theory of art, a grave problem and a grave danger lurk as soon as we consider them from the standpoint of a system of spiritual forms of expression. For if the totality, Gesamtheit, of these forms really constitutes a systematic unity, then the fate of any one of them is closely connected with the fate of all the others. Thus, every negation that affects one must, directly or indirectly, extend to the others any destruction, Vernichtung, of a single member threatens the whole insofar as this whole is regarded not as a mere aggregate but as a spiritual organic unity. And it becomes immediately evident that myth possesses a decisive significance in and for this whole if we consider the genesis of the basic forms of intellectual culture. Geistigen Kultur, from that of mythical consciousness. None of these forms possesses from the beginning an independent being, sein, and a clear, actual, and a limited shape rather, each of them confronts us, as it were, disguised and enshrouded in some shape of myth. There is scarcely any realm of objective spirit that cannot be demonstrated to have originally entered into this fusion, this concrete unity, with mythical spirit. The formations, gebilde, of art as well as those of cognition, 
the contents of ethics, law, language, and technology, all point here to the same basic relationship. The question of the origin of language is indissolubly interwoven with the case tie-in of the origin of myth, both can, if at all, be raised only with one another and in a reciprocal relation to one another. Similarly, the problem of the beginnings of art, the beginnings of writing, and the beginnings of law and science leads back to a stage, stuff, in which they all rest in the immediate and undivided unity of mythical consciousness. Only very gradually do the basic theoretical concepts of cognition, the concepts of space, time, and number the concepts of law and community, such as the concept of property or the individual configurations of economics, art, and technology, free themselves from this containment and concatenation. And this genetic interconnection is not apprehended in its original significance and depth so long as it is regarded and accepted as a merely genetic one. As everywhere in the life of spirit, becoming points back to a being, Zine, without which it cannot be comprehended, without which it cannot be recognized in its distinctive truth. Psychology itself, in its modern scientific form, Gestalt, gives an account of this interconnection here it has become increasingly evident that genetic problems can never be solved solely by themselves but only in a close connection and thoroughgoing correlation with structural problems. The emergence of the specific individual formations, Gabilda, of spirit from the generality and indifference of mythical consciousness can never be truly understood if this originary ground itself remains an uncomprehended riddle, if, instead of being recognized as an independent mode of spiritual forming, for among, it is rather taken as a figureless, just altlows, chaos. Grasped in this way, the problem of myth expands beyond the narrow limits of psychology and psychologism and takes its place in the general circle of problems that Hegel has designated as the phenomenology of spirit. That myth stands in an inner and necessary relationship to the universal task of the phenomenology of spirit follows indirectly from Hegel's own framing and determination of the concept. As Hegel writes in the preface to the phenomenology of spirit. The spirit that, so developed, knows itself as spirit, is science. Science is its reality, Vuriklischkeit, and the realm that it builds itself in its own element, elementi. The beginning of philosophy presupposes or demands that consciousness find itself in this element. This element itself, however, achieves its own perfection and transparency only through the movement of its becoming. It is pure spirituality, as the universal, that has the mode of simple immediacy. For its part, science requires that self-consciousness should have raised itself into this ether, in order to be able to live with science and in science, and, so, live. Conversely, the individual has the right to demand that science should at least provide him with a ladder to this standpoint, should show him this standpoint within himself. If the standpoint of consciousness, which knows things in their opposition, Gegensetze, to itself, and itself in opposition, Gegensetze, to them, is valid for science as other, Andra, then, the element, element, of science is for consciousness a distant other word in which it no longer possesses itself. Each of these two aspects, of self-conscious spirit, appears to the other as the inversion of truth. Let science be in its own self what it may. In relationship to immediate self-consciousness it presents itself in an inverted posture or, because this self-consciousness has the principle of its reality and the certainty of itself, science appears to it not to be actual, since self-consciousness exists on its own account outside of science it bears the form of unreality. Science must therefore unite this element, element, of self-certainty with itself, or rather show that and how this element belongs to it. So long as science lacks this reality, it is only the content as the in itself, ANSIC the purpose that is as yet still something inward, not a spirit, but only spiritual substance. This in self, ANSIC, has to express itself and become for itself, and this means simply that it has to posit self-consciousness as with itself. Knowledge in its first phase, or immediate spirit, is the spiritualist, i.e. sense of consciousness. In order to become genuine knowledge, to beget the element, element, of science which is the pure concept of science itself, it must travel a long way and work its passage. These sentences, in which Hegel characterizes the relationship of science to sense of consciousness, are valid in their full extent and in all their sharpness for the relationship of cognition to mythical consciousness. For the actual point of departure for the entire becoming of science, its beginning in the immediate, does not lie so much in the sensible sphere as it does in the sphere of mythical intuition. What is commonly called sense of consciousness, the consistent existence of the world of perceptine, which is further subdivided into clearly separated individual spheres of perception, into the sensible elements, elemente, of color, tone, etc. is itself the product of an abstraction, of a theoretical elaboration of the given. Before self-consciousness rises to this abstraction, 
it is and lives in the formations, Gabilda, of mythical consciousness, in a world not so much of things and their properties but rather of mythical potencies and forces, of demonic and divine figures, Gestalten. If, in accordance with Hegel's demand, science is to provide natural consciousness with a ladder leading to itself, then it must first set this ladder a step lower. Insight into the becoming of science, understood in the ideal, not the temporal, sense, is complete only if science demonstrates its emergence and its own working out from the sphere of mythical immediacy and explains the tendency and law of this movement. And it is not merely a question here of a requirement that concerns only philosophical systematics rather, this requirement concerns cognition itself. For cognition does not master myth by exiling it beyond its borders rather, it is able to truly overcome what it has previously understood only in its own distinctive content, Gehalt, and according to its specific nature, Vazen. As long as this spiritual work has not been completed, the battle, which theoretical cognition believes it has won for good, will continually break out anew. Cognition now discovers the opponent that it had seemingly and decisively defeated in its own midst. Even the epistemology of positivism provides clear evidence of this state of affairs. The isolation, absondaung, of the purely factual, the factuali given from all subjective admixture of the mythical or metaphysical spirit, forms here the ultimate goal of reflection. Science arrives at its own form only by expelling every mythical and metaphysical component from itself. And yet the development of Combe's theory precisely shows that those elements and motives that were thought to have already been overcome in the beginning remain alive and effective in it. Comte's system, which began with the banishment of all mythology to the originary time, Urtzeit, and prehistory, Fortzeit, of science, culminates in a mythical religious superstructure. Thus, it can after all be seen that between theoretical cognitive consciousness and mythical consciousness there nowhere exists a hiatus in the sense of a sharp temporal incision, in the sense asserted in Comte's law of the three phases, each separated over against and from the other. For a long time, science preserves a primordial mythical heritage, to which it merely imprints another form. For the theoretical natural sciences, recalling the centuries long and conclusive struggle, which continues today, to detach the concept of force from all mythical components, to transform it into a pure concept of function, is sufficient. Here it is not a question of an opposition that breaks forth again into the establishment of the content of basic individual concepts but rather a conflict that reaches deep down into the very form of theoretical cognition. How little within this form a truly sharp boundary has been erected between myth and logos proves more than anything else that myth today is also at home in the domain of pure methodology and claims rights, Bergerecht, for itself. Already the view is explicitly expressed such that no clear logical partition can be made between myth and history, Geschichte, such that, rather, all historical, historisch, comprehension is and must be permeated with mythical elements, elementae, and necessarily bound to them. If this thesis were justified, then not only history, Geschichte, but also the entire system of the human sciences, Geistswissenschaften, that rests on it as one of its foundations would be withdrawn from the domain of science and entrusted to that of myth. Such encroachments and infringements by myth into the circle of science can be warded off successfully only if we have previously recognized myth in its own sphere according to what it is and is capable of spiritually. Its real overcoming must be based on its cognition and recognition only through an analysis of its spiritual structure can its distinctive sense and boundary be determined. The more sharply this general task became clear to me over the course of my investigation, the more clearly I perceived the difficulties in the way of carrying it out. Even less than for the problems in the philosophy of language treated in the first volume, did a sure path or even a partially blazed trail exist here. If in the case of language, a systematic consideration could, from the standpoint of method if not of content, build on Wilhelm von Humboldt's seminal investigations, in the domain of mythical thinking there were no such methodological guidelines. The plethora of material that the research of the last decades had brought to light offered no compensation on the contrary. It made the lacuna of a systematic insight into the inner form of mythology all the more evident. The present investigation hopes to advance along a path leading to such an insight, I am, however, far from supposing that it has reached the end of this path. It by no means claims to be conclusive but rather claims to be at most a beginning. Only once the framing of the case time that is attempted here is taken up and carried further in progressive work not only in systematic philosophy but also in the individual scientific disciplines, in particular, in the history of religion and ethnology, can it be hoped that the aim that this investigation originally set itself will be achieved. The first drafts and other preliminary work for this volume were already far advanced when, through my call to Hamburg, I came into close contact with the Warburg Library. I found in its abundant and 
particular nature almost incomparable material in the domain of mythology and the general history of religion, but in its organization and selection, in the intellectual stamp that Warburg gave it, this material dealt with a unitary and central problem closely related to the basic problem of my own work. This correspondence provided me with new incentive to continue along the path on which I had begun, for it suggested that the systematic task undertaken by this book is intimately connected to tendencies and demands that are the outgrowth of concrete work in the human sciences, Geist Swiss and Schaften, and of an endeavor to deepen and reinforce their historical foundations. In my use of the Warburg Library, Fritz Saxla provided me with helpful and expert guidance. I am fully cognizant that without his active help and the lively personal interest that he showed in my work from the beginning, many difficulties in obtaining and penetrating the material could scarcely have been overcome. I should not wish this book to appear without this expression of my heartfelt gratitude. Hamburg, December Ernst Kessier. The philosophical consideration of the contents of mythical consciousness in the attempt at a theoretical apprehension and interpretation of these contents go back to the beginnings of systematic philosophy. Philosophy turned its attention to myth and its formations, Gabota, earlier than to other domains of culture. This is historically and systematically understandable, for it was in the confrontation, Ausein Andersetzen, with mythical thinking that philosophy first succeeded in advancing to a preachish framing, Fasong, of its own concept and a clear consciousness of its own task. Wherever philosophy sought to constitute a theoretical consideration and explanation of the world, it was confronted not so much by the immediate appearance of reality itself but rather by the mythical apprehension and recasting, umpragung, of this reality. It did not, at least not without the decisive contribution of philosophical reflection itself, encounter nature in the configuration that it would acquire in a later period, characterized by a highly developed and worked out consciousness of experience, but rather, all the shapes, gestalten, of existence appeared shrouded in the atmosphere of mythical thinking and fantasy. Nature receives its form and color, receives its specific determination, only through these shapes. Long before the world is given to consciousness as a totality, Gansa, of empirical things and a complex of empirical properties, it is given as a totality, Gansa, of mythical forces and effects. And the philosophical view and genuine philosophical tendency of seeing were not immediately able to detach the world concept from this its originary spiritual ground and mother soil. For a long time afterward, the beginnings of philosophical thinking retained, as it were, an undecided middle position between a mythical and a truly philosophical framing, Fasong, of the problem of origins. This twofold relation is clearly and pregnantly expressed in the concept that early Greek philosophy created for this problem, the concept of the arch. It designates the boundary between myth and philosophy, a boundary, however, that is such as a share in both domains by separating them it constitutes the point of transition and indifference between the mythical concept of beginning and the philosophical concept of principle. The further and the more sharply the methodological self-awareness of philosophy progresses, since the Iliadic school, a critique, a, penetrates within the concept of being itself, the more clearly the new world of logos, which now arose and asserted itself as an autonomous formation, gabota, emerges separated from the world of mythical forces and the mythical figures, Gestalten, of the gods. If both worlds, however, can no longer immediately exist next to one another, nay benign under simultaneously, then at least an attempt was made to declare and justify the one as a preparatory stage of the other. Here lies the germ of that allegorical interpretation of myths that belongs to the fixed cultural inventory, Bill Dung's best and, of ancient science. If, in comparison to the new being concept and world concept that philosophical thinking progressively establishes, myth is to retain any essential significance, any even mediated truth, then this would be possible only if it were recognized as an indication and preparation for this very world concept. The pictorial content, Bilchald, of myth was said to enclose and conceal a rational cognitive content, Gehalt, that reflection had to flush out and expose as its true core. Thus, especially since the 5th century, since the century of the Greek Enlightenment, this method of interpreting myths was continually practiced. In this interpretation of myths, the sophists liked to practice and test the force of their newly founded doctrine of wisdom. Myth was comprehended and explained by translating it into the conceptual language of popular philosophy, in which it was grasped as the veil of a speculative, natural scientific, or ethical truth. It is no accident that the very Greek thinker in whom the distinctive mythical force of configuration was still alive and immediately effective was foremost in opposing this view, which leads to a total leveling down of the mythical image world. 
Plato maintained an attitude of ironic superiority toward the attempts at an interpretation of myth as they were undertaken by the sophists and rhetoricians, for him, such interpretations were nothing more than an exercise of the wit, a gross and labored wisdom? Rustic wisdom. If Gouda once praised the simplicity of the Platonic consideration of nature and compared it with the boundless multiplicity, fragmentation, and complexity of the modern theories of nature, Plato's relationship to myth displayed the same basic characteristic features. For in the consideration of the mythical world, Plato's vision also never dwells on the plethora of party chular motives rather, this world appears to him as a self-contained whole that he juxtaposes to the whole of pure cognition in order to measure the one by the other. The philosophical rescuing of myth, which likewise signified its philosophical sublation, consisted in the fact that Plato apprehended it as a form and stage, stuff, of knowledge itself, and, admittedly, as one that necessarily belongs to it as a determinate realm of objects and corresponded to it as an adequate expression. Thus, for Plato, too, myth harbors a certain conceptual content, gehalt, for it is the conceptual language in which alone the world of becoming can be expressed. What never is but always becomes, what does not, like the formations, gebilde, of logical and mathematical cognition, remain in identical determinacy, bestimmtheit certainty, but manifests itself from moment to moment as something different can be given only a mythical presentation. However sharply the mere probability, more shamelik keet, of myth is separated from the truth, varheit, of rigorous science, there still exists, on the other hand, by virtue of this separation, a close methodological interconnection between the world of myth and that world that we call the empirical reality of appearances, the reality of nature. Here myth thus grows beyond every merely material significant eye and here it is thought of as a specific, and in its place, necessary function for the apprehending of the world. And now it is able to prove its value in the details of the construction of Platonic philosophy as truly creative, as an engendering and shaping motive. This profound view, to be sure, was not always sustained in the subsequent course of Greek thinking. The Stoics and Neoplatonists returned to the old paths of the speculative allegorical interpretation of myth, and through them, this interpretation was transmitted to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The very thinker who first communicated the theory of Plato to the Renaissance may be regarded as a typical example of this tendency of thought. Georgios Gemistos Plethon's presentation of the theory of ideas is so intermingled with his own mythical allegorical theory of the gods, God or layer, that the two are fused into an inseparable whole. Opposed to this objectivizing hypostasis, which the figures, gestalts, of myth undergo in Neoplatonic speculation, the gradual turn toward the subjective that will take place in modern philosophy becomes increasingly prevalent at this point. Myth became a problem for philosophy insofar as it expresses an original tendency of spirit, a non-pendant configuring mode of consciousness. Wherever a comprehensive systematic of spirit is demanded, contemplation is necessarily led back to myth. In this regard, John Battista Vico, as the founder of the modern philosophy of language, became the founder of one of the sources of a completely modern philosophy of mythology. For Vico, the real and truly unitary concept of spirit is constituted in the triad of language, art, and myth. Vico's idea was, however, brought to full systematic determinacy and clarity only with the foundation of the science of spirit, Geistwissenschaft, undertaken by the philosophy of Romanticism. Here too, as in other spheres, Romantic poetry and philosophy reciprocally prepared the way it was perhaps in response to Holderlin's spiritual impulse that Schelling, in the first draft of his system of objective spirit, composed at age 20, called for an unification of the monotheism of reason and the polytheism of the imagination, that is, a mythology of reason. To carry out this demand, however, the philosophy of absolute idealism, as elsewhere, also rejected here. The conceptual means that Kant's critical theory had created the critical question of origins that Kant had raised for the theoretical, ethical, and aesthetic judgments was applied by Schelling to the domain of myth and mythical consciousness. As in Kant, this question is not concerned with the psychological emergence of myth but with its pure inventory, bestand, and content, gehalt. Like cognition, morality, and art, myth now becomes an autonomous, self-contained world, which may not be measured by the external criteria of value and reality but must rather be comprehended according to its own inherent, structural lawfulness. Any attempt to render this world intelligible by seeing in it something merely mediated, as simply a cloak of something else, is now decisively rejected once and for all. Like Herder in the philosophy of language, Schelling overcomes in his philosophy of mythology the principle of allegory like Herder. Schelling turns back from the apparent explanation through allegory to the basic problem of symbolic expression. 
he replaces the allegorical interpretation of the world of myths with a tautagorical interpretation i.e., he takes the mythical figures, gestalten, as autonomous formations, gebilda, of spirit, which must be comprehended on their own terms, based on a specific principle of sense bestowing and gestalt bestowing, shin und gestalt jibung. This principle, as Schelling's introductory lectures on the philosophy of mythology set out in detail, is overlooked both by the humoristic interpretation, Deutung, which transforms myth into history, as well as by the physicalist interpretation, Oslogung, which makes it into a kind of primitive explanation of nature. They do not explain the distinctive reality, realitate, that the mythical possesses for consciousness but rather volatilize and deny it. The path of true speculation, however, is opposed to the direct iron of such resolute consideration. It aims not at an analytical breaking down but rather at a synthetic understanding it strives back toward the ultimate positive aspect of spirit and life. And myth must, by all means, be comprehended as just such a positive aspect. Schelling's philosophical understanding of myth begins from the insight that myth, too, in no way moves in a purely fabricated or poetically invented, or dictated, world but rather possesses its own mode of necessity and, therefore, in accordance with the concept of the object of philosophical idealism, possesses its own mode of reality, rarely date. Only where such necessity is demonstrable does reason, and hence philosophy, have a place. For philosophy, the purely arbitrary, the absolutely accidental and random, cannot even form an object of inquiry, for it, the study of being, Wesen, cannot establish a foothold in the sheer void, in a domain that is itself without intrinsic, Wesenhaft, truth. At first sight, to be sure, nothing seems more disparate than truth and mythology. Accordingly, nothing more opposed than philosophy and mythology. However, precisely in the opposition itself lies the definite challenge and the task of uncovering reason in just this which is apparently unreasonable, of uncovering sense in just this which appears senseless, and, indeed, not in the way in which this has only been attempted up to now, by virtue of an arbitrary differentiation, such namely that anything one was confident in asserting as reasonable or meaningful was explained as essential, everything else however merely explained as contingent, and counted as part of disguise or distortion. The intent must be, on the contrary, that also the form appears as a necessary and to that extent reasonable one. In keeping with the overall conception of Schelling's philosophy, this basic intent must be realized in a twofold direction toward the side of the subject and toward that of the object, object, on the one hand, and with regard to self-consciousness and with regard to the absolute, on the other. As concerns self-consciousness and the form in which the mythical is experienced in it, this form, when considered more precisely on its own, is already sufficient to rule out any theory that grounds myth in pure invention. For such a theory has already missed the pure factual existence, be stand, of the phenomenon that was to be explained by it. The actual phenomenon that is to be understood here is not the mythical content of the representation as such but the significance that it possesses for human consciousness and the spiritual power, mocked, that it exerts over it. The problem is not the material content of mythology but the intensity with which it is lived, or laped, with which it is believed, as only something objectively existing and actual can be believed. Already this originary factum of mythical consciousness frustrates any attempt to see its ultimate root in an invention, erdichtung. Dash whether poetic or philosophical. For, even if we admit that the purely theoretical, intellectual content, gehalt, of mythology might in this way be rendered intelligible, the dynamic, as it were, of mythical consciousness, the incomparable force, craft, that it has demonstrated over and over again in the history of human spirit, would remain entirely unexplained. In the relationship between myth and history, myth proves to be primary, history secondary and derived. It is not by its history that the mythology of a people is determined but, conversely, its history is determined by its mythology, or rather, the mythology of a people does not determine but is itself its fate, its fate has befallen it from the very beginning. The whole history of the Hindus, the Hellens, and others was given with their system of gods, god or layer. There is, therefore, neither for an individual people nor for humanity as a whole of free choice here, a liberum arbitrium indifferentiae, free choice of indifference by which given mythical representations can be accepted or rejected rather, a strict necessity prevails everywhere. A real power, mocked, i.e. a power no longer situated in its forceful power, gewalt, dash has possession, bemeshtikt, on consciousness in myth. Mythology originates in the true sense from something independent of all invention, something indeed that is opposed to invention in both form and essence from the standpoint of consciousness, it arises out of a necessary process, whose origin is lost in a suprahistorical sphere, 
a process that consciousness can perhaps resist at certain moments but that, as a whole, it cannot impede, much less annul. We see ourselves taken back here to a region where there is no time for invention, either by individuals or by a people, no time for artificial disguises or misunderstandings. Whoever understands what a mythology is for a people, what inner forceful power, Gavalt, it possesses over a people and what reality, realitate, is manifested therein, will say that mythology, no more than language, was invented by the endeavors of individuals. Thus, according to Schelling, speculative philosophical reflection had touched on the actual vital source of mythology, which, however, it was able only to demonstrate but was not able to explain further. Schelling expressly claimed it as his distinctive intellectual achievement to have replaced inventors, poets, and individuals in general by human consciousness as the source, the subjectum agents of mythology. Indeed, mythology has no reality outside of consciousness even though the mythological process consists only in the determinations of consciousness, that is, in representations, this process, this succession of representations, Vorstil Lungen, cannot have been merely imagined, Vorgestelt, as such but must have actually taken place, must really have occurred in consciousness. Mythology is, therefore, not merely a successively imagined, Vorgestelt, system of gods, god or layer, rather, the successive polytheism in which this system of gods exists can be explained only if we assume that the consciousness of humanity actually dwells in every moment of it. The gods following one upon the other have actually successively taken possession, Bameshtikt, of consciousness. Mythology is the history of the gods, thus. Actual mythology, was able to produce itself only in life itself it had to be something lived and experienced. If, however, myth is thus demonstrated to be a distinctive and original life form then it therefore loses all semblance of merely one side subjectivity. For life, according to Schelling's basic view, signifies something neither merely subjective nor merely objective rather, it stands precisely on the borderline between the two. It is the indifference between the subjective and objective. If we apply this to myth, then here, too, the movement and development of mythical representations in human consciousness, provided this movement is to have an inner truth, must correspond to an objective event a necessary development in the absolute. The mythological process is a theogonic process a process in which God becomes, in which, as the true God, God creates himself step by step. Each individual stage, stuff, of this production, provided it can be comprehended as a necessary point of passage, Dirtgangspunkt, has its own significance however, only in the whole, only in the unbroken interconnection of the mythical movement passing through all the moments, are its complete sense and true goal disclosed. In this, Every particular and contingent individual phase appears as necessary and hence as justified. The mythological process is the process of the self-restoring and thus self-realizing truth. It is thus indeed not truth in the individual moment, for otherwise it would need no advance to one following, no process but in this process itself the truth generates itself and therefore is, as a self-generating one, contained within this process the truth that is the end of the process, that thus the process in toto itself contains as completed. More closely considered, what determines this development for Schelling is a progress from the unity of God, as a merely existing, say and a, but not as such conscious unity, to a multiplicity from which, through opposition to multiplicity, the true existing, seen, and recognized unity of God is gained. Even the earliest human consciousness to which we can return must necessarily likewise be thought of as a divine consciousness, as a consciousness of, von, God in its true and specific sense. Human consciousness is a consciousness that does not have God outside it but rather, though not with knowledge and will and not by Introduction A free act of caprice but rather by virtue of its nature, contains within it the relation to God. The original human is the positing of God not by Akshu but rather by nature Asua, its own nature, and indeed there remains for originary consciousness nothing other than that it is that which the positing of God in is truth and absolute unity. If this is monotheism, however, then it is only a relative monotheism the God who is postulated here is one only in the abstract sense that there are still no internal differences, that there is still nothing present with which he can be compared or to which he can be opposed. Only in the progress to polytheism is this other achieved the religious consciousness now undergoes a split within itself, a particularization, an inner alteration, for which the multiplicity of gods is only a figurative e objective expression. On the other hand, through this progress, the way is open that raises up from the relative one to the absolute one actually revered on the way. Consciousness had to pass through the separation, the crisis of polytheism, before it could differentiate the true God, i.e. he who remains one, and eternal as such, from the primal God, Ergot, 
whom consciousness comes to regard as the relative one and only temporarily eternal. Without the second god, without the solicitation to polytheism, there would have been no progress to true monotheism. God was not mediated to the human of the primal time, Urtzeit, through a doctrine, through a science. The relationship was a real one and for that reason could only be a relationship to God in his reality, not to God in his essence, and thus also not to the true God. For the actual God is not immediately also the true God. The God of prehistorical time, Fortsight, is an actual, real God, and in him also the true God is, but not known as such. Thus, humanity worshipped what it did not know, to which it had no ideal, free, relation, but rather only a real relationship. To produce this ideal and free relationship, to transform the existing, seen, unity into the known unity such as the sense and content of the whole mythical, actual theogonic process. Once again, we see here a real relationship of human consciousness to God, whereas all previous philosophies had known only of a religion of reason, thus only of a rational relationship to God, and had seen all religious development only as a development of the idea, i.e. in representation and in thoughts. With this, According to Schelling, the circle of enlightenment is complete, subjectivity and objectivity are placed in their proper relationship within the mythical. It is not at all the things with which the human deals in the mythological process by which consciousness is moved, but rather it is the powers, meshta, arising in the interior of consciousness itself. The theogonic process, through which mythology emerges, is a subjective one insofar as it takes place in consciousness and shows itself through the generating of representations but the causes and thus also the objects of these representations are the actually and in themselves theogonic powers, just those powers through which consciousness is originally the God positing consciousness. The content of the process is not merely imagined potencies but rather the potencies themselves, which create consciousness, and which create nature, because consciousness is only the end of nature, and for this reason are also actual powers. The mythological process does not have to do with natural objects, nature object and, but rather with the pure creating potencies whose original product is consciousness itself. Thus, it is here where the explanation fully breaks through into the objective realm, becomes fully objective. Indeed, the highest concept and form of objectivity that Schelling's philosophical system knows has been reached here. Myth has attained its essential truth in that it is comprehended as a necessary moment in the process of the self-unfolding, Selbstentfaltung of the absolute. The fact that it nowhere has to do with things in the sense of a naive realistic view of the world but that it is merely a reality, a potency of spirit in which it constitutes itself, cannot establish an objection against its objectivity, its essential being and truth even nature has no other or no higher truth than this. Nature itself is also nothing other than a stage, stuff, in the development, and viklung, and self-unfolding, selbstentfaltung, of spirit and the task of a philosophy of nature consists precisely in understanding and elucidating. It is such. What we call nature, and this is already stated in the system of transcendental idealism, is a poem that lies hidden in a secret most wonderful writing yet if the enigma could be unveiled, then we would recognize the odyssey of spirit, who, wonderfully deceived, flees from itself while seeking itself. This secret writing of nature is now approachable from another side, through the consideration of myth and its necessary phases of development. The odyssey of spirit here has reached a stage in which we no longer, as in the world of the senses, behold its ultimate goal before us through a semi-transparent mist but rather behold it in figures, gestalten, that, though immediately familiar to the mind, are still not completely penetrated. Myth is the odyssey of the pure consciousness of God that is conditioned and mediated in its unfolding equally through the consciousness of nature and the world as through the consciousness of the eye. It unveils here an inner law that is fully analogous to the law prevailing in nature but of a higher mode of necessity. Because the cosmos is to be understood and interpreted only from spirit and thus from subjectivity, the seemingly purely subjective content, Gehalt, of the mythical has conversely also an immediate cosmic significance. Not that mythology would have emerged under an influence of nature, of which the interior of the human is, on the contrary, deprived through this process rather, the mythological process passes, according to the same law, through the same levels, Stuffen, through which nature or e.g. Nally passed. Thus, the mythological process does not have merely religious significance, it has universal significance. For it is the universal process that repeats itself in it accordingly, the truth that mythology has in the process is also a universal one, one excluding nothing. One cannot, as is customary, deny to mythology historical, historish, truth, for the process by which it emerges into being is itself a true history, geschichte, an actual set of events. Just as little as physical truth to be excluded from it, 
for nature is just as much a necessary passage point of the mythological process as of the universal process. The characteristic merit and limitations of Schelling's idealistic explanation appear clearly in this passage. The concept of the unity of the Absolute truly and definitively assures the absolute unity of human consciousness by deriving everything that emerges in it as the particular achievement, as a specific tendency of spiritual doing, from a common ultimate origin. At the same time, however, the danger of this concept of unity is that in the end it will ultimately absorb the abundance of concrete, particular differences and render them unrecognizable. Thus, myth can become for Schelling a second nature because nature itself has previously been transformed into a kind of myth in which its purely empirical significance and truth are sublated into its spiritual significance, into its function, namely, to be the self-revelation of the Absolute. If we refuse to take this first step, then it would seem that we must abandon the second as well thus, there would seem to be no remaining path to the essential being and truth of the mythical, to its distinctive objectivity. Or is there perhaps a means and possibility to retain as such the question put forward by Schelling's philosophy of mythology but, at the same time, to transplant it from the ground, Bowdoin, of a philosophy of the absolute to that of a critical philosophy? Is there sheltered in it not only a problem of metaphysics but also a purely transcendental problem that is as such susceptible to a critical transcendental solution? If we take the concept of the transcendental in a strictly Kantian sense, then it would indeed seem paradoxical even to suggest such a question. For Kant's transcendental framing of the problem limits itself expressly to the conditions of possibility of experience and restricts itself to these conditions. What experience, however, can be shown in which the world of the mythical can be authenticated and in which any kind of objective truth and objective validity might be proven? If this were demonstrable for myth in general, it would at least seem possible to ground it in its psychological truth and in its psychological necessity. The necessity with which myth arises in relatively corresponding forms at certain stages in the development of spirit seems to constitute its only objective and tangible content, Gehalt. Indeed, since the epoch of German speculative idealism, the problem of myth has been posited only in this sense and sought in this way. Insight into the ultimate absolute grounds of myth has been replaced by insight into the natural causes of its emergence The methodology of metaphysics has been replaced by the methodology of ethnic psychology, Volker psychology. True access to the world of the mythical and to its explanation seemed to have been opened only after Schelling and Hegel's dialectical concept of development had been replaced once and for all by the empirical concept of development. That the mythical world was an ensemble of mere representations was now taken for granted however, these representations were comprehended only if we succeeded in making them intelligible from the general rules governing the formation of representations, namely by the elementary laws of association and reproduction. Myth now appeared in an entirely different sense, as a natural form of spirit, which could be understood in no other way than by the methods of empirical natural science and empirical psychology. And yet is it not possible to conceive of a third form of determination of mythical thinking that explains the mythical world neither through the being, Vazen, of the absolute nor merely reduces it to a play of empirical psychological forces? If this determination seeks, like Schelling and the methodology of psychology, the subjectum agents of mythology solely in human consciousness, then must we necessarily accept either the empirical psychological or the metaphysical concepts of consciousness? Or is there not a form of critical analysis of consciousness that distances itself from both of these points of view? The modern critique of cognition, the analysis of the laws and principles of knowledge, has detached itself more and more resolutely from the presuppositions of both metaphysics and those of psychologism. The struggle that is conducted here between psychologism and pure logic seems today to have been finally decided we may also venture to predict that it will never recur in the same form. What is true of logic, however, is no less true of every independent domain and every basic original function of spirit. In them all, the determination of their pure content, Gehalt, the determination of what they signify and are, is independent of the question of their empirical becoming and of the psychological conditions of their origins. We can and must inquire in a purely objective sense into the being, design, of science, into the content, Gehalt, and principles of its truth, without reflecting on the temporal order in which the particular truths and insights, Erkentnisse, are manifested to empirical consciousness, and the same problem recurs for every form of spirit. We can never do away with the question of their being, Vazen, by transforming it into an empirical, genetic question. The presupposed tie-in of such a unity of being, Vazen, signifies for art and myth, just as for cognition, a general lawfulness of consciousness that conditions every configuration of the particular. In accordance with the basic critical view, we obtain the unity of nature only in that we put it into 
Hini and Legan, the appearances we do not obtain it as the unity of an intellectual form from the individual phenomena but rather constitute, Darstellen, and produce, Herstellen, it in them, the same is true of the unity of culture and of each of its original tendencies. It is not enough to demonstrate it factually in the appearances rather, we must explain them through the unity of a determinate structural form of spirit. Thus, here too, as in the theory of cognition, the method of critical analysis stands between the methodologies of metaphysical deduction and psychological induction. Like the latter, it must always begin from the given, from the empirically ascertained and secured facts, Totsikin, of cultural consciousness however, it cannot stop with them as merely given. From the reality of the factum, it must inquire back into the conditions of its possibility. In these conditions of possibility, it seeks to disclose a certain hierarchical structure, a superordination and subordination of the structural laws of the domain in question, an interconnection and reciprocal determinate high and of individual configuring elements. In this sense, to inquire into a form of mythical consciousness means to search neither after its ultimate metaphysical grounds nor after its psychological, historical, or social causes rather, it is only to inquire after the unity of the spiritual principle by which all its particular configurations, in all their diversity and their vast empirical abundance, appear to be governed. And with this, the question of the subject of myth takes another turn. Metaphysics and psychology have answered it in opposing senses metaphysics from the ground, Bowdoin, of theogony, psychology from the ground, Bowdoin, of anthropogeny. In one case, the mythological process is explained as a particular instance, a determined and necessary individual phase of the absolute process in the other, mythical apperception is deduced from the general factors and rules governing the formation of representations. Is this, however, not basically a recurrence of that allegorical view of the mythical that had, in principle, already been discredited by Schelling's philosophy of mythology? In both cases, do we not comprehend myth by referring it and reducing it to something other than what it immediately is and signifies? As Schelling formulates it, Mythology is known in its truth, and, thus, only truly known, when it is known in the process. However, the process that repeats itself in it, only in a particular way, is the universal, the absolute process, and, thus, the true science of mythology is accordingly the one that presents the absolute process in it. But to present this process is the task of philosophy. The true science of mythology is, for this reason, the philosophy of mythology. Ethnic psychology only replaces this identity of the absolute with the identity of human nature, which always and necessarily brings forth the same elementary thoughts of myth. However, in beginning in this way from the constancy and unity of human nature and making it the presupposition for all its attempted explanations, it ultimately falls into a petitio principii. For instead of demonstrating the unity of spirit through analysis and establishing it as the outcome of analysis, it treats this unity as a self-evident datum existing in itself. As in cognition, However, the certainty of a systematic unity stands here at the end rather than at the beginning it signifies not the point of departure but the goal of consideration. Within the boundaries of the critical point of view, we therefore cannot conclude the unity of the function from the pre-existing or assumed unity of a metaphysical or psychological substrate rather, we must begin from the function as such if despite the change in the individual motives, we find in the function a relatively constant inner form, then we shall not return back from this form to infer the substantial unity of spirit. Rather, the constancy of inner form seems to constitute and designate this unity. Unity, in other words, appears not as the ground but as another expression of this same determinacy of form. This must be apprehended as a pure, imminent determinacy, in its imminent significance, without our needing to answer the question about its ground, be it transcendent or empirical. Thus, we may inquire into the pure determination of the being, Vazen, of the mythical function, its, what X is, in the Socratic sense, and compare this pure form with that of the linguistic, aesthetic, and logical conceptual functions. For Schelling, mythology has a philosophical truth because expressed in it is not only a thought but a real relationship of human consciousness to God, because it is the Absolute, God Himself, who passes here from the first potency of being in itself to the potency of being outside itself and through it to the perfect being with itself. For the opposite view, for the standpoint of anthropogeny, as represented by Feuerbach and his successors, inversely the empirical real unity of human nature is taken as a starting point, as a basic original causal factor of the mythological process, which explains why under the most diverse conditions and beginning from the most multifarious spatio-temporal points it develops in essentially the same way. As opposed to these approaches, a critical phenomenology of mythical consciousness can begin neither from the Godhead, as an originary metaphysical fact, nor from humanity, 
as an originary empirical fact, but rather will seek to apprehend the subject of the cultural process, spirit, solely in its pure actuality, in the manifold of its modes of configurations and will seek to determine the imminent norms that each of them follows. Humanity constitutes itself only in the whole of these activities, in accordance with its ideal concept and concrete historical existence the progressive separation of subject and object, of I and world, occurs only in these activite eyes, through which consciousness issues from its stupor, its captivity and mere existence and insensible impression and effect, and forms itself into a consciousness of culture. From the standpoint of this framing of the problem, the relative truth that is awarded to myth can no longer be questioned. It can now no longer be grounded as the expression and reflection of a transcendent process nor by the fact that certain constant soul-like, sealish emotional, forces operate in its empirical becoming. Its objectivity, and from the critical standpoint this is true of each mode of spiritual objectivity, is to be determined not tangibly but functionally this objectivity lies neither in a metaphysical nor in an empirical psychological being that stands behind it but rather in what myth itself is and achieves, in the mode and form of objectivization that it accomplishes. It is objective provided that it is recognized as one of the determining factors by virtue of which consciousness frees itself from its passive constraint and sensible impression and progresses to the creation of its own world, configured according to a spiritual principle. If we formulate the question in this way, then the unreality of the mythical world can no longer be said to argue against its significance and truth. To be sure, the mythical world is and remains a world of mere representations however, in terms of its content, its mere matter, the world of cognition is no different. We arrive at the scientific concept of nature not by apprehending behind our representations their absolute archetype, or build, the transcendent object, but by discovering in them and through them the rule determining their order and sequence. The representation acquires an objective character for us when we divest it of its contingency and emphasize in it a universal, objectively necessary law. Likewise, in connection with myth, we can raise the question of objectivity only in the sense of inquiring whether it, too, discloses an imminent rule, a necessity distinctive to it. Of course, in this case, the rule would seem to always be concerned with only a lower level, stuff, of objectivity. Is not, then, this rule destined to vanish in the face of real, scientific truth, before the concept of nature and that of the object that are gained in pure cognition? With the dawn of scientific insight, the mythical world of dream and magic seems once and for all to sink into nothingness. And yet even this relationship appears in another light when, if instead of comparing the content of myth with the content of the final worldview of cognition, we instead compare the process of the construction of the mythical world with the logical genesis of the scientific concept of nature. There are here individual stages, stuffen, and phases in which the different levels, stuffen, of objectivation, objectivierung, and spheres of objectification, objectivation, are not yet sharply separated. Indeed, even the world of our immediate experience, that world in which we all constantly live as long as we are outside the sphere of conscious, critical scientific reflection, contains a wealth of features that, from the standpoint of this same reflection, can be designated only as mythical. In particular, the concept of causality, the general concept of force, must pass through the sphere of mythical intuition of effective action before being solved in the mathematicological concept of functian. Thus, everywhere, right into the configuration of our perceptive world, right into that domain that from the naive standpoint we tend to designate as actual reality, we find this distinctive survival of basic, originary mythical motives. Little though these motives correspond immediately to objects, they are, nevertheless, on the way to objectivity, g. Jun Standlerchkai, in general, insofar as they constitute a determinate, not accidental, and necessary mode of spiritual forming, for Mung. Thus, the objectivity, objective at that, of myth exists above all there where it seems farthest removed from the reality, realitate, of things, from the reality, vuriklishkeit, in the sense of naive realism and dogmatism, this objectivity is not the picture, opbuilt, of a given existence but is a proper, typical, mode of forming, built in, itself, in which consciousness disengages itself from and confronts the mere receptivity of sensible impressions. Proof of this relationship cannot, to be sure, be attempted from above in a purely constructive construction, constructiva mouthbow, but rather, it must presuppose the facts of mythical consciousness, the empirical matrial of comparative mythology and comparative religion. The problem of a philosophy of mythology has been vastly broadened by this material, particularly by the increasing mass of data that has come to light since the middle of the 19th century. For Schelling, who depended principally on Georg Kreuzer's Symbolikunt Mythologie der Alten Volker, 
The symbolism and mythology of ancient peoples, all mythology was essentially the system and history of the gods. For him, the concept of God and the knowledge of God, God is Erkentness, formed the beginning of all mythological thinking, Anotisha and Sita, innate knowledge, that it takes as its actual starting point. Kreuzer vehemently opposes those who made the religious development of humanity begin not with the unity of the concept of God but with the multiplicity of partial, or even initially local, representations, with so-called fetishisms or deifications of nature, in which the object of worship was not even concepts or kinds but an individual natural object, for example this tree or this river. No, humanity has not proceeded from such misery the majestic course of history has an entirely different beginning the keynote in the consciousness of humanity always remained that great one, who did not yet know his equal, who actually filled heaven and earth, that is, the all. Modern ethnological research for example the theories of Andrew Lang and Wilhelm Schmidt, has also attempted to revive Schelling's basic thesis of a primary originary monotheism and to support it by way of extensive empirical material. The further they advanced, however, the clearer it became that it was impossible to combine the pure content of the configurations of mythical consciousness into a unity and genetically derive them from it as from a common root. If animism, which for a long time after the appearance of Tyler's seminal work dominated all interpretation of myth, believe this root to be found in the nature of the primitive representation of the soul rather than in the primary intuition of God, then. Today this mode of explanation appears to have increasingly been pushed back and at the very least shaken in its singular, general validity. More and more clearly, features of a basic mythological outlook emerge that know neither a distinct concept of God nor a concept of the soul or personality but begin from a still entirely undifferentiated intuition of magical efficacy from the intuition of a substantive magical force inherent in things. This demonstrates a distinctive stratification within mythical thinking, a superordination and subordination of its structural elements, elementae, which is significant in a purely phenomenological sense, even for those who do not venture to identify the temporally first elements, elementae, the empirical beginnings of myth on the strength of it. With this, however, we are brought from another direction of inquiry to the same requirement that Schelling had also established as the basic postulate of his philosophy of mythology namely, that no element in the process of mythical thinking, no matter how unimposing, fantastic, or arbitrary it may appear, should be considered insignificant as such, but rather, each factor must be assigned to the specific place within the whole from which this thinking receives its ideal sense. This whole contains its own inner truth insofar as it designates one of the paths by which humanity has advanced to its specific self-consciousness and to its specific objective consciousness. Even within purely empirical research and comparative mythology, a tendency has been evident for some time, not merely to survey the extent of mythical thinking and representing, Vorstellen, but also to describe it as a unitary form of consciousness with its own specifically distinctive characteristic features. It expresses itself in the same philosophical tendency that has in other domains, such as natural science or linguistics, led to a reversal in the framing of the problem, to a return from positivism to idealism. In physics, the question of the unity of the physical worldview has led to a renewal and deepening of its general theoretical principles, and in ethnology, the problem of a universal mythology has been increasingly taken on by those engaged in specialized research in recent decades. From the conflict of the individual schools and tendencies, there would appear to be here ultimately no other alternative than to mindfully return to unitary principles and to the fixed and determinate points of the orientation of research. However, as long as it was believed possible to simply infer these principles from objects of mythology, as long as we began from a classification of mythical objects, object, it quickly became evident that the conflicts between the basic views could not be resolved. While it established an overview grouping of the basic mythical motives that were to be found throughout the world and whose kinship was illuminated, even where there was the possibility of an immediate spatio-temporal interconnection, a direct borrowing would seem to be lacking. However, as soon as it was undertaken to separate these motifs, as soon as we attempted to distinguish some as truly original and others by contrast as derived, the strife of opinions at once reared itself again and in the strongest possible terms. The task of ethnology, it was declared was to ascertain in conjunction with ethnic psychology a general validity in the alteration of phenomena and to determine the principles that underlie all particular mythical formations. However, the unity of these principles was, no sooner than it was believed to have been secured, lost amid the abundance and diversity of concrete objects, object. Soul mythology stood alongside nature mythology, and within nature mythology different tendencies, each of which strove with determination and perseverance to prove that a specific object of nature was the heart and origin of all myth formation. 
It was assumed that for each individual myth, if it was at all scientifically explainable, a certain connection with some natural being or event was required, since this was the only way of limiting the arbitrary formation of fantasies and bringing research to a rigorous objective path. However, the formation of hypotheses, which resulted from this supposedly rigorous objective path, proved in the end no less arbitrary than the formation of fantasies. The older form of storm and thunder mythology was now challenged by the astral mythology, which itself soon broke down into the various forms of sun mythology, moon mythology, and planet mythology. To the degree that each of these forms strove, to the exclusion of the others, to constitute and to affirm itself as the sole principle of explanation, it became increasingly clear that the connection with certain individual spheres of given objects, objecte, was not able to guarantee the objective unity of explanation that was sought. Another path to an ultimate unity of myth formation seemed to open when this unity was determined as a spiritual unity rather than as a natural one, in that it was apprehended as the unity of a historical cultural sphere rather than as the unity of a sphere of objects, object. If it were possible to show that such a cultural sphere was the common origin of all the great fundamental mythical motives and the center from which they gradually spread over the whole earth, then the inner inner connection and systematic consistency of these motives would seem to be explained. If this inner connection might be obscure in the derived and mediated forms, it would become immediately evident again as soon as we return to the ultimate historical sources and to relatively simple conditions of emergence. If older theories, such as Benfi's theory of folk legends, had sought here the proper home of the most import and mythical motives in India, then a conclusive proof of the historical interconnections and the historical uniformity of myth formation could be produced, it would seem, only once research had made available the content of Babylonian culture. The question of the original, unitary structure of mythology would now seem to have been answered, along with the question of the originary home, your heimat, of culture. Indeed, according to the pan-Babylonian theory, myth could never have developed into an inherently consistent Weltanschauung if it had emerged solely from primitive magical representations or dream experiences, from animistic beliefs or other superstitions. Rather, the path to such a Weltanschauung was given only where there was a specific concept, a thought of the world as an ordered whole led the way, a condition that was fulfilled only in the inception of Babylonian astronomy and cosmogony. This intellectual and historical orientation seemed to open up the possibility of comprehending myth no longer as a pure figment of the imagination, Fantasy, but as a self contained system, intelligible in itself. We do not need to discuss the empirical foundations of this theory of pan Babylonianism in greater detail here, however. What makes this theory noteworthy in a purely methodological sense is that upon closer examination, it by no means proves to be a merely empirical assertion concerning the factual historical origins of myth, but rather a kind of a priori assertion about the tendency and aim of mythological research. That all myths must be of astral origin that they must ultimately be calendar myths, was for the followers of the pan-Babylonian method the basic methodological claim, the Ariadne's thread that alone would be able to lead us through the labyrinth of mythology. It was repeatedly this general postulate that would serve to fill the lacunae in the empirical tradition and evidence however, with this, it became increasingly clear that no definitive solution to the basic question of the unity of mythological consciousness could be arrived at by way of a purely empirical and historically objective inquiry. More and more firmly, the insight established itself that a merely factual unity of the basic mythical formations, Gabilda, even if we could succeed in demonstrating it beyond any doubt, would still represent a puzzle unless it could be referred back to an underlying structural form of mythical fantasy and thinking. If, however, we do not want to abandon the ground, Bowden, of purely descriptive consideration to the designation of this structural form, then in the end, we would have to rely on the only other concept that offered itself which was the Bastianian concept of folk thoughts, Vokurja Dankin. Fundamentally considered, this theory possesses one important advantage over all the purely objective, elegant forms of explanation the focus of its inquiry is directed not merely toward the contents and objects of mythology but also toward the function of the mythical itself. The basic tendency of this function is always the same, regardless of the diverse conditions under which it is exercised in the variety of the objects, objecte, it draws into its sphere. Thus, from the outset, the desired unity is transposed from the outside to the inner, from the reality of things to the reality of spirit. Even this ideality, however, is not clearly characterized as long as it is only grasped psychologically and determined according to the categories of psychology. When mythology is spoken of as an integral spiritual possession of humanity, whose unity is to be ultimately explained by way of the unity of the human psyche, seal, and the similarity of its doing, then the unity of the psyche, seal itself once again breaks down into a plurality of diverse potencies and faculties. 
As soon as we ask which of these potencies plays the decisive role in the construction of the mythical world, the rivalry and conflict of the different modes of explanation become apparent once again. In the final analysis, does myth stem from the play of subjective fantasy, or does it, in each individual case, go back to a real intuition in which it is grounded? Does it depict a primitive form of cognition and, therefore, is essentially a formation, gabilda, of the intellect, or does it owe its basic manifestations to the sphere of affect and will? The answers given to these questions open up entirely different avenues of scientific research and interpretations of myth. Just as theories were previously distinguished according to the class of objects, object, that they viewed as decisive for the formation of myth, the psychological theories differ according to the basic psychic, sealish, energies to which they are reduced. And here too, the basic different possible types of explanation seem to constantly reappear and succeed one another in a kind of cycle. Even the form of a purely intellectual mythology that for a long time seemed superseded, the view that the core of myth was to be sought in an intellectual interpretation of the phenomena, has recently been revived. In opposition to Schelling's demand for a tautagorical interpretation of mythical figures, Gestalten, an attempt has been made to rehabilitate allegory and allegorical interpretation. All this shows how the inquiry into the unity of myth is constantly in danger of losing itself in some individual detail and satisfying itself in it. Whether this individual detail turns out to be a domain of natural objects, object, a specific, historical cultural sphere, or a particular basic psychological force is essentially indifferent. For in all these cases, the desired unity is mistakenly transposed into elements, elementae, rather than being sought in the characteristic form that produces from these elements, elementae, a new spiritual whole, a world of symbolic significance. Critical epistemology, however, looks at cognition, despite the incalculable diversity of the objects toward which it is directed and despite all the different psychological forces on which it is based in its actual execution, as an ideal whole whose general constitutive conditions it seeks, and the same point of view applies to every spiritual unity of sense. In the final analysis, this unity must be ascertained and secured in a teleological regard rather than in a genetical causal one, as a directional goal followed by consciousness in the construction of spiritual reality. What emerges from such a directional goal and finally stands before us as a finished formation, Gabilda, possesses a self-sufficient being and an autonomous sense, regardless of whether we penetrate the nature of its emergence or how we think of it. Thus, although it is limited to no single group of things or events but instead encompasses and penetrates the whole of being, and although it employs the most diverse spiritual potencies, as its organs, myth constitutes a unitary perspective of consciousness from which nature as well as the psyche, seal, outward being as well as the inward being, appear in a new shape, gestalt. It is necessary to apprehend this modality and understand it according to its conditions. Empirical science, ethnology as a comparative mythology and a history of religion, establishes only the problem the more it expands the circle of consideration, the more evident the synchronicity, Glacialfigkeit, of myth formation becomes. Here too, however, it is important to seek behind this empirical regularity the original lawfulness of spirit from which it derives. Just as within cognition, the mere rhapsody of perceptions is transformed by virtue of certain formal laws of thinking into a system of knowing here too, we can and must inquire into the constitution of that formal unity that brings it about that the infinitely manifold world of myth is not a mere conglomeration of arbitrary representations and unrelated notions but a condensing into a characteristic spiritual formation, Gabilda. Here too. The mere enrichment of our factual cognizing is fruitless as long as it does not at the same time lead to a deepening of the fundamental cognition in which instead of a mere aggregate of individual motives a thoroughgoing organization, a certain superordinatian and subordination of form bestowing elements is rendered visible between them. Nevertheless, if from this perspective, the subordination of myth to a general system of symbolic forms immediately proves beneficial, then of course, it seems to include a certain danger. For a comparison of the mythical form with other basic spiritual forms threatens to level down, nivellierung, its proper content, gehalt, as soon as we accept it in a purely contentative sense, inhaled like imsina, and seek to ground it in merely contentive correspondences or relations. Indeed, there has been no lack of attempts to render myth intelligible by reducing it to another form of spirit, whether cognition, art, or language. If in determining the interconnection between language and myth, Schelling considered language to be a faded mythology, comparative mythology begins from the reverse direction and rendered language as the primary formation, Gabilda, and myth as the secondary formation, Gabilda. Max Mola, for example, attempts to interlink myth and language by making the word and its ambiguity the motive behind mythical concept formation. 
as the connecting link between word and myth, the metaphor, which is itself rooted in the nature, vason, and function of language itself, gives itself to representing, Vorstellen, that tendency that leads to the formations, Gebilde, of myth. Mythology is inevitable it is an inherent necessity of language, if we recognize in language the external form of thought it is the dark shadow that language throws upon thought and which will never disappear as long as language and thought do not coincide, which can never be the case. Mythology, in the highest sense of the word, is the power exercised by language on thought in every possible sphere of mental activity. The fact of baronomy, the fact that one and the same word can be used for an entirely different representative formation, Vorstellungsgebilde, becomes here the key to the interpretation of myths. The source and origin of all mythical sense, Shin, is linguistic ambiguity, Doppelsin, dash myth itself is nothing else but a kind of disease of spirit that has its ultimate ground in a disease of language. The Greek word, which designates laurel, goes back to the Sanskrit root ohana, which signifies the dawn, thus, the myth of Daphne, who in her flight from Apollo is transformed into a laurel tree, is essentially a presentation, Darstellung, of the sun god pursuing his bride, the dawn, Morganberta, who ultimately takes refuge in the bosom of her mother, the earth, and in Greek, the words for human being and stones. And? Resemble one another, according to Greek myth, as in the well-known tale of Deucalion and Pyrrha, human beings who come from stones. The linguistic explanation of mythological motive no longer takes this naive form however, it still seems tempting to render language as the proper vehicle of myth formation. Indeed, Comparative mythology and the comparative history of religion constantly reveal facts that seem to confirm from the most diverse angles the following equation noumena, divinity, equals nomina, names. Usner has given an entirely new depth and fertility to the idea at the base of this equation. The analysis and critique of the names of the gods has proven here to be the spiritual instrument that, if correctly used, can establish an understanding of the process of religious concept formation. In this way, we arrive at a general theory of signification in which the linguistic and the mythical become inseparable from, united with, and correlated with one another. In philosophical terms, the progress that philology and the history of religion have achieved through Usner's theory consists in the fact that here again inquiry is no longer directed at the naked content of individual myths but at myth and language as a whole, as lawful, spiritual forms. For Usner, mythology is nothing more than the theory, of myth, or the morphology, for men lawyer of religious representations. Its purpose is nothing less than to exhibit, Alphysen, the necessity and lawfulness of mythical representing, Vorstellen, and render intelligible not only the mythological formations, Gebilde, of folk religions but also the representational forms of the monotheistic religions. The possibilities inherent in this method of reading the nature, Vazen, of the gods from their names and from the history of their names and the luminous light it is able to cast on the structure of the mythical world, are admirably shown by Usner's Goneman, the names of the gods. Not only is the sense and becoming of the Greek figures of the gods, Gotthard Stalton, illuminated here in detail by philology and the history of language, but at the same time, the attempt is made to exhibit a certain general and typical sequence in mythical and linguistic representing, Vorstellen, itself and accordingly a reciprocal correspondence in their mutual development. And since, on the other hand, Myth subsumes in itself the first beginnings and attempts at a cognition of the world, since it furthermore constitutes perhaps the earliest and most general product of aesthetic fantasy, we would again have before us that immediate unity of the spirit, from which all the separate forms are only fragments, only individual manifestations, oisurungen. Once again, however, our general task demands that in lieu of an original unity in which oppositions resolve themselves and seem to merge into one another, a critical transcendental conceptual unity be sought that aims rather, at the preservation, at the clear determination and delimitation of separate forms. The principle of this separation becomes clear when we connect the problem of signification with that of designation, that is, when we reflect on the manner by which, in the diverse spiritual forms of manifestation, Aserungsfermen, the object is connected with the image, the content, Gehalt, with a sign, and by which, at the same time, both separate from one another and on pendently maintain themselves over against each other. For the active, Creative force of signs appears to be a basic element of agreement in myth as in language, in artistic configuration as in the formation of the basic theoretical concepts of the world, and in the formation of the coherence, Tsuzam and Hong, of the world. What Humboldt says about language, that the human places it between itself and the nature that inwardly and outwardly acts on it, that it surrounds itself with a world of sounds in order to assimilate and rework, Bear Baton, the world of objects, 
is equally true of the formations, gabilda, of mythical and aesthetic fantasy. They are not so much reactions and impressions that act on spirit from outside, as rather genuine spiritual actions. It already becomes clear in the first, in a certain sense most primitive, manifestations of myth that what we are dealing with is not a mere reflection of being but a distinctive formative reworking and presentation of being. Once again, we can trace here how an initial existing tension between subject and object, between inside and outside, is gradually resolved as a new intermediary realm, growing constantly richer and more varied, is placed between the two worlds. To the factual world, Sechevelt, that envelops and dominates it, spirit opposes an independent image world, the active force, craft, of expression ever more clearly and consciously opposes the power, mocked, of impression. This creation, however, does not yet bear the character of a free spiritual act rather, it has a character of natural necessity, the character of a determinate psychological mechanism. This is precisely because at this stage, stuff, there still exists, vorhandenist, no independent and self-conscious, free in its productions, living I rather, because we stand here at the threshold of the spiritual process that is intended to delimit the I and the world over against each other, the new world of signs must appear to consciousness itself as a thoroughly objective reality. Every inception of myth, particularly every magical apprehension of the world, is permeated by this belief in the objective, essential being and in the objective force of the sign. Word magic, image magic, and writing magic form the basic inventory, grundbestand, of magical activity and the magical view of the world. If we look at the general structure of mythical consciousness, we might find a curious paradox. For if, according to a widely prevalent view, the basic drive of myth is a drive to vitalization, i.e. to the concrete intuitive grasping and presentation of all the elements of existence, then how does it come about that this drive is directed with particular intensity toward what is most unreal and lifeless, that the shadow realm of words, images, and signs obtains such a substantial forceful power over mythical consciousness? How does this belief in the abstract, this cult of the symbol, come about in a world in which the general concept is nothing, in which sentiment, immediate drive, sense perception, and intuition seem to be everything? Answers to these questions can be found only if we recognize that the question, at least in this form, is incorrectly formulated, as long as it imports a separation that we make and must necessarily make at the level, stuff, of thoughtful consideration, reflection, and scientific cognition into a domain of spiritual life that precedes this separation and remains indifferent to it. The mythical world is not concrete in as much as it has to do only with sensible objective contents and excludes and repels all merely abstract elements, momenta, everything that is simply signification and sign rather, it is concrete because in it the two elements, momenta, the element of thing, ding moment, and the element of signification, bedudungs moment, merge undifferentiatedly into each other because they are concretized here into an immediate coalesced unity. From the start, myth, as an original mode of configuration, erects a certain barrier against the world of passive sense impression it, too, like art and cognition, arises in a process of divorce, scheidung, in a separate ion, trennung, from immediate actuality, i.e. from the simply given. However, though in this sense it signifies one of the first steps beyond the given, its own product recedes without delay into the form of givenness. Myth rises spiritually above the thing world however, in the figures, gestalten, and images that it sets in their place, it only substitutes another form of existence, dasein, and bondage. What seems to free spirit from the fetters of things becomes a new fetter that is even more unbreakable since it is not merely a physical power but itself already a spiritual power whose violence, gewalt, it undergoes. Of course, a cursion of this sort already contains within itself the imminent condition for its future sublation it contains the possibility of a process of spiritual liberation that is actually performed, Valjuhan, in the progress from the stage, stuff, of the magical mythical view of the world to the authentic religious view of the world. This transition is also, as our investigation will show in detail, conditioned by the fact that spirit posits a new, free relationship to the world of images and signs and that while still living immediately in them and making use of them, it likewise sees through them in a different way than before and for this reason raises above them. And the same dialectic of this basic relationship, this bonding and liberating that spirit undergoes through its own self-made image worlds and confronts us more intensely and with greater clarity when we compare myth with the other domains of symbolic expression. Even for land gauge, no sharp dividing line by which the word and its signification, the material content, seshchal, of the representation and the content, gehalt, of the mere sign, are separated from one another exists at first, but both immediately enter, I'm Gehen, 
into one another and immediately transition, ubergehen, into one another. The nominalistic view, in which words are still only conventional signs, mere flatus voces, is a product of late reflection, not an expression of natural, immediate linguistic consciousness. For this to be valid, the being, vazen, of the thing is not only immediately designated in the word but also in some way contained and present, jejunwaradig, in it. In the linguistic consciousness of primitive peoples, and in that of children, this stage, stuff, of the full concrete sense of names and things, zaka, can still be shown in highly pregnant examples, we need only think of the various forms of namatabu. In the progress of the spiritual development of language, however, an ever sharper and more conscious separation also asserts itself here. If the world of language, like that of myth in which it is still, as it were, initially embedded, appears to immediately cling, at first thoroughly, to the one the sameness, inner lay hide, of word and being, vazen, of signifier and signified, then there nevertheless arises, to the extent that its independent and basic intellectual form, the actual force of logos, which emerges in it as an ever more determinate detachment. Compared to any other merely physical existence and any physical efficacy, the word emerges as something proper and authentic, in its purely ideal, significative function. And art leads us to a new stage of detachment. Even here, there is from the beginning no sharp and clear delimitation between the ideal and the real here too, the formation, jubilda, is not immediately sought as the outcome of a creative process of forming, bilden, as a pure creation of the productive imagination, Einbildungskraft, and known as such as a creation. Rather, the inception of plastic art, bildend and kunst, reaches, as it creates, back into a sphere in which the activity of forming, bilden, itself is still immediately rooted in the circle of magical representation and directed at certain magical purposes, in which, as a consequence, the image, built, itself still has no independent, purely aesthetic significance. Nevertheless, already in the first stirring of authentic artistic configuration there is achieved an entirely new inception, a new principle in the gradual progress of the spiritual form of expression. For here, the image world, build welt, which spirit opposes to the mere object world, sashvelt, and the thing world, obtains for the first time a purely imminent validity and truth. It does not aim at something else or refer to something else rather, it simply is and exists in itself. From the sphere of effectiveness, in which mythical material content, sashchalt, of the representation and the content, gahalt, of the mere sign, are separated from one another exists at first, but both immediately enter, imgehen, into one another and immediately transition, ubergehen, into one another. The nominalistic view in which words are still only conventional signs, mere flatus voces, is a product of late reflection, not an expression of natural, immediate linguistic consciousness. For this to be valid, the being, vazen, of the thing is not only immediately designated in the word but also in some way contained and present, jejunwaradig, in it. In the linguistic consciousness of primitive peoples, and in that of children, this stage, stuff, of the full concrete sense of names and things, zaka, can still be shown in highly pregnant examples. We need only think of the various forms of namatabu. In the progress of the spiritual development of language, however, an ever sharper and more conscious separation also asserts itself here. If the world of language, like that of myth in which it is still, as it were, initially embedded, appears to immediately cling, at first thoroughly, to the one the sameness, inner lay hide, of word and being, vazen, of signifier and signified, then there nevertheless arises, to the extent that its independent and basic intellectual form, the actual force of logos, which emerges in it as an ever more determinate detachment. Compared to any other merely physical existence and any physical efficacy, the word emerges as something proper and authentic, in its purely ideal, significative function. And art leads us to a new stage of detachment. Even here, there is from the beginning no sharp and clear delimitation between the ideal and the real here too. The formation, jubilda, is not immediately sought as the outcome of a creative process of forming, bilden, as a pure creation of the productive imagination, Einbildungskraft, and known as such as a creation. Rather, the inception of plastic art, Bildend and Kunst, reaches, as it creates, back into a sphere in which the activity of forming, Bildin, itself is still immediately rooted in the circle of magical representation and directed at certain magical purposes, in which, as a consequence, the image, built, itself still has no independent, purely aesthetic significance. Nevertheless, already in the first stirring of authentic artistic configuration there is achieved an entirely new inception, a new principle in the gradual progress of the spiritual form of expression. For here, the image world, 
Build Welt, which Spirit opposes to the mere object world, Sashvelt, and the thing world, obtains for the first time a purely immanent validity and truth. It does not aim at something else or refer to something else rather, it simply is and exists in itself. From the sphere of effectiveness, in which mythical insights of critical philosophy that objects are not given to consciousness in a rigid, finished state, nakedly in themselves but that the relation of representation to the object presupposes an independent, spontaneous act of consciousness. The object does not exist before and outside of synthetic unity but is rather constituted only through it, it is no shaped form, gepragged form, that consciousness itself simply imposes and impresses, but rather, it is the result of a forming, formung, that takes place by virtue of the basic medium of consciousness, by virtue of the conditions of intuition and pure thinking. The philosophy of symbolic forms takes up this basic critical idea, this fundamental principle of Kant's Copernican revolution, in order to broaden it. It not only seeks the categories of object consciousness in the theoretical intellectual sphere but also assumes that such categories must be effective wherever a cosmos, a characteristic and typical worldview, takes form out of the chaos of impressions. Every such worldview is possible only through specific acts of objectivization, the reshaping of mere impress signs into intrinsically determinate and configured representations. If in this way, however, the end of objectivization can be traced back to strata that precede the theoretical object consciousness of our experience, of our scientific worldview, then when we descend into these strata the way and the means of this process of objectivization change. So long as the direction of this path is not recognized and generally designated, no clarity can be obtained with regard to its particular course, its individual stages, and its stopping places and turning points. That this direction is not simply one way and unique that the mode and tendency in which the manifold of sensible impressions is combined together into spiritual unities, can exhibit in itself the most diverse nuances of signification this overall result of our previous investigation undergoes a clear and pregnant confirmation when we now focus on the oppositions in the process of objectivization in mythical, theoretical, and pure experiential thinking, Erfahrungsdenken. The logical form of experiential thinking emerges most sharply when we consider its highest working out, Ausbildung in the configuration and construction of science, particularly the foundation of an exact science of nature. What is achieved here in the highest perfection is, however, already inherent, angelate, in each of the simplest acts of empirical judgment, in the empirical comparison and coordination of certain contents of perception. The development of science brings only the principles on which, to speak with Kant, the possibility of every perception rests to full actuality, to elaboration, and to a thoroughgoing logical determination. In truth, however, what we call the world of our perception is already not simply nor self-evidently given from the outset but is only insofar as it has passed through certain basic theoretical acts, grundigt, grasped through the world, by which it is apprehended and determined. Perhaps this general basic relationship most clearly takes shape when we begin from the intuitive originary form of our perceptual world, in its spatial configuration. The relationships of with one another, mighty nander together, next to one another, by ananda together apart from one another, asinander apart, and side by side to one another, nebony and ander juxtaposed, in space are not as such given with our simple sensations, the sensible matter that is ordered in space they are a highly complex, thoroughly mediated result of experiential thinking. If we ascribe a certain size, a certain position, and a certain distance to, in space, we are not thereby speaking about a simple datum of sense impression but are situating the sensible data in an inner connection of relations, relations to sum and hang, and coherent system, system Susam and Hang, one that proves ultimately to be nothing other than a judgment complex, or tail Susam and Hang. Every organization in space presupposes an organization in judgment a difference in positions, sizes, and distances can be grasped and posited only because the individual sensible impressions are judged by different measures of judgment, because a different signification is attributed to them. The epistemocritical as well as psychological analysis of the problem of space has illuminated this state of affairs from every side and secured its basic features whether we take as the expression of this Helmholtz's concept of unconscious inferences or whether we reject this expression, which indeed involves certain dangers and ambiguities. The transcendental as well as the physiological psychological considerations both show that the spatial order of the world of perceptian, as a whole as well as in its details, goes back to acts of identification, differentiation comparison, and coordination that are in their basic form purely intellectual acts. Only in that impressions are structured by such acts, in that they are assigned to a different strata of signification, does the organization in space occur for us, as an intuitive reflex, as it were, of this theoretical stratification of signification. 
and this diverse stratification of impressions, which we come to know in detail in physiological optics, would not be possible if it were not in turn grounded in a general principle, a thoroughgoing required standard. The transition from the world of immediate sense impression to the mediated world of intuitive representation, particularly of spatial representation, is based on the fact that in the fleeting, always the same series of impressions, the constant relationships, in which they stand and according to which they recur, must gradually be emphasized as something independent, and precisely by this means of changing from moment to moment, they are distinguished by the perpetual flux of sensible contents. These constant relationships now form the fixed structure, gafuga, and, as it were, the fixed framework, gorost, of objectivity. Naive thinking, untainted by epistemological doubts and questions, tends to speak without inhibition of constant things and their properties for critical contemplation, this assertion of constant things and properties dissolves when one traces them back to their origins and to their ultimate logical grounds, to the certainty of such relationships, in particular to the certainty of the content relationships of measure and number. The being of the objects, object, of experience is constituted in and through them. For this reason, however, Every apprehension of a particular empirical thing or a determinate empirical event contains within it an act of evaluation. The empirical reality, the fixed core of objective being, in difference to the world of mere representation or imagination, stands out in that the permanent is more and more sharply and clearly distinguished over against the fluid, the constant over against the variable, the fixed over against the mutable. The individual sense impression is not simply taken for what it is and immediately gives rather, it is questioned as to what extent it is confirmed by the whole of experience and is able to assert itself against this whole. Only if it can withstand this inquiry and this critical test is it considered to be included in the realm of reality, of objective determinacy. And at no stage of experiential thinking and experiential knowing is this test, this confirmation, ever at an end rather, it can and must continuously begin anew. Over and over again. The constants of our experience prove to be merely relative constants that in turn require the support and grounding of other, firmer constants. Thus, the boundary IEs between the objective and the merely subjective are not rigidly determined from the beginning but instead are formed and determined only in the continuing process of experience and its theoretical found a tie-in. It is by virtue of a constantly renewed work of spirit that the outline of what we call objective being is constantly displaced in order to be restored in a modified and renewed shape, gestalt. This work, however, is of an essentially critical nature. Again and again, elements, elementae, that were previously considered as secured, as valid, as objective e actual are eliminated, because it turns out that they did not fit without contradiction into the unity of experience as a whole or at least that, measured by this unity, they possessed only a relative and limited and not an absolute significance. Time and again, the order, the lawfulness of appearances in general, is required as a criterion for the truth of the individual empirical phenomenon and of the being that is attributed to this phenomenon. Thus, in the theoretical construction of the interconnected coherence of the world of experience, every particular is immediately or immediately referred to a universal and measured by it. In the final analysis, the relation of the representation to the object means and is grounded in nothing other than the subordination into a more comprehensive, systematic totality of coherence in which an explicit determinate position is assigned to it. The apprehending, the mere apprehension of the individual already occurs, therefore, in this form of thinking, as a consequent subspecie of the concept of law. The individual, particular being and the concrete particular event are and exist, bis ten, however, this consist in existence, be stand, is to be secured and authenticated only in that we are able to think it and must think it as a special case of a general law, or more precisely, as an ensemble a system of general laws. The objectivity of this worldview is, thus, nothing more than the expression of its complete uniformity, jesh loss and hide, the expression of the fact that in and with each individual, we must think the form of the whole, and the individual must be considered, as it were, only as a particular expression, as a representative, representant, of this total form, jessumt form. From this task, which is set for theoretical experiential thinking, the intellectual means are, however, now produce that must be progressively used to accomplish its task. If its aim consists in the highest and most general synthesis, in the combination, tsuzam and fasung, of all particulars in the thoroughgoing unity of experience, then the method by which it can attain this goal seems, however, to point in the opposite direction. Before the contents are rearranged in this way, before they can enter into the form of the systematic whole, they must undergo a transformation they must, in the end, be reduced to, and in a sense dissolved into ultimate elements, elementae, 
that cannot be apprehended by immediate sensible impression but that can be postulated only by theoretical thinking. Without the positing of such elements, elementae, the lawful thinking of experience and science would, as it were, lack a substrate to which it could connect. For as such the undissected contents and configurations of perception as such provide this thinking with no support or basis. They fit into no thoroughgoing and fixed order they nowhere bear the character of truly unequivocal determinacy but rather are apprehended only in their immediate existence and constitute a pure ephemeral flow and flux that defies any attempt to distinguish sharp and exact boundaries. Such boundaries can, on the contrary, be determined only if we return from the immediate existence and constitution of appearances to something else that no longer appears but must rather be thought of as the ground of the appearance. For example, there can be no formula tie-in of the truly exact laws of motion as long as we seek the subjects of motion simply in the realm of concrete perceptible objects. Only when thinking passes beyond this sphere, when it continues on to the positing of atoms as the true subjects of motion, does the phenomenon of motion in these new ideal elements, elementae, become mathematically comprehensible. And in a like manner, the synthesis toward which theoretical experiential thinking strives always presupposes a corresponding analysis and can be constructed only based on such an analysis. Here connection presupposes separation, as in turn separation aims only at mocking the connection possible and preparing the way for it. In this sense, all experiential thinking is intrinsically dialectical, if we take the concept of dialectic in its original historical significance, given it by Plato, and think in it the unity of connection and separation, of, collection and, division. The logical circle that seems inherent in dialectical thinking is, on the contrary, nothing other than the expression of the constant cycle of experiential thinking, which must always operate at once analytically and synthetically, progressively and regressively, by breaking down the particular content into its constitutive factors in order to reproduce it genetically from them as its preconditions. The world of knowledge receives its characteristic form only in the interdependency, in the correlation of these two basic methods. What distinguishes this world from the world of sensible impressions is not the matter, strophe, from which it is constructed but the new order in which it is grasped. This form of order requires that what still stands undifferentiated side by side in immediate perception be gradually distinguished, that what is given in mere togetherness be transformed into subordination and superordination, into a system of grounds and consequences. It is in this category of ground and consequence that thought finds the truly effective instrument of analysis, which in turn makes possible the new mode of connection that it now applies to sensible data. Where the sensible view of the world sees only a peaceful togetherness, a conglomerate of things, dingen, empirical theoretical thinking finds instead of meshing with one another, a complex of conditions, bedingungen. And each particular content is assigned a determinate place in this hierarchy of conditions. Whereas sensible apprehension contents itself with ascertaining the what of the individual contents. This mere what is now transformed into the form of because the mere coexistence or succession of contents, their cogivenness in space and time, is replaced by an ideal dependency, their being grounded in one other. At the same time, however, this is compared to the simplicity, einfachheit, and, as it were, simplicity, einfalt of the first unreflecting view of things to an extraordinary refinement and differentiation in the significance of the concept of the object, object. From the standpoint of the theoretical view of the world and its cognitive ideal, objective no longer means everything that sensation sets before us as a simple existence, dasein, and as a simple being ascertain way, sasein, but only what possesses a guarantee of constancy, of enduring and thoroughgoing determinacy. Because this determinacy, as any phenomenon of optical illusion shows, is not an immediate property of perceptions, perceptions are progressively displaced from the center of objectivity, which they originally seem to occupy, toward the periphery. The objective significance of an element, element, of experience no longer depends on the sensible, forceful power with which it individually strikes consciousness but instead on the clarity with which the form, the lawfulness of the whole, is expressed and reflected in it. However, as this form does not exist all at once but rather is constructed only in a continuous sequence of stages, the empirical concept of truth itself is subject to differentiations and gradations. Mere sensible semblance separates itself from the empirical truth of the object, object, which cannot be apprehended immediately but rather can be achieved only in the progress of theory, in the progress of the scientific thinking of law. Precisely for this reason, however, this truth is not absolute but rather has only a relative character for it stands and falls with the general interconnection of the condition, bedingung susam and hang, in which it must be achieved and with the preconditions, for else sitzung, the hypothesis, 
on which this interconnection of the condition rests. Over and over again, the constant is differentiated from the variable, the object type from the subjective, truth from semblance, and it is through this movement that the certainty of the empirical is gained for thinking, constituting its true logical character. The positive being of the empirical object, object, is obtained, as it were, through a double negation through its delimitation from the absolute on the one hand and from sensible semblance on the other. It is the object, object, of appearance, or shining, but this is not a semblance, shine, provided it is grounded in necessary laws of cognition, provided it is a phenomenon benefunditum. Again, we see that the general concept of objectivity, as well as its individual concrete fulfillments, because both are shaped in the sphere of theoretical thought, are both based on a progressive separation of the elements, elementae, of experience, on a critical work of spirit in which the essential progressively separates itself from the accidental, the constant from the variable, the necessary from the contingent. And there is no phase of experiential consciousness, however primitive and unreflected, in which this basic character is not clearly discernible. To be sure, epistemological considerations often take a state of pure immediacy at the beginning of all empirical cognition in which impressions are absorbed and lived, are laped, in their simple, sensible constitution, without that any sort of forming, formung, or intellectual reworking is undertaken in them. Thus, all the contents are still situated here, as it were, on one plane they are still endowed with a single unsplit and unseparated character of an unadorned and simple existence. What is too readily forgotten here, however, is that the presumed absolutely naive stage of experiential consciousness is not itself a factum but a theoretical construction, it is basically nothing other than a boundary concept created by an epistemocritical reflection. Even where empirical perceptual consciousness has not yet developed into the cognitive consciousness of abstract science, it already implicitly contains those separations and divisions that emerge in cognitive consciousness in explicit logical form. This has already been shown through the example of spatial consciousness however, what is valid for space is no less valid of the other forms of order on which the object of experience is based and through which it is constituted. For every simple perception, Varnamung, implies a taking for true, for of our name and, dash thus, a determinate norm and a standard of objectivity. Upon closer scrutiny, Consciousness already car race out a process of selection and differentiation vis vis the chaotic mass of impressions. As these impressions surge together in a particular given temporal moment, certain features in them must be retained as recurrent and typical, while others are antithetically merely accidental and transient, certain elements must be stressed, while others are excluded as non-essential. Upon such a selection, which we undertake on the matter, Stolf, of perception that presses in from all sides, rests the sole possibility of giving it a determinate form, hence of obtaining a determinate object the sole possibility of relating perception in general to an object, object. Thus, object consciousness of perception and object consciousness of scientific experience do not differ in principle, only in degree, insofar as differences in validity that are already present and effective in perception are in scientific experience raised to the form of cognition, i.e. are fixed in concept and judgment. We are, however, carried one step further in the direction of immediacy when we consider the type of objects and objectivity that confront us in mythical consciousness. Myth, too, lives in a world of pure figures, gestalten, that confronted as something thoroughly objective, indeed, as the objective, pure and simple. The relation to this world, however, discloses no sign of that decisive crisis with which empirical and concept to all knowledge begins. Its contents, to be sure, are given in an objective fashion, as actual contents but this form of reality is still completely homogeneous and undifferentiated. The nuances of significance and value that cognition develops here in its object concept, object, and by virtue of which it comes to rigorously distinguish different spheres of objects, objecte, and to draw a dividing line between the world of truth and the world of semblance are utterly lacking. Myth holds itself, held zisch, exclusively in the presence, gegenwart, of its object, object dash in the intensity with which the object seizes and takes possession of consciousness in a determinate moment, Augenblick. Myth, therefore, lacks any possibility of extending the moment, Augenblick, beyond itself, of looking ahead of it or behind it, of relating it as a particular to the elements, elementae, of reality as a whole. Instead of the dialectical movement of thinking, for which every given particular is only the occasion to incorporate it with others into a series of particulars and ultimately in this way to subordinate it to a general lawfulness of events, here stands a mere devotion to the impression itself and its momentary presence, presents. Consciousness is imprisoned in it as a simple existent, 
it possesses neither the impulse nor the possibility to correct or criticize what is given here and now, to limit its objectivity by measuring it against something not given, a past or a future. If this mediate standard is absent, however, then all being, truth, and reality merge into the mere presence, presence, of. The content and in general all appearances surge together, Zusamandranjan, into a single plane. Here, there are no different levels of reality, really that, no mutually delimited grades of objective certainty. The image of reality, build it air date, that emerges in this way thus lacks the dimension of depth, the separation of foreground and background that is so characteristic of the mode of the empirical scientific concept in which the difference between ground and grounded is realized. And with this one basic feature, Grundzug, of mythical thinking, which has initially been only generally portrayed here, a wealth of other features are determined as its simple and necessary consequence, and with this, the special phenomenology of myth is already indicated in its broad outlines. Indeed, even a cursory look at the facts of mythical consciousness shows that this consciousness in general knows nothing of such determinate lines of separation that the empirical concept and empirical scientific thinking esteems as absolutely necessary. Above all, it lacks any fixed boundary between the merely imagined, vorgestellt, and actual perception, between wish, wunsch, and fulfillment, between image and thing, zaka. This is most clearly revealed by the decisive significance that dream experience possesses for the genesis and construction of mythical consciousness. To be sure, the animistic theory, which attempts to derive the entire content of myth essentially from this one source, which would have myth primarily spring from a confusion and conflating of dream experience and waking experience, is unbalanced and innate quite in the form primarily given to it by Tyler. There can, however, be no doubt that certain basic mythical concepts can be rendered intelligible and transparent in their distinctive structure only if we consider that for mythical thinking and experience, there exists a constant impending transition between the world of dream and the world of objective reality. Even in a purely practical sense, in the position that the human takes vis-a-vis reality, not merely in representatine but in behavior and doing, certain dream experiences are accorded the same force and significance and indirectly come to the same truth that is lived while being awake. The whole life and effective activity of many natural peoples are determined and guided down to the smallest details by their dreams. And mythical thinking makes no clearer difference between the spheres of life and those of death than it does between dreaming and being awake. The two are related not as being and non-being but as two similar, homogeneous parts of one and the same being. For mythical thinking, there is no determinate, clearly delimited moment in which life transitions into death and death into life. It thinks of birth as a return and death as a continuation. In this sense, all the doctrines of immortality of myth originally have not so much a positive a dogmatic significance but rather a negative significance. The undifferentiated and unreflecting consciousness refuses to make a separation that in fact is not immediately and necessarily found in the content of life and experience as such but that ultimately is postulated only through a mindfulness of the empirical conditions of life, that is, through a specific form of causal analysis. If all reality is entirely accepted as it is given in immediate impression, if it is valid in the power that it exercises on the representation of life, effective life, and the life of the will, then indeed the dead person still is even when their previous appearance has changed, even when a merely disembodied shadow existence, Dasein, has taken the place of the sensible material existence, existence. The fact that the living is interconnected as before with the deceased in the appearance of the dream as well as in emotions of love, fear, etc. can be expressed and explained here, where to be actual, Viraklish Sein and to be effective, worksome sign, merge into one, in no other way than by the continued existence, fort best and survival, of the dead. The analytical discretion, which advanced experiential thinking carries out between the appearance of life and that of death and between their empirical presuppositions, is replaced here by an undivided intuition of existence, Dasein, as such. Even physical existence, Dasein, according to this intuition, does not suddenly break off in the moment, Augenblick of death but instead only changes its venue, Shao plots. All the cults of the dead rest essentially on the belief that the dead also require a physical means of preserving their existence, Zine, that they require their food, clothing, and possessions. Thus, if at the stage, stuff, of thinking, at the stage, stuff, of metaphysics, thought must struggle to provide proof for the survival of the soul after death, in the natural progress of the history of human spirit, it is rather the inverse relationship that is the case. It is not immortality but mortality that must here be proven, i.e. that must be theoretically recognized, which must be set out and secured through dividing lines that progressive reflection must introduce into the content of immediate experience. 
This distinctive interpenetration, this indifference of all the various levels, stuff and, of objectivization that are distinguished by empirical thinking and critical understanding, Verstand, must be kept constantly in mind if instead of reflecting on the contents of mythical consciousness from the outside, we wish to understand, verstehen, them from within. We are accustomed to view these contents as symbolic, to seek behind them another hidden sense to which they immediately refer. In this way, myth becomes mysterium its proper signification and depth lie not in what its own figures reveal but in what they conceal. Mythical consciousness resembles a cipher script that is readable and intelligible only for those who possess the key for it, i.e. for whom the particular content of this consciousness is basically not taken as conventional signs for another, another who is in itself not contained in them. From this result, the various types and tendencies of the interpretations of myth are attempts to bring to light the sense of the content, be it theoretical or moral, that myths shelter in themselves. Medieval philosophy distinguished three levels of interpretation a sensus allegoricus, allegorical sense, a sensus anagogicus, anagogical sense, and a sensus mysticus, mythical sense. And even the Romantics, however much they strove to replace the allegorical view of myth with a purely tautagorical view, that is, to understand the basic phenomena of the mythical from itself and not through its relation to something else, did not in principle overcome this type of allegoricis. Furthermore, both Kreuzer in his The Symbolism and Mythology of Ancient Peoples and Johann von Garz in his A History of the Myths of the Asian World see in myth an allegorical and symbolic language that conceals a secret deeper meaning, a purely ideal content, Gehalt, that shines through the pictorial expression itself. On the other hand, if we look at myth itself, at what it is and what it knows itself to be, we see that this separation of the ideal from the real, this divorce between a world of immediate being and a world of mediated signification, this opposition of image and thing, Zaka, is alien to it. Only we, spectators who no longer live and are in myth but who face it merely reflectively, read such differences into myth. Where we see a relationship of mere representation, representation, myth, insofar as it is not yet deviated from its basic and originary form, or form, sees rather a relationship of real identity. The image does not present the thing, Zaka, it is the thing, Zaka. It does not merely represent. Vertraden, it rather, it is effectively equal to it, so that it supplants its immediate presence, Gegenwart. Thus, accordingly we can almost call it a characteristic trait of mythical thinking that it lacks the category of the ideal and that, as a consequence, wherever it encounters something concerning pure significance, this concerning significance itself, in order to be grasped at all, must be transcribed into something tangible, Dinglik, into something being like, Sainzartig. This basic relationship repeats itself in the most diverse stages of mythical thinking however, it comes to expression in mythical doing, far more clearly than it does in mere thinking. In all mythical doing, there is a moment in which a true transubstantiation takes place, the transformation of the subject of this doing into the god or a demon whom it presents. This basic feature can be followed from the most primitive manifestations, oisarungan, of the magical view of the world to the highest enunciation, kunjabungan, of the religious spirit. It has rightly been stressed that in the relationship between myth and right right is the earlier, myth the later. Instead of attempting to explain ritual doing from the content of faith, as a mere representational content, we must rather forge a path the other way we must understand that part of myth that belongs to the world of theoretical representation, that is a mere record or believed narrative, as immediate interpretation of the part that is immediately living in the doing of the human being and in human emotion and will. Thus apprehended, however, no right is originally allegorical, simulative, or depictive but rather in a very real sense, they are so woven into the reality, realitate, of effective action as to form an indispensable component of it. It is a constant belief, encountered in the most varied forms and from the most diverse forms of culture, culture for men, dash, that the survival of human life, indeed the very existence of the world itself, depends on the correct execution of rites. Proust tells us that the Kora and Uedoto Indians attach more importance to the performance of the sacred rites, festivals, and chants than to the results of all their field work, for it is on them that everything that flourishes and grows depends. The cult is the true instrument by virtue of which the human subjugates the world, not so much in a spiritual as in a purely physical sense. The main concern, Furzorga, is that the original innator, the creator of the world has effected, consists in imparting the human with the various forms of cult by which the human has been able to subjugate the forces of nature. For despite its regular course, Nature yields nothing without ceremonies. And this transition, this merging of being into magical mythical action, as well as the immediate repercussion of this action on being, 
occurs in both the subjective as well as the objective sense. It is no mere show, scustuck, and spectacle, schauspiel, that the dancer, who participates in a mythical drama, performs rather, the dancer is the god, becomes the god. In particular, this basic feeling of identity, of a real identification, is repeatedly expressed in every vegetation rite in which the death and the resurrection of the god is celebrated. What is advanced in these rites, as in most of the mystery cults, is no mere imitative presentation of an occurrence but the occurrence itself and its immediate performance it is a offstage drama, just as real and actual because it is through and through an effective event. This form of mime, to which we can trace all dramatic art, is never a mere aesthetic play rather, it is tragically serious, with the seriousness characteristic of the sacred action itself. Consequently, the expression of analogy magic, which we are accustomed to employ for a certain tendency of magical efficacy, does not correspond to the true sense of this efficacy for where we see mere sign and similarity of signs, for magical consciousness, and so to speak for mythical perception, the object itself is, on the contrary, present, Jejenwartig. Only in this light is the belief in magic intelligible magic not only needs to believe in the effectivity of magical means, but in what for us is just called the means it possesses the thing, Zaka, as such and seizes it immediately. This inability of mythical thinking to apprehend only according to signification, to apprehend a pure ideal and significative, is most pregnantly expressed in the position that language is given here. Myth and language are in constant reciprocal contact, their contents bear and condition each other. Image magic stands beside word and name magic, which makes up an integral component of the magical view of the world. In all this, however, the decisive presuppositions are that word and name possess a presentative function and that the object itself and its real force are contained within them. Even word and name do not designate and signify rather, they are an act effectively. A distinctive power over things is already inherent in the mere sensible matter out of which language forms itself, already in every utterance, oisering, of the human voice. As such. For example, natural peoples repel and conjure threatening events and catastrophe through loud shouting and crying. In this way, shouting and noise seek to banish solar and lunar eclipses, severe storms, and thunderstorms. The proper mythical magical force of language emerges, however, only where it appears in the form of an organized, articulated sound. The formed word is in itself delimited and individual, so that a particular domain of being is subject to each word, an individual sphere over which, as it were, it absolutely governs and prevails. In particular, it is the proper name, eigen name, that is in this way fastened by mysterious bonds to the particularity of being, die eigenheit der Wesens. In many cases, this distinctive awe before the proper name still affects us, this feeling that it is not outwardly appended to the person, mensch, but that in some way belongs to him or her. As Gouda puts it in a famous passage from Poetry and Truth. The proper name of a person, mensch, is not like a cloak that only hangs around them, that may be loosened and tightened it will rather, it is a perfectly fitting garment. It grows over them like their very skin one cannot scrape and scratch at it without injuring the person themselves. For original mythical thinking, however, the name is even more than such a skin it expresses the inner, essential being of the person, mensch, and is literally this interiority. Name and personality, Berzunlischkeit, flow together into one here. In the coming offage rites and other rites of initiation, the person receives a new name because what he or she is given here is a new self. It is above all, however, the name of a god that constitutes a real part of the god's being, vazen, and efficacy. It designates the sphere of forces within which each particular deity is and effectively acts. Thus, in prayer, hymns, and all forms of religious speech, great care must be taken that each god is called, Nedin, by its proper name, because the god will accept the proffered sacrifice only if it is invoked, Anrufen, in the proper way. Among the Romans, the ability to invoke the right god in a suitable form was developed into a particular art, which was practiced by the pontifices and in which the indigenous meta that they administered was enshrined and we encounter repeatedly elsewhere in the history of religion the basic view that the proper nature of the god, the strength and diversity of its doing, is contained and, as it were, concentrated in its name. In the name rests the mystery of divine plenitude the diversity of a god's names, the divine polyonomy and moronomy, is a true indication of the inexhaustibility of the work of the god. This belief in the power of the divine name immediately plays out in the books of the Old Testament. In Egypt, which is the classical land of magic and name magic, this feature has most clearly developed in its religious history, the universe is considered to have been created by the divine logos, and the first god is held to have brought himself into being through the force, craft, of his own powerful, gualtig, 
name in the beginning was the name, out of which all being, including divine being, was brought forth. Whoever knows the true name of a god or demon has unlimited power, mocked, over the bearer of the name an Egyptian legend tells how Isis, the great enchantress, tricked the sun god Ra into revealing his name to her and how she thus obtained dominion over him and all the other gods. And in particular, the image, like the name, of a person or thing, Zaka, makes immediately clear the indifference of mythical thinking toward all differences in the stage of objectivization. For mythical thinking, for which all contents condense into a single plane of being, for which everything perceived already possesses as such the character of reality, really Tate, dash the seen image, like the spoken and heard word, is endowed with real forces. The image, too, not only presents the thing, Zaka, for the subjective reflection of a third party, an observer, but is a part of its proper reality and efficacy. Like the proper name of the person, Mensch, their image is an alter ego which befalls the image befalls the person, Mensch, themselves. Thus, in the circle of magical representation, image magic and thing, Zaka, magic are never sharply separated. As its means and vehicle, magic can equally well make use of a person's image as some physical part of them, such as their fingernails or hair. If an enemy's image is pierced with pins or darts, this magically affects the enemy immediately. And the image possesses not only a passive but also a fully active effectiveness, Wurkungsfähig Kiet, dash an effective capacity, Wurkungsfähig Kiet, that is equivalent to that of the object itself. A wax model of an object is the same and performs the same as the object, object, it depicts. This role of image befalls in particular even the shadow of a person. It, too, is a real vulnerable part of them, and every injury to the shadow is an injury to the person himself. It is forbidden to step on the shadow of a person, because this can bring an illness on them. Certain natural peoples are said to tremble at the sight of a rainbow, because they regard it as a net thrown out by a mighty magician to catch their shadows. In West Africa, a murder is sometimes secretly committed by striking a nail or thrusting a knife into the shadow of a man. It is almost certainly a later reflection that we only subsequently introduce into the phenomena of mythical thinking. When we attempt to explain the significance of the shadow as animistic by equating the shadow of the person with their soul. Actually, we seem to be dealing here with a far simpler and more original identification, namely, the identify cation that merges together waking and dreaming, name and thing, zaka, etc., and allows no strict separation between the forms of pictural, abaldic, being and the forms of archetypal, or bilich, being. For a separation of this sort would require something other than a mere intuitive inner scion in the content itself it would require that the individual contents were not apprehended in their mere presence, presents, but traced back to the conditions of their emergence in consciousness and to the causal law that governs this emergence. This, however, would again require a mode of analysis, analyze, that is presupposed by a purely intellectual analysis, zirli gung, and which is completely remote to mythical thinking. In general, the specific particular nature of mythical thinking, and the decisive opposition in which it finds itself vis vis the purely theoretical apprehension of the world, can be comprehended no more from the side of its object concept, object by gruff, than from the side of its causal concept. For both concepts reciprocally condition each other the form of causal thinking determines the form of object thinking, object thinking, and vice versa. Mythical thinking is by no means lacking in the general category of cause and effect indeed, in a certain sense they belong to its basic inventory. This is evidenced not only by the mythical cosmogonies and theogonies that seek to explain the emergence of the world and the birth of the gods but also by a wealth of mythical fables, Marishan, that possess a wholly explicative character, i.e. in that they seek to provide a particular explanation for the origin of some concrete individual thing, such as the origin of the sun or the moon, the human, or some genus of animal or plant. And the cultural fables, Marishan, that trace the possession, of a cultural heritage back to an individual hero or savior, Heilbringer, belong to this circle of intuition. The causality of myth is, however, distinguished from the form of the causal explanation that is required and established by scientific cognitai and by the same feature to which the opposition between their mutual object concepts, object begriff, ultimately reduces itself. According to Kant, the causal clause, causal sats, is a synthetic principle, grunsts, dash a statement, zots, that serves to spell out phenomena in order to read them as experience. However, this synthesis of the causal concept as well as the synthesis that takes place in object concepts, object begriff, includes at the same time an entirely determinate tendency of analysis within itself. Once again, synthesis and analysis complement each other they are methods requiring each other. 
It is a basic lacuna in Hume's psychological view and his psychological critique of the concept of causality that he does not sufficiently recognize this analytical function. According to Hume, every representation of causality should ultimately be derived from the representation of mere coexistence. Two contents that have appeared together in consciousness with sufficient frequency are ultimately transposed, through the mediating psychological function of imagination, from a relationship of mere proximity, of mere spatial togetherness or temporal succession, into a causal relation. Local, or glitch, or temporal contiguity is transformed into causality by a simple mechanism of association. In truth, however, scientific cognition obtains its causal concepts and its judgments of causality in precisely the opposite way. Through these concepts and judgments, contents that are contiguous for immediate sensible impressions are progressively dissected and assigned to different complexes of conditions. In mere perception, a certain state A in moment A is followed by another state B in moment A. Regardless of how often this succession is repeated, however, it would not lead to the thought that A is the cause of B, the post hoc, after this, would never become a propter hoc, because of this, if a new mediating concept were not introduced. From a general state A, thinking isolates a certain element, which it connects with an element sharp S and B and that and sharp S stand in a necessary relationship to each other, a relationship of ground and consequence, of condition and condition, is not passively read from a given perception or a plurality of such perceptions rather, we put it to the test by producing the condition by itself and then seeking the consequence connected with it. The physical experiment, in particular, on which causal judgments in physics ultimately depend, is always based on such a breakdown, ver legung, of the event into individual spheres of conditions, into different strata of relations, relation. By virtue of this progressive analysis, the spatio-temporal event, which was initially given to us as a mere play of impressions, as a rhapsody of perceptions, takes on the new sense that stamps it as a causal event, Geschehen. The individual occurrence, Vorgang, that we have before us is no longer considered merely as such it becomes the bearer and expression of a universal, comprehensive lawfulness that is present in it. The twitching of the frog's leg in Galvani's laboratory becomes, not as an undisassembled phenomenon but, by virtue of the process of analytical thought that was connected with it, the proof and evidence for the new fundamental force of galvanism. Thus, the causal relations produced by science do not simply re-establish a sensible empirical existence rather, inversely, they interrupt and break up the mere contiguity of the elements of experience contents, which in empirical existence stand side by side, are separated according to their ground and essence, while, for the concept, for the intellectual construction of reality, others, which for the immediate sensible view lie far apart, move close together and are related to one another. It was, in this way, that Newton discovered a new causal concept of gravitation, through which such diverse phenomena as the free fall of bodies, the orbit of the planets, and the phenomena of the tides and floods were grasped together as a unity and subjected to one and the same general rule of events. However, this isolating abstraction, by which, from an entire complex, a determinate individual element is emphasized and apprehended as a condition, is and remains alien to mythical thinking. Here every simultaneity, every spatial accompaniment and contact, provides a real causal sequence. It has even been called a principle of mythical causality and of the physics based on it that every contact in time and space is taken as an immediate relationship of cause and effect. In addition to the principles of post hoc, ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore because of this, the principle of juxta hoc, ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore because of this, is especially characteristic of mythical thinking. A common view in this thinking is that animals that appear in a certain season are the bringers, the initiators, of this season in the mythical view, the swallow makes the summer. In connection with the basic intuition that underlies the customs of magic and sacrifice in the Vedic religion, Oldenburg writes. Networks of fantastically arbitrary relations embrace all essential beings whose action is believed to explain the structure of sacrifice and its effect on the course of the world and on the eye they effectively act on one another by contact, by the number inherent in them by something adhering to them. They fear one another, penetrate one another, interweave and pair with one another. One transitions into the other, becomes the other, is a form of the other, is the other. It would seem that once two representations find themselves in a certain proximity, it is impossible to keep them apart. If this is true, we must come to the astonishing conclusion that Hume, in attempting to analyze the causal judgment of science, instead reveal the root of all mythical explanations of the world. Indeed, Mythical representing, Vorstellen, 
has been designated, with an expression taken from the classification of languages, as polysynthetic and this designation has been explained as meaning that for mythical representing, no separation of a total representation, jessum vorstellung, into its elements, elemente, is carried out but that only a single undivided whole, gansa, of intuition is given, a whole in which there has been no dissociation of individual elements, in particular, of the elements of objective perception and subjective feeling. Proust has illustrated this particular nature of the mythical complex mode of representation in opposition to the analytical view of concept to all thinking by way of a reference to the cosmological and religious representations of the core Indians here, it is not the individual star, not the moon or sun, that possesses predominance but the totality of the stars taken as an undivided whole and this whole that is religiously venerated. Thus, the view of the heavens at night and during the day in its totality proceeds, he says, that of the particular heavenly bodies because the whole was apprehended as a unitary being, Vazen, and the religious representations connected with the stars often confounded them with the heavens as a whole they could not free themselves from the holistic view, Jessam Tafasung. In the context of our discussion up to this point, we now recognize, however, that this often stressed and often described feature of mythical thinking is not external or accidental to it but follows necessarily from the structure of this thinking. We have before us here, so to speak, the reverse of the important epistemocritical insight that the basic logical function of the scientific concept of causality is not exhausted in its subsequent combining, either by the imagination or by the understanding, elements, elemente, that have already been given in perception, but it has to first posit and determine these elements, elemente, as such. As long as this determination is lacking, we also lack all those lines of separation and demarcation that divide the different objects and object spheres for our formed, ausgebildet conscious experience that is already entirely permeated with causal inferences. Whereas the thought form of empirical causality is essentially directed toward establishing an unequivocal relation between determinate causes and determinate effects, mythical thinking, even where it raises the question of origins as such, has a free selection of causes at its disposal. Here, anything can come from anything, because anything can stand in temporal or spatial contact with anything. Whereas empirical causal thinking speaks about alteration and seeks to understand it on the basis of a general rule, mythical thinking knows only a simple metamorphosis, understood in the Ovidian, not in the Gethian, sense. When scientific thinking turns to the fact of alteration, its interest is not essentially directed at the transition of a single sensibly given thing into another rather, this transition appears for it as possible and admissible only insofar as a general law is expressed in it insofar as it is based on certain functional relations and determinations that can be regarded as valid independently of the merely here and now and of the constellation of things in the here and now. Mythical metamorphosis, on the other hand, is always the record of an individual event, a progress from one individual and concrete form of a thing and existence to another. The world is fished out of the depths of the sea or molded from a tortoise, the earth is formed from the body of a great beast or from a lotus blossom floating on the water the sun emerges from a stone the human from rocks or trees. In all of these diverse mythical explanations, as chaotic and lawless as they may seem in their mere content, one and the same tendency of apprehending the world takes shape, os pragen. Whereas, the conceptual causal judgment breaks down an event into constant elements, elemente, and seeks to understand it through the complexion and penetration of these elements, elemente, from their similar recurrence, the image of a simple process of the event itself satisfies mythical representing which remains within a holistic representation. In this event, certain typical features may, however, be repeated without being able to speak of a rule and therefore of a determinate restrictive formal condition of becoming. Of course, even the opposition between law and lawlessness, necessity and contingency, requires a sharp, critical analysis and a more rigorous determination before it can be applied to the relationship between mythical and scientific thinking. Leucippus and Democritus seem to express the principle of a scientific explanation of the world and its definitive break with myth when they set forth the proposition that nothing in the world happens at random, von Jungifer, but rather that everything happens for a reason, Grunda, and by necessity? And yet, at first glance, it would seem that this principle of causality is no less valid for the structure of the mythical world, such that it still undergoes a particular accentuation and intensification. That mythical thinking is unable to grasp the thought of an event that is in some sense absolutely by chance has, in any case, been called an essential feature of mythical thinking. We frequently find that where we, from the standpoint of the scientific explanation of the world, would speak of a chance, mythical consciousness insists on a cause and in every single case postulates such a cause. Thus, for example, for the thinking of natural peoples, a catastrophe that descends upon the land, 
an injury that an individual suffers, sickness, and death are never chance events, erignisa, rather, they are always traced back to a magical influence, einwirkung, as their proper cause. In particular, death never occurs of itself but is always brought about by magical influence, einfluss. Mythical thinking, therefore, seems to be so far from an arbitrary lawlessness that, on the contrary, we are tempted rather to speak of a kind of hypertrophy of the causal instinct and of a need for causal explanation. Indeed, the proposition, Zots, that nothing in the world happens by chance but that everything happens by conscious intent has sometimes been designated as the fundamental principle, Zots, of the mythical view of the world. Once again, it is not the concept of causality as such but the specific form of causal explanation that underlies here the difference and the opposition between the two spiritual worlds. It is as if pure cognitive consciousness, er Kentnisbe was sane, and mythical consciousness applied the lever of explanation at entirely different points. Pure cognitive consciousness, er Kentnisbe was sane, is satisfied if it succeeds in comprehending the individual event in space and time as a special instance of a general law, whereas it asks no further of the why regarding the individualization itself, regarding the here and now as such. On the other hand, mythical consciousness directs the question of the why precisely to the particular to the individual and unique. It explains the individual event by positing and assuming individual acts of the will. Our concepts of causal law can, however much they are, directed toward the apprehension and determination of the particular and however much they differentiate themselves and complement and determine one another in order to fulfill this intent, nevertheless always return this particular back, as it were, into a sphere of indeterminacy. For precisely as concepts, they are not able to exhaust concrete intuitive existence and events they are not able to exhaust all the countless modifications of the general case. Every particular, therefore, is indeed subject here to the universal but cannot be completely derived from it alone. Even the particular laws of nature do not present anything new and distinct, as opposed to the general principle, princip, the principle, grunsts, of causality as such. They are subject to this basic principle they fall under it, but in their concrete framing. They are not postulated by it and cannot be determined by it alone. Theoretical thinking and the theoretical science of nature encounter here the problem of random chance. Tsufaligan, dash for in this connectian, random, tsufalik, does not mean what deviates from the form of general lawfulness but what rests on a modification of this form that is not wholly derivable. If theoretical thinking wants in some way to apprehend and determine this element, which is, from the standpoint of the general law of causality, a random chance, it must as the critique of teleological judgment has set out in detail, move it into another category. The pure principle of causality is now replaced by the principle of purpose for what we call purposiveness is really the lawfulness of random chance. Myth, however, takes the opposite path. It begins with the intuition of the purposeful effective action, for all the forces of nature are for myth nothing other than the manifestation of a demonic or divine will. This principle forms the source of light that progressively illuminates for myth the whole of being, however, Outside of this, there is for it no possibility of understanding, verstehen, the world. For scientific thinking, to understand, verstehen, an event signifies nothing other than to reduce it to certain general conditions, to subordinate it to the universal complex of conditions that we call nature. A phenomenon such as the death of a person is understood, verstanden, if we succeed in assigning a place to it within this complex, if we can recognize it as necessary on the basis of the physiological conditions of life. Even if myth could conceive of this necessity of the general course of nature, it would, however, remain for myth a mere random chance, because it leaves unexplained precisely what holds the interest and attention of myth, namely the here and now of the particular case, the death of precisely this person, at precisely this moment in time. This individual event seems to be intelligible, first English, only if we succeed, in tracing it back to something no less individual, to a personal act of the will, which, as a free act, requires and is susceptible of no further explanation. If the tendency of the general concept thinks of all freedom of doing as having been determined by an unequivocal causal order, then myth, on the contrary, dissolves all determination of the event into a freedom of doing, and both have explained an occurrence when they have interpreted it from their own specific point of view. And this framing of the concept of causality is connected to another feature that has always been stressed as particularly characteristic of the mythical view of the world namely the distinctive relationship that it assumes between the whole of a concrete object, object, and its individual parts. For our empirical apprehension, the whole consists of its parts for the logic of the cognition of nature, nature or kentness, for the logic of the analytical scientific concept of causality, it results from them. However, essentially neither of them applies for the mythical apprehension rather, 
here an actual undifferentiatedness, unjushedenheit, an intellectual and real indifference between the whole and its parts prevails. The whole does not have parts and does not break down into them rather, the part is immediately the whole and effectively acts and functions as such. This relationship, this principle of the pars pro toto, a part for the whole, has also been designated as a basic principle of primitive logic. And once again, it is by no means a question of a mere substitution but of a real determination, not a symbolic thought, but a tangible effective interconnection. The part, mythically speaking, is the same thing as the whole because it is a real bearer of efficacy, because everything that it incurs or does, that actively or passively happens to, and, it, is incurred or done of, day, the whole. Consciousness of the part as such, as a mere part, does not belong to the immediate, naive intuition of the actual but rather is achieved only by that separating and organizing function of mediating thinking that goes back from objects, as concrete thing unities, to their constitutive conditions. If we follow the progress of scientific thinking, we see how the working out, Ausbildung, of the concept of causality and the working out of the category of the whole and the parts develop hand in hand and how both belong to one and the same tendency of analysis. The question of the origin of being detaches itself in the inception of Greek speculation from the question of the origins of mythical cosmogonies in that it penetrates it at the same time with the question of the elements, elementae, of being. The arch, in its new philosophical sense, in the sense of a principle, henceforth signifies both it is origin as well as element, element. The world is not only, as in myth, coming into being out of the originary water, your wasser, rather, the water accounts for its consistent existence, its lasting material, stofflichi, constitution. And if this constitution is initially sought in a single material, in a concrete originera stuff, then once the concept of the element, element, is displaced, insofar as the physical view of the world is replaced by mathematical intuition and with it the basic form of mathematical analysis emerges. Earth, air, water, and fire no longer form the elements, elementae, of things, and love and hate as basic semi-mythical forces, no longer intertwine with one another and separate from one another rather, being as a mathematical physical cosmos is now constructed by the simplest spatial figures, gestalten, and movements in the integrated and necessary laws according to which they are ordered. In the emergence of the ancient atomic theory, one can clearly follow how the new concept of ground, the new concept of causality, demanded and called forth a new concept of the element, element, a new relationship between the whole and its parts. The idea of the atom forms only a single element, moment, in the construction and development of the general view of being that manifested itself in Democritus' concept of natural law, of ideology. And the further development that the concept of the atom has undergone in the history of science has continued to confirm this interconnection. Atoms were valid as the ultimate, irreducible parts of being only as long as the analysis of becoming seemed to have found in them an ultimate resting point. In the moment, however, when the causal analysis, Zierligung, of becoming into its individual factors progressed further and advanced beyond these resting points, the picture, built, of the atom changed. It disintegrated, Zerfallen, into other, simpler elements, elementae, that were then established as the actual bearers of events, as the starting points for the formulation of determinate causal relations. We thus see that the divisions and subdivisions made by scientific cognition and being are always only the expression and, as it were, the conceptual cloak for the lawful relations by which science seeks to comprehend and unambiguously determine the world of becoming. The whole is here not so much the sum of its parts as it is constructed out of their reciprocal relationship it signifies the unity of the dynamic connection, in which each individual participates and which in its place it helps to accomplish. And here too, myth now shows us the reverse side of this relationship and thus allows us to prove our point inversely. Because myth does not know the thought form of causal analysis, there consists for it no sharp boundary that only this thought form initially posits between the whole and its parts. Even where empirical sensible intuition seems to give itself, so to speak, as separated and divorced, myth replaces this sensible, apartness, asinander, and proximity, nebanianander, by a distinctive form of interpenetration, inianander. The whole and its parts are interwoven into each other, inianander, their destinies are linked, as it were, with one another, mitinander, dash and so the parts are still the whole even if they have been detached from one another, vone nonder, in pure fact. Even after this separation, the fate of the part hangs over the whole as well. Whoever acquires even the most insignificant bodily part of a person, be it their name, their shadow, their reflected image, which in a sense are for mythical intuition likewise real parts of a person, has thereby taken possession of them, has achieved forceful magical power over them. 
from a purely formal point of view, the whole of the phenomenology of magic goes back to this one basic prerequisite, in which the complex intuition of myth is distinguished with particular clarity from the particular nature of the abstract, or, more precisely, the abstracting and analyzing concept. The influence of this thought form can be followed in the direction of time as well as in the direction of space it is reorganized after itself the apprehension of succession as well as that of simultaneity. In both cases, mythical thinking has a tendency to impede the possibility of that analytical dissection of being into independent partial elements, telelemente, and partial conditions, telbedingungen, with which the scientific apprehension of nature begins and which remains typical of it. According to the basic representation of sympathetic magic, a constant connection, a true causal nexus, exists between everything whose spatial proximity or whose affinity to the same tangible whole designates them, however externally, as belonging together. To leave remnants of food about, or the bones of animals one has eaten, involves grave dangers anything that happens to these remains through hostile magic influences will simultaneously happen to the food in the body and to whoever has eaten it. A person's excrement and the cuttings of their hair and nails must be buried or burned to prevent them from falling into the hands of a hostile magician. Among certain Indian tribes, if the saliva of the enemy can be obtained, it is enclosed in a potato and hung in the chimney as the saliva dries in the smoke, the enemy's strength dwindles with it. As we see, the sympathetic interconnection that is assumed between the individual parts of the body is totally indifferent to their physical and spatial separation. The force of this interconnection sublates the separation of the whole of an organism into its parts and the fixed delimitation of what these parts are for themselves and what they signify for the whole. Whereas conceptual causal apprehension, in its presentation and explanation of the occurrences of life, lays out, as in Anderlegen, the whole event taking place in the organism into single characteristic activities and performances, the mythical view accomplishes no such separation into elementary processes and, therefore, no proper articulation of the organism itself. Any part of the body, however inorganic, such as the nail or the little toe, is equal to any other in what it magically signifies for the whole instead of the organic construction, which always presupposes an organic differentiation, a simple equivalence prevails. Once again, it remains here with the intuition of a simple togetherness of tangible pieces without arriving at a superordination and subordination of functions, each of which is differentiated according to its particular conditions. And just as the physical parts of the organism do not sharply separate from each other, asinodertraden, according to their significance, so too are the temporal determinations of the event, the individual moments of time, not set apart from each other according to each one's causal significance. If a warrior is wounded by an arrow, he can, according to the magical mode of representation, be healed or diminish his pain by hanging the arrow in a cool place or smearing it with an ointment. Strange as this kind of causality may seem to us, it immediately becomes intelligible when we consider that here the arrow and the wound, the cause and the effect, are still an entirely simple, unanalyzed thing in it. From the standpoint of a scientific consideration of the world, one thing is never simply the cause of another rather, its effect on this thing is produced only under very specific determining circumstances and above all in a rigidly delimited temporal moment. The causal relationship here is not so much a relationship of things but rather a relationship between alterations that occur in certain objects, objecte, at determinate times. By virtue of this tracing out of the temporal course of events and its laying out, asinanderlegung, into different, clearly distant from one another phases, causal interconnections become more and more complex and mediate as scientific cognition progresses. The arrow can no longer be thought of as the cause of the wound, rather, in a determinate moment, t, in which it penetrates the body, the arrow evokes, her vorufen, a determinate alteration in it, and this is followed, in the ensuing moments t, t, etc., by other determinate alterations and a series of alterations in the bodily organism, all of which must be considered as necessary partial conditions, tailbettingungen, of the wound. Because myth and magic nowhere undertake this separation into the partial conditions, each of which would only possess a certain relative value within the whole of the interconnection of effect, there are for them essentially just as few such barriers that distinguish the elements of time as there are barriers for the parts of a spatial whole. The sympathetic magical interconnection bridges spatial differences as well as temporal differences the resolution of spatial togetherness, the physical separation of a body part from the whole of the body, does not sublate the effective interconnection between them, and similarly, the borders of before and after, earlier and later transition into one another. More precisely, the magical relation does not have to first establish itself between spatially and temporally separate elements, elementae, dash this would only be immediate reflexive expression of the relationship, rather, in general, 
magic thwarts from the outset that such a decomposition, zerfong, into elements, elemente, can come about. And even where empirical intuition seems to immediately render present such a separation, it is at once sublated by magical intuition as the tension between the differences in space and time is resolved into the simple identity of the magical ground. A further consequence of this barrier that is set before the mythical view manifests itself in the tangible substantial view of effective action that is everywhere characteristic of it. The logical causal analysis of events is essentially directed toward dissolving the given into simple processes that we can observe separately and assess in the regularity of their course, mythical intuition sees it the other way around, where it turns to the consideration of the processes of the event, where it poses the question of emergence and origin, the genesis itself is always already linked to a concrete given existence. It always knows and apprehends the process of effective action only as a simple variation between forms of concrete individual existence. There the path goes from the thing, ding, to the condition, bidingung, from substantial to functional intuition, here, the intuition of becoming remains confined within the intuition of a simple existence. If cognition, the further it advances, progressively limits itself to inquiring into the pure how of becoming, i.e. into its lawful form, then myth inquires solely into its what, whence, and whither. And it insists on seeing both the whence and the whither in full tangible determination before itself. Here causality is not a relational form of mediating thinking, which, as real, eigen, and independent, places itself, as it were, between the individual elements, elemente, in order to implement their connection and separation rather, here the elements, momenta, into which becoming is dissected still possess and preserve, but varen, a true character of an originary thing, or is a primal matter, of the independent, concrete thing character. While conceptual thinking, in that it lays out a continuous series of events into causes, urazakan, and effects, is in this way essentially directed toward the mode, the constancy, and the rule of the transition, the beginning and end of the process being clearly contrasted against each other is enough for the mythical need for explanation. A great number of creation myths relate how the world, weld, emerged from a simple, originary thing or a beginning thing, yorunt and fangsache, from the cosmic egg, welte, or the world ash tree, veltisha. In Nordic mythology, it is formed from the lived body of the giant Immer from Immer's flesh that the earth is created, from his blood the roaring sea, from the bones the mountains, from his hair the trees, from his skull the dome of heaven. That this is a typical form of representation is shown by the analogy of a Vedic creation hymn, which describes how the living nature, Vazan, the animals of the air and wilderness, the sun, the moon, and the air issued from the limbs of the Purusha, the human who was offered up as a sacrifice by the gods. Here the distinctive high postatization that is essential to all mythical thinking stands out even more sharply they are not only individual, concrete perceptible objects, objecte, whose emergence is explained in this way but also highly complex and mediated formal relations. The songs and melodies, the meters, and the sacrificial formulas are also issued from different parts of the parosha, and the social differences and orders disclose the same concrete and tangible origin. The Brahmin was his mouth, his arms were made the Rajanya, warrior his two thighs the Wysia, trader and agriculturist, from his feet the Esyudra, serval class, was born. Whereas conceptual causal thinking seeks to dissolve all being, seen, into relations and understand it through them, the mythical question of origins is addressed only in that it traces even intricate complexes of relations, such as rhythms of a melody or the organisatide of the castes, back to a pre-given tangible existence. According to its original thought form, all the mere states or properties must also for myth ultimately become bodies. The fact that the Braham, the warrior, and the Sutra distinguish themselves from each other is intelligible only in that they contain different substances the Braham, the Kshatra, the Sutra, each lends their particular property to those who partake of it. According to Vedic theology, the husband-killing body dwells in an evil, faithless woman the body, Tanu, of soullessness dwells in a barren woman. In such determinations, the imminent conflict, the dialectic in which the mythical mode of representation moves, becomes particularly evident. The mythical fantasy drives toward animation and ensoulment, toward a thoroughgoing spiritualization of the all, all, however, the mythical thought form, which attaches all qualities and activities, all states and relations to a fixed substratum, leads to the opposite extreme a kind of materialization of spiritual contents. Indeed, Mythical thinking also seeks to establish a kind of continuity between cause and effect by intercalating a series of middle links between them as beginning and end states. Even these middle links, however, preserve a merely substantive character, sash character. From the standpoint of analytic scientific causality, 
The continuity of events is essentially established in that a unitary law, an analytical function, is demonstrated by which the whole of the event can be intellectually mastered and determined from temporal moment to temporal moment. Each temporal moment is a determined state of the event, which can be expressed mathematically by certain values of magnitude however, in their totality, all these different values constitute a single series of alterations, because the alterations that they undergo is subject to a general rule and is thought of as issuing necessarily from that rule. In this rule, both the unity and the separation, the continuity and the discretion of the particular moments of the event are constituted. Mythical thinking, however, knows no such unity of connection nor such a separation. It apprehends the effective process, even where it would seem to be dismantled and unfolded into a plurality of stages, in an entirely substantial form. The entire particular nature of effective action is explained in that a determinate tangible quality of the thing, zaka, successively passes over from one thing, zaka, in which it is inherent to other things, session. Even everything that in empirical and scientific thinking appears to be a mere dependent property or a mere state, obtains here the character of complete substantiality and hence of immediate transferability. It is reported that the Hoopa Indians look on pain as a substance. And even purely spiritual, purely moral properties are, in this sense, apprehended as transferable substances, as is shown by a number of ritual rules regulating this transference. Thus, attained, a miasma that a community has brought on itself, can be transferred to an individual, a slave for example, and destroyed by the sacrifice of the slave. One such atonement ritual found in the Greek Thergelia festivals and also in otherwise extraordinary events that took place in Ionian cities traces back to the most ancient and widespread basic mythical intuition. When one considers the original sense of all these rites of purification and atonement, their use was in no way a merely symbolic substitution but rather a thoroughly real, almost physical transference. A botox suffering under a curse can make it fly away by transferring it to a swallow and letting it fly away and the transference can occur to a mere object, object, as well as to an ensouled or animate subject, as is reported, for example, of a custom of the Shinto religion. Here, the priest gives the person who is to be cleansed a sheet of white paper cut in the shape, gestalt, of a human garment, called katashiro, representative, representant, of the human shape, gestalt, on which the year and month of their birth and their family name are written. The person then rubs it over their body and breathes on it, whereupon their sins are transferred to the Katashiro. At the end of the purification ceremony, these scapegoats are thrown into a river or sea, so that the four gods of purification may guide them into the underworld, where they will disappear without trace. And all other spiritual properties and faculties are, for mythical thinking, bound up with some specific tangible substrate. In the Egyptian coronation ceremonies, there are detailed instructions as to how, in each of the specific stages, all the properties, all the attributes of the god are to be transferred to the pharaoh through the regalia, the scepter, the scourge, and the sword. These are looked upon not as mere symbols but as true talismans, bearers and guardians of divine forces. In general, the mythical concept of force distinguishes itself from the scientific concept of force in that for a myth, force never appears as a dynamic relationship, as the expression for a totality, gansa, of causal relations, relationen, but rather always as something thing-like or substance-like. This thing-like is widespread throughout the world, but it seems thickened, as it were, in certain powerful personalities, in the magician and the priest, in the chieftain and the warrior. And from this substantial whole, Gansa, from this store of force, individual parts can detach themselves and enter into another individual by mere contact. The magical force of magic, Daimagish at Saubercroft, proper to the priest or chieftain, the mana that is concentrated in them is not bound to them as individual subjects but is capable of the most varied transformations and communications, mit Eilingen. Mythical force is not, therefore, like physical force, a mere synoptic expression, only an event and mere resultant of causal factors and conditions that can be thought as effective only in their combination, in their reciprocal relation to one another, rather, it is a unique substantive being that as such wanders from place to place, from subject to subject. Among the use, for example, the vessels and secrets belonging to the magician can be acquired by purchase however, an individual can acquire the magic force only by physical transference, which is accomplished mainly by mixing the blood and saliva of the seller and purchaser of the magic. Even a sickness from which a person suffers is never, mythically speaking, a process operating that plays out in their body under empirically known and general empirical conditions but rather is a demon that has taken possession of them. And the emphasis here is not on the animistic but on substantial apprehension for the sickness can be apprehended equally as well as an animated demonic being, 
Vazen, as a kind of foreign body that has entered into a person. The profound gulf between this mythical form of medicine and the empirical scientific form that found its first basis in Greek thinking becomes apparent when we compare, for example, the Hippocratic corpus with the lore of the priests of Asclepius at Epidaurus. Throughout mythical thinking, even the high postatization of properties and processes returns in other ways from forces and activities that often simply lead to their immediate materialization. To allude to this distinctive detachability and transferability of mere properties and states, a principle of emanism is said to dominate mythical thinking. Perhaps we can best appreciate the sense and origin of this mode of thinking, however, if we consider that even in scientific cognition, the sharp separation between the thing, on the one hand, and a property, state, and relation, on the other, only gradually results from unremitting intellectual struggles. Here too, the boundaries between the substantial and the functional are ever and again blurred, so that a semi-mythical hypostasis of purely functional and relational concepts arises. Even the physical concept of force, for example, was only able to slowly free itself from this entanglement. In the history of physics, we frequently encounter attempts to understand and classify the different forms of effective action by attaching them to determinate stuff and their transference from one point in space to another, from one thing to another. The physics of the 18th century and early 19th century still spoke in this way of a thermal stuff, or of an electrical or magnetic matter. However, while the true tendency of scientific, Analytical critical thinking is toward liberation from this material mode of representation, stoff like and Vorstellungsart, it is distinctive of myth that despite all the spirituality of its objects, objecte, and contents, in its logic, in the form of its concepts, it clings to bodies. So far, we have attempted to characterize this logic in its most general basic features, now, we must consider the impact of the specific object, object concept and causal concept of mythical thinking in the framing and forming of individuals and how they decisively determine all the particular categories of the mythical. 2. The Individual Categories of Mythical Thinking When we compare the empirical scientific and the mythical worldviews with one another, it immediately becomes clear that the opposition between them is not in their employing entirely different categories in the consideration and interpretation of the actual, not the constitution, the quality of these categories but rather their modality distinguishes myth from empirical scientific cognition. The modes of connection that they both employ to give the form of unity to the sensible manifold, to imprint a shape, gestalt, on the diffluent, disclose a thoroughgoing analogy and correspondence. They are the same general forms of intuition and thinking that constitute the unity of consciousness as such and that accordingly constitute the unity of mythical consciousness, as well as the unity of the pure cognitive consciousness. In this respect, it may be said that each of these forms, before taking on its specific logical shape, gestalt, and imprinting, must pass through a preliminary mythical stage. The image of the cosmos, the image of the world space, Veltraum, and of the organization of bodies in the world space as the astrological science designed it, underlies the astrological intuition of space and of events in space. Before the general theory of motion became pure mechanics, the mathematical presentation of the phenomena of motion, bewegung, it had sought to answer the question of the where from, wo her of motion, bewegung, which took it back to the mythical problem of creation, to the problem of the prime mover, bewiger, and no less than the concepts of space and time, the concept of number, before becoming a purely mathematical concept, was also a mythical concept, as a precondition that, if foreign to the primitive mythical consciousness, underlies all its further, higher formations. Long before number became a pure unit of measurement, it was revered as a sacred number, and an aura of this reverence still attended the inception of systematic mathematics. Thus, taken abstractly, the same types of relation, unity and multiplicity, coexistence, mitinander, togetherness, bizomen, and succession, nashinander, dominate the mythical and the scientific explanations of the world. And yet each of these concepts, as soon as we restore them to the mythical sphere, immediately take on a unique particularity and, as it were, a certain distinctive tonality. This tonality, this nuancing of individual concepts within mythical consciousness, seems at first glance to be entirely individual, something that can only be empathized with but that can in no way be recognized and comprehended. Nevertheless, this individual is still based on a universal. On closer consideration, as the particular constitution and the particular nature of each individual category are repeated, a determinate type of thinking shows itself. The basic structure of mythical thinking, which manifests itself in the tendency of mythical object consciousness and in the character of its concepts of reality, realitate, substance, and causality, goes further, 
It also seizes and determines the individual configurations of this thinking and, as it were, imprints its seal on them. Object, object, relation and object, object, determination within pure cognition go back to the basic form of the synthetic judgment we say that we cognize the object if we have effected a synthetic unity in the manifold of intuition. The synthetic unity is, however, essentially a systematic unity its production stands still at no point but progressively seizes upon the whole of experience, to transform it into a single logical coherent interconnection, a totality, gansa, of grounds and consequences. In the construction, in the hierarchy of these grounds and consequences, each individual appearance, each particular existence and event, is assigned a particular position, by virtue of which it is distinguished from all the others and at the same time related to them. This emerges most clearly in the mathematical framing, fasong, of the worldview. The particularity of a being or event is designated here in that specific, characteristic, numerical, and quantitative values are assigned to it, however, all these values are connected to one another in definite equations, in functional interconnections, so that they form a lawfully organized series, a fixed framework, gafuga, of exact quantitative determinations. In this sense, modern physics, for example, comprehends the totality of events in that it expresses each particular event in its four space-time coordinates, x, 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 and traces the alterations of these coordinates back to an ultimate invariant lawfulness. This example shows once again that for scientific thinking, connection and separation do not form two different or entirely opposite basic acts, but rather through one and the same logical process, in which both remain, the sharp keeping asunder of particulars in their combination, tsuzam and fusung, into the systematic unity of the whole is carried out. And the deeper reason for this is to be sought in the essential nature of the synthetic judgment itself. For what distinguishes the synthetic judgment from the analytical judgment is that it thinks of the unity that it undertakes not as a conceptual identity but as a unity of differences. Each element, element, that is posited in it is thus characterized not by the fact that it simply is in itself and logically remains in itself but rather by the fact that it is correlative to some other element. To bring this relationship to schematic expression, we call the elements, elemente, of the relation A and B and the relation, relation, by which they are held together are so that every such relation shows a threefold organization. Not only do the two basic elements, elementae, A and B, contrast clearly and distinctly with one another through the relation into which they enter and by virtue of it, but the form of the relation itself, R, signifies something new and specific as opposed to the contents that are ordered in it. It belongs, so to speak, to another plane of signification than the individual contents themselves it is not itself a particular content, a particular thing, but a general, purely ideal relationship. Such ideal relations ground what scientific cognition calls the truth of appearances what is understood by this truth is nothing other than the totality of the appearances. Themselves, insofar as they are not taken in their concrete existence but are transposed into the form of an intellectual interconnection, an interconnection that is based to an equal degree and with equal necessity on acts both of logical connection and of logical separation. Myth also strives for a unity of the world. And in satisfying this striving, it moves in specific channels prescribed by its spiritual nature. Even in the lowest levels of mythical thinking, in which it seems to be wholly subjected to immediate sensible impressions and elementary sensible drives, and even in magical apprehension, which disperses the world into a confused multiplicity of demonic forces, we find features pointing to a kind of organization, Gliederung, a future organization, organization, of these forces. And as myth rises to higher formations, as it transforms the demons into gods, each with its own individuality and history, the more clearly it delimits their essential being and effectiveness over against each other. Just as scientific cognition strives for a hierarchy of laws, a systematic superordination and subordination of grounds and consequences, so too does myth strive for a hierarchy of forces and figures, gestalten, of the gods. The world becomes progressively transparent in that its parts are assigned to the various gods, in that in particular regions, but seerk, of existence and human activity are subjected to the guardianship of a particular god. No matter how much the mythical world is woven into a whole, however, this intuitive whole is of a very different character than the concept to all whole in which cognition seeks to hold together reality. There are no ideal forms of relation here that constitute the objective world as a thoroughly and lawfully determined world rather, here all being melts together into concrete pictorial, build haft, unities. And this opposition which is visible in the result, rests ultimately on an opposition in principle. 
Every individual connection that takes place in mythical thinking bears this character, which comes to complete clarity and visibility only in the whole. If scientific cognition is able to connect elements, elementae, only by separating them over against each other in one and the same basic critical act, then myth, as it were, rolls up everything it touches together into an undifferentiated unity. The relations it posits are of such a nature that the members that enter into them not only enter into a reciprocal ideal relationship but also become positively identical with one another, become one and the same thing. These relations in a mythical sense only. Ever touch, berurt, one another, whether this contact, berurung, is understood as a spatial or temporal togetherness or as a similarity, however remote, or as belonging to the same class or species, have fundamentally ceased to be many and diverse it has acquired a substantial unity of being. Vazen. This intuition clearly emerges even at the lowest stages of myth. Concerning the basic tendency of the magical view of the world pre-USS has an inner connection that is based to an equal degree and with equal necessity on acts both of logical connection and of logical separation. Myth also strives for a unity of the world. And in satisfying this striving, it moves in specific channels prescribed by its spiritual nature. Even in the lowest levels of mythical thinking, in which it seems to be wholly subjected to immediate sensible impressions and elementary sensible drives, and even in magical apprehension, which disperses the world into a confused multiplicity of demonic forces, we find features pointing to a kind of organization, Gliederung, a future organization, organization, of these forces. And as myth rises to higher formations, as it transforms the demons into gods, each with its own individuality and history, the more clearly it delimits their essential being and effectiveness over against each other. Just as scientific cognition strives for a hierarchy of laws, a systematic superordination and subordination of grounds and consequences, so too does myth strive for a hierarchy of forces and figures, gestalten, of the gods. The world becomes progressively transparent in that its parts are assigned to the various gods, in that in particular regions, but circ, of existence and human activity are subjected to the guardianship of a particular god. No matter how much the mythical world is woven into a whole, however, this intuitive whole is of a very different character than the concept to all whole in which cognition seeks to hold together reality. There are no ideal forms of relation here that constitute the objective world as a thoroughly and lawfully determined world rather, here all being melts together into concrete pictorial, build haft, unities. And this opposition, which is visible in the result, rests ultimately on an opposition in principle. Every individual connection that takes place in mythical thinking bears this character, which comes to complete clarity and visibility only in the whole. If scientific cognition is able to connect elements, elementae, only by separating them over against each other in one and the same basic critical act, then myth, as it were, rolls up everything it touches together into an undifferentiated unity. The relations it posits are of such a nature that the members that enter into them not only enter into a reciprocal ideal relationship but also become positively identical with one another, become one and the same thing. These relations in a mythical sense only. Ever touch, berurt, one another, whether this contact, berurung, is understood as a spatial or temporal togetherness or as a similarity, however remote, or as belonging to the same class or species, have fundamentally ceased to be many and diverse it has acquired a substantial unity of being. Vazen. This intuition clearly emerges even at the lowest stages of myth. Concerning the basic tendency of the magical view of the world pre-USS has, a whole assumes, for sets and proposits, their sharp separations, their differentiation as elements, elementing. Thus, number is defined by the Pythagoreans as that which brings all things into harmony within the soul and what thus lends them corporeality and separates the relationships of delimited and unlimited things each for itself. And precisely on this separation rests the necessity as well as the possibility of all harmony. The like, glike, and related needed no harmony, but unlike, unglaish, and unrelated and unequally allocated are necessarily fastened together by such a harmony, through which they are able to hold together the world order. Instead of such a harmony, which is the arrangement of mixed things and the correct agreement of diversity, mythical thinking knows only the principle of one's the sameness, einer lehyd, of the part with the whole. The whole is the part in the sense that it enters into it with its whole mythical substantial essential being, that is almost sensibly and materially set into it. The whole person is contained in their hair, their nail cuttings, their clothes, their footprints. Every trace that the person leaves behind them is effectively a real part of them, which can react on them as a whole and endanger them as a whole. And the same mythical law of participation that holds for real relationships prevails for purely ideal relationships in our sense. Similarly, the genus, 
in its relation to the species or individuals that it comprises, is not the relationship that logically determines the party tular as something general but is immediately present, living, and acting in this particular. Here, we have no mere intellectual subordination but an actual subjugation of the individual to its generic concept. The structure of the totemic worldview, for example, can scarcely be comprehended except through this essential feature of mythical thinking. For in the totemic classification of people, mention, and the totality, gesamtheit, of the world, there is no mere coordination between the classes of people, mention, and things, on the one hand, and certain classes of animals and plants, on the other rather, the individual is thought of here as dependent on, even identical with, their totemic ancestor. According to Carl von den Steinen, the Trumais of northern Brazil say, for example, that they are aquatic animals, whereas the Bororos call themselves red parrots. For mythical thinking does not even know that relationship that we call a relationship of logical subsumption, the relationship of exemplars to its species or genus, but always configures an objective effective relationship in thus, since in mythical thinking only like, glike, can act on like, glike, dash an objective relationship of a likeness, Soklitsch's glaciates for haltness. The same tendency becomes still more evident if we consider it from the standpoint of quality rather than quantity, i.e., when, if instead of the relation between the whole and its parts, we consider the relation between the thing and its properties. Once again, we observe here the same distinctive coincidence of the members of the relation for mythical thinking, the property expresses and contains a determination not so much in the thing but as the totality, gesamtheit, of the thing itself seen only from a certain angle. For scientific cognition, the reciprocal determination that is created in it also rests on an opposition that in this determination is reconciled but not effaced. For the subject, the substance in which properties inhere is not itself immediately comparable with any property. It cannot be apprehended and demonstrated as something concrete but rather opposes each particular property as well as the totality, gesamtheit, of properties as something other, something independent. Here accidents are not tangibly real pieces of substance, rather, the substance forms the ideal center and mediation through which they are related to one another and through which they are united with one another. For myth, however, the unity it creates is here again immediately absorbed into sheer one the sameness, einer Leihheit. For myth, which moves all actuality together within the same plane, one and the same substance does not have different properties rather, each particularization as such is already substance i.e., it can be apprehended in no other way than in an immediate concretion, in a direct reification. We have already seen how all mere states and properties, all activities and all relations, undergo this reification. The distinctive principle of thinking on which it is based, however, emerges far more sharply than at the primitive stages of the mythical worldview, where, in the concept, it is already in an alliance with the basic principle of scientific thinking and penetrates it, where in communion with this principle, it creates a kind of hybrid being, Vazen, a semi-mythical science of nature. Just as the particular nature of the mythical concept of causality can perhaps be most clearly illustrated by the construction of astrology, so too is the particular tendency of the mythical concept of property most evident in the structure of alchemy. The kinship between alchemy and astrology, which can be traced through their whole history, finds here its systematic explanation This explanation is based on both being merely different manifestations, oiserungen, of the same thought form, of mythical substantial identity thinking. For here, all the common features of properties, all the similarities in the sensible appearance of different things or in their mode of effect, are ultimately explained by the supposition that one and the same tangible cause is in some way contained in them. In this sense, for example, alchemy looks on particular bodies as complexes of simple basic qualities from which they emerge through mere aggregation. Each property constitutes for it a determinate elementary thing, and from the sum of these elementary things, the world of composites, the empirical world of bodies, is constructed. Anyone familiar with the mixture of these elementary things consequently knows the secret of their transformations and is therefore lord over them, because they not only understand these transformations but also understand that their own self-activity is able to produce them. Thus, the alchemist can obtain the philosopher's stone from common quicksilver by first extracting the water, i.e. that element of mobility and fluidity that detracts from the true perfection of the quicksilver. The next task consists of fixing the body thus obtained i.e. to free it from its volatility by removing an airy element that it still contains. In the course of its history, alchemy developed this addition and subtraction of properties into a highly ingenious and intricate system. Even in these extreme refinements and sublime ations, however, we can still clearly discern the mythical root of the whole process. Every operation of alchemy, 
regardless of its individual type, is grounded in the originary thought, urge dank, of the transferability and tangible detachability of properties and states. The same thought is also manifested in a more naive and primitive stage, for example, in the view of the scapegoat and the like. Every particular state, Beschaffenheit, that possesses matter, every form that it can assume, and every effectiveness that it can exert is hypostatized into a particular substance, an independent being, Wesen vor sich. Modern science, and in particular modern chemistry in the form given it by Lavoisier, has succeeded in overcoming this semi-mythical concept of the property of alchemy only through a fundamental transformation and reversal of the whole framing of the question. For modern science, the property is not something simple but very much a compound not something original and elementary but rather something derived not an absolute but something thoroughly relative. What the sensationalist view calls a property of the thing and what it believes to immediately grasp and understand as such is dissolved by critical analysis into a determinate mode of effect, a specific reaction that occurs, however, only under specific conditions. Thus, the inflammability of a body no longer implies the presence, on Wesenheit, of a specific substance, of the phlogiston, in it but rather signifies its reaction to oxygen just as the solubility of a body signifies its reaction to water or an acid, etc. The individual quality no longer appears as something thing-like but as something thoroughly conditioned, as something that, under causal analysis, dissolves into a framework, gafuga, of relations. From this, however, there arises at the same time the reverse position as long as the thought form of this analysis has not been developed thing and attribute cannot be sharply separated instead, the categorical spheres of the two concepts must move against each other and ultimately merge into one another. The typical opposition between myth and cognition can be shown in the category of similarity no less than in the categories of the whole and the part and the category of the property. The organizing of the chaos of sensible impressions, in which certain groups of similarities are emphasized and certain series of similarities are formed, is, again, common to both logical and mythical thinking without it myth would not be able to arrive at fixed shapes, gestalten, any more than logical thought would be able to arrive at fixed concepts. Once again, however, the grasping of the similarities of things moves here along different paths. For mythical thinking, any similarity in the sensible appearance suffices to group the formations, gebilda, in which it appears together into a single mythical genus. Every distinguishing mark, however external, is nonetheless as good as another. There can be no sharp separation between inward and outward, essential and non-essential, precisely because for myth every perceptible equality, gleichheit, or similarity is an immediate expression of an identity of being, Wesen. Equality, gleichheit, or similarity is never a mere concept of relation, relation, and reflection rather, it is a real force, absolutely actual because it is absolutely effective. All so-called analogy magic manifests this basic mythical intuition, which, indeed, is more obscured than clarified by the false name of analogy magic. For precisely where we see a mere analogy, i.e. a mere relationship, for myth, it is a question of immediate existence and immediate presence, Gegenwart. There is no mere sign that points to something distant and absent in myth, but rather, the thing is present with a part of itself, i.e. in the mythical view, the thing is there as a whole as soon as anything similar to it is given. In the smoke rising from the pipe, mythical consciousness sees neither a mere symbol, zinbilt, nor a mere means for making rain, rather, in it, mythical consciousness has the tangible image of a cloud and in this image the thing, Zaka, itself, the longed for rain. It is even a general principle of magic that one can gain possession of things by a mere mimetic presentation of them, even without undertaking any purposeful action in our sense of the term, because, from the standpoint of mythical consciousness, nothing is merely mimesis, merely significative. Cognitive consciousness again demonstrates its distinctive twofold logical character in the positing of similarities and in the production of a series of similarities, on which Keats Rayan, here too, it proceeds at once. Synthetically and analytically, at once connecting and separating. In similar contents it therefore emphasizes the element of inequality as well as the element of equality indeed, it gives special emphasis to the element of inequality, since in setting up its genera and species, it is concerned less with bringing out the common element in them than with the principle on which differentiation and gradation within one and the same genus are based. Thus, the interpenetration, in Ian Ander, of these two tendencies is demonstrable, for example, in the structure of every mathematical concept of class and genus. When mathematical thinking subsumes the circle and the ellipse, the hyperbola and parabola under one concept, this combination, Tsizamenfassung, is not grounded in any immediate similarity of the figures, which from the standpoint of the senses are as dissimilar as possible. 
In the midst of this heterogeneity, however, thinking now detects a unity of law, a unity of the principle of construction, in which it determines all the formations, gebilde, as conic sections. The expression of this law, the general formula for curves of the second order, fully describes their interconnection as well as their inner differences it shows how through the simple variation of certain magnitudes, one geometrical form transitions into another. This principle, which determines and regulates the transition, is here no less necessary and, in the strict sense, constitutive of the content of the concept than the positing of the common factor. Thus, the view of the traditional theory of concepts, which ordinarily attributes the formation of log i cal classes and genera to abstraction and by abstraction understands nothing other than the selection of those features in which a plurality of contents agrees, is just as one side as the view that sees the function of causal thinking solely in terms of the connection, or association, of representations. Rather, in both cases, the point is not to combine after the fact merely given and fixed, opposing and delimited contents but rather to perform this logical act of delimitation only in thinking. And, here again, myth shows that this delimitation, this separating of the individual, the species, and the genus in the sense of a logical superordination and subordination, of abstraction and determination is alien to it. Just as it sees in every part the whole, so too in every exemplar of a genus does it immediately see the genus with the totality, gesamtheit, of its mythical characteristic traits i.e. their mythical forces. Thus, whereas the logical genus separates and unites at the same time, as it seeks to let the particular emerge from the unity of an overarching principle, myth rolls up the individuals together into the unity of an image, of a mythical figure, gestalt. As soon as the parts, the exemplar, the species, have in this way grown into one another, there is for them no more separation there is, rather, only a total indifference by virtue of which they continuously transition into one another. Admittedly, However, it might seem as if with this delimitation of the mythical thought form and the logical thought form, as it has so far been attempted, virtually nothing is gained for an understanding of myth as a whole, for the insight into the originary spiritual stratum from which it arose. For does it not signify petitio principii? Does it not essentially undertake a false rationalization of myth if we attempt to understand it through its thought form? Granted, such a form exists. But does it signify more than an outward shell that surrounds the core of the mythical and conceals it in this enclosure? Does myth not imply a unity of intuition, antroung, an intuitive, intuitive, unity that precedes and underlies all the interpretative unfolding that it undergoes in discursive thinking? And even this form of intuition, antroung, does not yet designate the ultimate stratum from which it rises and from which new life continuously pours into it. For nowhere in myth is it a question of a passive vision, a quiet consideration of things rather, here, all consideration begins from an act of taking a position, an act of the emotion and will. Insofar as myth thickens into lasting formations, gebilde, insofar as it sets before us the fixed outlines of an objective world of figures, gestalten, the significance of this world is comprehensible for us only if behind it we feel the dynamic of life feeling from which it originally grew. Only where this life feeling is aroused from within, only where it is manifested itself in love and hate, in fear and hope, in joy and grief is there that excitement of the mythical fantasy out of which a determined world of representations grows. From this, however, it seems to follow that any characterization of the mythical thought form applies only to something mediated and derived, that it must remain inadequate as long as it does not succeed in going back from the mere thought form of myth to its form of intuition and to its distinctive life form. That these forms are nowhere separated from one another, that from the most primitive formations, gebilde, to the highest and purest figures, gestalten, of the mythical they remain interwoven in. One another, gives the mythical world its distinctive coherence and its specific imprint. This world also configures and organizes itself according to the basic forms of pure intuition, it also unfolds, as in Anderlegen, itself into a unity and multiplicity, into a togetherness of objects and into a consequence of events, a Ragnason. However, the mythical intuition of space, time, and number that thus emerges here remains distinct from the highly characteristic boundaries that signify space, time, and number for theoretical thinking and the theoretical construction of the object world. These boundaries can become clear and visible only if we succeed in reducing the mediated divisions that we encounter in mythical thinking as in the thinking of pure cognition to a kind of originary division, your tiling, from which they emerge. For myth also presupposes a spiritual crisis of this sort. It also takes form only when a separation takes place in the whole of consciousness through which a certain separation penetrates the intuition of the world e-whole, Weltgans, by which a dissection of this whole into different strata of signification is effected. 
this first separation contains in germ all subsequent separations, and through it, they remain conditioned and dominated. In this separation, if anywhere, we shall find not so much the particular nature of mythical thinking as that of mythical intuiting and the mythical life feeling. Part 2. Myth as Form of Intuition The Construction and Organization of the Spatio-Temporal World in Mythical, Consciousness I. The Basic Opposition the theoretical construction of the worldview arose at the point where consciousness first performed a clear separation between semblance and truth, between what is merely perceived or represented and true beings, seen in, between the subjective and the objective. The criterion for truth and objectivity employed here is the element of persistence, logical constancy, and logical lawfulness. All the individual contents of consciousness are oriented toward this demand for universal lawfulness and are measured by it. Thus, spheres of being unfold themselves the relatively transient is divorced from the relatively permanent and the accidental and unique from the universally valid. Certain elements, elemente, of experience prove necessary and fundamental as the framework that bears the structure of the whole. On the other hand, authors are assigned only a dependent and mediated being they are, only insofar as the particular conditions of their appearance is realized, and by virtue of these conditions, they are restricted to a certain ambit, to a certain sector of being. Thus, Theoretical thinking proceeds in that it continuously posits certain differences of logical dignity, one might say logical valency, in the immediately given. The general criterion that it draws on, however, is the principle of sufficient reason, grunt, which is held by it as its ultimate postulate, as its primary requirement of thinking. The original, essential tendency, the characteristic modality of cognition, is expressed in it. To cognize means to advance from the immediacy of sensation and perception to the immediacy of a merely thought ground, grunt, dash it means to unfold the simple existence of sensible impressions into strata of grounds and consequences. As we have seen, such a separation and stratification is totally alien to mythical consciousness. This consciousness is and lives in the immediate impression, which it accepts without measuring it by something else. The impression is not merely relative but absolute the impression is not through something other and does not depend on another as its condition rather, it manifests and confirms itself by the simple intensity of its existence through the irresistible compulsion with which it imposes itself upon consciousness. If thinking opposes, inquires, and questions its object with the claims of objectivity and necessity, it contains doubt and requires checks if it turns to itself with its own norms mythical consciousness knows of no such contrast. It has the object only insofar as it is overpowered by it it does not possess the object by progressively constructing it for itself but is simply possessed by it. The will is not able to comprehend the object in the sense that it encompasses it in thought and arranges it in a complex of grounds and consequences. Rather, here there is only the simple emotion, or griffin hide, owing to it. However, this very intensity, this immediate forceful power with which the mythical object, object, is there for consciousness, now raises forth from the mere series, which is always uniform and recurs identically. Instead, every object, object, appears spellbound in the schema of a rule, a necessary law, insofar as it seizes and fulfills mythical consciousness as something only akin to itself, as something incomparable and unique. It lives, as it were, in an individual atmosphere it is something unique that can be comprehended only in its uniqueness, in its immediate here and now. And yet, on the other hand, the contents of mythical consciousness are not simply abandoned to unconnected singularities rather, there prevails in them also a universal, which, however, is of an entirely different kind and source from the universal of the logical concept. For precisely through their special character, all the contents that belong to mythical consciousness are rejoined into a whole. They form a self-enclosed realm, they possess a common tonality, by virtue of which they are singled out from the series of the everyday and ordinary, from common empirical existence. This feature of isolation, absondung, this character of the uncommon, is essential to the content of mythical consciousness as such it can be traced from the lowest to the highest stages, from the magical view of the world, which still understands, for Stein, magic in a purely practical and thus semi-technical sense, up to the purest expression, Ausprägung, of religion, in which all miracles are ultimately dissolved in the one miracle of religious spirit itself. This distinctive feature of transcendence always connects all the contents of mythical and religious consciousness with one another. In their mere existence, and in their immediate constitution, they all contain a revelatai in which, nevertheless, also retains as such a kind of mystery, and this inner penetration, this revelation, is at once an unveiling and availing and imprints the mythical religious content with its basic feature, its character of the sacred. 
What this basic character implies and signifies for the construction of the mythical world emerges perhaps most clearly if we seek it where it is still encountered in a completely pure, unmixed state, where it has not yet been imbued with other spiritual shadings of signification and value, in particular, with ethical determinations. For the original myth I cal feeling, the sense and the power of the sacred are limited to no special region, to no individual sphere of being, and to no individual sphere of value. Rather, this sense is imprinted on the whole fullness, the immediate concretion and immediate totality of existence and events. There is no sharp boundary spatially dividing the world, as it were, into a this world, diacets, and a beyond, yenzites, into a merely empirical sphere and a transcendent one. The isolation, absondaung, that is performed in consciousness of the sacred is rather purely qualitative. Thus, even the most everyday content of existence can acquire the distinguishing character of the sacred, provided only that it fall under the specific mythical religious perspective, blikritung, dash provided that, instead of remaining restrained within the habitual ambit of events and effective action, it seizes mythical interest from one angle or another and arouses strength in particular. The characteristic trait of the sacred is therefore by no means limited from the beginning to certain objects, objecte, or groups of objects, objecte, dash rather, even the most indifferent content can suddenly acquire this distinctive trait. It designates a certain ideal relatedness rather than a certain objective constitution. Myth also begins by introducing certain differences, differenzen, into undistinguished and different being, by laying it out into diverse circles of significance. It also proves to be form bestowing and sense bestowing, by interrupting the dreary monotony, einerlei, and homogeneity of the contents of consciousness, by introducing certain differences of the valence of value, wordig geat, into this dreary monotony. All being and all events are projected into the basic opposition of the sacred and the profane, and in this very projection, they acquire a new content, gehalt, dash one that they do not simply have from the beginning but that they acquire in this form of contemplation, in this, as it were, mythical illumination. These general considerations throw considerable light on certain basic phenomena of mythical thinking, on certain differences and stratifications that have been disclosed in the last decades in particular by the purely empirical research into myth and by comparative mythology. Ever since Codrington, in his well-known work on the Melanesians, pointed to the mana as a core concept of primitive mythical thinking, the problems grouped around this concept have attracted increasing interest among ethnologists, ethnopsychologists, and sociologists. First, it became evident that from the standpoint of the pure content, the representation expressed in the mana of the Melanesians and Polynesians has its exact correlate in other mythical concepts distributed over the whole earth and diverse variants. The Manitou of the Algonquin tribes of North America, the Orenda of the Iroquois, and the Wafinda of the Sioux all disclose such consistent and striking parallels with the mana representation that, indeed, a genuine elementary thought of myth seemed to have been seized here. The phenomenology of mythical thinking alone would seem to indicate that in this representation, it is not so much the mere content of mythical consciousness but rather its typical form, perhaps, indeed its most original form, that exhibits itself. Thus, various researchers have gone so far as to treat the mana representation almost as a category of mythical religious thinking, even as the originary category of religion. This representation has been associated with the closely related, negative tendency of the corresponding representation of taboo, and with these two polar concepts, so to speak, an originary stratum of mythical religious consciousness would seem to have been laid bare. The mana taboo formula was looked on as a minimum definition of religion, as one of its primary constitutive conditions. However, the more the framework, Raman, of the mana representati spanned, the more difficult it was at the same time to establish its sharp and clear determination. The attempts to grasp its sense by situating it among the various hypotheses concerning the origin of mythical thinking proved more and more inadequate. Codrington took the mana essentially as a spiritual power, which he further qualified as a magical supernatural power. This attempt to reduce the mana concept ultimately to the soul concept and thus to interpret and illuminate it through the presuppositions of animism did not, however, stand up under criticism. The more closely scholars define the signification of the word mana and the content of its representation, the more evident it became that both belonged to another stratum, to a pre-animistic tendency of mythical thinking. The use of the word mana seemed to have its proper place in a sphere precisely where there can be no discussion of a highly developed concept of the soul or personality, or at least where there is no clear dividing line between physical and psychic, between spiritual personal being and impersonal being. And this usage is preserved in a distinctive indifference as compared with other oppositions of either developed logical or mythical thinking. Thus, in particular, 
nowhere in it is there a sharp difference between the representation of stuff and that of force drawn. Neither the substantial theory that takes the manas imply as a magical substance nor the dynamistic theory that places the emphasis on the concept of power, on ability and effectuating, seems to arrive at the proper significance of the concept of mana. This significance lies, rather, in its distinctive fluidity, in its flowing and transitioning into one another of determinations that seem from our view to be clearly separated. Even here, where what is discussed is the semblance of spiritual being and spiritual forces, both are still permeated with substantial representations. At this stage, the spirits are of a certain indeterminate type, possessing no difference between natural and supernatural, real and ideal, between persons and other existences and essential beings. Thus, what seems to remain is the only relatively solid core of the mana. Representation is in general simply the impression of the extraordinary, the inhabitual, the uncommon. The essential is not what bears this determination but precisely this determination, this character of the uncommon. The mana representation, like its negatively corresponding taboo representation, opposes the layer of everyday existence, Alteklish and Daseins, and the event of running, in the customary beaten path, along another layer that clearly stands out from it. Here, other measures are valid here, other possibilities, other forces and modes of efficacy than those manifested in the everyday common course of things. At the same time, however, this realm is filled with constant threats, with unknown dangers that surround humans on all sides. Thus, it is clear that the contents of the mana representation as well as the taboo representation can never be fully apprehended through a pure examination of their objects. The mana and taboo representations do not serve the designation of certain classes of objects, but to a certain degree, they constitute in them the distinctive accent that magical mythical consciousness places on objects. This accent divides the whole of being and events into a mythically significant and mythically irrelevant sphere, into what arouses mythical interest and what leaves it relatively indifferent. Thus, there is neither more nor less justification for regarding the taboo mana formula as the ground of myth and religion than for regarding interjections as the ground of language. Indeed, in both concepts, it is a question of the primary interjections, as it were, of mythical consciousness. They still have no independent function of signification and presentation they are rather like simple sounds of the arousal of mythical emotion, effect. They designate that amazement, that, one daring, with which myth as well as scientific cognition and philosophy begin. When sheer animal terror becomes wonder moving in a twofold direction, composed of opposite tendencies, tsuga, dash fear and hope, awe and admiration, when sensible agitation thus seeks for the first time an outlet and an expression. The human stands on the threshold of a new spirituality. This properly human spirituality shows itself, as it were, reflected in the thought of the sacred. For the sacred always appears at once as the distant and the near, as the familiar and the protective as well as absolutely inaccessible, as the mysterium tremendum, fearful mystery, and the mysterium fascinosum, fascinating mystery. The consequence of this twofold character is that while certainly isolating itself from the empirical profane existence, the sacred does not expel it per se but progressively permeates it even in its opposition, it still retains the ability for the configuration of the oppositions itself. The general concept of taboo and the concrete abundance of taboo regulations mark the first steps on the way to this configuration. In a purely negative sense, they constitute the first limitation that the will and the immediate sensible impulse impose on themselves this negative limit, however, already contains the germs and the first precondition for a positive positing of boundaries, a positive bestowing of form. The direction in which this primary mythical bestowing of form moves, however, remains sharply separated from other basic directions of spiritual consciousness. There are differences proper to mythical valence, just as there are similar original differences, differentsin, of logical or ethical valence of value, worded kiat. The original mythical concept of holiness coincides so little with that of ethical purity that both can find themselves opposed to each other in a remarkable opposition, in a distinctive tension. That which is hallowed in a mythical and religious sense has thereby become forbidden, an object of awe, hence unclean. This ambiguity, da pelsin, this distinctive ambivalence of significations, is still expressed in the Latin sacer and the Greek? Devoted to the gods, and cursed. Dash for these terms designate both the holy and the accursed, the forbidden, but, in both cases, something consecrated and set apart. It is now important, however, to track how this basic tendency of mythical consciousness, how, as it were, this originary division, your tilung, between the sacred and profane, the consecrated and the unconsecrated, 
does not simply remain limited to particular, eminently primitive formations but asserts itself and establishes itself in even its highest shapes, gestalt and it is as though everything that myth seizes were drawn into this separation, as if, so to speak, it pervaded and impregnated the whole of the world, das ganze der Welt, insofar as it constituted itself as a mythically formed whole. All the derived and mediated forms of the mythical worldview, regardless of their complexity and spiritual elevation, remain in some part conditioned by this primary division. The entire wealth and dynamism of the mythical life forms are based on the full affect of the accentuation of existence, which is expressed in the concept of the sacred, and on its progressively seizing new domains and contents of consciousness. When we study this progression, an unmistakable analogy between the construction of the mythical object, object, world and the construction of the empirical object, object, world becomes clear. In both, it is a question of overcoming the isolation of the immediately given, to comprehend how all individuals and particulars are woven into a whole. The basic forms of space and time, to which number is added as a third form in both cases the concrete expressions of this wholeness, its intuitive schemata, in which the elements that appear separate in space and time, the element of togetherness and that of succession, permeate each other. Every interconnection, which is gradually acquired by the contents of mythical consciousness as well as those of empirical consciousness, is accessible only in and through these forms of space, time, and number. However, the basic separation between logical and mythical synthesis manifests itself once again in the mode of this combination. In empirical cognition, the intuitive construction of experienced reality is immediately determined and guided by the general goal that it sets itself, by its theoretical concept of truth and reality. The configuration of the concepts of space, time, and number takes place here according to the general logical ideal toward which pure cognition aims more and more determinately and consciously. Space, time, and number stand out as the intellectual media by virtue of which a mere aggregate of perceptions is gradually formed into a system of experience. The representations of order and togetherness, of order in succession, and of a stable numerical, quantitative order of all empirical contents form the presupposition required for all these contents to be combined, Susamen Fossen, into a lawfulness, into a causal order of the world. In this respect, space, time, and number are, for theoretical cognition, nothing other than the vehicles of the principle of sufficient reason, Grund. They form the basic constants, Grund Constantin, to which all variables are referred they are the universal systems of positions in which every individual must in some way be fitted in and assigned its fixed place, plots, and thus its unambiguous determinacy guaranteed. Thus, in the progress of Teoraei Calcognition, the purely intuitive features of space, time, and number recede more and more into the background. They appear less as the concrete contents of consciousness than as its universal forms of ordering. Leibniz, the logician and philosopher of the principle of sufficient reason, Grund, first expressed this relationship in full clarity in that he determined space as the ideal condition of order and togetherness and time as the ideal condition of order and succession, and apprehended them, on the basis of this purely ideal character, not as contents of being but as eternal truths. And for Kant, too, the true grounding, the transcendental deduction of space, time, and number consists in showing them to be pure principles of mathematical cognition, hence immediately of all empirical cognition. As the conditions of possibility of experience, they are at the same time the conditions of possibility of the objects of experience. The space of pure geometry, the number of pure arithmetic, and the time of pure mechanics are, in a sense, the originary gestalts of theoretical consciousness they form the intellectual scheme at a by virtue of which the mediation between the sensible individual and the general lawfulness of thinking, of the pure understanding is established. Mythical thinking also reveals the same process of schematization, here too, the more it progresses, the more it endeavors to integrate, einfugen, all existence into a common spatial order, all events into a common order of time and fate. This striving finds its completion, its highest fulfillment which is possible at all within the ambit of myth, in the construction of the worldview of astrology its true root, however, goes deeper, extending down into the ultimate basic and originary stratum of mythical consciousness. Even in the progress of linguistic concept formation, it clearly emerges how the sharp and clear elaboration of spatial determinations in general form here the precondition for the designation of general intellectual determinations. We have seen how the simplest spatial terms of language, the designations for here and there, for near and distant, contain a fruitful germ, which with the progress of language unfolds into a surprising wealth of linguistic intellectual formations. Through the mediation of spatial terms, the two ends of all language formation seem, 
in a sense, to be truly connected to one another for the first time, a purely spiritual element seems to be disclosed in a sensible expression of language just as a sensible element seems to be disclosed in a spiritual expression of language. Space, and moreover time, proves to be such a medium of spiritualization in the mythical representation sphere. The first obvious and clear organizations that this representation sphere undergoes are linked to spatio-temporal differences. Here, however, it is not, as in theoretical consciousness, a question of obtaining certain constant originary measures by virtue of which variable events can be explained and grounded. This difference is replaced by another, which is conditioned and postulated by the distinctive perspective of the mythical. Mythical consciousness arrives at an organizing of space and time not by fixing the fluctuating and hovering of sensible appearances into durable thoughts but rather by introducing its specific opposition, the opposition of the sacred and profane, into spatial and temporal being. This basic and originary accent of mythical consciousness also dominates every party to our division and connection within the whole of space and time. At the most primitive level of mythical consciousness, power and holiness still appear as a sort of a thing, ding, a sensibly physical something that adheres to a certain person or thing, zaka, as their bearer. In a further progress, however, this character of holiness gradually transitions from individual persons or things, sachin, to other, in our sense, purely ideal determinations. Now, there are holy places and sites, holy landmarks and periods, termini und Sidon, and eventually sacred numbers in which this character especially appears. And thus, the opposition between the sacred and profane is no longer viewed as a particular but as a truly universal opposition. Because all existence is rigidly secured in the form of space and all events in the rhythm and periodicity of time. Every determination that adheres to a certain spatio-temporal position is immediately transferred to the content that is given in it, whereas the particular character of the content gives a distinguishing character to the position in which it is situated. By virtue of this reciprocal determination, all being and all events are gradually spun into a network of the subtlest mythical relations. Just as space, time, and number can be shown from the standpoint of theoretical cognition to be the basic means and stages, stuff and, in the process of objectivization, so to do they constitute the three essential phases in the process of mythical apperception. Here, a perspective is opened on a specific morphology, form and her, of myth that complements our considerations into the general thought form on which it is based and fills it with concrete content, Gehalt. 2. The basic features of a morphology of myth space, time, and number the organization of space in mythical consciousness. To provisionally describe the particular nature of the mythical intuition of space and provide a general outline, we can begin from the observation that mythical space occupies a distinctive middle position between the space of sense perception and the space of pure cognition, that is, the space of geometrical intuition. The space of perception, the space of vision and touch, does not coincide with the space of pure mathematics, but rather there consists a thoroughgoing divergence between the two. The determinations of mathematical space do not follow simply from those of sensible space that are not easily read or even derived in an unbroken sequence of thinking rather, they require a distinctive reversal of perspective, a sublation of what seems immediately given in sensible intuition, in order to advance to the thought space of pure mathematics. In particular, a comparison between physiological space and the metric space on which Euclidean geometry bases its constructions shows this antithetical relationship in every detail. What is posited in the one seems negated and reversed in the other. Euclidean space is indicated by the three basic attributes of continuity, infinity, and thoroughgoing uniformity. All these elements, however, contradict the character of sensible perception. Perception does not know the concept of infinity rather, it is bound from the outset to certain boundaries of the faculty of perception and thus to a certain delimited domain of the spatial. And the homogeneity of percept to all space can no more be spoken of than can its infinity. Ultimately, the homogeneity of geometric space is based on the fact that all its elements, elementae, the points, which are affiliated in it, are nothing more than the simple determinations of location, log A, which possess, however, no independent content of their own beyond this relation, relation, this locatian, log A, in which they find themselves in relation to each other. Their being merges in their reciprocal relationship it is a purely functional and not a substantial being. Because, in general, these points are basically devoid of all content, because they have become mere expressions of ideal relations, there can be no question of a diversity in content. Their homogeneity implies nothing other than the similarity of their structure, which is grounded in their common logical task, their ideal determinatian and signification. Homogeneous space is therefore never a given but a constructed and produced space, and indeed, 
The geometrical concept of homogeneity can be expressed by the postulate that the same constructions can be carried out from every point in space to every place and in all directions. Nowhere in the space of immediate perception can this postulate be fulfilled. There is here no strict homogeneity of place and direction rather, each place has its own mode and its own value. Visual space and tactile space are both anisotropic and unhomogeneous in contrast to the metric space of Euclidean geometry the main directions of organization, before behind, above below, right left, are dissimilar in both physiological spaces. If we begin from this standard of comparison, there would seem to be little doubt that mythical space is closely related to the space of perception and strictly opposed, on the other hand, to the thought space of geometry. Both mythical space as well as perceptive space are thoroughly concrete formations, gabota, of consciousness. The separation here between position and content that underlies the construction of the pure space of geometry is neither complete nor applicable. Position is nothing. That can be detached from the content, that can be contrasted as an element, element, with its own signification rather, it is only as long as it is filled with a certain individual sensible or intuitive content. Thus, in sensible space as in mythical space, no here and there is a mere here and there, a mere term for a general relation that can recur identically in the most diverse contents rather, every point, every element, element, possesses here, as it were, a tonality of its own. A particular distinguishing character adheres to it that cannot be described in more general concepts, which, however, is immediately lived as such. This characteristic difference also adheres to the individual directions in space as it does to individual places in space. We have seen that physiological space differs from metric space and that here right and left, before and behind, above and below are not interchangeable, since movement in any of these directions involves specific organic sensations, thus, mythical feeling values are, as it were, connected with each of these direct yones. In contrast to the homogeneity that prevails in the conceptual space of geometry, Every place and direction in the mythical intuition of space is endowed, as it were, with a particular accent, and this accent always goes back to the actual basic mythical accent, to the separation of the profane and the sacred. The boundaries that mythical consciousness posits and through which it spatially and intellectually organizes the world are not, as in geometry, based on the discovery of a realm of fixed gestalts amid the flux of sensible impressions but instead are delimited based on the human's immediate position, stellung, visivis reality as a will or an actor, on the fact that in confronting this reality, the human sets up certain barriers to which its feeling and its will attach themselves. The primary spatial difference, which in the more complex mythical formations is only ever repeated anew and increasingly sublimated, is this difference between two precincts of being an everyday, generally accessible precinct and another that, as the sacred precinct, appears to be raised out of its surroundings, separated off, enclosed, and guarded against them. Although the mythical intuition of space distinguishes itself from the abstract space of pure cognition through this foundation of individual feeling on which it rests and from which it seems inseparable, even here, however, a general tendency and a general function are manifested. In the whole of the mythical view of the world, space carries out an analogous performance, Leistung, not in terms of identical content but in terms of form, to the one undertaken in geometrical space in the construction of the empirical, objective nature. It also operates, Verkan, as a schema through whose application and mediation the most diverse elements, elementae, which at first sight seem utterly incommensurate, can be brought into a relation with one another. The progress of objective cognition is essentially based on the fact that all the merely sensible differences, unishita, that are provided by immediate sensation are ultimately reduced to pure differences, unishita, of space and magnitude and representatively depicted in them. Thus, the mythical view of the world also knows of a similar presentation, a picturing, opbuilding, of the in itself non-spatial in space. To a certain extent, every qualitative difference, difference, here possesses an aspect according to which it likewise appears as spatial, while every spatial difference, difference, always is and remains a qualitative difference, difference. Between the two domains, there is a kind of exchange, a perpetual transition from one to the other. The consideration of language has already demonstrated the form of this transition it has shown us that a wealth of relations of the most diverse kind, particularly qualitative and modal relations, serve language only indirectly, by way of spatial determinations. The simple spatial terms are thus a kind of spiritual originary terms, your word and the objective world became intelligible and transparent for language only to the degree to which language was able to return it to space, to translate, as it were, back into space. And a similar translation, 
a similar transference of perceived and felt qualities into spatial images and intuitions, also constantly occurs in mythical thinking. Here too, the distinctive schematism of space operates by virtue of which space is able to adapt the most dissimilar elements and so able to render them mutually comparable and, in some way, similar. The further back we go in the series of specifically mythical configurations and the closer we come to the truly authentic mythical originary configurations and originary organizations, the more distinct this relationship seems to become. In the totemism sphere of intuition, we see an originary organization of this sort, a first primitive separatian and division of all existence into rigidly determined classes and groups. Not only do human beings, individuals, and groups appear here sharply delimited from one another by their membership in a specific totem but the whole world is grasped and permeated by this form of classification, Ein Tilong. Each thing, each occurrence is understood in that it joined, Eingerite, to the system of totemic classes, in that it is endowed with some characteristic totemic emblem, Optsition. And, as everywhere in all mythical thinking, this emblem is no mere sign, Psyshin, but rather the expression of the interconnections that are intended and felt is thoroughly real. However, the entire vast complex that results from this, the integration of all that is individual and social, of all spiritual and physical cosmic being, into the most multifarious relations of totemic kinship, becomes relatively transparent as soon as mythical thinking begins to give it a spatial expression. This very elaborate division of classes now seems to break down according to the main directions and dividing lines of space and thus acquires intuitive clarity. In, for example, the mythical sociological worldview of the Zunis, which Cushing has described in detail. The sevenfold form of the totemic organization, which runs through the whole world, is above all reflected in the apprehension of space. The whole of space is divided into seven regions north and south, east and west, the upper and the lower world, and finally the middle or center of the world, and every being occupies its unequivocal position within this general classification, taking up a fixed prescribed place, plots, within it. The elements, elementae, of nature, the corporal stuff, as well as the individual phases of events, are separated according to the point of view of this division. To the north belongs air, to the south fire, to the east earth, to the west water the north is the home of winter, the south of some air, the east of autumn, the west of spring, etc. and the various human status groups, occupations, and performances enter into the same basic scheme at war and warriors belong to the north, the hunt and the hunter to the west, medicine and agriculture to the south, magic and religion to the east. Strange and peculiar as these organizations may appear at first glance, it is nevertheless obvious that they did not arise by chance but are the expression of a specific, typical fundamental intuition. For the Jorobas, who like the Zunis are totemistically organized, this organization is likewise characteristically expressed in the apprehension of space. Here too, a specific color, a specific day of the five-day week, and a specific element, element, is assigned to each region in space here too, the sequence of prayers the order in which the cult implements are employed, and the seasonal sacrifices performed, in short, the whole sacral system, goes back to certain basic spatial differences, particularly the basic difference between right and left. Similarly, the construction of their city and its demarcation into precincts is, one might say, nothing more than a spatial projection of their general totemic view. In Chinese thought, we again encounter in another form, but developed with the greatest subtlety and precision. The view that all qualitative differences, differences, and, and oppositions possess some sort of spatial correspondence. All being and all events are in some way also distributed here among the diverse cardinal points. Each of them possesses a certain color, a certain element, element, a certain season, and a certain sign of the zodiac, a certain organ of the human lived body, a certain basic soulish, sealish, affection, etc., which belong in and to it, an unzuzhorin, specifically and through this common relation to a certain position in space, the most heterogeneous elements center, as it were, into contact with one another. All species and genera of being have their home somewhere in space, and their absolute mutual strangeness is thereby sublated local, or tlitch, mediation leads to spiritual mediation between them, to emerging of all differences, differenzen, in a great whole, into a mythical ground plan of the world. Thus, the universality of spatial intuition becomes once again a vehicle for the universalism of the view of the world. Here too, however, myth distinguishes itself from cognition by the form of the whole toward which it strives. The whole of the scientific cosmos is a whole of laws, i.e. of relations and functions. Even the space and the time, though at first taken as substances, as things existing in themselves, are, as scientific thinking develops, 
more and more recognized as an ideal ensemble, as a system of relations. Their objective being signifies nothing other than that they first render empirical intuition possible, that is their principles they underlie empirical intuition. And all being, every spatial and temporal mode of appearance, is ultimately based on this function of the foundation, Grundlgung. The intuition of pure geometric space is also governed by the law formulated in the principle of sufficient Riasan, Grund. It serves as an instrument and organ for an explanation of the world that consists in nothing other than the fact that a merely sensible content is poured into a spatial form in which it is, as it were, reshaped, upragan, and through which it is comprehended in accordance with the generally valid laws of geometry. Thus, space has a single ideal factor. Integrates, Fugen, into the general task of cognition, and this systematic position also determines its own character. In the space of pure cognition, the relation of the spatial whole to the spatial part is comprehended not tangibly but basically in purely functional terms the whole of space is not assembled together out of elements, elementae, but is constructed from them as constitutive conditions. The line is generated from the point, the surface from the line, the body from the surface, in that thought lets one formation, gadota, emerge from another in accordance with a determinate law. The complex spatial shapes, gestalten, are comprehended in their genetic definition which expresses the man there and the rule of their production. Accordingly, here an understanding of the spatial whole requires a return to the producing elements, elementae, to points and to the motions of points. In contrast to this functional space of pure mathematics, the space of myth proves to be a thoroughly structural space. Here the whole does not become by growing genetically from its elements, elementae, according to a determinate rule rather, there exists a purely static relationship of inward being, in a scene, and in dwelling. Regardless of how far we divide, we find in each part the form and structure of the whole. This form is thus not, as in the mathematical analysis of space, broken down into homogeneous and therefore formless, gestaltlos, elements, elementae, rather, it endures in itself, irrespective of any division and unaffected by them. The whole spatial world, and with it the cosmos in general, appears to be built according to a certain model, which may manifest itself to us on an enlarged or a reduced scale but which, large or small, remains the same. All interconnection in mythical space is ultimately based on this original identity, identitate, it goes back not to a similarity, glaciartige key and homogeneity, of effective action, not to a dynamic law, but to an original equality, gleichheit, of essence. This basic view has found its classical expression in the worldview of astrology. For astrology, every event in the world, every new form of time and new emergence is fundamentally a semblance, shine, dash what is, expressed in this event, what lies behind it, is a predetermined fate, a uniform determinacy of being that asserts itself as identical with itself through the individual temporal moment. Thus, the whole of a person's life is contained and decided in its beginning, in the constellation of the hour of their birth in general, all becoming constitutes not so much an emergence as a simple, consistent existence and an explanation of this consistent existence. The form of existence and life is not created from the most diverse elements, elementae, from an interweaving of the most multifarious causal conditions rather, it is from the outset given as a stamped, gepraked, form that need only be explained, which, for us onlookers, seems to unfold in time. This law of the whole is repeated in each of its parts. The predetermination of being is as valid for the individual as it is for the universe. The formulas of astrology often speak of this relationship in an unambiguous way in that they express the effectiveness of the planet, which forms the basic principle of astrological contemplation, by transforming it into a kind of substantial indwelling, interwonens. In each of us, there is a certain planet. We can recognize here how the astrological intuition of effective action is ultimately grounded in that mythical view of space that astrology developed to its supreme, one might say, systematic consequence. In accordance with the basic principle that governs all mythical thinking, astrology can interpret this togetherness in space only as a thoroughly concrete togetherness, as a determinate position and situation of bodies in space. There is here no detached, no merely abstract, form of space, rather, all intuition of form is melted down into the intuition of content, into the aspects of the planetary world. These are, however, themselves not unique and singular they are not mere individuals rather, in them, the structural law of the whole the form of the universe, emerges in intuitive clarity and determinacy. Regardless of how far we advance toward the individual, regardless of how much we split this form, its proper being, Vazen, remains untouched it remains an indivisible unity. Because space possesses a certain structure in itself, which recurs in all its individual formations, 
Gabilda, no individual being or event can depart or, as it were, fall away from the determinacy, the fatality, of the whole. We may contemplate the order of the natural elements, elementae, or the order of the seasons, the mixtures in bodies or the typical temperaments of human beings, but we always find in them one and the same originary schema of organizing, one and the same articulation, by virtue of which the seal of the whole is imprinted on every particular. Of course, this intuition of the spatial physical cosmos, as astrology arranges it for us in the greatest perfection and cohesion, does not form the beginning of mythical thinking but rather is one of its late spiritual achievements. The mythical view of the world also begins from the most restricted ambit of sensible spatial existence, which is extended only bit by bit and only gradually. It was seen in the consideration of language that the expressions of spatial orientation, the words for before and behind and for above and below are usually taken from the intuition of one's own body the living body of the human being and its limbs are the system of reference to which all other spatial differentiations are indirectly transferred. Myth travels the same road wherever it grasps, or fasten, an organically organized whole and strives to comprehend, degree of and, with its means of thinking, it tends to see this whole in the image of the human body and its organization. The objective world becomes transparent for myth and divides into determinate precincts of existence only in that in this way myth analogically pictured, abilded, it, it in terms of the living body. It is often the form of this picturing, opbildung, that is actually thought to contain the answer to the mythical question of origins and that hence dominates all mythical cosmographies and cosmologies. Because the world is formed from parts, be they of a human or superhuman nature, vazen, it retains the character of a mythical organic unity however much it may seem to break asunder into nothing but individual beings, Vazen. One of the hymns of the Rig Veda describes how the world emerged from the living body of the human being, the Purusha. The world is the Purusha, because it arose when the gods offered him up as a sacrifice and brought forth into being the individual creatures from the parts of its body, which was dismembered in accordance with the technique of sacrifice. Thus, the parts of the world are nothing other than the organs of the lived human body. The Brahman was his mouth, his arms were made the Rajanya war rire, his two thighs the vasya, trader and agriculturist, from his feet the sutra, servile class, was born. The moon was born from his spirit, manas, from his eye was born the sun, from his mouth indra and agni, from his breath vayu, wind, was born. From his navel arose the middle sky, from his head the heaven originated, from his feet the earth, the quarters from his ear. Thus, did they fashion the worlds. Thus, here, in the early age of mythical thinking, the unity of microcosm and macrocosm appears to be grasped such that it is not so much the human who is formed from the parts of the world as the world from the parts of the human. We find this same point of view, though in the reverse direction, in, for example, the Christian Germanic view that Adam's lived body was formed of eight parts, so that his flesh resembles the earth, his bones the rocks, his blood the sea, his hair the plants, his thoughts the clouds. In both cases, Myth begins from a spatial physical correspondence between the world and the human and from this correspondence infers a unity of origin. And this transposition is not limited to this particular relationship between the world and the human with all its significance rather, it recurs more generally in the application to the most diverse spheres of existence. Consequently, mythical thinking in general knows of no pure ideal similarities but rather looks upon any kind of similarity as an indicatine of an original community, as an essential identity. This is particularly true above all for similarities or analogies of spatial structure. The mere possibility of assigning, Tsordnan, each one, member for member, to a determinate spatial whole is for mythical intuition the immediate inducement to let them merge together with each other. From this point on, they are only different forms of expression of one and the same essential being, which can appear in entirely different dimensions. By virtue of this distinctive principle of mythical thinking, spatial distance is constantly negated and sublated by it. The distant comes together with what is nearest, insofar as it is somehow pictured, Abelden, in it. We see how deeply rooted this feature is, for example, in that despite all the progress of pure cognition and the exact view of space, it has never been fully overcome. As late as the 18th century, Swedenborg, in his Arcana Coelestia, attempted to construct a system of the intelligible world according to this category of universal correspondence. All spatial barriers ultimately drop here, for, as the human is picturable, Abeldbar, in the world and thus is essentially the same with it, so too is the smallest picturable, Abeldbar, in the largest and thus is essentially the same with it and likewise with most distant and the nearest. Thus, just as there is a magical anatomy in which specific parts of the human body become equated with specific parts of the world, there is also a mythical geography and
cosmography in which the structure of the earth is described and determined in accordance with the same basic intuition. Often the two, Magi call anatomy as well as mythical geography, merge into one. In the Hippocratic book on the number seven, the seven-part map of the world represents the earth as a human-lived body the Peloponnesus is its head, the Isthmus is its spinal cord, and Ionia appears as the diaphragm, i.e. the true center, the navel of the world and all the intellectual and moral qualities of the peoples who dwell in these regions are, in some way, thought of as dependent on this form of localization. Here, on the threshold of classical Greek philosophy, we encounter a view that can be understood only through its widespread mythical parallels. We need only compare the schema of the earth and space in general, as it is projected here, with the universal spatial schematism of the Zunis in order to perceive the basic kinship between the two. For mythical thinking, there never exists between what a thing is and the position in which it is situated a merely external and accidental relationship rather, the position is itself a part of its being through which the thing appears subjected to specific inner bonds. In the totemic sphere of representations, for example, the members of a specific clan stand in such a relationship of the bond, of a originary kingship, not only to one another but also, for the most part, to specific regions of space. To each clan there belongs above all an often precisely determinate and specific direction in space and a determinate sector, an extract from the whole of space. When a member of a clan dies, care is taken to bury him in the spatial position and direction distinctive and essential to his clan. In all this, we see the two basic features of the mythical feeling of space, the thorough qualification and particularization from which it starts and the systematization toward which it nevertheless strives. The systematization has found its clearest expression in that form of mythical geography that has grown out of astrology. As early as the old Babylonian period, the terrestrial world was divided, according to its affiliation with the heavens, into four different realms Akkad, i.e. South Babylonia, was governed and guarded by Jupiter and Meru, the West Country, was governed by Mars Subertu and Elam in the North and East were ruled by the Pleiades and Perseus. Later, the schema of the seven planets seems to have led to a sevenfold organization of the whole world, such as what we encounter in Babylonia, India, and Persia. We seem far removed here from those primitive divisions that project all being on the human body and pictured, abilded, it, it in them the narrow sensible view seems to be overcome here by something truly cosmic and universal however, the principle of correlation has remained the same. Mythical thinking seizes upon a specific concrete spatial structure in order to carry through its whole orientation of the world. In what does it mean to orient oneself in thinking? Dash an article that despite its brevity is highly characteristic of his manner of thinking, Kant attempted to determine the origin of the concept of orientation and to follow its development. However exalted the application of our concepts, and however far up from sensibility we may abstract them, still they will always be appended to pictural, buildlick, representations. For how would we procure sense and significance for our concepts if we did not underpin them with some intuition? Kant then goes on to show how orientation begins with a sensibly felt difference, namely, with the feeling of the difference between the right hand and the left hand, and how it then rises to the sphere of pure mathematical intuition and ultimately to the orientation in thinking in general, in pure reason. If we examine the particular nature of mythical space and compare it with the space of sensible intuition and that of the thought space of mathematics, we can follow these stages of orientation down to a still deeper spiritual level and we can clearly identify the point of transition at which an opposition intrinsically rooted in mythical religious feeling begins to configure itself, to give itself an objective form, through which the general process of objectivization, the intuitive objective apprehension and interpretation of the world of sense impressions, assumes a new direction. Space and light The problem of orientation thus far, the intuition of space has proven to be a basic element in mythical thinking as this showed itself dominantly by the tendency to transform all the differences that it posited and apprehended into spatial differences and to make them immediately present, vertigen and wartigen, in this form. Thus far, we have in the previous consideration essentially considered the differences as directly given, i.e. it was assumed that the separations and divisions of spatial regions and spatial directions, the separation of right and left, above and below, etc. to be affected in the primary sense impressions without the need of a particular spiritual labor, a specific energy of consciousness. It is, however, precisely this presupposition that now requires a correction, for, on closer scrutiny, it contradicts what we have recognized as a basic feature of the process of symbolic forming, for Mung. We have seen that the essential and distinctive achievement of each symbolic form, the form of language as well as the form of myth or the form of pure cognition, does not consist simply in receiving a given material from impressions, which in themselves already possess a fixed determinacy, 
a given quality and structure, in order to then graft it, as it were, as though from outside, onto another form originating in an independent energy of consciousness. Rather, the characteristic achievement of spirit begins much earlier than this. On sharper analysis, even the apparently given proves to have passed through a certain act, be it that of linguistic, mythical, or logical theoretical apperception. Only what is made in these acts is even in its seemingly simple and immediate consistent existence, what is thus made proves to be conditioned and determined by some primary significance bestowing function. And it is in this primary, not in that secondary, forming, formung, that the true mystery of all simple each form is located and that must forever awaken new philosophical astonishment. Here too, the fundamental philosophical problem does not consist in understanding by means of what spiritual mechanism mythical thinking succeeds in relating purely qualitative differences to spatial differences, into which it transposes them, as it were, but rather, the question concerns the basic motive by which mythical thinking is guided in its original original positing of these spatial differences. How, in the whole of mythical space, do individual regions and directions come to be singled out? How does it come about that one region and direction is opposed to the others, stressed over against them, and endowed with a certain distinguishing mark? These are not idle questions, as becomes evident once we consider that in this isolation, mythical thinking proceeds according to entirely different distinguishing traits and criteria from those employed by theoretical scientific thinking in tackling the same task. The latter arrives at the fixation of a certain spatial order by relating the sensible manifold of impressions to a system of purely thought, purely ideal formations, gabilda. The empirical straight line, the empirical circle, and the empirical sphere are determined and understood in reference to the ideal world of purely geometrical figures, gestalten, in reference to, as the platonic expression reads, the straight line in itself, the circle in itself, and the sphere in itself. An ensemble of geometrical relations and laws is set up which supplies the norm and fixed guiding principles for all apprehension and interpretation of the empirical spatial. The theoretical view of physical space shows itself to be governed by the same motive of thinking. To be sure, not only sensible intuition but also immediate sense sensation seems to play a part here, individual regions and directions in space seem to be distinguishable here only in that we connect them with some material differences of our corporeal organization, our physical lived body. If, however, the physical view of space cannot dispense with this dependence, then it strives more and more to free itself from it. All progress in the exact, in the strict sense, scientific physics is directed toward eradicating the merely anthropomorphic component of the physical worldview. Thus, in particular, the sensible opposition of above and below loses its significance in the cosmic space of physics. Above and below are no longer absolute opposites rather, they are valid only in relation to the empirical phenomenon of gravity and the empirical lawfulness of this phenomenon. Physical space is, in general, characterized as a space of force however, the concept of force, in its purely mathematical framing, fossong, goes back to the concept of law, thus to the concept of function. In the structural space of myth, however, we see entirely different guidelines. The general validity is not divorced here from the particular and accidental, the constant from the variable, through the basic concept of law rather, we find here the one accent of mythical value expressed in the opposition between the sacred and profane. There are here no purely geometrical or purely geographical, no purely ideal thought or merely empirically perceived differences rather, all thinking as well as all sensible intuiting and perceiving rest on an original ground of feeling, geful scrunt. However particularized and refined its structure may become, mythical space as a whole remains embedded, or, one might say, embedded and immersed, in this feeling. In this space, the positing of certain demarcations and differences are thus not arrived at by way of a progressive intellectual determination. By way of an intellectual analysis and synthesis rather, the differentiations of space go back to differentiations already in effect in this ground of feeling, Geffel Skrunt. The places and directions in space stand out from one another because and insofar as a different accent of significance is connected with them, because and insofar as they are mythically evaluated in different and opposite senses. In this valuation, were tongue, a spontaneous act of the mythical religious consciousness is performed however, Objectively considered, it is also connected to a certain basic physical fact. The unfolding of the mythical feeling of space always begins from the opposition of day and night, light and darkness. The dominant power that this opposition exerts on mythical religious consciousness can be followed down to the most highly developed cultural religions. A few of these religions, particularly that of the Iranians, may even be designated as complete developments, as thoroughgoing systematizations of this one opposition. However, 
even where this difference and conflict does not present itself in this intellectual determination, in this almost dialectical intensification, it may be recognized as one of the latent motives in the religious construction of the cosmos. As regards the religion of primitive peoples, such as the religion of the core Indians described in detail by Proust, it is entirely dominated and permeated by this opposition of light and darkness. Around it unfolds the mythical feeling and the whole mythical apprehension of the world that is distinctive to the chorus. In the creation legends of nearly all peoples and religions, however, the process of creation immediately merges with the dawning of the light. In the Babylonian creation legend, the world emerges from the struggle waged by Marduk, god of the morning sun and the spring sun, against chaos and darkness that is depicted in the monster Tiamat. The victory of the light is the origin of the world and of the world order. The Egyptian story of creation has also been interpreted as an imitation of the phenomenon of the daily sunrise. The first act of creation begins here with the formation of an egg, which rises out of the primal water from the egg issues forth Ra, the god of light, whose genesis is described. In the most diverse versions, all of which, however, go back to the one originera phenomenon, the bursting forth of light from the darkness of night. How the living intuition of this originera phenomenon gives the mosaic account of creation its full, concrete sense requires no further exposition since Herder first pointed out this interconnection and presented it with sensitive eloquence. Perhaps Herder's gift of not seeing all spiritual phenomena as mere formations, gebilda, but of situating himself immediately in the creative process of forming, bilden, from which they spring is nowhere so brilliantly revealed as in this interpretation of the first chapter of Mosaic Genesis. For Herder, the presentation of the creation of the world is nothing other than the account, Erzählung, of the birth of light, as experienced by the mythical spirit in the becoming of every new day, in the coming of every new dawn. This becoming is for mythical intuition no mere event rather, it is a genuine abiogenesis, not a periodically recurring natural process following a determinate rule but something absolutely individual and unique. Heraclitus saying, the sun is new each day, is spoken in a truly mythical spirit. We have here before us, as it were, the first characteristic emergence of mythical thinking and in all its further progress, the opposition of light and darkness, day and night, proves to be a living enduring motive. In his fine and moving book, Trolls Lund followed the becoming and growth of this motif from its first primitive beginnings to that universal formation, Dirchbildung, that it underwent in an astrological mode of thinking. As Trolls Lund writes, we begin from the assumption that the predisposition for the emperor's signs of light and the feeling of place are the two most original and deep-seated forms of the manifestation of human intelligence. It is by these two paths that the individual and the race achieve their most essential spiritual development. It is from this perspective that the three great questions have been answered with which existence itself confronts each one of us who are you? What are you? What should you do? For each dweller of the earth, this sphere which is itself not luminous, the interchange of light and darkness, day and night, is the earliest impulse in the ultimate end of their ability to think. Not only our earth but ourselves, our own spiritual eye, from our first blinking. The Basic Features of a Morphology of Myth At the light to our highest religious and moral feelings, are born and nurtured of the sun. The progressive apprehension of the difference between day and night, light, and darkness, is the innermost nerve of all human cultural development. And every separation of the individual regions of space and with it every mode of organizing the whole of mythical space is connected with this difference. The characteristic mythical accent of the holy, heiliga, and unholy, unheiliga, is distributed in different ways among the individual directions and regions and lends each of them a specifically mythical religious imprint. East and West, and North and South, are not differences that serve in essentially the same way for orientation. Within the world of empirical perception rather, each of them has a specific being and specific significance of its own, an inherent mythical life. Each particular direction is not taken as an abstract ideal relationship but rather as an on-pendant formation, gebilda, endowed with its own life, as can be seen, for example, from the fact that they often undergo the highest degree of concrete configuration and independentization, verselbstandigung, of which myth is capable, i.e. they are raised to the level of a particular god. Even at relatively low stages of mythical thinking, we encounter these gods of direction the gods of the east and north, of the west and south, of the lower and upper world. And perhaps there is no cosmology, however primitive, in which the opposition of the four main directions of the heavens, Himal, do not in some way emerge as the cardinal points of its apprehension and explanation of the world. Thus, one of Gouda's sayings, to God belongs the Orient, to God belongs the Occident the northern and the southern lands resetting, tranquil, in his hands, applies in the strictest sense to mythical thinking. However, 
before it could arrive at this unity of a universal feeling of space and of a universal feeling of God in which all particular oppositions seem dissolved, mythical thinking had to pass through these same oppositions and set them off against one another. Each individual spatial determination thus obtains a certain divine or demonic, friendly or hostile, holy or unholy character. The East as the origin of all light is also the source and origin of all life, the West as the place of the setting sun is filled with all the terrors of death. Wherever the thought of a realm proper to the dead arises in contrast to the spatially separate and isolated realm of the living, it is situated in the West of the world. And this opposition of day and night, light, and darkness, birth and death, is also reflected in the most varied mediations and in the most diverse refractions and the mythical apprehensions of the individual, concrete relationships of life. They all receive, as it were, a different illumination, according to the relationship in which they stand to the phenomenon of the rising or setting sun. Usner writes the following in his Godinaman. The worship of light is woven into the whole of human existence. Its basic features are the same for all the members of the Indo-European family of peoples indeed, they extend much farther even today, often unconsciously, we are dominated by it. Out of the half-death of sleep the light of day awakens us to life to come to the light, to be born to depart from the light means to die. As early as the Homeric epics, light is the redeeming and saving. Euripides calls the light of the day pure the cloudless blue heavens with its unobstructed light as the divine archetype, or build, of purity as it became the basis for the representation of the land of the gods and the sojourn of the blessed. And this intuition was directly transposed into the supreme moral concepts of truth and justice. From this basic view it followed that sacred actions, for which the gods of heaven could be invoked as helpers or witnesses, could be performed only under the open daytime heavens. The oath, whose sanctity is based on the invocation of the all-seeing, all-knowing, punishing gods as witnesses, could originally be taken only under the open heavens. The genuine thing that combined the free men of a community who dwelt in houses in council and judgment took place in the sacred ring under the open sky. All these are simple, involuntary representations they arise under the irresistible forceful power of sense impressions to which we have not yet grown impervious and which form a closed circle of their own. In them springs up an original and inexhaustible well of religiosity and morality. In all these transitions, we are once again immediately aware of that dynamic that belongs to the nature, vazen, of every true spiritual form of expression. It is the decisive achievement of every such form that in them the rigid boundary between inner and outer, the subjective, and the objective, does not subsist as such but begins, as it were, to grow fluid. Inner does not stand alongside the outer, the outer alongside the inner as if each were its own separate precinct rather, both are reflected in the other, and only in this reciprocal reflection does each disclose its own content, Gehalt. Thus, in the spatial form that mythical thinking sketches out, the whole mythical life form is imprinted and can, in a certain sense, be read from it. This reciprocal relationship found its classical expression in the Roman sacral order that appeared to be literally characterized by this constant transposition. In his seminal work, Nissen has elucidated the process of this transposition from all sides. He has shown how the basic mythical religious feeling of the sacred found its first objectivization by turning outward, by presenting itself in the intuition of spatial relationships. Hallowing begins when a specific domain is detached from the whole of space, when it is distinguished from other domains and one might say religiously enclosed and cared for. This concept of a religious hallowing, which likewise presents itself as a spatial delimitation, has found its linguistic sedimentation in the expression of templum, Greek, which goes back to the root, to cut, and thus signifies that which is cut out, delimited. In this sense, it first designates the sacred precinct belonging to the god and consecrated to the god and then, by extension, every market-off piece of land, every bounded field or orchard, whether it belongs to a god, king, or hero. However, the space of the heavens as a whole appears, according to an ancient religious intuition, as just such an enclosed and consecrated domain, as a temple in which one divine being dwells and which is governed by one divine will. And a sacral organization of this unity sets in. The whole of the heavens breaks down into four parts that determine the regions of the world an anterior in the south, a posterior in the north, a left in the east, and a right in the west. From this first original, purely local, or tlich, division, the entire system of Roman theology developed. When the augur observed the heavens in order to read from it the symbol, Vardsition, of earthly doing, each such observant kind began by dividing the heavens up into determinate sections. The east-west line, which is designated and established by the course of the sun, was bisected by another vertical line, the north-south line. With this cutting and intersection of the two lines, the decumanus, east-west way, and the cardo, 
South Road, as they were called in the language of the priests, religious thinking created its first fundamental scheme of coordinates. Nissen has shown in detail how this schema was transferred from the domain of religious life to every sector of juridical, social, and political life and how in this transference it became more precisely and subtly differentiated. It formed the basis for the development of the concept of property and the symbolism by which property was designated and safeguarded as such. For the act of positing a boundary, the basic act of limitation through which a fixed property was first established in the juridical religious sense, is everywhere related to the sacred order of space. In the books of the Roman agrimensors, grammatic writers, the introduction of limitation was attributed to Jupiter and related directly to the act of world creation. It is as though the demarcation prevailing in the universe had thus been transferred to the earth and to all individual earthly relationships. Limitation is also based on the world regions, on the separation, Scheidung, of the world, which is designated by the east-west line and the north-south line, the decumanus and the cardo. It begins with the simplest natural division, with the division into a day and night, followed by a second division into morning and evening the waxing and waning day. Roman political law is closely interconnected with this form of limitation upon it is based the separation between ager publicus and ager devices et at sinatus, between public and private property. For only land enclosed in fixed boundaries, in immutable mathematical lines, passes as private property. Like the god before them, the state, the community, and the individual now acquired a definite space through the mediation of the idea of the templum, a determinate space in which they made themselves at home. It is not a matter of indifference how the augur limits the heavens for although the will of Jupiter extends over the whole of the extent, just as the pater familias, owner of the family estate, governs the whole household, other gods dwell nevertheless in the various regions, and the lines are drawn according as one interprets the will of this one or that one. The immediate result of this constitution is that the harbored space is immediately taken into possession by a spirit not only the city but also the compitum, crossroads, and house not only the fields as a whole but every agricultural field and vineyard, not only the house as a whole but every room within it, has its own god. The godhead is recognized by its workings and surroundings. Consequently, every spirit which is confined within a given space obtains an individuality and a specific name by which the human can invoke them. In this system, which also dominated the structure of the Italic cities, the grouping and order within the Roman camp, and the ground plan and inner arrangement of the Roman house. It immediately becomes clear how the progressive spatial delimitation, like every new landmark posited in space by mythical thinking and mythical religious feeling, became at the same time a landmark of spiritual and moral, sidelich, culture. Indeed, this interconnection can be followed down to the beginnings of theoretical science. Moritz Cantor's book has shown how the beginnings of scientific mathematics in Rome went back to the books of the Roman agrimensors and their basic system of spatial orientation. In the classical founding, Begründung, of mathematics by the Greeks, we can also hear everywhere the echo of the basic ancient mythical representation we can still feel the breath of that awe surrounding the spatial boundary from its inception. The form of logical mathematical determination developed through the thought of spatial boundary. In the Pythagoreans and Plato, boundary and the unbounded, limit, and, unlimited, are set off against each other as the determinant and the indeterminate, form and formless, good and evil. Thus, the purely intellectual orientation of the cosmos grew from this incipient mythical spatial orientation. Language has in many instances preserved the traces of this interconnection, for example, the Latin expression for pure theoretical contemplating, patroctan, and vision, schauen, contemplari, which etymologically and substantially goes back to the idea of the templum, the market of space in which the augur carried out his observation of the heavens. And from the ancient world, the same theoretical and religious orientation entered into Christianity and the system of Christian medieval dogmatics. The ground plan and the structure of the medieval church showed the characteristic features of that symbolism of the cardinal points that is essential to the mythical feeling of space. Sun and light are no longer the Godhead itself however, they still serve as the nearest and most immediate emblems, Vardsaishan, of the divine, of the divine will. To salvation and the divine power of salvation. The historical effective governs the whole household, other gods dwell nevertheless in the various regions, and the lines are drawn according as one interprets the will of this one or that one. The immediate result of this constitution is that the harbored space is immediately taken into possession by a spirit not only the city but also the compitum, crossroads, and house, not only the fields as a whole but every agricultural field and vineyard, not only the house as a whole but every room within it, has its own god. The godhead is recognized by its workings and surroundings. Consequently, 
Every spirit which is confined within a given space obtains an individuality and a specific name by which the human can invoke him. In this system, which also dominated the structure of the Italic cities, the grouping and order within the Roman camp, and the ground plan and inner arrangement of the Roman house, it immediately becomes clear how the progressive spatial delimitation, like every new landmark posited in space by mythical thinking and mythical religious feeling, became at the same time a landmark of spiritual and moral, citilich, culture. Indeed, this interconnection can be followed down to the beginnings of theoretical science. Moritz Cantor's book has shown how the beginnings of scientific mathematics in Rome went back to the books of the Roman agrimensors and their basic system of spatial orientation. In the classical founding, Begründung, of mathematics by the Greeks, we can also hear everywhere the echo of the basic ancient mythical representation we can still feel the breath of that awe surrounding the spatial boundary from its inception. The form of logical mathematical determination developed through the thought of spatial boundary. In the Pythagoreans and Plato, boundary and the unbounded, limit, and, unlimited, are set off against each other as the determinant and the indeterminate, form and formless, good and evil. Thus, the purely intellectual orientation of the cosmos grew from this incipient mythical spatial orientation. Language has in many instances preserved the traces of this interconnection, for example, the Latin expression for pure theoretical contemplating, patroctan, and vision, schauen, contemplari, which etymologically and substantially goes back to the idea of the templum, the market of space in which the augur carried out his observation of the heavens. And from the ancient world, the same theoretical and religious orientation entered into Christianity and the system of Christian medieval dogmatics. The ground plan and the structure of the medieval church show the characteristic features of that symbolism of the cardinal points that is essential to the mythical feeling of space. Sun and light are no longer the Godhead itself however, they still serve as the nearest and most immediate emblems, Vardzeichen, of the divine, of the divine will. To salvation and the divine power of salvation. The historical effective, crowned with a garland and sprinkled with the blood of a sacrificial animal. From the veneration of the temple threshold, which separates the space of the house of the god from the outside, profane world, the concept of property, as a basic religious juridical concept, appears to have developed along similar lines in totally different circles of life and culture. The holiness of the threshold, as it originally shelters, shoots in, the dwelling, the housing, of God, even in the form of land and field markers, shelters the land, field, and house from every enemy encroachment or attack. Often the designations that language coins for the expression of religious awe and veneration go back to a basic sensible spatial representation, the representation of shrinking back from, vor before, a specific spatial precinct. And this spatial symbolism is transferred to the intuition and expression of those living relationships that bear only the most indirect relation, if any, to space. Wherever mythical thinking and mythical religious feeling endow a content with a particular accent of value, wherever they mark it off from others and lend it a distinctive significance, this qualitative marking off tends to be presented in the image of spatial separation. Every mythically significant content, every living relationship that is raised out of the sphere of the indifferent in the everyday forms, as it were, its own ring of existence, an enclosed and cared for, umhagen, region of being that is separated from its surroundings by fixed barriers, and only in this separation does it achieve its own individual religious shape, gestalt. Entering this ring and leaving it are governed by specific sacral regulations. The transition, uber gong, from one mythical religious precinct to another is always bound to carefully observed rites of passage, uber gangsreiten. These rites govern passage from one city to another, from one land to another changes from one phase of life to another and the transition from childhood to puberty, from celibacy to marriage, from childlessness to motherhood, etc. Here again, we find confirmed the general norm that is recognizable in the development of all spiritual forms of expression. If the purely inward must be objectified, must be transformed into something outward, then, on the other hand, all intuition of the outward remains penetrated and interwoven with inward determinations. Even where contemplation seems to move entirely into the sphere of the outward, the pulsation of an inner life can be felt in it. The barriers that the human posits in the basic feeling of the sacred are the starting point from which the positing of limits in space arises and from which, by a progressive process of organization, organization, and structuring, gliderung, the process spreads over the whole of the physical cosmos. The mythical concept of time as significant as the basic form of space may prove to be for the construction of the mythical object world, it nevertheless seems that if we stop here, we will not be able to enter into the actual being, the true interior of this world. Even the linguistic expression that we employ to designate this world indicates this for us in its basic signification. 
Myth contains not a spatial but a purely temporal view it designates a determinate temporal aspect, under which the totality, Gesamtheit, of the world is moved. Genuine myth begins not only when the intuition of the universe and its individual parts and forces is formed into certain images, into the figures, Gestalten, of demons and gods but also when an emergence, a becoming, a life in time, is attributed to these figures, Gestalten. Only where it does not rest with a static contemplation of the divine, but where the divine explains its existence and its nature in time, where it advances from the figure, Gestalt, of the gods to the history of the gods, and on to the narrative of the gods, does it involve myths in the restricted and specific meaning of the word. And if we break down the concept of the history of the gods into its elements, of mere being but of events, can we distinguish their specific, singular configurations from their independent and individual imprint, Pragung? The particularity of becoming, of doing and being acted on, creates here the foundation for delimitation and determination. The first step that is presupposed here is that the separation underlying all mythical religious consciousness in general, the opposition between a world of the sacred and the world of the profane, has emerged in its universality. However, within this universality, which already finds its express sign in purely spatial separations and the positing of boundaries, a true particularization, a proper organizing of the mythical world is achieved only when the dimension of depth, so to speak, is opened up with the form of time. The true character of mythical being is first unveiled only when it appears as the being of origins. All the holiness of mythical being goes back ultimately to the holiness of the origin. It does not adhere immediately to the content of the given but to its source, Herkunft, dash not to its qualities and properties but to its having become Tob, Jward and Sane. Only in that a certain content is moved into temporal distance, in that it is situated back into the depths of the past, that it is posited not only as something sacred, as something mythically and religiously significant, but also as justified as such. Time is the first originary form of the spiritual justification. Not only the usages, customs, social norms, and bonds of specifically human existence undergo this hallowing in which they are taken back to statutes of the mythical before time and originary time, vor und Turzeit, dash but also existence itself, the nature of things, becomes truly understandable for mythical feeling and thinking only from this perspective. Any outstanding feature in the image of nature, any specific characteristic of a thing or a species, is considered to be explained as soon as it is connected with a unique event of the past, and thus, its mythical emergence, Entstehung, is demonstrated. The mythical tales of all times and all peoples are rich in concrete examples of this kind of explanation. A stage, stuff, has been reached here at which thought no longer contents itself with the mere givenness, be it of things, of customs and ordinances, with their simple existence and simple presence, Gegenwart, while, on the other hand, it does not rest until it has been able somehow to transpose this presence into the form of the past. The past itself no longer has a why it is the why of things. What distinguishes the mythical contemplation of time from the historical contemplation of time is that for myth there exists an absolute past that neither requires nor is susceptible to any further explanation. If history dissolves being into the continuous sequence of becoming, in which no outstanding point is singled out but every point indicates the way to one further back, so that regression into the past becomes a regressus in infinitum, then myth, to be sure, also makes an incision between being and having become tope, between the present, Gegenwart, and the past. However, once this past is attained, myth remains in it as if in something permanent and unquestionable. For myth, time does not take the form of a mere relation, relation, in which the moments of preant, past, and future are constantly shifting and transforming into one another, for Sheba and Ian and Umsetsen, rather, here a rigid barrier separates the empirical present from the mythical origin and gives to each its own inalienable character. In this sense, it is understandable that mythical consciousness, despite the fundamental and truly constitutive significance which the general intuition of time possesses for it, has sometimes been called a timeless consciousness. For compared with objective cosmic and objective historical time, there does not exist here such a timelessness. In its early phases, mythical consciousness retains the same indifference toward relative stages of time that characterizes certain phases of linguistic consciousness. There still prevails in it, to speak with Schelling. An absolutely prehistoric time, which is according to its nature the indivisible, absolutely identical time which therefore, whatever duration one ascribes it, can only be regarded as a moment, i.e. is time in which the end is like the beginning and the beginning like the end, a kind of eternity because it is itself not a sequence of times but only one time, which is not in itself an actual time, i.e. a sequence of times, but only becomes time, that is, the past, relative to the time that time follows it. 
If we now seek to trace the process of how this mythical originary time gradually transitions into actual, eigenlish, time, into the consciousness of a sequence, we find confirmed that basic relationship that our consideration of language has already called to our attention. Here again, the expression of the individual temporal relationships develops only through that of spatial relationships. Between the two there exists at first no sharp isolation, absonda ung. All orientation in time presupposes an orientation in space, and only insofar as the latter succeeds and creates certain spiritual means of expression do the individual determinations of time also separate from one another for immediate feeling and thinking consciousness. It is one and the same basic concrete intuition, the interplay of light and darkness, day and night, that underlies both the primary intuition of space as well as the primary organization of time. And the same schema of orientation, the same at first purely felt differences between the regions of the heavens and the cardinal directions of the heavens, governs the division both of space as well as time into determinate individual sections. The simplest spatial relationships, such as left and right as well as forward and backward, are separated in that the course of the sun determines a baseline, the east-west line, and this then is bisected by a second baseline, by north-south line, and all apperception of temporal sections goes back to this separation and intersection. Among the peoples who developed this system to the greatest clarity and spiritual perfection, this relation is often echoed in the most common linguistic expressions they have coined for time. The Latin tempus, to which corresponds the Greek, the holy tempus, and, tempo, preserved in the plural, grew out of the idea and designation of the templum. The basic words, tempus, templum signified nothing other than bisection, intersection according to the terminology of later carpenters to crossing rafters or beams still constituted a templum hence, the signification of the space thus divided was a natural development in tempus the quarter of the heavens, for example the east, passed into the time of day, for example morning, and thence into time in general. The separation of space into individual directions and regions runs parallel to the separation of time into individual phases, both present only two different moments in that process of gradual illumination of spirit that begins from the intuition of the physical originera phenomenon of light. By virtue of this interconnection, a unique mythical religious char actor, a particular accent of holiness, is given here to time as a whole. And to every segment of time, Zaitab Schnitt, in particular. For mythical feeling, a place in space and direction in space is not the expression of a mere relation but of a particular being, Vazen, a god or a demon, and this is equally true of time and its individual subdivisions. Even highly developed cultural religions have preserved this basic intuition and this belief. In the Persian religion, the cult of time and the individual segments of time of the centuries, the years, the four seasons, the twelve months, as well as particular days and hours, developed from the general worship of light. Particularly in the development of the Mithraic religion, this cult achieved a great significance. In general, the mythical intuition of time, like the mythical intuition of space, is altogether qualitative and concrete and not quantitative and abstract. For myth, there is no time in itself, no perpetual duration and no regular recurrence or succession in itself rather, there are only configurations of determinate content that in turn reveal determinate temporal gestalts, a coming and going, a rhythmical existence and becoming. Thus, the whole of time is divided by certain boundary points and, as it were, certain musical bars however, these segments are initially only objectively present as immediately felt, not as measured or counted. In particular, all religious doing of the human shows a rhythmic organizing of this sort. The ritual is careful to cautiously assign specific sacred acts to specific times and temporal segments, which if undertaken outside of these segments would lose all sacral force. All religious conduct is organized according to determinate epochs, for example according to periods of seven or nine days, weeks, or months. The holy times, the times of the festival, interrupt the uniform course of events and introduce into it certain lines of demarcation. It is in particular the phases of the moon that determine the sequence of critical dates. According to Caesar, Ariovistus postponed hostilities until the new moon the Lacedaemonians waited until the full moon before taking to the field. Underlying all this, quite analogously to space, is the intuition that in the positing of temporal boundary lines and lines of separation it is not a question of mere conventional distinguishing marks of thinking but that the individual temporal segments possess in themselves a qualitative form and particular nature, a nature, vason, and efficacy of their own. They do not form a simple, uniform, purely extensive series to each of them, rather, there belongs an intensive performance by virtue, of which they are similar or dissimilar to, corresponding or contrasting with, friendly or hostile to one another. Indeed, 
It seems that long before human consciousness forms its first fixed concepts concerning the basic objective differentiations of number, time, and space, a consciousness of the subtlest sensitivity to the peculiar periodicity and rhythm prevails in human life. Even at the lowest stages of culture, even among natural peoples who have barely arrived at the first beginnings of enumeration and who consequently cannot possibly have any exact quantitative apprehension of temporal relationships, we often find this subjective feeling for the living dynamic of the temporal events developed in astonishing subtlety and precision. To a certain extent, a unique mythical religious feeling of phases connects them to all the occurrences of life, particularly to all the most important periods, all the crucial transformations and transitions. Even at the lowest levels these transitions, the most important turning points, Einsknet, in the life of the species as well as in the life of the individual are in some way distinguished by the cult, are somehow lifted out of the uniform course of events. Any number of carefully observed rites safeguard their beginning and end. Through these rites, the fluid same series of existence, the mere course of time, is, as it were, religiously divided through them. Each particular phase of life acquires a particular religious impact and is given its own specific sense. Birth and death, pregnancy and motherhood, and puberty and marriage are marked by specific rites of passage, ubergangs written, and initiation. The religious separation of the individual stage of life, Lebensabschnitt, that are brought about by these rituals is often so sharp that the continuity of life is sublated by them. It is a widespread representation, recurring in various forms, that in transitioning from one circle of life to another a person acquires a new eye, that the child, for example, dies with the coming of puberty in order to be reborn as a youth and as a man. In general, two significant epochs of life are separated by a critical phase of greater or lesser duration, which tends to be marked off by an abundance of positive prescriptions and negative prohibitions and taboos. We can see from this that, before it works out the intuition of a properly cosmic time, there is for the mythical view of the world and for mythical feeling, a biological time of sorts, a rhythmic ebb and flow of life. Indeed, cosmic time itself where it is apprehended by myth, is first lived. By myth in no other way than in this distinctive biological configuration and transformation. Even the regularity of natural events, the periodicity in the circulations of the planets and the changing of the seasons, appears to myth entirely as the process of life. At first, mythical consciousness apprehends the change of day into night, the flowering and fading of plants, and the cyclical sequence of the seasons only by projecting these phenomena into the existence of the human being, where it perceives them as in a mirror. In this reciprocal relatedness, a mythical feeling of time arises that creates a bridge between the subjective life form and the objective intuition of nature. Even at the stage of the magical view of the world, both forms are immediately interwoven and bound together. This bondage explains how objective events can be determined by magic. The path of the sun and the course of the seasons are not regulated by an immutable or rather, they are subject to demonic influences and open to magical effects. The most diverse forms of analogy magic serve to influence, sustain or subdue the forces that are at work here. The popular customs, which even today are associated with the crucial turning points in the rise and fall of the year, particularly with the winter and summer solstices, still disclose this original view, obscured only by the lightest of veils. The imitative games and rites that are connected with the various festivals, the maypole dances, the crowning with wreaths, the fires lighted in the nights of May Day and Christmas, Easter, and the summer solstice, are based on the intuition that the life-giving power of the sun and the vegetative forces of nature must be aided and be guarded against hostile forceful powers, by human doing. The general distribution of these customs, Wilhelm Manhart has compiled copious material for the Greek and Roman worlds as well as the Slavic and Germanic worlds, while Hillebrand has given a detailed description of the solstice festivals of ancient India, proves that we are dealing here with intuitions that go back to a basic form of mythical consciousness. The primary mythical feeling of phases can apprehend time only in the image of life, and, consequently, it must immediately transpose and dissolve everything that moves in time, everything that comes and goes in a set rhythm, into the form of life. Thus, myth knows nothing of that kind of objectivity expressed in the mathematical-physical concept of Newton's absolute time, which flows in and for itself, without regard to any outward object. It knows historical, historish, time no more than it knows mathematical-physical time. For even the historical, Jeshishalich, consciousness of time contains definite objective elements, momenta. It is based on a fixed chronology, a strict differentiation of the earlier and later, and the observation of a determinate, unequivocal order in the sequence of individual temporal moments, momenta. 
such as separation of the individual stages of time and an establishment of these stages into a single tightly knit system in which each event belongs to one and only one position is completely foreign to myth. It belongs as such to the nature, Vazen, of the mythical thought form that wherever it posits a relation, it allows the members of this relation to flow together and merge, in Ionander Ubergeon, this rule of concrescence, this growing together of the members of a relation, prevails also in the mode of the mythical consciousness of time. Here too, the separation of time into clearly separated stages, into the past, present, and future is not stationary rather, consciousness repeatedly succumbs to the tendency and temptation to level down the differences, even allowing them to ultimately transform into pure identity. It is characteristic of magic, in particular, that it extends its general principle, the principle of pars pro toto, from space to time. Just as in the physical spatial sense, each part not only stands for the whole but is the whole, so too does the magical interconnection of effect pass over all temporal differences, differenzen, and dividing lines. The magical now is by no means a mere now, a simple and more isolated point of the present rather, it is, to employ Leibniz's expression, charged to pass a at gross de l'avenir, laden with the past and pregnant with the future. In this sense, divination, in which this peculiar qualitative interpenetration of all temporal moments is most clearly presented, belongs to the integral existence, be stand, of mythical consciousness. This consciousness, however, rises to a new level as soon as it is no longer fixated, as in magic, on the attainment of an individual effect and no longer contents itself with it and closes itself off in it, but instead directs itself toward the whole of being at events and is more and more imbued with the intuition of this whole. It now gradually frees itself from its immediate confinement in sense impressions and momentary sensible emotions. Instead of living in the individual point of the present or in a mere series of such points of the present, in a simple sequence of individual phases of events, it turns more and more to the contemplation of the eternal cycle of events. Even this cycle is still immediately felt more than it is thought however, even in this feeling, mythical consciousness rises to the certainty of a general, universal order of the world. The now is no longer, as in the mythical animation of nature, an individual thing, a particular physical existence, filled with particular emotional, sealish, contents, with individual personal forces rather, it is an everywhere recurring measure that is felt in the whole of the world events. The stronger this sensation becomes, the more it awakens mythical thinking and sets this thinking before a new problem. For now, contemplation is no longer directed toward the mere content of events but toward their pure form. Here again, the time motif operates as a mediation although time is apprehended by myth only concretely, only as a definite physical event, particularly through the changes of the stars, it nevertheless contains within it an element that belongs to a different, purely ideal demon scion. It is a different matter whether the individual powers of nature are in their particularity made the object of mythical interpretation and religious veneration or whether they are looked on only as the bearers, as it were, of a general temporal order. In the first case, we are still entirely within the ambit of the substantial view sun, moon, and stars are animated divine beings, Vazen, however, they are nevertheless individual singular things that are endowed with specific individual forces. In this respect, these divine beings, Vazen, are distinguished only in degree but not in kind from the subordinate demonic forces that prevail in nature. However, a different view, a new sense of the divine, matures when the mythical religious feeling is no longer directed solely toward the immediate existence of the individual objects, object, of nature and the immediate effective action of the individual forces of nature but when both of these are provided, as it were, with a characteristic significance of expression in addition to their direct significance of being, when they become a medium through which the idea of a thoroughgoing lawful order governing and permeating the universe is apprehended. Consciousness is now no longer oriented toward any individual phenomenon of nature be it the most powerful and violent rather, every phenomenon of nature serves only as a sign for something else, something more comprehensive, that reveals itself to it and in it. Where the sun and the moon are not considered solely according to their physical being and physical effects, where they are not venerated for the sake of their radiance or as the producers of light and warmth, moisture and rain, but instead are taken as the constant measures of time from which the course and the rule of the whole of events are read we stand here at the threshold of a fundamentally shifting and deepening of the spiritual view. From the rhythm and periodicity that can already be felt in all immediate existence and life, thought now rises to the idea of a temporal order as a universal order of fate, governing all being and becoming. Only in this framing as fate does mythical time become a truly cosmic potency, a power that binds not only the human but also the demons and gods, because only in it, and by virtue of its inviolable measures and norms, 
is all life and effective action of humans and even of the gods possible. At lower stages, the representation of such a bond can still clothe itself in entirely naive, sensible images and expressions. The Maoris of New Zealand have a mythical tale, Erdse Lung, relating how Maui, their tribal ancestor and cultural hero, once trapped the sun, which had previously moved through the heavens with no fixed rule, and compelled it to take a regular course. However, as development progressed and the more sharply the separation of the actual religious view of the world from the magical view of the world was undertaken, this basic relationship obtained a purer spiritual expression. This turned from the sensible individual to the general, from the deification, vergeterung, of individual natural powers to a universal time mythology, can be followed with particular clarity in Babylonia and Assyria, the home and source of all astral religion. The beginnings of the Babylonian Assyrian religion points back to the sphere of a primitive animism. Once again, the basic stratum forms here the belief in demons, the belief in friendly and hostile powers that intervene arbitrarily and capriciously in events. The demons of the heavens and those of the storm and the demons of the meadow and field and those of the mountain and spring stand here next to hybrid creatures, Mr. Wesson, that still bear the traces of animal worship and older totemistic views. However, insofar as Babylonian thinking was more and more concentrated on the contemplation of the world of the stars, the total form of this thinking changed. The primitive mythology of demons was not eliminated however, it now belonged to a lower stratum of popular beliefs. The religion of the initiated, of the priests, became the religion of the sacred times and sacred numbers. The actual basic phenomenon of the divine is constituted in the determinacy of the astronomical events, in the temporal rule that holds sway over the course of the sun, the moon, and the planets. It is not so much a single star that is thought and venerated as a godhead in its immediate corporeity rather, in the star, a partial revelation of the universal divine power is apprehended, one that works according to consistent norms in the whole as in the individual, in the greatest as in the smallest sphere of events. From the heavens, where we see its clearest manifestation, this divine constitution may be followed in constant gradations down to the order of the earthly, to the specifically human, to political and social beings. It is one in the same basic form that realizes itself in the most diverse circles of existence. Thus, the movements of the stars as the visible image of time express the new unity of sense in which mythical religious thinking now begins to encompass the totality, gazamtheit, of being and events. The creation myth of the Babylonians depicts the emergence of the world order from the formless, gestalt lozen, originary ground, ergrand, in the image of the struggle waged by the sun god Marduk against the monster Tiamat. After his victory, Marduk established the stars as the seats of the great gods and determined their course he introduced the signs of the zodiac, the year, and the twelve months he provided fixed barriers lest any of the days deviate or lose their way. Thus, all movement and with it all life began when the luminous gestalt of time penetrated absolutely formless, formless, existence, its differentiation and its separating into individual phases. And this consistency, bestandage kiat, of the external events was immediately connected here in accordance with the interweaving of the two moments in mythical feeling and thinking, to the internal events, the thought of an inviolable rule and norm that is posited over the doing of human beings Marduk's word is constant, bestandig, his command is not changed, what issues from his mouth no god can transform. Thus, he has become the supreme protector and guardian of justice, who looks into that which is innermost, who does not let the malefactor escape, who bends the recalcitrant and causes justice to prosper. The same interconnection between the universal order of time, which prevails over all events, and the eternal order of justice, under which these events stand, the same connection between the astronomical and ethical cosmos, can be found in nearly all the great cultural religions. In the Egyptian pantheon, the moon god Thoth, as the measurer, the divider of time, is also lord over just measurement. The sacred cubit used in drawing up the plan of temples and in surveying the land is consecrated to him. He is the scribe of the gods and the judge of the heavens, who has bestowed language and writing on humanity and who, through the arts of counting and reckoning, has given the gods and humans to know what is their due. Here too, the name for the absolutely exact and unchanging measure, Maud, becomes the name for the eternal immutable order that reigns in nature as in ethical life. This concept of measure in its twofold signification has indeed been designated as the foundation of the whole system of Egyptian religion. The religion of China was equally rooted in that basic feature of thinking and feeling that de Groot is called universism the conviction that all the norms of human doing are grounded in the original law of the world and the heavens and can be directly derived from it. Only those who know the course of the heavens, who understand the course of time and who orders their work, Verkan, accordingly, only those who know to connect their work to fixed dates, months, and days, 
can properly accomplish their human career. What the heavens determine, that is human nature to follow human nature that is Tao, the human, the cultivation of this Tao is called instruction. Once again, the ethical bonds of doing merge here with the temporal, in fact with the calendary cal regulation of these acts, and the individual segments of time, the great year, the year, the seasons, and the months, are accordingly venerated as divine. Human duty and virtue consist in nothing less and nothing more than knowing and observing the way that the macrocosm imposes on the microcosm. The same characteristic transition can be followed in the religious intuitions of the Indo-Germanic peoples here again, the particularization and individuation of the divine, prevailing in the polytheistic religion of nature, is replaced by the thought of a universal order of nature, which appears at the same time as a spiritual ethical order. And once again, it is the intuition of time that enters between these two basic significations and ultimately brings about their merging. In the Vedas, this process of religious development is depicted by the concept of the Rita, in the Avesta by the substantially and etymologically corresponding concept of the Asha. Both are expressions of the regular course, the prescribed providence of events, apprehended equally from the standpoint of being as well as from the standpoint of ought, an order of events that is likewise an order of justice. According to the Rita, the rivers flow, in a song of the Rig Veda, and according to the Rita, the dawn rises. The Rita follows the path of order knowing, it does not miss the directions of the heavens. And the same order watches and prevails over the progress of the year. Around the heavens runs the twelve-spoke chariot wheel of the Rita which never grows old the year. In a well-known song of the Atarvaveta, time itself, Kala, runs like a horse with many reins. With seven wheels does this time ride, seven knaves has he, immortal it is his axle. He carries hither all these beings, worlds. Time, the first god, now hastens onward. He carries away all these beings, worlds, they call him time in the highest heaven. He surely did bring hither all the beings, worlds, he surely did encompass all the beings, worlds. Being their father, he became their son there is, verily, no other force, higher than he. In this intuition of time, we can discern the struggle between two original inner religious motifs the struggle between the motif of fate and that of creation. There exists a distinctive dialectical opposition between fate, which appears in time but its being, Vazen, is following a transtemporal power, and creation, which must always be thought of as an individual act in time. In the later Vedic literature, we find the idea of Prajapati as the creator of the worlds the creator of the gods and humans is comprehended but his relationship to time is twofold and contradictory. On the one hand, Prajapati, from whom all things have emerged, is identified with the year, or more generally with time he is the year, because he has created it in his own image. However, in other passages, as in the recently mentioned song of the Atarvaveta, the relationship is reversed. It is not Prajapati who created time but time that created Prajapati. Time is the first of the gods, who has brought forth all being, Vazan, and who will survive them all. We can recognize here how time, as a divine power, begins to become in a certain sense super-divine, because it begins to become super-personal. Like good as Prometheus, wherever almighty time and eternal fate enter. The stage, they dethrone the polytheistic gods, even the supreme creator god. In so far as the polytheistic gods remain, they are no longer venerated for themselves but as guardians and administrators of the universal order of fate, into which they fit into which they are subordinated. The gods are no longer the unconditional legislators of the physical and ethical world rather, their doing and effective actions are conditioned by a higher law. Thus, the Homeric Zeus stands under the impersonal power of Moira and in the sphere of Germanic mythology, the power of the fate of becoming, word, appears at once as the fabric of the Norns, the women of fate, and as originarila, erlagu, ohg erlog, Old Saxon, orlag. Here too, time is the measuring power, in the Nordic theology of creation, for example, the world ash tree, Yggdrasil, is depicted as the tree with the right measure, as the tree that gives the measure. In the Avesta, where the pure creation motif is most sharply carried out, Ahura Mazda, the supreme ruler, is venerated as the creator and lord of all things, but at the same time, he is comprehended as the executor of a superpersonal order of the Asha, which is both a natural and an ethical order. Although the Asha is created by Ahura Mazda, it appears as an independent originary power that stands by the god of light in his struggle against the forceful powers of darkness and falsehood and jointly settles this struggle with him. As helpers in his strife against Armin, the god of goodness has created the six archangels, the Amshas Benta, headed by the good disposition, Asha Vaishta, and good mind, Vohumana. In the positing and designation of these spiritual potencies, which in Plutarch's Greek translations are rendered as benevolence, and, 
Alethea Truth, dash we are already in a sphere of religious thought that exceeds the boundaries of a, mere image world of the mythical, that indeed is shot through with truly dialectical and speculative motifs. Once again, the impact of these motifs is most clearly depicted in the framing and determining of the concept of time. Here the tension between the thought of eternity and the thought of creation becomes strongest, so that it gradually seems to transform the whole religious system from within and imprint on it a new character. Even the Avesta distinguishes two basic forms of time limitless time, or eternity, and the prevailing time of the long period, which Ahura Mazda has appointed as the temporal segment for the history of the world, as the epoch of his struggle against the spirit of darkness. This epoch of the long time, subordinated to its own law, organizes itself further into four main segments. With the creation begins the first segment of three millennia, a time before time, in which the world, though already luminous, is not yet discernible but exists only spirit to ally that an originary time, in which the world is transformed into a perceptible figure on the basis, grunt, of its already available forms then a time of struggle, in which Ahriman and his comrades invade the pure creation of Ormazd and in which the history of humanity on earth begins, until finally, in the time of the end, the power of the evil spirit is broken and the prevailing time of the long period is again taken up into endless time in the time of the world into eternity. In the system of Zaravanism, which is given literary expression only in relatively late times, but which seems merely to have revived certain originera motifs of the Iranian faith that have been submerged by the Zoroastrian reform, endless time, Zruvanakarano, is created as the ultimate and supreme principle, as the originary ground, Ergrand, from which all things as well as the two opposing potencies of good and evil emerged. Endless time divides itself within itself, thus creating the powers of good and evil as its two sons, who, as twin brothers, belong to each other but must continuously struggle against each other. This system, in which time and fate are expressly equated, the Greek reports renders Reuven by fortune, dash shows the distinctive twofold character of concept formation which at certain positions rises to the most difficult and subtle abstractions but which on others still fully bears the color of the specifically mythical feeling of time. Here time as the time of the world and time as the time of fate is never what it is for theoretical, particularly mathematical cognition a purely ideal form of order, a system of references and positions. Rather, it is the basic power of becoming itself, which is endowed with divine and demonic, creative and destructive forces. To be sure, its order is apprehended in its universality and inviolability, but, on the other hand, this order appears as prescribed. The law of time, to which all events are subjected, appears as a law ordained by a hate personal, half impersonal power. Myth cannot pass beyond this last barrier, because of the conditionality of its form and its spiritual means of expression. However, within this form, an extensive differentiation of the concept and feeling of time is possible. Insofar as mythical religious intuition can emphasize different individual moments of time it can provide them with entirely different values and thereby imprint a different gestalt on the whole of time. The configuration of time in mythical and religious consciousness it is characteristic of the approach taken by theoretical cognition, mathematics, and mathematical physics that in them the thought of the homogeneity of time is more and more sharply worked out and developed. Only by virtue of this thought can the goal of mathematical physical contemplation, the progressive quantification of time, be achieved. Time, in all its individual determinations, not only is taken up into the concept of pure number but ultimately appears to be entirely absorbed by it. In the modern development of mathematical physical thinking, in the working out of the general theory of relativity, this is expressed in the fact that here time has indeed cast off all its specific particularity. Every point of the world is determined by its space-time coordinates, x, 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 x however, these signify only numerical values, which are no longer distinguished from one another by any special characteristic traits and which are accordingly interchangeable with each other. For the mythical religious view of the world, however, time never becomes a uniform quantum of this sort rather, as universal as its concept may ultimately be configured, it is and remains given as a distinctive quail. In precisely this qualification of time do the various epochs and cultures, as well as the various basic directions of religious development, distinguish themselves from one another in highly characteristic ways. What we have found to be true of mythical space is also valid for mythical time, its form depends on the distinctive mythical religious accentuation, on the type of distribution of the accent of the holy and unholy. Religiously considered, time is never a simple and uniform course of events rather, it obtains its sense only through the contrasting and differentiation of its individual phases. The whole of time acquires a different gestalt depending on how religious consciousness distributes the light and shadow, 
on whether it dwells on and immerses itself in one temporal determination or in another on which it sets a particular mark of value. The present, past, and future are of course basic features of any image of time, however, the mode and the lighting of this image vary according to the energy with which consciousness turns now to the one, now to the other element. For mythical religious apprehension is not concerned with a purely logical synthesis, with the combination, tsuzam and fasung, of the now with the earlier and the later into the transcendental unity of apperception rather, everything depends here on which direction of temporal consciousness obtains predominance over the others. In the concrete mythical religious consciousness of time, there always lives a specific dynamic of feeling, a varying intensity with which the eye devotes itself to the present, past, or future and in the act of this devotion and by it places them in a definite relationship of affinity or subordinate position vis-a-vis one another. It would be an interesting task to trace and point out these diversities and transformations in the feeling of time through the whole of the history of religion and to show how this changing aspect of time, this changing apprehension of its consistent existence, its duration, and its transformation, Weindel, constitutes one of the most profound differences, differenzen, in the character of individual religions. We shall not follow this difference in detail here but only demonstrate a few of its most typical examples. The emergence of the idea of pure monotheism forms an important turning point in the configuration and apprehension of the problem of time in religious thinking. For in monotheism, the actual revelation of the divine does not occur in the form of time that nature discloses before us in the transformation, wandel, and periodic recurrence of its shapes, gestalten. This form of becoming can provide no image of God's imperishable being. Particularly in the religious consciousness of the prophets, there is, consequently, a sharp turn away from nature and from the temporal orders of the events of nature. While the Psalms praise God as the creator of nature, as he to whom day and night belong, who assigns a fixed course to the sun and the heavenly bodies, who has made the moon to divide the year by, the prophetic view, although these great images appear in it, takes an entirely different path. The divine will has created no sign of itself in nature thus. The purely ethical religious pathos of the prophets is indifferent to nature. Belief in God is seen as superstition if, whether in hope or in fear, it clings to nature. Learn not the way of the heathen, says Jeremiah, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them, Jeremiah. And for prophetic consciousness. The whole of cosmic, astronomical time disappears along with nature, in its place arises a new intuition of time that refers solely to the history of humanity. Even this history, however, is not comprehended as the history of the past but as a religious history of the future. It has been pointed out, for example, that the legend of the patriarchs was removed from the center of religious interest by the new prophetic self-consciousness and consciousness of God. All true consciousness of time now becomes a consciousness of the future. Remember not the former things, nay there consider the things of old. Is now expressly required. Herman Cohen who of all modern thinkers has most profoundly felt this foundational and originary thought of the prophetic religion most deeply and renewed it in the greatest purity, writes the following of time. Time becomes the future and only the future. The past and present are submerged in this time of the future. This return to time is the purest idealization. All existence vanishes before this perspective of the idea. The existence of humans sublated itself into this being of the future. What Greek intellectualism could not bring forth was brought forth by prophetic monotheism. History, histoire, in Greek consciousness is synonymous with knowledge as such. Thus, for the Greeks, history, geschichte, is and remains directed entirely toward the past. The prophet, however, is a seer, not a scholar. The prophets are the idealists of history. Their vision, certum, created the concept of history as the being of the future. The whole present, gegenwart, which reshapes the human as well as things, must be reborn out of this thought of the future. Nature, as it is and exists, can offer no support to prophetic consciousness. Just as a new heart is required of the human, so too must there be a new heavens and a new earth, a natural substratum, as it were, of the new spirit in which all time and events are seen here as a whole. The theogony as well as the cosmogony of myth and of the mere nature religions are thus surpassed by a spiritual principle of an entirely different form and origin. Even the actual thought of creation disappears almost entirely at least in the pre-exilic prophets. Their God stands not so much at the beginning of time as at its end he is not so much the origin of all events as their ethical religious fulfillment. The temporal consciousness of the Persian religion also stands under the sign of this pure religious idea of the future. Dualism, the opposition between the powers of good and evil, forms here the great fundamental ethical religious theme however, this dualism is not ultimate, insofar as it is expressly limited to a certain span of time 
to the prevailing time of the long period. At the end of this epoch, the power of Arman is broken and the spirit of the good is alone victorious. Thus, here again, religious feeling is not rooted in the intuition of the given but is entirely directed toward the accomplishment of a new being and a new time. However, compared with the prophetic thought of the end of times, the willing of the future in Persian religion seems at first sight more limited, more earthbound. The willing toward culture and an optimistic cultural consciousness have been given their full religious sanction here. Whoever tills and waters the fields, whoever plants a tree, whoever destroys harmful animals and cares for the preservation and support of useful animals, is fulfilling the will of God. These good deeds of the countrymen are praised over and over again in the Avesta. The man of right, the preserver and helper of the Asha, is he who brings forth the grain, the source of life from the earth, he who cultivates the grain observes the law of Ahura Mazda. This is the religion that Gouda described in the legacy of ancient Persian faith in his West Eastern Divan heavy service every day maintained, no more revelation need be framed. For humanity as a whole and the human being as an individual do not stand aside from the great cosmic struggle. They do not feel and experience, or leaven, it is a mere outward fate rather, they are determined to intervene in it through their own actions. Only through their constant collaboration can the Asha, the order of the good and right, be led to victory. Only by virtue of the communion with the will and doing of righteous thinking men, the men of the Asha, does Ormazd ultimately succeed in his work of liberation and redemption. Every good deed, every good thought of human beings, increases the force of the good spirit, just as every evil thought multiplies the realm of evil. So with all the directions toward an outward configuratine of culture, it is ultimately from the inner universe that the thought of God draws its true force. The accent of religious feeling rests on the aim of action, on its telos, in which the mere course of time is surpassed by being concentrated in a single supreme summit. Again, all light falls on. The final act in the great world drama, in the end of times, in which the spirit of light will have conquered the spirit of darkness. For redemption is accomplished not only through God but also through humans and with the help of humans. All humans are in unison and accord loud praises to Ormaz the renovation takes place in the worlds according to his will, and the world is immortal forever and everlasting. If we compare this basic view to the image of time and becoming as it emerges in the philosophical and religious speculation of India, the contrast is immediately discernible. Once again, a sublation of time and becoming is sought here, however, it is not the energy of the will that ultimately concentrates all condition doing on a single, supreme goal rather, it is from the clarity and depth of thinking that this sublation is expected. Once the first natural form of the early Vedic religions was overcome, religion more and more assumed the color of thought. When reflection penetrates the semblance of the multiplicity of things, when it obtains the certainty of the absolute one beyond all multiplicity, then the form of time, along with the form of the world, also vanishes for it. We can perhaps best perceive the contrast between the basic Indian and Iranian intuitions in one characteristic feature the religious position and evaluation of sleep. In the Avesta, sleep appears as an evil demon because it paralyzes the activity of people. Here, waking and sleeping are opposed, like light and darkness good and evil. Even in the old Upanishads, however, older Indian thinking feels attached, as though by a mysterious magic, to the representation of the deep, dreamless sleep, which it reshapes more and more into a religious ideal. Here, where all the determinate boundaries of being pass into each other, all torments of the heart are overcome. Here the mortal becomes immortal and attains to the Braham. As a man, when in the embrace of a beloved wife, knows nothing within or without, so this person, when in the embrace of the intelligent soul, knows nothing within nor without. Verily, that is his form, in which his desire is satisfied, in which he is without desire and without sorrow. Here lies the germ of that characteristic feeling of time that emerges in full clarity and extreme intensity in the Buddhist sources. With regard to the intuition of time, the teachings of Buddha retain only the moment of coming and the being and passing away all coming into being and passing away is, however, above all and essentially anguish. The source of suffering is the threefold thirst the thirst for pleasure, the thirst for becoming, and the thirst for transitoriness, for Ganglishkeit. Here, therefore, the endlessness of becoming, as it is immediately enacted in the temporal form of all empirical events, reveals in one stroke all its senselessness and hopelessness. In becoming itself, there can be no conclusion, and thus, it can provide no aim, no telos. As long as we are fastened to the wheel of becoming, it spins us around unremittingly and inexorably without rest and without purpose. In the questions of Melinda, King Melinda asks Saint Nagasena for a metaphor for the transmigration of souls. Nagasena draws a circle on the ground and asks, Has this circle an end, great king? No, my lord, 
It does not. So moves the cycle of births. Is there then no end to this chain? No, there is none, my lord. The essential religious and intellectual method of Buddhism can almost be characterized by the fact that wherever the ordinary empirical worldview believes to be whole being, permanence, or consistent existence, that it demonstrates in this semblance of being the moment of coming and a being and ceasing tobe, and that it even immediately feels this mere form of succession as such, independently of the content that moves and is shaped in it, as suffering. For Buddhism, all knowing, visan, and all non knowingness, on wis and hide, are rooted in this one point. As Buddha instructs a monk. Here, bhikkhu, the uninstructed worldling does not understand form subject to arising as it really is, thus, form is subject to arising. He does not understand form subject to vanishing as it really is, thus, form is subject to vanishing. He does not understand form subject to arising and vanishing as it really is, thus, form is subject to arising and vanishing. He does not understand feeling perception volitional formations, consciousness subject to arising subject to vanishing subject to arising and vanishing as it really is thus consciousness is subject to arising and vanishing. This is called ignorance, bhikkhu, and in this way one is immersed in ignorance. Thus, in sharp contrast with the active feeling of time and the future in the prophetic religion, it is activity, beta tigan, sankara, our very doing itself that is the source and root of suffering. Our own deeds as well as our sufferings inhibit the way of the true, inward life, because they drag this life down and entangle it in the form of time. Since all doing moves in time and possesses reality, realitate, only in it and through it, its difference from suffering is leveled down and sublated. Redemption from both occurs only if we succeed in sublating this temporal foundation, this substratum of all suffering and doing, in that we see through it as essenceless, wesenlos. The overcoming of suffering as well as the overcoming of doing occurs through the destruction of the form of time, after which spirit enters into the true eternity of nirvana. Here the aim consists not in the end of time, as for Zarathustra or the Israelite prophets, but in the disappearance for the religious view of time as a whole, with everything that is in it and everything that acquires figure, gestalt, and name in it. The flame of life is extinguished before the pure gaze of cognition. He has cut the round and one desirelessness the dried up river flows no more the severed round does revolve, just this is the end of suffering. And another completely different but no less significant way of considering time is disclosed when we consider the configuration of Chinese religion. As varied as the threads may be that connect India with China, in particular as close as certain individual forms of Indian mysticism are that touch on those of Chinese mysticism, the two cultures would appear far apart in their characteristic feeling of time and in their intellectual and emotional attitude toward temporal existence. The ethics of Taoists also culminates in a doctrine of immobility and inactivity, Nick's Tun, immobility and silence are the basic attributes of the Tao. Human beings, when they want to participate in the Tao, the fixed course and permanent order of the heavens, must above all generate the emptiness of the Tao in themselves. The Tao engenders all beings, Vaisan, and yet renounces their possession it makes them and yet relinquishes them. That is its mysterious virtue to create through renunciation, through relinquishing. Thus, inactivity becomes a principle of Chinese mysticism practice stillness, busy yourself with inaction is its supreme rule. However, as soon as we penetrate to the sense and heart of this mysticism, we learn that it is antithetical to the religious tendency that prevails in Buddhism. It is significant that in the teaching of Buddha, redemption from life, from the endless cycle of birth, is the true goal, whereas in Taoist mysticism, it is the prolongation of life that is promised and sought after. Thus, in a Taoist text, the Emperor Huang is taught by an ascetic that the refinement that belongs to the Tao of the highest order confers, is the loneliest solitude and darkest darkness nothing is there to be seen, nothing to be heard it envelops the soul in silence and the mate real body is thereby set to the correct state. So be still, and you are sure to become pure by it do not exert your body and do not be preoccupied with your refinement, in this way, your life can be extended. Whereas Buddhist nothingness, nishts, nirvana, aims at the effacement of time, the doing nothing, nix ton, of Taoist mysticism aims to preserve it, to perpetuate the endless duration not only of being in general but ultimately of the body and its individual form. When your eyes see nothing more, when your ears hear nothing more, when your heart feels nothing more, then your soul will preserve your body and your body will live forever. What is negated here, what should be overcome, is not time as such, as we see, but rather alteration in time. It is just through this sublation of alteration that the pure duration, the same endless continued existence, an unlimited repetition of sameness, cell big, should be achieved and secured. Being is grasped as a simple and immutable continued existence in time, however, for Chinese speculatine. 
in sharp contrast to the basic intuition of Indian thinking, precisely this consistent existence becomes the aim of religious desire and the expression of a positive religious value. Time, in which all changes of appearances are to be thought, Kant once said, endures and never changes because it is that in which succession and coexistence can only be presented as determinations of themselves. This unchanging time that forms the substratum of all change is apprehended by Chinese thinking and concretely viewed in the image of the heavens and their eternally recurrent shapes. The heavens govern without effectively acting, they determine all being without departing from themselves, from their always identical forms and rule. All earthly dominion and government should reproduce them. Because the Tao, of the heavens, is without stirring, Raygung, and no thing is that it does not create. If princes and kings can preserve the stillness, Rigungslo Sigkiat, then traces of the development of the ten thousand beings, Vazen, takes place by itself. Thus, instead of the element of variability, instead of emergence and passing away, the element of pure substantiality is attributed here to time and to the heavens and at the same time is raised to the supreme ethical religious norm. Pure, uniform persisting in being is the rule that time and the heavens posit for the human. Just as the heavens and time are not created but have been from all eternity and will remain and be for all eternity, so too must human action renounce the illusion of effect and creation and direct itself toward the preservation and maintenance of the existing order. Best Hinden. A determinate and specific cultural feeling is expressed in this religious configuration of the concept of time. The ethics of Confucius is permeated with this feeling, in that what it stresses above all is the immovability of the celestial and the human Tao. Thus, ethical theory becomes the doctrine of the four immutable properties of the human, which are the same as those of the heavens, which are as eternal and unchanging as the heavens themselves. This basic presupposition enables us to comprehend the strict traditionalism that is imprinted on this ethics. Confucius said of himself that he was a transmitter and not a creator, that he believed in and loved antiquity. And in the Tao Te King, it is written that one dominates the being of the present by holding to the Tao of antiquity to be able to recognize the beginnings of antiquity that is called parting the threads of the Tao. There is no demand here for a new heaven and a new earth. The future has its religious justification only insofar as it can legitimize itself as a simple continuation, an exact and faithful picture, opbuilt, of the past. If the speculative thinking of the Upanishads and Buddhism seeks a being beyond all multiplicity, all alteration, and all temporal form, and if in the messianic religions, the pure will toward the future determines the form of belief, then here the given order of things just as it is, is perpetuated and sanctified. This hallowing extends even to the individual details of the spatial arrangement and organization of things. In the intuition of the one unmoved order of the all, spirit attains silence and time itself, as it were, stands still for now, the remotest future seems connected to the past by unbreakable threads. Ancestor cult and filial piety thus form the basic requirements of Chinese ethics and the foundation of Chinese religion. De Groot writes thus in describing the Chinese ancestor cult. While the tribe constantly obtains new members by childbirth, it gradually dies out at its summit. However, the dead do not separate from it. Even in the afterlife, they continue to exercise their dominion and their beatific will. Their souls, made present by wooden tablets with their names, find their place on the house altar and in the temple of the ancestors, where they are faithfully venerated and consulted for advice, and respectfully nourished with sacrifices of food. And thus, the living and the dead form together a larger tribe. As in their lifetime, the ancestors are the natural guardians of their descendants, whom they protect against the harmful influences of evil spirits and thus assure them of happiness, prosperity, and rich progeny. In this form of ancestral belief and ancestor cult, we have again a clear example of a feeling of time in which the religious ethical accent is nay there on the future nor on the present in its pure immediacy but above all on the past and in which the succession of the individual moments of time is transformed into a consistent being together and interpenetration, in Ian Anderson. This religious tendency, Zug, toward perseverance in existence is determined in yet another way in the basic intuition that determines the form of the Egyptian religion. Once again. Religious feeling and thought hold fast here to the world with clutching organs here again, there is no returning back beyond the given into its metaphysical originary ground, Ergrant, nor is there any thought of another, ethical order beyond it to which it is constantly approaching and through which it wants to obtain a new shape, Gestalt. What is sought and desired is rather simple continuity, a continuity that refers above all to the individual being and individual form of the human. The preservation of this form, immortality seems entirely bound up with the preservation of the physical substratum of life, of the human lived body in all its particularity. It is as if the pure thought of the future could assert itself in no other way than through the immediate presence of this substratum, 
as if it could establish itself only in the constant concrete intuition of this immediate presence. Accordingly, the greatest care must be taken to protect not only the lived body as a whole from destruction but the preservation of each of its individual members. Through certain material methods of embalming as well as through certain magical ceremonies, each part of the body, each organ, must be transferred from its ephemeral, for Ganglish, being into a state of immortality, unver Ganglishkeit, only this guarantees the eternity of the continuity of the soul. And thus here in general, the representation of life after death can be achieved in no other way than through the representation of a simple prolongation of empirical existence that is to be preserved in all its individual features, in its immediate physical concretion. Similarly, in the ethical, there prevails the thought of an order to which not only are their guardians, the gods governed, but in which the human must also consistently collaborate. However, it is not a question here, as in the Iranian religion, of being transported to a new being of the future, but only of the simple continuation of the currently existing, Beschend. The spirit of evil is never definitively defeated rather, since the beginning of the world, there has been the same balance of forces, the same periodic rise and fall in the phases of the struggle. Due to this basic intuition, all temporal dynamics are ultimately sublated into a kind of spatial statics. This sublation has received its clearest expression in Egyptian art, in which this tendency, zug, toward stabilization is most, magnificently and consistently depicted, in which all being, all life, and all movement seem spellbound within eternal geometric forms. What is sought in India by way of speculative thinking and in China by way of a state religious order of life is the eradication of the merely temporal, which is achieved here through means of artistic configuration, through the immersion in the purely intuitive, plastic, and architectonic forms of things. This form triumphs in its clarity, determinacy, and eternity over all mere succession, over the ceaseless flux and transience of all temporal configurations. The Egyptian pyramid is the visible sign of this triumph and for this reason the symbol of the aesthetic as well as the basic religious intuition of Egyptian culture. However, if in all the typical manifestations of the concept of time that we have considered up to now, pure thinking, as well as feeling and intuition, can master time only by abstracting or negating it into some type of form another approach to time, quite apart from this mere abstraction. And negation, ultimately still remains. A true overcoming of time and fate can basically be spoken of only where the basic characteristic moments of the temporal are not merely disregarded or overlooked but where precisely these moments are held onto, where they are posited and positively affirmed. Only in this affirmation is their actual overcoming possibly, not so much outwardly as inwardly, not so much transcendently as imminently. As soon as this path has been taken, the development of the consciousness and feeling of time enters a new phase of development. The intuition of time and fate now begins to break loose from its mythical originary ground, Ergrand, the concept of time enters into a new form, the form of philosophical thinking. It was the philosophy of the Greeks that prepared the ground, Bowdoin, and created the basic presuppositions for this great transformation, perhaps one of the most significant and momentous in the history of human spirit. In its inception, Greek thinking reveals close connections with speculative religious doctrines of time emanating from the Orient. Regardless of whether it is possible or not to demonstrate a direct historical connection between Saravanite speculation and the Orphic cosmogonies and cosmologies, the factual similarity between certain basic motifs is in any case unmistakable. In the Theogony of Pharisides of Syros, which is now assigned roughly to the middle of the 6th century BC, the threshold of the great intellectual creations of Greek philosophy, time, Zeus, and Thania are the originary gods, from which all being has descended. Question mark middle dot? Zeus and Kronos, time, and Kthini, earth, always existed, and that Kronos made out from his own seed fire and air and water. Here, creation, and all that is contained in it, is the product of time, while in other Orphic poems night and chaos appear as its origin. And, much later, at the summit of Greek speculation, we sometimes feel echoes of such basic mythical thought and moods. In Empedocles' doctrine of the transmigration of the soul and redemption, time and fate? Time, and, necessity are again immediately grasped as one. The basic features of a morphology of myth. There is an oracle of fate, an ancient decree of the gods, eternal, sealed fast with broad oaths, that when one of the divine spirits whose portion is long life sinfully stains his own limbs with bloodshed and following hate has sworn a false oath, these must wander for thrice ten thousand seasons far from the company of the blessed, being born throughout the period into all kinds of mortal shapes, which exchange one hard way of life for another. Objective becoming in the oppositions, as they unfold within the one world order, within the spheros, 
are subject here to inviolable laws and measures of time to each antagonism, a specific epoch is assigned, in which it is completed. When time has been fulfilled. Completed time, one opposition must cede to the other love to hate or hate to love. And yet in Empedocles, this old concept of time and fate seems merely to echo a remote world that had vanished for philosophical thinking. For where Empedocles speaks not as a seer and priest of atonement but as a philosopher and researcher, his theory is based on that of Parmenides. In Parmenides, however, Greek thinking took an entirely new position in regard to the problem of time. It is his great achievement that with him for the first time thinking made logos the measure of being, from which the final decision, the critique, concerning being and non-being is expected. And for him, the power of time and becoming dissolves into a mere mirage, truth built. Only for myth is there a temporal origin, a genesis of being, whereas for logos itself the very question of an origin loses its sense. There is only one other description, one way remaining, namely, that, what is, is. To this way there are very many signposts that being has no coming and a being and no destruction, for it is whole of limb, without motion and without end. And it never was, nor will be, because it is now, a whole altogether. One, continuous for what creation of it will you look for? How, whence, could it have, sprung? What necessity impelled it, if it did spring from nothing, to be produced later or earlier? Thus, it must be absolutely, or not at all. Justice has never released being in its fetters and set it free either to come into being or to perish but holds it fast. Thus, in the mythical language, which the didactic poem of Parmenides still speaks throughout, the consistent existence of being, be stand design, is again linked to the commandment and order of fate, of. However, this fate, which is the expression no longer of a foreign power but rather of the expression of the necessity of thought itself, has now become timeless, timeless as that a truth in whose name Parmenides pronounces his verdict on the world of becoming as a world of semblance. In this exclusion of all temporal determinations, the mythical concept of fate passes for the first time into the logical concept of necessity? Becomes. The measurement, gemess and hide and rigidity of the archaic style in which Parmenides' didactic poem is written prevents any expression of a subjective, personal emotion, nevertheless, in the verses of this poem, we sometimes hear the triumph of Logos over the mythical powers of fate, the triumph of pure thought and its unassailable consistent existence over the temporal world of appearances. Thus coming into being is quenched and destruction also into the unseen. But being is motionless in the limits of mighty bonds, without beginning, without ceasing since coming into being and destructive have been driven far away, and true conviction has rejected them. And remaining the same in the same place, it rests by itself and thus remains there fixed for a powerful necessity holds it in the bonds of a limit, which constrains it round about therefore all things that mortals have established, believing in their truth, are just a name becoming and perishing, being a note being, and change of place, and alteration of bright color. It is immediately declared here that the force of philosophical thought, the force of true conviction, rejects becoming as a mythical originary power as well as an empirical sensible form? Question mark it is motionless in the limits of mighty bonds, without beginning, without ceasing, since becoming and destruction have been driven very far away, and true conviction has rejected them. The power of time is broken as long as time, considered from the standpoint of philosophical thought, dialectically dissolves itself, as long as it reveals its own inner contradiction. If religious feeling, particularly in India, senses in time above all the the basic features of a morphology of myth. Burden of suffering, then for philosophical thinking, here where it first appears in full independence and consciousness, time is grounded in, sugrunden, the burden of contradiction. And in the progress of Greek philosophy, this basic thought established itself, regardless of the multiple transfigurations it undergoes, as a permanently enduring effective force. Democritus and Plato follow the path that Parmenides had indicated as the only path of true conviction the path of Logos, which for them too became the highest authority in the decision concerning being and non-being. However, while Parmenides believed that he had intellectually destroyed, furnished it, becoming, they demanded its intellectual penetration, they called for a theory of becoming. The world of alteration was not to be denied but rather saved however, this salvation could be achieved only if a solid intellectual substratum could be provided for the world of sensible phenomena. It was in answer to this demand that Democritus comprehended the world of atoms and Plato the world of ideas. To the temporal coming and ill-being and ceasing Tobe, the one side opposed the consistent existence of immutable natural laws that govern all physical events, while the other side opposed a realm of pure timeless forms in which all temporal existence participates. 
Democritus was the first to state the concept of natural law in a truly sharp and universal form and by virtue of the new standard thus established to disparage all mythical thinking as merely subjective and anthropomorphic people have fashioned a mirage, troop build, of chance as an excuse for their own stupidity. To this human idol, he opposed the eternal necessity of logos, which knows no chance, no exception to the universal rule of the world events nothing happens at random everything happens out of reason and by necessity. And in addition to this new logical concept of ananke, a new ethical concept of it arose more and more clearly and consciously in Greek thinking. Although this unfolded above all in Greek poetry, it was in the tragedy that a new sense and force, craft, of the eye, of the moral self as opposed to an omnipotence, aljwalt, of fate was first discovered. Greek thinking not only accompanied this process, this gradual detachment from the mythical religious originary grounds in which the drama was originally rooted, but it gave it its own foundation. Like the Oriental religions, from its beginnings Greek philosophy apprehended the temporal order at once as a physical and as a moral order. It looked upon time as the fulfillment and enforcement of an ethical lawful order. The source from which existing things derive their existence, says an examander, is also that to which they return at their destruction, according to necessity for they give jutice and make reparation to one another for their injustice, according to the arrangement of time. Theophrastus, who handed down these words, felt and emphasized with their mythical poetic tone. More and more, however, the ethical side of the mythical concept of time, which is at the same time fate, undergoes a new spiritual deepening and internalization. In Heraclitus, we find the profound saying that a person's character is his fate and his demon. And in Plato, this thought is completed in that presentation of the judgment of the dead which, perhaps deriving from motifs of Iranian belief concerning death and the soul, gives new expression and significance to these motifs. In the tenth book of the Republic, we find the image of the spindle of necessity by which all the spheres are set in motion. These were the fates, the daughters of necessity Lachesis, Clotho, and Atropos. They were dressed in white, with garlands on their heads, and they sang to the music of the sirens. Lachesis sang of the past, Clotho of the present, and Atropos of the future. There a speaker arranged them in order, took from the lap of Lachesis a number of lots and a number of models of lives, mounted a high pulpit, and spoke to them here is the message of Lachesis, the maiden daughter of necessity ephemeral souls, this is the beginning of another cycle that will end in death. Your demon or guardian spirit will not be assigned to you by lot you will choose him. Virtue knows no master each will possess it to a greater or less degree, depending on whether he values or disdains it. The responsibility lies with the one who makes the choice the god has none. In this magnificent vision, vision, in which once again the entire force of mythical configuration is condensed, which was proper to the Greeks and above all to Plato, we nevertheless no longer stand on the ground, Bodin, of myth. For opposed to the idea of mythical guilt, Schult, and mythical undoing, we find here the basic Socratic idea of ethical responsibility for oneself. The sense and core of the life of the human, their true destiny, is placed within them, as with Parmenides' pure thought, here time and fate are overcome by the ethical will. This inner process of spiritual liberation explains the characteristic feeling of time that attained its first true maturity among the Greeks. We might say that here for the first time, thought and feeling become free to gain a pure and full consciousness of the temporal present, Geg and Wart. Being present, Jeg and Wartig, should and can be thought of only as the being of Parmenides it has never been and never will be, because it is altogether only present, Vorhanden, in the now, one and indivisible. Question mark question mark the platonic idea has the character of pure presence, Gegenwart, dash for only as always being, immersant, never becoming, can it stand firm to thinking and meet its demands for identity, for constant self-same determinacy. And for Plato, the philosopher is the one who by virtue of the force of argument is always responsible, aplique, for this always being, immersant. Even that thinker, the one who is commonly regarded as the true philosopher of becoming is only a seeming exception to this basic character of Greek philosophical thought. For we ignore and misunderstand the teachings of Heraclitus if we take his thesis of the flux of things simply in a negative significance. Of course, he spoke in unforgettable images of the intuition of the stream of time, of that stream that irresistibly sweeps away all being, seen, along with it and in which no one could step twice. His gaze, however, is by no means focused on this mere factum of the flowing and passing rather it is directed toward the eternal measures that he apprehends in it. These measures are the truly one and immutable logos of the world. This order of the world that is the same for all, he therefore proclaimed, was not created by any one of the gods or the human, but it was ever and is and shall be, ever living fire, kindled in measure and quenched in measure. And again, 
in the figure of Dyke, the directing undoing, this thought of the necessary imminent measure in all events is mythically personified. The sun will not transgress his measures, otherwise the Arrhenies, ministers of Dyke, will find him out. On this certainty of a metron, a secure and necessary rhythm that is maintained in all change, rests the certainty of an invisible harmony that is better than the visible harmony. It is only in order to assure himself of this hidden harmony that Heraclitus turns back again and again to the intuition of becoming. What seizes and captivates him is not, therefore, the naked facticity of becoming but rather its sense. Wisdom is one thing. It is to know the sense by which all things are steered through all things. This twofold position, this attachment to temporal intuition and this overcoming it through the thought of a unity of law, indwelling and immediately grasped in it, most precisely expresses the particular nature of Heraclitus as a Greek thinker. Oldenburg has pointed to numerous parallels between the Heraclitine teaching of becoming and the soul, on one hand, and the Buddhist teaching of the same oppositions, on the other. The creations of the West and the East in many respects are very similar in the way they correspond to each other, which indeed may excite our astonishment, in fundamental aspects as in secondary matters, even down to the form of the maxims to which religious consciousness is so devoted, or to the comparisons that are intended to introduce the great orders of events of fantasy. It is obviously not by chance that precisely in the period of development we are speaking about here that the agreement between the ideas of two peoples who are far removed from each other both outwardly and inwardly are stronger in many respects than in the preceding period. The myth-forming fantasy that operate in the time scepter goes its ways without plan and aimlessly it is driven by chance it connects what is far remote according to its whims it playfully spills out new shapes, rich in sense or baroque, from its cornucopia. However, as soon as a reflection which rapidly grows into inquiring thought, begins to devote itself more and more purposively to the problems of the world and to those of human existence, the leeway, spiel realm room to play, is reduced. What almost inevitably appears as reality to the attentive, though less experienced in the art of seeing, eye of those days confines the stream of representations in a set channel and thus imprints the most diverse and striking features of similarity upon the analogous thought processes of Greek and Indian minds. And, nevertheless, on the other hand, Precisely when we pursue these similarities, typical oppositions between the modes of thinking and general intellectual attitudes become clearer and more concise. In Buddhism, the finite form to which all existence is bound must above all be shattered, the illusion of the intrinsically limited figure must be sublated, so that the religious sense of events can be disclosed. Form, rupa, is the first of the five elements, elementae, of existence that bear within them the source and ground of all suffering. In one of his sermons, Buddha says. Bikas, I will teach you the burden, the taking up, Alfhaben, of the burden, and laying down of the burden. And what, Bikas, is the burden? It should be said the five aggregates subject to clinging. What five? That the form aggregate subject clinging, the feeling aggregate subject to clinging the perception aggregate subject to clinging, the volitional formations aggregate subject to clinging, the consciousness aggregate subject to clinging. This is called the burden. Friends, Form is impermanent what is impermanent is suffering what is suffering has ceased and passed away what is impermanent is suffering what is suffering has ceased and passed away. No one stressed the changeability of what the common view calls the form of things more sharply than Heraclitus. However, he draws from it the exact opposite consequence to the one drawn in Buddha's sermon it leads him not to a rejection of existence but rather to its passionate affirmation. While in the Buddhist legend, Siddhartha the king son flees from his first sight of old age, sickness, and death to become an ascetic and penitent, Heraclitus seeks all this and dwells on it, because he needs it as a means of grasping the mystery of Logos, which is only in that it constantly breaks apart, Asinandraghan, into oppositions. While the mystic feels in temporal becoming only the torment of impermanence, understand, Heraclitus delights in the intuition of the Great One, which must split itself in two in order to find itself again. The oppositions unite themselves and from opposites has created the most beautiful harmony, a unification of opposing tensions, like that of the bow and the lyre. For Heraclitus, the intuition of harmony of opposing tensions solves the riddle of form and takes from us the burden of becoming. Now, the temporal no longer appears as a deficiency pure and simple, as limitation and suffering in it, rather, is disclosed the innermost life of the divine. There is no peace and beatitude in the ceasing of becoming. In oppositionless perfection rather, disease makes health pleasant and good, hunger satisfaction, weariness rest. Now, even the opposition of life and death becomes relative. It is always one and the same that dwells in us living and dead, awake and sleeping, as well as young and old. If it changes, this becomes that, and that becomes this. As with Buddha, 
Heraclitus has a fondness for the image of the circle to express the content of his theory. In the circumference, reads one of the fragments, the beginning and the end are one. However, whereas for Bud DHA, the circle serves as a symbol, Zin built, of the endlessness and hence aimlessness and senselessness of becoming, for Heraclitus, it serves as a symbol, Zin built, of perfection. The line returning to itself indicates the uniformity of form, the figure is the basic determining law of the universe, and similarly, Plato and Aristotle made use of the figure of the circle to ground and form their intellectual image of the cosmos. Thus, while Indian thinking is oriented essentially toward the transience of the temporal and Chinese thinking toward the intuition of its consistent existence, while the first one-sidedly emphasizes the element of becoming and the second that of duration, here the two elements are placed in a pure internal balance. The thought of variability and that of substantiality merge with one another. And from this merging together arises a new feeling that might be called the purely speculative feeling of time and presence. Here, there is no longer, as in myth, a return to the temporal beginning of things, or as in the prophetic, religious ethical feeling, an orientation toward its ultimate goal, its telos rather here thinking dwells in the pure contemplation of the eternally unchanging fundamental law of the all. In this feeling of the present, the eye gives itself to the moment, Augenblick, without being confined to it it seems to hover free in the moment, without being touched by its immediate content, without being captured by the burden or adversely affected by its suffering. In this speculative now, the differences of the empirical form of time are thus sublated. In a fragment preserved by Seneca, Heraclitus says that each day is the same as another, unus dies par omniest. This does not signify some sameness in the content of events, which, on the contrary, changes not only from day to day but from hour to hour and from moment, Augenblick, to moment, Augenblick, but refers to the always identical form of the world process that emerges just as definitely in little things as in big, in the simplest point of the present as in the infinite. Duration of time. Among the moderns, Gouda is the one who has deeply felt this Heraclitian, this truly Greek feeling of time and life, and has revived it with the greatest intensity today is today, tomorrow tomorrow and what ensued and what has passed by is neither carried away nor left behind. Indeed, the basic speculative view of time bears a feature that would seem to relate it closely to the artistic view. For in both, we are relieved of the burden of becoming that finds so moving an expression in the teaching of Buddha. For whoever, in the intuition of time, no longer clings to the content of events but apprehends their pure form, this content is ultimately sublated into form the substance of being and events is sublated into pure play. It is perhaps possible to understand the strangely profound saying of Heraclitus in this way? Sharpes? Time is a child playing a game of drafts the kingship is in the hands of the child. At this point, we cannot follow how the speculative apprehension of time, whose ground is set down here, unfolded further and how it ultimately came to decisively intervene in the sphere of empirical scientific cognition. Here too, the philosophy of the Greeks, particularly Platonic philosophy, forms the connecting middle link. For even Plato's teaching, as sharply as it drew the boundary between the pure being of the idea and the world of becoming, did not stop at a merely negative evaluation of time and becoming. In Plato's later work, the concept of movement finds its way into the presentation of the realm of pure ideas there is a movement of the pure forms, eh? And yet the new significance that the concept of time receives for the overall construction of Plato's teaching becomes clearer and more determined in the configuration of his natural philosophy. In the Timaeus. Time is the intermediary between the worlds of the visible and the invisible and explains how the visible world can participate in the eternity of the pure forms. The physical corporeal world arises with the creation of time. The demiurge, Weltbildner, looking to the always being, immerse and, to the ideas as the eternal mode images, muster builder, wanted to make the sensible world as much like them as possible. The nature of the eternal archetypes, or builder, however, could not be wholly transferred to what has become. So the demiurge decided to create a moving picture, opbuilt, of eternity. This moving picture, opbuilt, of eternity persisting in unity is what we call time and thus, the days and nights, the months and years, appeared, which were linked with the structure of the whole by the will of the demiurge. Time, by moving in a circle according to number, is therefore the first and most complete imitation of the eternal insofar as it is possible to grasp such an imitation in what has become. With this, however, time, which, as an expression of that which merely becomes and never is, seen, had until now seemed to constitute a fundamental barrier to thinking, has become a basic concept for the cognition of the cosmos. This intermediary concept of a temporal order undertakes, as it were, a cosmodice within Plato's philosophical system, as it ensures the ensouling of the cosmos and its elevation into a spiritual totality, 
Gans. Plato still consciously speaks here in the language of myth however, at the same time, he points out a path that has led, in strict historical continuity, to the grounding, but grundung, of the modern scientific worldview. Kepler shows himself to be thoroughly imbued with the basic ideas of the Timaeus they guided him unremittingly from his first work, the Mysterium Cosmographicum, the Cosmographic Mystery, to the mature expositi of the Harmonices Mundi, the Harmony of the World. And here, for the first time, a new concept of time appears in full clarity the concept of time of the mathematical science of nature. In the formulation of Kepler's three laws, time appears as the fundamental variable, that uniformly changing magnitude to which all non-uniform alteration and motion are referred and by which the measure of this alteration is determined and read off. This is henceforth its ideal, its purely intellectual significance, as it was immediately established by Leibniz in general philosophical concepts from the standpoint of the new shape of mathematical physics. The concept of time has thus been imbued with the concept of function, in that it now appears as one of the most important applications and manifestations, oisurungen, of functional thinking it is thereby raised to an entirely new level of signification. The Platonic concept of time has now been confirmed only by being ordered in the continuum of time, only by being related to this moving picture, opbil, of eternity, have phenomena become ripe for knowledge and gained their share in the idea. That this insight into the problem of planetary motion is achieved, however, also points us to a historical intellectual interconnection of typical significance. The planets, the moving and wandering stars, have from the earliest times aroused mythical and religious interest. Along with the sun and moon, they are worshipped as divinities. In the astral religion of the Babylonians, Venus in particular, as the morning star and the evening star, was thus venerated and, in the image of the goddess Ishtar, became a leading figure in the Babylonian pantheon. And we find this cult of the planets in far distant cultures, as for example, among the Aztecs. In the course of religious development, particularly in the transition to the basic intuition of monotheism, belief in these ancient deities long remained alive, they now appeared, however, degraded to demons that interfered in the order and lawfulness of the all in a hostile and disruptive manner. In the Iranian religion, the planets are looked upon as evil powers who resist the Asha, the world order of the good. As servants of Armin, they plunge into the celestial sphere and in the freedom of their course disturb its regular constitution. This demonization of the planets recurs later, particularly in Gnosticism the demonic planetary powers are the true enemies of the Gnostic, in them is embodied the power of fate, from which the Gnostic seeks redemption. And this representation of the irregularity of the planets continues to have an effect in modern philosophy, as it did in the Renaissance speculation on the philosophy of nature. In antiquity, Eutyxus of Nidus, the mathematician and astronomer of the Platonic Academy, worked out a strictly mathematical theory of planetary motion, in which he furnished proof that the planets were not errant stars but moved according to fixed laws. Kepler, however, was still confronted by the objection of Patrizzi, who declared, Clarity the concept of time of the mathematical science of nature. In the formulation of Kepler's three laws, time appears as the fundamental variable that uniformly changing magnitude to which all non-uniform alteration and motion are referred and by which the measure of this alteration is determined and read off. This is henceforth its ideal, its purely intellectual significance, as it was immediately established by Leibniz in general philosophical concepts from the standpoint of the new shape of mathematical physics. The concept of time has thus been imbued with the concept of function, in that it now appears as one of the most important applications and manifestations, oisurungen, of functional thinking it is thereby raised to an entirely new level of signification. The Platonic concept of time has now been confirmed only by being ordered in the continuum of time, only by being related to this moving picture, opbuilt, of eternity, have phenomena become ripe for knowledge and gained their share in the idea. That this insight into the problem of planetary motion is achieved, however, also points us to a historical intellectual interconnection of typical significance. The planets, the moving and wandering stars, have from the earliest times aroused mythical and religious interest. Along with the sun and moon, they are worshipped as divinities. In the astral religion of the Babylonians, Venus in particular, as the morning star and the evening star, was thus venerated and, in the image of the goddess Ishtar, became a leading figure in the Babylonian pantheon. And we find this cult of the planets in far distant cultures, as for example, among the Aztecs. In the course of religious development, particularly in the transition to the basic intuition of monotheism, belief in these ancient deities long remained alive, they now appeared, however, degraded to demons that interfered in the order and lawfulness of the all in a hostile and disruptive manner. In the Iranian religion, 
The planets are looked upon as evil powers who resist the Asha, the world order of the good. As servants of Armin, they plunge into the celestial sphere and in the freedom of their course disturb its regular constitution. This demonization of the planets recurs later, particularly in Gnosticism the demonic planetary powers are the true enemies of the Gnostic, in them is embodied the power of fate, from which the Gnostic seeks redemption. And this representation of the irregularity of the planets continues to have an effect in modern philosophy, as it did in the Renaissance speculation on the philosophy of nature. In antiquity, Eutyxus of Nidus, the mathematician and astronomer of the Platonic Academy, worked out a strictly mathematical theory of planetary motion, in which he furnished proof that the planets were not errant stars but moved according to fixed laws. Kepler, however, was still confronted by the objection of Patrizzi, who declared ships of things, whether they be non-limited or limiting, into their separate groups. In this connection and separation, in this positing of fixed boundaries and relations, the strictly logical force of number is contained. By it, the sensible itself, the matter of perception, is increasingly divested of its specific nature and recast in a basic general intellectual form. Measured by the true nature of the actual, the immediate sensible constitution of the impression, its visibility, audibility, tactility, etc. appears only as a secondary property, whose true source, whose primary ground, is to be sought in the pure determinations of magnitude, thus ultimately in purely numerical relationships. The development of the modern theoretical cognition of nature has guided this ideal of knowledge toward its fulfillment by reducing not only the specific constitution of sense perception but also the specific nature of the pure forms of intuition, the nature of space and time, to that of pure number. Just as number here serves as the true intellectual means for setting forth the homogeneity of the contents of consciousness, so too does number develop more and more into an absolutely homogeneous and uniform entity. The single individual numbers disclose no differences over against one another, other than those arising from their position in the total system. They have no other being, no other constitution and nature, than that which comes to them through this position through the relations within an ideal ensemble. Accordingly, it is possible to define, i.e. constructively produce, specific numbers that, though they directly correspond to no assignable sensible or intuitive substratum, are unequivocally characterized by these relations, such as in the well-known explanation of irrational numbers that has become dominant since static end, where the irrational numbers appear as cuts within the system of rational num bears, i.e. as complete divisions of this system into two classes, affected by a definite conceptual regulation. The pure thinking of mathematics can apprehend individual number, any individual number basically only in this form for mathematical thinking, numbers are nothing but an expression of conceptual relations, relation and, that only in their totality constitute the self-enclosed and unitary framework, gafuga, of number as such and of the realm of number in general. Number takes on a very different character, however, as soon as we abandon the modality of thinking and pure theoretical cognition in order to consider the configuration that it undergoes in other domains of spiritual forming, formung. The consideration of language has already shown that there is a phase of number formation in which every party chular number, instead of signifying merely a link in a system, possesses a very individual imprint, a phase in which the representation of number does not possess abstract general validity but is always grounded in some concrete individual intuition from which it cannot be detached. Here, numbers are not yet general determinations applicable to any content whatever there are no numbers in themselves, and zish, rather, the apprehension and denomination of number grow out of an individual numerable thing and remain bound to the intuition of this thing. By virtue of the objective diversity of numerable things and by virtue of the particular intuitive content, gehalt, and the particular feeling tone attached to certain quantities, the diverse numbers do not appear here as an absolutely uniform formation, gebilda, but as highly differentiated, each having, as it were, its own tonality. This distinctive emotional tonality of number and its opposition to the purely conceptual, abstract logical determination, emerges still more clearly and sharply as soon as we turn to the domain of mythical representing. Just as myth knows absolutely nothing of the merely ideal, just as for myth all likeness, gleich hide, or similarity of contents appears not as a mere relation between them but as a real bond that time, likewise contains an element of universality and an element of thoroughgoing particularity. Here number is never a mere ordinal number, a mere designation of a position within a comprehensive total system rather, each number has its own being, vazen, its own individual nature and force. This individual nature, however, is itself universal insofar as it is able to permeate the most diverse, for mere empirical perception, heterogeneous being of consistent existences, saints best and, and by virtue of this penetration allow them to take part in one another. Thus, in mythical thinking, 
number serves as a basic primary form of relation, here this relation is never taken merely as such but appears as something immediately actual and efficacious, as a mythical object with its own attributes and forces. For logical thinking, number possesses a universal function, a general validity of signification, whereas for mythical thinking, it appears always as an original entity that communicates its being, vasen, and force to everything that is concerned with it. As a result, however, the development that the concept of number undergoes in the two different spheres of theoretical and mythical thinking clearly does not possess the same sense. In both, it is true, we can follow how the concept of number gradually expands over ever wider circles of sensation, intuition, and thinking and finally draws almost the whole domain of consciousness into its influence. We are confronted here, however, by two entirely different aims and basic spiritual attitudes. In the system of pure cognition, number, like space and time, primarily and essentially serves the purpose of reducing the concrete multiplicity of appearances to the abstract ideal unity of their grounds. Through the unity of number, the sensible is first formed into something intellectual and combined into a self-contained cosmos, into the unity of a purely intellectual state. All appearing being is referred to number and expressed in it, because this relation and this reduction to number proves to be the only way to establish a thoroughgoing and unequivocal lawfulness between appearances. Ultimately, everything that cognition, that science, comprehends under the name of nature is constructed out of purely numerical elements, elementae, and determinations that serve here as the actual intermediary by which to recast all merely accidental existence into the form of thinking, into the form of lawful necessity. In mythical thinking, number also emerges as such as a medium of spiritualization, here, however, the process of this spiritualization takes another direction. In scientific thinking, number appears as the great instrument of reasoning, but Grundung, whereas in mythical thinking, it appears as a vehicle of religious sense bestowing. In the one case, it serves to prepare and develop, reefed summation, all empirical existing, exister and, to be taken up into a world of purely ideal interconnections and purely ideal laws in the other, it serves to draw all existing, descend, everything that is immediately given, everything that is merely profane, into the mythical religious process of hallowing. For whatever in any way partakes of number, whatever reveals in itself the gestalt and force of a definite number, no longer leads for the mythical religious consciousness to a mere irrelevant existence but has precisely thereby obtained an entirely new significance. Not only number as a whole but each individual number is, as it were, shrouded by an air of magic, which communicates itself to everything connected with it, however seemingly irrelevant. We feel this awe of the sacred surrounding number down to the lowest sphere of mythical thinking down to the domain of the magical view of the world and the most primitive magical practice all magic is in large part number magic. In the development of theoretical science, too, the transition from the magical to the mathematical apprehension of number was affected only gradually. Just as astronomy goes back to astrology and chemistry to alchemy, so too do arithmetic and algebra go back to an older magical form of number theory, to a science of Alma Kabbalah. And not only do the founders of actual theoretical mathematics, the Pythagoreans, stand between the two views of number, but we also encounter the same spiritually mixed and intermediary forms in the transition to modern times, in the era of the Renaissance. Side by side with Fermat and Descartes stand Giordano Bruno and Reuschlin, who in their own works treat the miraculous magical mythical charism of number. Often the two features are united in a single individual Cardanus, for example, represents a highly distinctive and historically interesting example of this twofold type of thinking. In all these cases, such a historical mixture of forms could not have come about if they did not also agree systematically and in terms of their content, in at least one characteristic motif, one basic spiritual tendency. Mythical number already stands at a spiritual turning point, it, too, strives to escape from the narrowness and restraint of the immediate, of the sensible tangible view of the world to a freer, more universal total outlook. Spirit, however, is not able to grasp and penetrate the new universality that arises here as its own creation but encounters it as a foreign, demonic power. Thus, Philolaus still seeks the nature of number and its force not only in all human works and words, not only in every kind of artistic ability and in music, but also in demonic and divine things, so that it becomes, like Plato's Eros, the great intermediary, by which the earthly and divine, the mortal and immortal, commune, for Charon, with each other and are combined into the unity of a world order. To trace this process of the deification, virginal achung, and hallowing of number in detail and to seek to uncover its individual intellectual and religious motives would seem, to be sure, a futile undertaking. For at first sight, 
Only the free play of the mythical fantasy that mocks every fixed rule prevails here. It would seem futile to inquire further after a principle of selection, after the ground to which the individual numbers owe their particular character of holiness, because every number without deference can become an object of mythical apprehension and veneration. When we run through the series of elementary numbers, we encounter at every step such a mythical religious hypostasis. For one, two, and three, we find everywhere examples of such hypostases, not only in the thinking of primitive peoples but also in the great cultural religions. The problem of the unity that emerges from itself, that becomes another, and second, in order then to be ultimately reunited with itself in a third nature, this problem must belong to the common spiritual heritage of humanity. While it emerges in this purely intellectual framing only in the speculative philosophy of religion, the general distribution of the idea of a triune God shows that this idea must be based on some ultimate, concrete foundations of feeling, to which it points back and from which it continually arises anew. The first three numbers are joined by the four, whose general religious cosmic significance is attested above all in the religions of North America. The same dignity is accorded in still higher degree to the number seven, which radiates in all directions from the oldest culture sites of humanity in Mesopotamia, which, however, comes to us as a specifically sacred number even where no influence from the Babylonian Assyrian religion and culture is demonstrable or probable. This basic mystical religious character still adheres to it in Greek philosophy in a fragment attributed to Philolaus, it is likened to the motherless virgin Athene as leader and ruler of all things, as God, united, eternal, persistent, unmoving, the self-same, different from everything else. In the Christian Middle Ages, the Church Fathers thought of seven as fullness and perfection, as the truly universal and absolute number septenarius numerus est perfectionis. In this respect, however, from an early period the number nine vied with it in Greek myths and cults, as well as in the sphere of Germanic beliefs, in Attic intervals and weeks occupy a place similar to that of the Hebdomadic periods. If we further consider that this basic character, which is suited to simple numbers, is transmitted from them to the composite numbers, that therefore not only three, seven, nine, and twelve but their products as well have particular mythical religious forces, then in the end there clearly remains hardly any numerical determination that cannot be drawn into this circle of intuition and this process of hallowing. Here the mythical configuring drive, just tall tongue strieb, opens an unlimited latitude, spielraum, in which it can freely indulge itself independently of any fixed logical norm and of any regard for the laws of objective experience. If number becomes for science a criterion of truth, a condition and preparation for all strictly rational cognition, then here it imprints on everything that enters its sphere and is touched and permeated by it a character of mystery, a mystery whose depth reason can no longer fathom. And yet as in other domains of mythical thinking, a determinate spiritual route can be recognized and designated in the seemingly impenetrable maze of the mythical mystical doctrines of number. Here too, though the unlimited drive of mere association prevails, the main and secondary paths of configuration separate themselves here too, we can gradually discern certain typical guidelines by which the process of the hallowing of number and thus of the hallowing of the world is determined. We already possess a solid clue for the cognition of these guidelines if we look back at the development that the concept of number undergoes in linguistic thinking. Given what was shown there, namely that all spiritual apprehension and designation of numerical relationships always goes back to a concrete intuitive foundation and that spatial, temporal, and personal intuition make up the principal spheres in which the consciousness of number and its significance developed, we may presume a similar organization in the progress of the mythical doctrine of number. If we trace the emotional value that is connected to the individual sacred numbers back to its origins and attempt to labor its true roots, it almost appears to always be grounded in the particular nature of the mythical feeling of space, time, or the eye. As far as space is concerned, not only are the individual regions and directions as such imbued in the mythical apprehension with determinate religious accents of value, but such accents also adhere to the totality of these directions, to the whole in which they are comprehended as belonging. Where north, south, east, and west are distinguished as the cardinal points of the world, this specific difference usually becomes the model and prototype, forebuilt, for the organizing of all the contents and events of the world. Four now becomes the authentic sacred number this interconnection of every particular being with the basic form, grunt form, of the universe is expressed in it. Whatever exhibits a factual fourfold organization, whether it is an immediately known reality that imposes itself on sensible observation, or whether it is conditioned in a purely ideal way by a determinate mode of mythical apperception, seems attached, as though by inner magical bonds, to certain parts of space. What takes place here for mythical thinking is not only immediated transference. Rather, 
it beholds with intuitive evidence the one in the other, in every particular fornus, via hide, it seizes the universal form of the cosmic fornus. We encounter the four in this function not only in most North American religions but also in Chinese thinking. In the Qin essay system, a specific season, color, element, animal species, organ of the human body, etc. corresponds to each one of the directions of the heavens, west, south, east, and north, so that ultimately, by virtue of this relation, the entire diversity of existence is in some way distributed and, as it were, fixated and established in a particular intuitive precinct. We find this symbolism of the number four among the Cherokees, where likewise each of the four cardinal points of the world is associated with a particular color, a particular performance, or a particular state of fortune, such as victory or defeat, sickness or death. And, in accordance with its distinctive particular nature, mythical thinking cannot content itself with apprehending all these relations and correlations as such, with considering them, as it were, in abstracto, but rather, it must, in order to affirm their truth, combine them into an intuitive figure, gestalt and sensibly and pictorially, build haft, set them forth in this form. Thus, the veneration of the four is expressed in the veneration of the form of the cross, which is attested as one of the oldest religious symbols. We can follow a common basic tendency of all religious thinking from the earliest forms of the four cross, from the form of the swastika, down to the medieval speculatine that infuses the whole content, gehalt, of the Christian doctrine into the intuition of the cross. When in the Middle Ages, the four ends of the cross were identified with the four zones of the regions of the heavens or those of the world, when the east, west, north, and south were equated with certain phases of the Christian story of salvation, it was a revival of certain originary cosmic religious motifs. Like the veneration of the number four, that of the numbers five and seven can develop from the cult of the cardinal points along with the four principal directions, east, west, north, and south, the middle of the world is counted as the place, plots, in which the tribe or people has its appointed seat, and the above and below, the zenith and nadir, are also accorded a particular mythical religious distinction. Such a spatial numerical organization gives rise, among the Zunis, for example, to that form of Sepshuarchy that theoretically and practically determines the entire worldview in terms of its intellectual and sociological scope. And elsewhere as well, the magical mythical significance of the number seven reveals an interconnection with certain basic cosmic phenomena and representations. It is, however, at once evident how the mythical feeling of space is inseparably bound up here with the mythical feeling of time and how, together, the two form the starting point for the mythical apprehension of number. As we have seen, a basic characteristic of the mythical feeling of time is that in it the elements of subjective and objective still lie undifferentiated alongside one another and merge into each other. There exists here only the distinctive feeling of phases, that sensation of the division of events as such without that these events split into two different halves, into an inside and outside. Hence, mythical time is always thought of at once as the time of the occurrences of nature and as the time of the occurrences of human life it is a biological cosmic time. And this duality is imparted to the mythical apprehension of number. Every mythical number points back to a certain circle of objective intuition, in which it is rooted and from which it continuously draws new force. This objectivity, G. Jun Standlick, however, is never something only factual tangible. Sagelich Dinglich, rather, it is filled with an inner life of its own that moves in specific rhythms. This rhythmicity continues in all particular becoming, it is able to play out in very different forms and in widely separated points of the mythical space of the world. Above all, this universal period of the cosmic events exhibits itself in the phases of the moon. The moon, as its very name in most Indo-European languages and in the Semitic and Hamitic languages indicates, appears everywhere as the true divider and measurer, messer knife, of time. It is, however, still more than the soul becoming in nature and in human existence is not only correlated, pseudordinate, with it in some way but also goes back to it as its origin, as a qualitatively originary ground. This ancient, uralt, mythical intuition has been preserved and continued right up into modern biological theories, and with this, the number seven arrives at its universal significance as the ruler over all life. Only in relatively late times, in the era of Greco-Roman astrology, does the veneration of the number seven appear linked with the cult of the seven planets, whereas originally, the seven-day periods and weeks exhibited no such relation but followed from the natural and, one might almost say, spontaneous division of the 28-day month into four parts. The foundation for the hallowing of the number seven and for its apprehension as a full number, as the number of fullness and wholeness, proves to be an entirely determinate intuitive sphere, which, however, becomes truly effective only when, 
by virtue of the form and particular nature of mythical, structural thinking, it is progressively expanded until it ultimately extends over all being and all events. In this sense, for example, we encounter the number seven as the true member of cosmic structure in the pseudo-Hippocratic book on the number seven it works and weaves the seven spheres of the all it determines the number of the winds, the seasons, and the periods of life upon it is based the natural organization of the organs of the human body, as well as the distribution of forces in the human soul. From Greek medicine, the belief in the vital force of the number seven passed into medieval and modern medicine every seventh year used to be regarded as a climacteric year that brings with it a decisive turn in the mixture of the vital humors, in the temperament of body and soul. However, if, in the cases thus far considered, a specific objective circle of intuition has proven to be the starting point and foundation for the hallowing of specific numbers, then we are reminded by looking back at the linguistic expression of numerical relationships that this subjective element is not the sole determinant. It is not exclusively through the perception of external things or the observation of course of external events that the consciousness of number matures, rather, one of its strongest roots is found in that basic differentiation that leads to subjective personal existence, to the relationship between I, you, and he. In the example of the duel and trial, as well as the forms of the inclusive and exclusive plural, language shows how the numbers 2 and 3, in particular, refer back to this sphere and are thereby determined in their expression and our observations in the domain of mythical thinking are completely analogous. In Usner's work on threeness, in which he attempts to lay the ground for a mythical theory of number, he has argued that there are two groups of typical numbers, one of which goes back to the apprehension and organization of time, while the other, to which particularly two and three belong, has a different origin. If, in addition, he sees the holiness of three and its specifically mystical character as being grounded in the fact that in times of primitive culture three constituted the end of the numerical series and was, therefore, an express scion of perfection, of absolute totality, totalitat, as such, then grave objections can of course already be raised against this theory from an ethnological standpoint, because in the final analysis, the connection it assumes between the concept of the trial and that of infinity is purely intellectual and speculative. However, the separation between two different groups of sacred numbers and the indication of their different spiritual religious sources nevertheless persists. As concerns the three, in particular, the history of the basic representations of religion suggests that the purely intelligible significance, which it almost everywhere achieves in the development of religious speculation, is only a late and indirect consequence following from a relationship of a different kind, which one might call naive. If the philosophy of religion immerses itself in the mysteries of the Divine Trinity, if it determines this unity through the triad of Father, Son, and Spirit, then the history of religion teaches that this triad itself was originally grasped and felt. Very concretely, that definite natural forms of human life find their expression in it. Often the natural triad of Father, Mother, and Child still glimmers underneath the thin veneer of the speculative triad of Father, Son, and Spirit. In particular, this basic intuition is still clearly discernible in the configuration of the Divine Trinity in the sphere of Semitic religions. All these examples confirm the distinctive magic of number, which it demonstrates as being a basic power in the realm of spirit and in the construction of the self-consciousness of humanity. It proves itself to be the means of binding by which the different basic forces of consciousness are joined together, that locks together the spheres of sensation, intuition, and feeling into a unity. Number thus fulfills the function that the Pythagoreans awarded to harmony. It is an agreement of motley things and a miscellaneously tuned harmony. It effectively acts as the magic bond that not so much connects things together but rather brings them into harmony within the soul. Part 3. Myth is Life, Form. The Discovery and Determination of Subjective Reality in Mythical Consciousness. I. The I and the Soul. It would not be possible to speak of a discovery of subjective reality and myth if the generally held view that the eye concept and soul concept formed the beginning of all mythical thinking were justified. Ever since Tyler advocated for this theory of the animistic origin of myth formation in his seminal work, it seems to have been increasingly accepted as the secure empirical core and rule of research in mythology. Even Wundt's ethnic psychology is entirely grounded in this view he also sees all mythical concepts and representations only as variants of the representation of the soul which thus form not so much a specific goal as rather the given presupposition of the mythical apprehension of the world. And even the reaction against this view, which was initiated by the so-called pre-animistic theories, has only added to the factual inventory, be stand, of the mythical world some new features that had remained unnoticed in the animistic interpretation without alternating the principle of explanation as such. 
for although the concept of the soul and personality is not considered to be the necessary condition and true constituent of a certain originera strata of mythical thinking and representing, particularly of the most primitive magical usages, the importance of this concept is in general recognized for all the contents and forms of mythical thinking that go beyond this primitive originera strata. Even if we should accept the pre-animistic variations of Tyler's theory, myth would remain, in its general structure and its whole function, nothing other than an attempt to fold the objective world of events, as it were, back into the subjective world and to interpret it according to the categories of the subjective world. Against this uncontested presupposition, which still remains generally unopposed among ethnologists and ethnopsychologists, a grave objection, however, arises as soon as we consider it in the context of our basic general problem. For a glance at the development of each individual symbolic form shows us everywhere that their essential achievement does not consist in the fact that they reproduce the outward world in the inward world or that they simply project a finished inner world outward but rather that the two elements of inside and outside, a by and reality, first receive their determination and their mutual demarcation in and through their mediation. If each of these forms includes in itself a spiritual confrontation, outside Andersetzung, of the I with reality, then this is by no means to be understood in the sense that the two, the I and reality, are to be taken as given quantities, as finished, existing for themselves as halves of being that are only subsequently taken up together into a whole. Rather, the crucial achievement of each symbolic form lies precisely in the fact that it does not have the boundary between I and reality as fixed once and for all but rather first posits this boundary itself, and each basic form posits it differently. Already from these general systematic considerations, we may suspect that myth, too, does not begin from a finished concept of the eye or the soul as if from a fixed picture, built, of objective being and events, but rather that to acquire both it has had to form them from out of itself. Indeed, the phenomenology of mythical consciousness provides thoroughgoing confirmation of this systematic assumption. The further we extend the framework, Raman, of this phenomenology and the deeper we penetrate its basic and originera strata, the clearer it becomes that for myth the concept of the soul is no finished and fixed pattern, scoblone into which it arranges everything that comes into its grasp but rather that for myth the concept of the soul signifies an element, element, that is fluid and malleable, versatile and open to configuration, that changes, as it were, in its hands as it makes use of it. If metaphysics and rational psychology operate with the concept of the soul as a given possession, if they take it as a substance with determinate immutable properties, mythical consciousness exhibits precisely the opposite behavior. For myth, None of the properties and peculiarities that metaphysics tends to regard as analytical characteristic traits of the concept of soul, neither its unity nor its indivisibility, neither its immateriality nor its permanence, proves to be linked with it and necessary for it from the very beginning. All of these only designate certain elements that must be acquired very gradually in the process of mythical representing and thinking, and the acquisition of which passes through very different phases. In this sense, the concept of the soul may, with equal justice, be designated as the end as well as the beginning of mythical thinking. The content, Gehalt, of this concept and its spiritual scope lie precisely in its being at once beginning and end. It leads us in a continuous progress, in an uninterrupted interconnection of configurations from one extreme of mythical consciousness to the other it appears at once as that which is most immediate and that which is most mediated. In the beginnings of mythical thinking, the soul can appear as a thing, as familiar and close enough to touch as any physical existence. In this thingliness, However, a transmutation takes place by which it gradually accrues a richer spiritual meaning content, Bedutungsgehalt, until finally the soul becomes the distinctive principle of spirituality as such. Not immediately but only gradually and by all manner of detours does the new category of the I, the thought of the person and of personality, grow from the mythical category of the soul however, the distinctive content, Gehalt, of this thought is fully revealed only through the resistance that it must overcome. Admittedly, in this process, it is not a question of a mere reflective process, it is not a result that is obtained from pure contemplation. For the human, the spiritual organization of reality begins not from mere contemplating but from doing, ton. Here a separation begins to take place between the circles of the subjective and objective, between the world of the eye and the world of things. The further the consciousness of doing progresses, the more sharply this separation is expressed, the more clearly the boundaries between the eye and the nodi emerge. Even the mythical world of representation, especially in its first and most immediate forms, appears closely bound up with the world of effective action. Here lies the core of the magical view of the world, which is completely saturated. With this atmosphere of effective action, 
which is indeed itself no thing more than a translation and transposition of the world of subjective emotions and drives into a sensible, objective existence. The first energy by which the human as a unique and independent being opposes things is the force of desire. In desire, the human no longer simply accepts the world, no longer accepts the reality of things but constructs them within itself, for itself. The first, most primitive consciousness of the faculty of configuration of being stirs in desire. And in that this consciousness permeates all inner as well as outer intuition, all being now appears as such subjected to it. There is no existence and no event that does not ultimately submit to the omnipotence, almacht, of thought and the omnipotence of desire. Thus, in the magical view of the world, the eye exerts an almost unlimited dominance over reality it takes all reality back into itself. However, precisely this immediate positive genome, in the insetsung identification, now includes in itself a distinctive dialectic in which the original relationship is reversed. The enhanced feeling of self that seems to express itself in the magical view of the world indicates, on the other hand, that at this stage there is as yet no true self. Through the magical omnipotence, uljwalt, of the will, the eye seeks to seize things and make them compliant however, precisely in this attempt it shows itself still totally dominated, totally possessed, by things. Even its supposed doing now becomes a source of being acted on. Leiden suffering, all its ideal powers, krefta, the power of words and language, for example, are here also seen in the form of demonic beings, vazen, and projected outward is something foreign to the eye thus, the expression of the eye that is acquired here, and also the first magical mythical concept of the soul, are completely bound to this intuition. The soul itself also appears as a demonic power externally determining and possessing the lived body of the person, and hence determining and possessing the individual themselves with all their vital functions. Thus, precisely the increased intensity of the eye feeling and the resulting hypertrophy of effective action produce only a simulacrum of effective action. For all true freedom of effective action presupposes an inner bond, presupposes a recognition of certain objective boundaries of effective action. The eye comes to itself only in that it posits, zetsen, these boundaries for itself, in that it, therefore, successively restricts the unconditional causality that it initially attributed toward the world of things in that emotion and will no longer seek to grasp the desired object immediately and draw it into their sphere but rather interpolate always more and ever more clearly apprehend intermediary links between the sheer desire and its goal, do objects on the one side and the eye on the other acquire an independent intrinsic value the determination of both is achieved only by this form of mediation. Wherever this mediation is lacking, however, a distinctive indifference continues to adhere to the representation of effective action itself. All being and events, as a whole and individually, appear shot through with magical mythical effects however, in the intuition of effective action, there is still no divorce between fundamentally different factors of effective action, still no separation between material and spiritual, between physical and psychic. There is only a single lone divided sphere of effect, within which a continuous transition, a steady exchange, takes place between the two circles that we usually distinguish as the world of the soul and the world of material stuff. This indifference itself emerges most clearly just where the representation of effective action becomes the general all-encompassing category of the world concept and the explanation of the world. The Mana of the Polynesians, the Manitou of the Algonquin tribes of North America, the Orenda of the Iroquois, etc. have as their common core the concept and intuition of an enhanced effectiveness as such that goes beyond all mere natural boundaries, without there being any sharp demarcatai in between the individual potencies of this effective action, between its modes and forms. Mana is attributed equally to mere things and to certain persons, to spiritual and material, to animate and inanimate entities. Thus, when the adherents of pure animism as well as their opponents, the pre-animists, invoked the mana representation in support of their view, it was rightly argued against them that the word mana in itself is neither a pre-animistic nor an animistic expression, but utterly neutral toward these theories. Mana is powerful, effective, and productive without the specific determination of being conscious, soulish, sealish, or personal in the restricted sense. Elsewhere as well, we find without exception that as we return to the more primitive stage of mythical thinking, the sharpness, clarity, and the determinacy of subjective personal existence diminishes. Primitive thinking is simply characterized by the distinctive fluidity and fleetingness that the intuition and concept of personal existence still possess in it. There is here still no soul as an independent unitary substance detached from the corporeal rather, the soul is nothing other than life itself to which the body is imminently and necessarily bound. In accord dance with the particular nature of complex mythical thinking, this imminence reveals no sharp spatial determination and delimitation. Just as life, as an undivided whole, 
dwells in the whole of the lived body, so too is it present in each of its parts. Not only are certain vital organs, such as the heart, the diaphragm, and the kidneys, regarded in a sense as the seed of life, but each and every component of the body, even if it no longer stands in any organic combination with the totality of the lived body, can be thought of as a bearer of the life inherent in it. A person's spittle, their excrement, their nails, and cuttings of their hair and remain in this sense bearers of life and the soul every effect that is exerted on them immediately affects and endangers the whole of life. Once again, we see here the reversal, namely that the soul, in that it is seemingly accorded with a forceful power over physical beings and events, is in truth only even more captivated by material being and tightly interwoven in its fate. Even the phenomenon of death does not dissolve this interconnection. The way death is grasped in original mythical thinking in no way signifies a sharp divorce, a separation of the soul from the lived body. It has already been shown that such a separating boundary, such a determinate opposition, and again set song, of the conditions under which life and death stand, is contrary to the mythical mode of thinking, that for myth the boundary between the two continues to be a thoroughly fluid one. Thus, even death is for myth never an annihilation of existence but only a transition into another form of existence, and that, at the basic and or genera strata of mythical thinking, this form itself can be thought of only in thoroughgoing sensible concretion. Even the dead still is, and this being can be only physically apprehended and only physically delineated. Even if, compared to the living, the dead appear as a forceless shadow, this shadow itself still has full reality it resembles the dead not only in shape, gestalt, and feature but also in its sensible and physical needs. In the Iliad, the shadow of Patroclus appears to Achilles as like the man to the life, every feature, the same towel build and the fine eyes and voice and the very robes that used to clothe his body. Likewise, in Egyptian monuments, a person's ka, which survives them at their death, is formed as their physical doppelganger, which is likely to be confused with them. If, therefore, the soul is an image, an idolon, seems on the one hand to have cast off all coarse materiality, if it seems woven of more delicate stuff than the world of material things, on the other hand, from the standpoint of mythical thinking, the image itself is never purely ideal but is endowed with a certain real being and with real forces of effective action. Even the shadow has, therefore, a kind of physical reality and formation, for Mung. According to the representation of the Huron, the soul has a head and body, arms and legs in short, it is in every way an exact imitation of the actual lived body and its organization. Often all intuitive physical relationships appear in it as if preserved in a miniature and only reduced into a smaller space. If, as among the Malay, the soul is thought of in the form of a little man living inside the lived body, then this basic sensible naive representation is sometimes preserved in a sphere in which the transition to a totally different, purely spiritual intuition of the eye has already taken place. In the midst of the speculations of the Upanishad on the pure being, Vazan, of the self, the Atman, the soul, is once again designated as the Purusha, the man the size of a thumb the Purusha, self, of the size of a thumb, resides in the middle of the body as the lord of the past and the future he who knows him, fears no more. In all this, we see the same endeavor that aims to transpose the soul's image and shadow in another dimension of being, as it were also, on the other hand, precisely because it remains an image and a shadow, it possesses no independent features of its own but borrows everything it is and has from the material determinations of the body. Even the form of life, which is attributed to it beyond the existence, Dasein, of the body out there, signified nothing more than a simple continuation of its sensible earthly mode of existence, existence. The soul with its whole being, with its drives and needs, remains turned toward and rooted within the mate real world. For its survival, for dower, and well-being, it needs its physical possessions, which are sent along with it in the form of food and drink, clothes and weapons, household implements and ornaments. If in later forms of the soul cult, such gifts often appear as purely symbolic, they were, nevertheless, originally thought of as real and intended for the real use of the dead. Thus, likewise in this respect, the world beyond first appears as a mere doubling, a simple sensible duplicate of this world of the here and now. And even if an attempt is undertaken to distinguish the two by accentuating and describing in broad strokes their oppositions in regard to their content, this configuration by contrast is no less apparent than by similarity as the here and now and hereafter are grasped here only as different sides of one and the same intrinsically homogeneous sensible form of existence, existence form. And the social order of this world here continues to find its simple continuation in the order of the realm of the dead and the realm of ghosts, everyone takes up the same rank and performs the same occupation and function as in their earthly existence. Precisely where myth seems to go beyond the world of the immediately given, sensible empirical existence, existence, where it in principle transcends it, 
Myth holds fast to this world with clutching organs. In Egyptian texts, the preservation and survival, Fort Dower, of the soul appears bound to the fact that it regains the use of its individual sensible functions and sensible organs through the practice of magical means. The ceremony of the opening of the mouth, the opening of the ear, the nose, etc., by which the dead come into possession of sensation, into possession of seeing and hearing, smelling and tasting, are described and prescribed down to their smallest details. It has been said that these prescriptions are not so much the development, ausbildung, of a representation of the realm of the dead as they are a passionate protest against it. Thus, in Egyptian grave inscriptions, the departed is repeatedly designated as the living, just as in China, one speaks of coffins as living coffins, of the bodies of the dead as corpses buried alive. Even the eye of a person, even the unity of their self-consciousness and their feeling of self, is by no means constituted at this stage by the soul as an independent principle separated from the body. As long as a person lives, as long as he or she is present in concrete corporeity and sensible efficacy, their personality is included in the totality, Gesamtheit, of their existence, Dasein. Their material existence, existence, and their psychic functions and accomplishments, their feeling, their sensation, and there will form one in itself unseparated and undifferentiated whole. Accordingly, even after the separation between the two seems to have taken place and become visible, even after life, sensation, and perception, have all fled the body, the self of the person remains, as it were, split between the two elements, elemente, that formerly made up this whole. In Homer, when a psyche of the person has left them, the person themselves, i.e. their corpse, remains to be eaten by the dogs however, we also encounter another view and another linguistic usage, according to which their self lives on as a shadow and specter in Hades. Even the Vedic texts show the same characteristic vacillation sometimes it is the lived body of the dead and sometimes the soul that is thought of as the true he himself, the bearer of his personality. Attached to different but equally real forms of existence, this he cannot yet develop its purely ideal, its functional unity. If, therefore, in the theoretical working out and elaboration of the concept of the soul, the unity and simplicity of the soul becomes its essential, truly constitutive characteristic trait, then from it, originally, the opposite was rather the case. Even in the history of speculative thinking, we can follow how this unity and simplicity was established and secured only gradually even in Plato, the logical metaphysical motif of unity, the had to assert itself against its counter motif, the multiplicity of the parts of the soul. In myth, however, not only in its elementary forms but often also in relatively advanced formations, the motif of the splitting of the soul far outweighs that of the unity of the soul. According to Ellis, that she believe in two souls according to Mary Kingsley, the West Africans believe in four and according to Skeet, the Malay assume the existence of seven independent souls. Among the Yoruba, each individual possesses three souls, one dwelling in the head, the second in the stomach, and the third in the big toe. The same intuition can, however, also express itself in a far subtler form, an almost intellectually differentiated and intellectually systematized form. This systematic differentiation of individual souls and their functions seems to be most sharply developed in the Egyptian religion. Alongside the elements, elemente, that form the body, the flesh, bones, blood, muscles, are other, subtler, but still materially thought elements, elemente, from which the different souls of a person are constructed. Alongside the ka, which during a person's lifetime dwells in their lived body as their spiritual doppelganger and which does not forsake the person in death but remains with their corpse as a kind of guardian spirit, there consists a second soul, the ba, different in significance and in existential form, which flies at the moment of death from their body in the shape of a bird, which then wanders about freely in space and which only from time to time visits the ka and the corpse in the tomb. In Aditayan, however, the texts speak of a third soul, the ku, which is depicted as immutable indestructible, and immortal, whose significance seems consequently to come closest to our concept of spirit. An attempt is made here to determine the particular nature of soulish, sealish, being as opposed to corporeal being in three different ways however, this diversity of approaches proves that a specific principle of personality had not yet been elaborated. It was not only a negative element but also a highly important positive one whose neglect impeded for a long time the discovery of this principle. We find here not only an intellectual incapacity of mythical consciousness, but also a principle deeply rooted in the particularity of the mythical feeling of life itself. We have seen how this feeling of life is manifested primarily in a phase feeling, so that it takes the whole of life, not as an absolutely uniform and constant process but is interrupted by very specific seizures, by critical points and times. 
As these interruptions divide the continuum of life into sharply opposing delimited segments, it thus divides in the same way the unity of the self. The ideal unity of self-consciousness does not work here as an abstract principle that encompasses the manifold of contents and constitutes itself as the pure form of the I, rather, this formal synthesis finds in the contents themselves and in their concrete constitution very determinate limits. Where attention in the diversity of contents becomes so extreme that it turns into a complete polarity of opposition, the discrepancy sublates the interconnection of life and with it the unity of the self. It is a new self that begins with every characteristically new phase of life. Precisely in the primitive strata of mythical consciousness, we repeatedly encounter this basic intuition. Thus, it is a widespread idea that the transition from boyhood to manhood, which is generally regarded as a mythical occurrence with its own imprint in its own right and which is singled out from life as a whole by particular magical mythical usages, does not take place in the form of a development, of an evolution, but signifies the acquisition of a new I, a new soul. A tribe in the hinterland of Liberia is reported to believe that once a boy enters the sacred grove where the initiation takes place, he is killed by a wood spirit but then is awakened to new life and reanimated. Among the Kurnai of southeastern Australia, the boy in the initiation rite is cast into a kind of magical sleep, unlike ordinary sleep, from which he awakens as another, as a spitting image and a reincarnation of the totemic tribal progenitor and originary father, Irvator. In both these cases, we see that the I as a purely functional unity does not yet possess the force to encompass and join together that which appears detached and separated by certain critical phases and turning points. The immediate concrete feeling of life triumphs here over the abstract feeling of the I and the self, just as it does not only in the mythical representing but also in purely intuitive artistic natures. It is no accident that Dante depicted the live and experience of his love for Beatrice, through which he grew from youth to manhood, under the image of Avita Nuova and it is a constant feature in Gouda's life that he felt precisely the most significant phases in his inner development to be a sloughing off of passing and past states, then he felt his own poetic works to be nothing more than a cast-off snake skin abandoned along the way. For mythical thinking, the same process of splitting can take place successively as well as simultaneously just as mythically different souls can exist and dwell peacefully, simultaneously together with one another in one and the same person, in the same empirical individual. So too can the empirical succession of the events of life be distributed among wholly different subjects, each of which is not only mythically thought in the form of a particular being, Vazen, but also mythically felt and intuited as an immediately living demonic power that takes Posse's sign of the person. If the intuition of the eye itself is to be freed from this confinement, if the eye is to be apprehended in an ideal freedom and as an ideal unity, this can be achieved only by using a different approach. The decisive turn occurs when the accent of the soul concept shifts, when, Rather than being thought of as the mere bearer or cause, Urzika, of the life phenomena, the soul is taken rather as the subject of ethical consciousness. Only when the regard passes beyond the sphere of life to that of ethical doing, beyond the biological to the ethical sphere, does the unity of the I take precedence over the material or semi-material representation of the soul. This transformation can already be traced within the ambit of mythical thinking itself. The oldest historical evidence of this transition seems to be provided by the Egyptian pyramid texts, in which we can clearly follow how the new ethical form of the self that is gradually forged here passed through a series of preliminary stages in which the self was in every way still sensually grasped. It is the first, self-evident presupposition of Egyptian belief in the soul that any survival of the soul after death requires the continuance, for dower, of its material substratum. All care for the soul of the dead must therefore primarily imply the preservation of the mummy. The soul itself, however, is not only a corporeal soul but also an image soul and a shadow soul, and this element is also expressed in the form of its cult. From the material, concrete live and corporeity with which the veneration is originally concerned, religious thought and intuition rise more and more to the pure image form, bill form. The guarantee and security of the preservation of the self now comes to be seen in the statue, and in it above all, the statue now takes its place alongside the mummy as an equally effective instrument of immortality. It is from this basic religious intuition that the plastic arts, build and kunst, grow, in particularly the sculptures of the Egyptians. The tombs of the pharaohs, the pyramids, become the most powerful symbols of this basic spiritual tendency, which aims at the temporal eternity, the unlimited duration of the eye, which, however, can be attained and achieved only in architectural and plastic embodiment, in the intuitive visibility of space. We can, however, reach even further beyond this whole circle of visibility and visualization in that the ethical motif of the self expresses itself even more sharply in the belief and cult of the dead. The survival, for Dower, 
and fate of the soul no longer depend exclusively on the material aids that are given to the dead to take with them or on the performance of certain ritual prescriptions by which the soul is magically supported and furthered, but it is now bound to its ethical being and ethical doing. The favor of Osiris, the god of the dead, which in the early Egyptian texts is gained by magical practices, is replaced, in later texts, by the judgment, Greek, of Osiris over good and evil. In the narration contained in the Book of Gates, the dead appear before Osiris to confess their sins and justify themselves. Only after their heart has been weighed in the scales that stand before the God and has been found guiltless can. The dead enter the realm of the blessed. It is not their power and rank on earth, not their magical art, but their righteousness and freedom from guilt that now decide whether they will triumph in death. You awaken in beauty at daybreak, reads one of the texts, all evil has fallen away from you. You pass joyously through eternity with the praise of the God who is in you. Your heart is with you it does not leave you. Here the heart, the ethical self of the person, has become one with the God in them the heart of a person is their proper God. Thus, we see in typical clarity the progress from the mythical to the ethical self. The human rises from the level of magic to that of religion, from the fear of demons to the religious beliefs and the veneration of gods, and this apotheosis is not so much outward as inward. The human now apprehends not only the world but above all itself, in a new spiritual shape, gestalt. In the Persian beliefs about death, the soul lingers near the corpse for three days after it has been separated from the lived body on the fourth day, however, it goes to the place of judgment, to the bridge of Chinvit that passes over hell, from here, the soul of the righteous rises through good thoughts, good words, and good deeds to the place of light, while the soul of the unrighteous descends through the stairs of bad thoughts, words, and deeds into the house of the light. The mythical image appears here almost exclusively as a transparent veil behind which certain basic forms of ethical self-consciousness clearly and purely begin to emerge. In this way, the inversion from mythos to ethos has its prehistory within the phenomenology of mythical consciousness itself. At the lowest stage of primitive belief in the spirits and souls, seal, the soulish, sealish, being opposes the person as a mere thing, zaka, it is a foreign external power that is manifested in a person as a demonic forceful power to which a person succumbs unless they succeed in warding it off by magical means of protection. However, once the soul is grasped, not as a nature spirit but as a guardian spirit, the ground is prepared for a new relationship. For the guardian spirit stands, as it were, in a closer, more internal relation to the person, person, with whom it is joined. It not only dominates that person but protects and guides them it is no longer something purely external and foreign but something belonging specifically to the individual, individual something familiar and close to them. Thus, in the Roman belief of the soul, the lares are distinguished from the larvae, the latter are wandering phantoms that spread terror and evil, whereas the former are friendly spirits that bear a certain individual character, geprage, that are bound up with an individual person or individual place, to the house or the field, and that protect it from harmful influences. The representation of such personal guardian spirits seems to recur in the mythology of almost all peoples it has been found in the religions of the Greeks and Romans, in Native American religions as well as among the religions of the Finns and the Old Celts. True, the guardian spirit is not for the most part thought of as the eye of a person, as the subject of their inner life, but rather as something in itself still objective, which all the same dwells in the person that is thus spatially bound with them and hence can also be spatially separated from them. Among the Uatotos, for example, the guardian spirits seem to be the souls of various objects, objecte, such as animals that one has taken possession of by a forceful power, and they not only abide with their possessor but can be dispatched to perform some charge. And even where there exists the closest conceivable union between the guardian spirit and the person in whom it dwells, even where the guardian spirit determines the whole being and destiny of the person, it nevertheless appears as something existing for itself, something separated and strange, objizondits and absonderlishes. Thus, the Batak's view of the soul is grounded, for example, in the idea that a person before their birth, before their sensible lived corporeal existence, is chosen by their soul, their tiny, and that everything that concerns the person, all their fortune or misfortune, depends on this choice. Whatever the person encounters, whatever happens to them, does because their tiny willed it so. Their physical condition, their soulish, sealish, temperament, their fate and their character are wholly determined by the particular nature of their guardian spirit. This guardian spirit is, therefore, a kind of person in the person, but does not coincide with the personality, Berzunlischkeit, of the person, Mensch, and is often in conflict with the eye of the person it is a special being, Vazen, in the person, having its own will and its own desires, which it is able to gratify against the person's will and to the person's discomfiture. 
the motive of fear before one's own demon still outweighs the sense of intimacy, that inner necessary attachment and affiliation with the demon. From this first demonic form, however, the soul gradually begins to transition into another, more spiritual significance. Usner has followed this spiritual change of significance through the gradual change in linguistic signification that the terms, demon, and genius gradually undergo in Greek and Latin. The demon is at first a typical expression for what Usner designates as a momentary or special god. Any representational content, any object, insofar as it awakens mythical religious interest, be it ever so fleetingly, can be raised to the level of a distinct god, a demon. However, there is in addition another movement that aims to transform the outward demons into inward demons and the momentary and accidental gods into faithful beings, vazen, and figures. A person's demon constitutes not what outwardly befalls the person but what a person fundamentally is. It is given to the person from birth, to accompany them through life and to guide their desires and their doing. In the sharper form, Dirchbildung, that this basic idea assumes in the italic concept of genius, the genius appears, as the name already expresses, as the actual creator of the person and not only their physical but also their spiritual creator, the origin and expression of their personal, party to our nature. Thus, everything that possesses a truly spiritual form has such a genius. It is attributed not only to the individual, but also to the family and the household, the state, the people, and in fact generally every form of human community. Similarly, in the Germanic sphere of representations, the individual as well as the entire clan and the whole tribe possess their guardian spirit in the Nordic saga, the guardian spirit of the individual, the Mansfolgia, are differentiated from the guardians of the house, the Kaifolgia. It seems that this idea takes on sharper outlines and assumes a more significant role as the mythical religious. Thinking of this representation advances from the purely natural sphere to the intuition of a spiritual kingdom events. Thus, for example, in the Persian religion, which is oriented entirely toward the one basic opposition of good and evil, the Farvashi, the guardian spirits of good assume a central position in the hierarchical organization of the world. They are the ones who aided. The supreme ruler Ahura Mazda in the creation of the world and who in the end will decide in his favor the struggle that he is waging against the spirit of darkness and falsehoods. As Ahura Mazda proclaims to Zoroaster. Through their power and glory, I founded those heavens that they're above, shining shimmering, and encompassing the earth and enclosing all around like a home. Through their power and glory, I founded the God-created earth, the great and extensive, the bearers so much beauty, that bearers of the whole physical life, the living and the dead, and the high mountains, the pastures and the waters. Had not the awful Fravashi of the faithful given help unto me, those animals and humans of mine, of which there are such excellent kinds, would not subsist strength would belong to the falsehood, the dominion would belong to the falsehood, the material world would belong to the falsehood. Thus, the idea of the need for protection is extended to the supreme ruler, the true creator God according to the basic view of the Mazdian religion. As a prophetic ethical religion, the true creator God is what he is not so much through his own overwhelming physical power but rather by virtue of the sacred order whose executor he is. This eternal order of justice and truth is embodied in the Fravashi and by their mediation descends from the world of the invisible into the world of the visible. According to a passage in the Bundahish, Ormazd gave the guardian spirits, when they were still disembodied pure spirits, the choice of remaining in this state of pure bliss or of being provided with bodies and supporting him in his battle against Harman. They elected the latter, they entered into the material world to free it from the power of the hostile principle, the power of evil. This idea is, in its basic tendency, reminiscent of the climax of speculative religious idealism. For the sensible and material appears here as a barrier to the intelligible. However, it is a barrier that is nonetheless necessary, because only through it, only by progressively overcoming it, can the power of the spiritual be confirmed and visibly manifested. Thus, the sphere of the spiritual coincides here with the sphere of the good evil has no fravashi. We can recognize in this development how the mythical concept of the soul has been ethically sharpened and narrowed, how, however, at the same time, this very narrowing implies a wholly new concentration on a specifically spiritual content, gahalt. For the soul, as a merely biological principle of movement and life, no longer coincides with the spiritual principle in the human. An authority on Persian religion writes, if the concept of the Fravashi, most probably grew out of the vibrant Indo-European ancestor cult, it has, nevertheless, undergone a spiritualization noticeably different from the concept of the Manis, the Hindu or Roman worship the soul of the departed ancestors, the Mazdian reveres his own Fravashi and that of all other people, whether dead or alive or to be born in the future. Indeed, 
The new feeling of personality that breaks through here is combined with a new feeling of time that prevails in the religion of Zarathustra. Out of the ethical prophetic thought of the future grows a true discovery of individuality, of the personal self of the human being. Primitive mythical representations of the soul serve as a foundation for this discovery, but on this material, an entirely new form is ultimately imprinted. Thus, at this point, a development takes place within the sphere of mythical consciousness that is destined to lead it beyond its limits. This gradual detachment of the speculative thought of the self from its native mythical soil can still be followed in all its individual phases in the history of Greek philosophy. The Pythagorean theory of the soul is still penetrated through with an ancient, Uralt, mythical genetic constitution wrote has said that its central notions merely reflect phantasms of archaic popular psychology, in the improvement and reconfiguring execution that they underwent by theologians and hieratic purificatine and finally by the Orphics. And yet these features do not exhaust the essential particular nature of the Pythagorean psychology, which is rooted in the same element that gives the Pythagorean world concept its specific imprint, Geprage. The soul is neither something material-like nor, despite all the representations of the mythical migration of souls, a mere breath or shadow rather, it is determined, in the depths of its being and in its ultimate ground, as harmony and number. In Plato's Phaedo, this basic view of the soul as the harmony of the lived body is developed by Simeus and Cebes, pupils of Philolaus. And with this, the soul thus first acquires a share in the thought of measure. As the expression of boundary and form as such, of the logical as well as the ethical order. Thus, number becomes the ruler over not only all cosmic being but also everything divine and demonic. And this theoretical overcoming of the mythical demonic world, this subordination of it to a certain law that expresses itself in number, now finds its supplement and correspondence through the development that the basic problem of ethics undergoes in Greek philosophy. From the principle, Zots, of Heraclitus that a demon is the sense of a person, this development continues to Democritus and Socrates. In this context, we can perhaps fully empathize with the particular sense and resonance that adhere to the Socratic daimon and the Socratic concept of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is based on the new form of knowledge that is worked out by Socrates. It is achieved when the soul ceases to be a mere natural potency, in that it apprehends itself as an ethical subject. Only now is the human free from fear of the unknown, from the fear of demons, because the human no longer feels that its self, its innermost being, is dominated by a dark mythical power but knows itself capable of molding this self from clear insight, through a principle of knowledge and will. Thus, in opposition to myth, a new consciousness of inner freedom awakens. At the primitive stages of animism, we encounter even today the view that a person is chosen by their soul demon. Among the batakes of Sumatra, before being embodied by the originary father of the gods, the soul is presented with different lifeless human beings, and with a choice that it makes, the fate of the person into which it will enter their party tool our nature and their being, Vazen, as well as the whole course of their life, is determined. This basic mythical motif is taken up by Plato in the tenth book of the Republic, however, the consequence that he derives from it is opposed to the mythical manner of thinking and feeling. Your demon or guardian spirit will not be assigned to you by lot you will choose your demon says Lycasus to the souls. Virtue knows no monster each will possess it to a greater or less degree, depending on whether he values or disdains it. The responsibility lies with the one who makes the choice the God has none. These words are spoken to the souls in the name of necessity, in the name of Ananke, when their daughter Lachesis appears. However, since mythical necessity is replaced by ethical necessity, its law coincides with that of the highest ethical freedom. In the thought of self-responsibility, the person is now allotted their true. I it is initially conquered and secured for them. However, the further development of the concept of the soul in Greek philosophy shows, of course, how difficult it was even for the philosophical consciousness to preserve the new content, Gehalt, that is embedded in this concept in its specific particular nature. If we trace the path from Plato to the Stoics and on to Neoplatonism, we can see how the old basic mythical intuition of the soul demon gradually recovered its preponderance among the works of Plotinus, there is a treatise that again speaks expressly of the demon that is allotted to us. Another aspect of the discovery of subjectivity, not so much ethical as rather purely theoretical, took place in mythical religious consciousness before it took place in theoretical philosophical consciousness. Even mythical religious consciousness advances to the thought of the eye that is itself no longer thing-like nor determined by analogy to anything tangible, an eye for which, rather, the objective is available, vorhanden, as mere appearance. The classical example of such a version of the eye concept that adheres to the boundary between mythical intuition and speculative contemplation is to be found in the development of Indian thinking. In the speculation of the Upanishads, the individual stages of the path traversed here are most clearly distinguished from one another. 
We see here how religious thought seeks ever new images, bildern, for the self, for the subject as intangible and incomprehensible, and how in the end it is able to determine this self only by dropping all these pictorial, bildlich, expressions as inadequate and unsuitable. The eye is the smallest and the largest the Atman in the heart is smaller than a grain of rice or millet and yet greater than the air, greater than the heavens, greater than all these worlds. It is bound neither to spatial barriers, to a here and there, nor to the law of temporality, to a coming and a being and a passing away, to a doing and a being acted upon rather, it is all-embracing and all-governing. For everything that is and everything that happens, it stands as a mere spectator, Sushaur, who is not involved in what it looks at, showed. In this act of pure vision, Shawan, it differs from everything that has objective form, that has figure, gestalt, and name. For it, there remains only the simple determination it is, without any closer specification and qualification. Thus, the self is opposed, and Gagenga sets, to everything no able, whisparan, and yet at the same time it is the heart of everything. Knowable, whisparan. Only whoever does not know, Erkenen, it knows, Kenan, it, who knows, Visan it knows, visen, it not. It is not known, erkenen, by the knowing, erkenend, and is known by the non-knowing, nichterkenend. All the intensity of the drive to knowing, visen, turns toward it, however, at the same time, the problem of knowing, visen, is contained in it. It is not things that are to be rendered visible through cognition, erkentness, but the self that should be seen, heard, understood, verstehen, and known, erkenen, dash who has seen it, heard it understood, verstanden, it, and known it knows, wissen, by it the whole world. And yet precisely this all-knowing, all-wise end, is itself unknowable, unwispar from where there is a duality there one sees another there one smells another there one hears another there one speaks to another there one thinks of another there one understands another. But, whereby would one know, erkennen, the one through whom one knows, erkennen, this all. Lo, whereby would one know, erkennen, the knower, erkenner? It cannot be stated more clearly that here a new certainty has opened up to spirit but that this certainty, as a principle of knowing, is comparable with none of its objects or formations, gabilda, and accordingly it remains inaccessible to all those modes and means of cognition that are decisive precisely for these objective formations, gabilda. And, yet it would be premature to infer an inner affinity, let alone an identity, between the I-concept of the Upanishads and that of modern philosophical idealism. For the method by which religious mysticism seeks to apprehend pure subjectivity and determine its content, Gehalt, is clearly distinguished from the critical analysis of knowledge and its inventory, beast and the general direction of the movement itself, the direction from the objective to the subjective, continues to exist, despite all differences in the ultimate aims of this movement, as a coherent element, moment. As great as the gulf is that separates the self of mythical religious consciousness from the eye of transcendental apperception, it is no greater than the distance within mythical consciousness between the first primitive representations of the soul demon and the advanced view in which the eye is apprehended with a new form of spirituality as the subject of willing and cognizing. 2. The forming emergence of the feeling of self from the mythical feeling of unity in life the community of the living and mythical class formation totemism. The opposition between subject and object. The differentiation of the eye from all tangible givenness and determinacy, is not the only form in which progress is made from a general, still undifferentiated life feeling to the concept and consciousness of the self. Whereas in the sphere of pure knowledge, the progress consists above all in separating the principle of knowledge from its content, of the cognizing from the cognized, mythical consciousness and religious feeling still harbor, Bergen, within themselves another, more fundamental opposition. The eye is not immediately oriented here toward the outside world rather, it refers originally to a personal existence and life similar to it. Subjectivity has as its correlate not some outward thing but rather a you or a he, from which on the one hand it distinguishes itself but with which on the other hand it groups itself. This you or he forms the true opposite pal that the eye requires in order to find and determine itself. For here again the individual feeling of self and individual self-consciousness stand not at the beginning but at the end of the development. In the earliest stages to which we can trace back this development, we find the feeling of self immediately fused with a certain mythical religious feeling of community. The eye feels and knows itself only insofar as it grasps itself as a member of a community, insofar as it sees itself joined together with others into the unity of a clan, a tribe, a social group. Only in and through this unity does it possess itself in each of its expressions, its own personal existence and life is bound, as though by invisible magic ties, to the life of the surrounding whole. 
This bond can loosen and dissolve only gradually only gradually can it lead to a nigh independent, self-standage kia, of the surrounding circles of life. Here again, myth not only accompanies this process but mediates and conditions that it forms one of its most significant and effective impetus. In that every new position the eye takes toward the community, its expression in mythical consciousness is found in that it is above all mythically objectified primarily in the form of a belief in souls. The development of the concept of the soul not only comes to presentation but becomes a spiritual instrument for the act of subjectivization, for the acquisition and apprehension of the individual self. Even an examination of the mere contents of mythical consciousness indicates that these contents are in no way exclusively or even predominantly derived from the sphere of an immediate intuition of nature. Even if we do not, in line with the monistic theory as it has been championed and developed principally by Herbert Spencer, regard ancestor belief and ancestor cult as the actual origin. Ursprung, of mythical thinking, a crucial involvement would seem to be detected wherever it has come in general to a clear formation of the representation of the soul, to a certain mythical theory of the homeland, Heimat, and origin, Herkunft, of the soul. Of the great cultural religions, it is especially the Chinese religion that is rooted in a belief in ancestry and that seems to have preserved its original features with the greatest purity. Where this belief dominates, the individual not only feels themselves bound to their tribal elders by the continuous process of procreation but knows themselves to be identical with them. The souls of the ancestors are not dead they exist and are to be reincarnated in their grandchildren, to renew themselves. In the newborn of the same gender. And even when this primary circle of mythical social intuition broadens, when the intuition of the family progresses to that of the tribe and from the intuition of the tribe to that of the nation, every single phase of this progress proves, as it were, to possess its mythical exponent. Every change in social consciousness is imprinted on the form and figure, gestalt, of the gods. Among the Greeks, the family gods of a family, the, are subordinated to the gods of the Phratrian tribe, the, and, and these in turn to the gods of the city-state and the universal national day ties. Thus, the state of the gods becomes a faithful picture, opbuilt, of the organism of social life. Yet Schelling by anticipation made a decisive argument against the attempt to derive the form and the content of mythical consciousness from the relevant empirical relationships of human society and in this way to make social being into the foundation, Grundlage, of religion, sociology into the foundation of a science of religion. In his lectures in the philosophy of mythology, Schelling notes. However, it seems to me that one thing would still remain presupposed namely, that mythology is able to emerge in or among one people. However, whether it is indeed at all thinkable that mythology could emerge from or among one people, a question that has yet to shock someone, appears to me very much in need of investigation. For, first of all, what is a people, or what makes it into a people? Undoubtedly, not the mere spatial coexistence of a greater or lesser number of physically similar individuals, but rather the community of consciousness between them. This community has only its immediate expression in the common language. But in what are we supposed to find this community itself, or its ground? if not in a common worldview and then this common worldview, in what can it could have been originally contained and given to a people, if not in its mythology? For this reason, it appears impossible that a mythology would be added to an already present people, whether it be through invention by individuals among it, or whether it be that it emerges by a collective, instinctual production. This state of affairs also appears impossible because it is unthinkable that a people, would be, say, without mythology. One would perhaps consider replying that a people is held together by the common industry of some sort of commerce, for example, agriculture, trade, or through common customary mores, zitten, legislation, government, and so forth. Certainly, all of this belongs to the concept of a people, but it seems almost unnecessary to recall how with all people's authoritative power, gewalt, legislation, customary mores, and even occupations are eminently connected with the representation of the gods. The question is, then, if all of this, which is being presupposed, and which is certainly given with one people, could be comprehended of without all the religious representations, which nowhere exist without mythology. Methodologically speaking, these words remain in force even if we replace people with some more primitive social community to derive the ideal form of religious consciousness from it as a truly original form, grunt form. For here again. We are compelled to reverse the view at a certain point mythical religious consciousness does not simply follow from the consistent factual existence of the form of the community but rather appears as one of the conditions of the communal structure, as one of the most important factors of the feeling and life of a community. Myth is one of those spiritual syntheses through which a connection between I and you is rendered possible, through which a definite unity and a certain opposition, 
a relationship of belonging togetherness, Zeus and George Kiev cohesiveness, solidarity, shared identity, and a relationship of tension, are created between the individual and the community. Indeed, we cannot understand the mythical and religious world in its true depth so long as we see in it only an expression, i.e. a mere replica, optrook imprint, of some already available divisions, whether they belong to the natural being or to the social being. In it, we must rather recognize a means of the crisis, a means of the great process of spiritual separation by virtue of which certain originary forms of social and individual consciousness first emerge from the chaos of the first indeterminate life feeling. In this process, the elements, elementae, of social existence as well as physical existence form only the material stuff that first receives its actual configuration through certain fundamental spiritual categories that are not located in it nor derivable from it. For here, it is above all characteristic of the tendency of myth that the boundary it draws between inside and outside is of an entirely different mode and quite differently placed from those drawn by the form of empirical causal cognition. The two elements of objective intuition and subjective feeling of the self and life enter here into a completely other relationship than is the case in the construction of theoretical cognition, altering by virtue of this spiritual accent all the basic measures of being and events. The various spheres and dimensions of the actual merge together and separate according to entirely different perspectives than the ones that are valid for the purely empirical order and organization of the world of perception, for the construction of pure experience and its object. The task of a specialized sociology of religion has today become a particular science with its own problems and methods, to describe in detail the interconnections between the form of religion and the form of society, Gesellschaft's form. We, for our part, are concerned only with the demonstration of the most general religious categories that prove effective not so much in this or that particular form of social organization, but rather in the constitution of the basic forms of community consciousness, Gemeinschaft's was sane, in general. The a priority of these categories may be asserted in no other way, shin, than that which critical idealism assumes and allows for the basic forms of cognition. Once again, there can be no question here of isolating a fixed sphere of religious representations that recur always and everywhere and produce a similar effect on the construction of community consciousness, Gemeinschaftsbe was sane, dash rather, we can only ascertain a certain direction of the question, a unity of perspective by which mythical religious intuition takes place in the organization of the world, including the organization of the community. This perspective can be more closely determined only by attending to the particular conditions of life under which the individual concrete community stands and develops however, this does not prevent us from recognizing that here again certain general and continuous spiritual motifs of forming, formung, are operating. First of all, the development of myth shows one thing very clearly even the most general form of the human consciousness of genus, even the way in which the human separates itself vis-a-vis -vis the totality of life forms so as to merge its genus into its own natural species, is not given from the beginning as a starting point of the mythical religious view of the world but is to be understood rather as a mediated product, as a result of this view of the world. For mythical religious consciousness, the boundaries of the species the human are not rigid but thoroughly fluid. Only through a progressive concentration, only through a gradual narrowing of the general life feeling in which myth originates, does it gradually arrive at the specifically human feeling of community. In the early stages of the mythical apprehension of the world, no sharp cut that separates the human from the totality of living, from the world of animals and plants, yet exists. Thus, particularly in the representational sphere of totemism, the kinship between human and animal and above all the kinship between a certain clan and its totem animal or plant, is taken by no means in a figurative but in a strictly literal sense. In their actions and performances, in their whole form and manner of life, human beings feel themselves in no way isolated from animals. Even today, the bushmen, when asked, cannot define a single point of difference between the human and the animal. Among the Malays, there is a belief that the tigers and elephants have a city of their own in the jungle, where they live in houses and behave in every respect like human beings, Vazen. No matter what specific explanation is adopted for the significance and emergence of totemism, the fact that such a mixing of species of the living and the complete flowing into one another of their natural and spiritual limits is possible in primitive mythical consciousness, which otherwise is characterized precisely by the sharpness with which it apprehends all sensible concrete differences, every difference, different zen, of perceptual shape, gestalt. This must be grounded in some general features of the logic of mythical thinking, in the form and tendency of its concept and class formation. Mythical class formation differs from the one that is employed in our empirical theoretical worldview, especially in that it lacks the actual intellectual instrument that the latter possesses and of which it constantly makes use. 
When empirical and rational cognition divides the being of things into species and classes, it employs the form of causal reasoning and inference as a vehicle and as a consistent guideline for consideration. Objects are grouped into genera and species, based not on their purely sensible similarities or differences but rather on their causal dependency. We order them not according to what they give to outward or inward perception but rather according to how they belong together in keeping with the rules of our causal thinking. Thus, for example, the whole Organization of our empirical perception of space is determined by these rules of thinking how we single out individual shapes, gestalten, in this space and set them off against one another and how we determine their position and distance from one another derived not from simple sensitian, from the material content of our visual and tactile impressions, but from the form of their causal coordination and connection, hence from acts of causal inference. And our classification and delimitation of the morphological forms, of the genera and species of the living, follows the same principle since it is essentially based on criteria that we extract from the rules of lineage and from our insight into the order and causal interconnection of procreation and birth. When we speak of a certain genus of living being, the underlying idea is that it is engendered according to certain natural laws the thought of the unity of the genus arises from how we can always bring it forth anew through a continuous series of procreations. Kant writes in his treatise on the different human races. In the animal kingdom the natural classification into genera and species is based on the common law of reproduction, and the unity of the genera is nothing other than a unity of the generative power, which is valid for a certain variety of animals. The scholastic classification begins from classes that divide the animals based on similarities, whereas the natural classification begins from roots, stemma, and classifies the animals according to kinships in respect to procreation. The former creates a school system for the memory the latter a natural system for the understanding the former only has the intention to bring the creatures under rubrics, the second to bring them under laws. Such a natural system for the understanding, such a reduction of the species to stocks into the physiological laws of procreation, is unknown to mythical thinking. For mythical thinking, procreation and birth are not purely natural occurrences subject to general and fixed rules but rather essentially magical occurrences. The act of copulation and the act of birth are not related to one another as cause and effect they are not two temporally discrete stages of a unitary causal connection. Among the Australian indigenous tribes, who seem to have preserved certain basic forms of totemism in their greatest purity, there is the belief that the conception of the women is connected with specific places, to certain totemic centers, where the ancestral spirits reside, if a woman lingers in these places, the ancestral spirit enters into her lived body in order to be reborn. Fraser has attempted to explain the source, Herkunft, and content of the whole totemic system on the basis of this basic representation. Regardless of whether such an explanation is admissible and adequate, the representation is such throws, however, a bright light on the form in which the formation of mythical concepts of genus and species is accomplished in general. In a sense, mythical intuition does not constitute a species by grasping together certain elements, elementae, into a unity based on their immediate sensible similarity or based on their mediated causal belonging togetherness, Zeus cement George Kiat, rather, their unity is of another, more original magical origin. That those elements, elementae, which is a link, gleed, belong to one and the same magical circle of efficacy, fulfill a certain magical function in common with each other consistently shows a tendency to fuse, to become mere forms of appearance of a mythical identity that is situated behind them. In our previous analysis of the mythical thought form, we attempted to explain the fusion by reference to the nature, vasen, of this thought form itself. Whereas the links, gleed, of a synthetic connection undertaken by theoretical thought are preserved as independent elements, elementae, within this connection, whereas theoretical thought correlates them while at the same time separating and distinguishing between them, in mythical thinking, whatever is related to one another, that which is united by a magical bond flows together into one undifferentiated figure, gestalt. Thus, that which is totally dissimilar from the standpoint of immediate perception or the most unlike from the standpoint of our rational concepts may appear as similar or alike as long as they enter as a link, gleed, into one and the same magical complex totality, gesamt complex. The application of the category of equality, gleich height, is not based on an agreement in any characteristic sensible traits or abstract conceptual elements but rather conditioned by the law of magi calendar connection, of magical sympathy. Whatever is united through this sympathy, which magically corresponds, zischensperken, supports, and fosters each other this merges into the unity of a magical genus. If we apply this principle of mythical concept formation to the relationship between the human and the animal, a path opens by which we may arrive at an understanding of at least the general basic form of totemism, 
if not of its special branches and forks. 4. From the beginning, an essential element, a main condition of the mythical positing of unity is realized in this relationship. The original relation between the human and the animal that is valid in primitive thinking is neither an exclusively practical one nor an empirical causal one rather, it is a purely magical relation. For the intuition of the primitive, animals seem more than any other beings, Vazen, to be endowed with special magical forces. Even Mohammedanism has been unable to eradicate the malaise deep rooted on reverence of animal supernatural, demonic forces are ascribed particularly to the larger ones, to the elephant, the tiger, the rhinoceros. For primitive, in which the formation of mythical concepts of genus and species is accomplished in general. In a sense, mythical intuition does not constitute a species by grasping together certain elements, elementae, into a unity based on their immediate sensible similarity or based on their mediated causal belonging togetherness, Zeus cement or Kiat, rather, their unity is of another, more original magical origin. That those elements, elementae, which is a link, gleed, belong to one and the same magical circle of efficacy, fulfill a certain magical function in common with each other consistently shows a tendency to fuse, to become mere forms of appearance of a mythical identity that is situated behind them. In our previous analysis of the mythical thought form, we attempted to explain the fusion by reference to the nature, vazen, of this thought form itself. Whereas the links, gleed, of a synthetic connection undertaken by theoretical thought are preserved as independent elements, elementae, within this connection, whereas theoretical thought correlates them while at the same time separating and distinguishing between them, in mythical thinking, whatever is related to one another, that which is united by a magical bond, flows together into one undifferentiated figure, gestalt. Thus, that which is totally dissimilar from the standpoint of immediate perception or the most unlike from the standpoint of our rational concepts may appear as similar or alike as long as they enter as a link, gleed, into one and the same magical complex totality, jessumt complex. The application of the category of equality, like height, is not based on an agreement in any characteristic sensible traits or abstract conceptual elements but rather conditioned by the law of magi calendar connection, of magical sympathy. Whatever is united through this sympathy, which magically corresponds, zishinsperken, supports, and fosters each other this merges into the unity of a magical genus. If we apply this principle of mythical concept formation to the relationship between the human and the animal, a path opens by which we may arrive at an understanding of at least the general basic form of totemism, if not of its special branches and forks. 4. From the beginning, an essential element, a main condition of the mythical positing of unity is realized in this relationship. The original relation between the human and the animal that is valid in primitive thinking is neither an exclusively practical one nor an empirical causal one rather, it is a purely magical relation. For the intuition of the primitive, animals seem more than any other beings, vazen, to be endowed with special magical forces. Even Mohammedanism has been unable to eradicate the malaise deep rooted on reverence of animal supernatural, demonic forces are ascribed particularly to the larger ones, to the elephant, the tiger, the rhinoceros. For primitive, the living must be delimited differently visibus one another than they are for empirical perception and empirical causal inquiry, this still does not solve the real problem presented by totemism. For the specific particular nature of the phenomena that we tend to group together under the general concept of totemism lies not in certain connections, certain mythical identities, being posited here between the human in general and certain animal species but rather in each particular group possessing its own particular totem animal to which it stands in a special relation, to which in the strict sense it appears related and belongs. Only this differentiation, together with its social consequences and companion phenomena, above all the principle of exogamy, the prohibition of marriage between members of the same totemic group, constitutes the basic form of totemism. We would seem to move closer to an understanding of this differentiation when we hold fast to the idea that how the intuition of objective being and the organization of this being into individual classes takes place for human beings can ultimately be traced back to differences in the mode and tendency of effective action. How this principle dominates the whole construction of the world of mythical intuition, how the world of mythical objects proves almost everywhere to be a mere objective project tie-in of human doing, will be considered later in detail. It suffices here to point out that the first germs of such a development is given already at the lowest stages of mythical thinking, even within the magical view of the world, since the magical forces on which all events depend do not extend equally to all spheres of being but may be distributed in very different ways. Even where the intuition of subjective doing has been so little individualized that the whole world seems filled with an indeterminate magical force, that the atmosphere seems charged, as it were, 
with spiritual electricity the individual subjects share in varying degrees in this general distributed, inherently impersonal force. In many individuals and in individual classes and states, the magical potency that permeates and dominates all that appears in a particular climax, in a more intense and more concentrated form, the power as such, the general mana, is broken apart into the particular forms into the mana of the warriors, the mana of the chieftains, the mana of priests or doctors. However, in addition to this quantitative particularization, in which the magical force still appears as a common and transferable possession, which is merely accumulated, as it were, in individual places and persons, a qualitative particularization can and must be added at an early stage. For, it is not possible to think of a community, however primitive, simply as a mere collective being, collective voice in, in which there is only an intuition of the being and effective action of the whole but, no consciousness of the effective action of the parts. Rather, early on there must be at least the first attempts at a differentiation, be it individual or a social and manifold division and stratification of human effectiveness must develop that is then also in some way expressed and reflected in mythical consciousness. Not every individual, not every association or group, is capable of everything, to each, rather, is reserved a particular ambit of effective action in which it must prove itself and beyond which it becomes powerless. Beginning from these boundaries of ability, the mythical intuition gradually determines the boundaries of being and its different classes and kinds. If an essential feature of pure cognition, of pure theory, is that for it the sphere of vision, Shawan, is broader than the sphere of effective action, then mythical intuition initially begins in the domain that it is magically practically facing and dominates. To it the words of Gouda's Prometheus apply for it, only the circle that it fills with its effectiveness is there is nothing above it and nothing below it. From this, it directly follows, however, and an interconnection of the elements of being must correspond to each particular mode and tendency of effective action. The human grasps itself together with all this in a unity of being, vazen, from which the human immediately undergoes effects and on which the human exerts immediately effects. Even the human attitude toward the animal must also be determined by and, in particular, be in accordance with this basic view. The hunter, the shepherd, and the farmer all feel connected with the animal in their immediate activity. They feel dependent on the animal and thus, in accordance with a basic rule that dominates all mythical concept formation, akin to it for each of them, however, this community extends to entirely different circles of life, to different animal genera and species. Based on this, we can perhaps understand how the original, inherently indeterminate unity of the life feeling, through which the human feels an equal bond with all living things, gradually transitions into that more specialized relation that binds particular groups of human beings with certain animal classes. And indeed, those totemic systems that have been most accurately observed and studied offer numerous indications that originally the choice of a totem animal was by no means purely outward and accidental, that the totem does not signify a mere heraldry, but rather, in it a specific life and spiritual attitude is depicted and objectified. Even contemporary relationships, which clearly cannot be regarded as primitive but in which the original picture, built, of totemism has been so covered over by a wealth of accidental determinations that it has become unrecognizable, often still allow this basic feature to stand out clearly. In the mythical sociological worldview of the Zufii, the totemic organization largely coincides with the caste organization, so that warriors, hunters, farmers, and shamans all belong to a particular group designated by specific totem animals. And sometimes the relationship between the clan itself and its totem animal is so close that it is difficult to decide whether the individual clan chooses a certain totem animal according to its own particular nature or whether it has not rather shaped and formed itself according to the character of the animal warlike clans and occupations correspond to wild, powerful animals and peaceful clans and occupations to tame animals. It is as if the individual clan saw itself, as it were, objectively in its totem animal, as if it recognized its being. Vazen, its particular nature, its basic tendency of doing in the animal. And since in the highly developed totemic systems, the organization does not end with any individual social groups but extends concentrically to all being and all events, the entire universe is divided according to such affinities it is separated into sharply distinguished mythical genera and species. However sharp these separations may gradually become, for mythical consciousness and feeling, the idea of the unity of life is nevertheless preserved in undiminished strength in all of them. The dynamic and rhythm of life is felt as one and the same, no matter in which of the various objective configurations it reveals itself. It is the same not only in humans and animals but also in humans and the plant world. In the development of totemism, the animal and the plant are also never sharply separated. 
A clan holds the same veneration for its totem plant as it does for its totem animal the same taboos that prohibit the killing of the totem animal, or permit it only if certain conditions, certain magic ceremonies, are observed, apply equally to the eating of the totem plant. The descent of the human from a certain plant variety as well as the representation of the transformations of the human gestalt into the gestalt of plants forms a continuous motif of myth in the mythical tale. Once again, the outward form and the particular physical gestalt and the particular constitution can easily degenerate here into a mere mask, because from the beginning, the feeling of the community of all living things effaces all visible differences and all differences that can be postulated in analytical causal thinking, or it acknowledges them as merely incidental, as accidental differences. This feeling finds its strongest support in the particular nature of the mythical intuition of time, for which all life is set out into specific phases that always and everywhere recur in the same way. All these phases are not mere measures, according to which we artificially and arbitrarily section off events rather, they depict in them the nature, vazen, and basic constitution of life itself as a continuous qualitative unity. Thus, in becoming and growth, in the withering and decay of the plant world, the human not only finds a merely mediated and reflected expression of its own being but also immediately grasps and knows itself, experiences its own fate in them. From the winter, verily, a Vedic saying goes, the renaissance spring arises. For from the former the latter returns to existence. Thus, whoever knows this, verily returns to existence in this world. Of all the great cultural religions, it is in particular that of the Phoenician that has preserved this basic mythical feeling in the greatest purity and developed it most intensively. The idea of life has indeed been designated as the central idea of this religion, from which everything else emanates. Whereas the Balaam seem to be a relatively late formation in the Phoenician pantheon, whereas they seem to be not so much personifications of natural forces as rather the lords of the tribe and rulers of the ground, grund, and soil, Bodin, no such national tie originally pertained to the goddess Astarte. She represents, representiran, rather the mother goddess in general, who as such brings forth all life from her womb, who not only continuously bears anew the tribe but all physical natural existence. And beside her is the eternal genetrix, as the image of inexhaustible fertility, stands the image of the youthful god her son, who although subject to death frees himself from it over and over again and is resurrected into a new form of existence. This image of the dying and resurrected God not only runs through most of the historical religions but is also to be found in many variants, however, in essentially the same form even in the sphere of religious representations of primitive peoples. And everywhere the strongest cultic force originates from it. If we compare the vegetation cults of primitive peoples with the Babylonian cult of Tammuz, the Phrygian cult of Attis, and the Thracian cult of Dionysus, we find in them all one and the same basic line of development as well as one and the same source of specifically religious arousal. Nowhere here does the human stand still in the sheer intuition of the natural events rather, everywhere this intuition prompts the human to burst through the barrier that separates itself from the all of living things, to heighten the intensity of the life feeling to the point that the human liberates itself from its generic or individual particularity. This liberation is achieved, the identity with the originera source of all life is restored, in and through wild, orgiastic dances. It is not a question here of a mere mythical religious interpretation of the natural events but an immediate becoming one, Einzertung, with them, an authentic drama that the religious subject experiences in itself. The mythical narrative is for the most part only an outward reflect tie-in of this inner event, a light veil behind which this drama shines through. Thus, in the cult of Dionysus it is the form of the cult that, gives rise to the narrative of Dionysus Zagreus, who is overpowered by the Titans, torn to pieces and devoured, so that the one divine being, Gottswesen, disappears into the multiplicity of the shapes, Gestalten, of this world and into the plurality of human beings from the ashes of the Titans, whom Zeus shatters with his thunderbolt, arises the human race. The Egyptian Osiris cult is also grounded in the identity assumed between God and the human. Here the dead themselves become Osiris as true as Osiris lives. He too will live as true as Osiris did not die, he too will not die as true as Osiris has not been destroyed, he too will not be destroyed. For a highly developed metaphysical consciousness, the certainty of immortality is grounded above all in a sharp analytical separation that this consciousness carries out between body and soul, between the world of physical natural being and that of spirit to all being. Mythical consciousness, however, originally does not know of such a separation, of such a dualism. The certainty of the continua tie-in of life is rooted here in rather the reverse view it is continuously reinforced here by the intuition of nature as a cycle of new births. For everything that grows and becomes is related to and magically intervenous into everything else that grows and becomes. 
in the festive customs with which the human accompanies certain decisive phases of the year, in particular the descent of the sun from the autumnal equinox or its rising and the return of light and life, it is everywhere evident that this is no mere reflection, no analogical picturing, upbuilding, of an outward event but rather the human doing and the cosmic becoming are immediately interwoven here. No more than the complex mythical representation originally dissects being into a multiplicity of sharply differentiated biological species does it differentiate the various life-giving and generative forces of nature. It is one and the same vital force to which the growth of plants and the birth and growth of the human is entrusted. In the interconnection of the magical view of the world and in magical activity, Patetigung, the one can therefore always replace the other. Just as, in the well-known custom of the marriage bed in the field, the practice or presentation of the sexual act immediately results in the impregnation and fruitfulness of the earth, so, conversely, it is the mimetic presentation of the fertilization of the earth that enables souls to be reborn after death. The rain that fertilizes the ground of the earth has its corresponding magical counterpart in the human semen, the plow in the male member, the furrow in the female womb with the one, the other is magically posited and given. Accordingly, the representation of Mother Earth, or the correspondingly that of the earth as father, constitutes a core and originary thought that has repeatedly shown its power, from the beliefs of primitive P.O. plus down to the highest configurations of religious consciousness. The Uototos believe that during the season when there is no fruit, the fruit goes down to the Father under the earth the soul of the fruit and of plants goes to the dwelling place of the Father. That the earth is the common mother who brings human children to light and to whom they are given back after death to be resurrected to new life in the cycle, Christlauf of becoming is also a basic view of Greek belief that immediately expresses itself in the Choa Feroi of Aeschylus and Electra's prayer at the tomb of Agamemnon. Even in Plato's Menexenus, we still find the proposition that it is not the earth that imitates childbearing and birth but women who imitate the earth. For the original mythical intuition, however, there is here as such no before or after, no first or second, but only the complete and indissoluble interpenetration of the two processes. The mystery cults apply this general belief to the individual. Through the practice of sacramental acts that represent the primordial mystery of becoming, death, and the rising from the dead the initiate seeks to obtain assurance of rebirth. In the Isis cult, the creator of the green seeds is, for her worshippers, the mother of God, the great mother, the queen, who gives life to all human beings. And here, as in other mystery cults, it is expressly taught that the Mestes, initiates, before achieving their new spiritual being, their spiritual transfiguration must have gone through all the circles, chrysa, of nature and of physical life, that they must have been in all the elements, elemente, and formations, gabilda, of life, in the earth, the water, and the air and in the animals and the plants, that they must have accomplished a journey and transformation through the zones of heaven and all the animal shapes. Thus, even where the basic tendency is directed toward a sharp separation of the spiritual from the corporeal, toward a dualism between the lived body and the soul the original mythical feeling of unity continuously breaks through. At first, the fundamental categories of human communal life are taken and used both as natural as well as spiritual. In particular, the archetype, earthworm, of the human family, the triad of father, mother, and child, is immediately introduced, hinienlagen, and read into the being of nature. In the Vedic religion as in the Germanic religion, Mother Earth is opposed to Father Heaven. Even within the sphere of the Polynesian, the origin of the human is traced back to heaven and earth as its first progenitors. The triad of father, mother, and son is depicted in Egyptian religion in the figures of Osiris, Isis, and Horus it is found among almost all Semitic peoples, and its presence has been demonstrated among the Germanic peoples, the Italic and Celtic tribes, the Scythians, and the Mongols. In the representation of the Divine Trinity, Usner sees a basic category of mythical religious consciousness a deep-rooted form of intuition endowed with the forceful power of a natural drive. In the development of Christianity, the religious ethical apprehension of the divine filiation also developed only gradually from determinate concrete physical intuitions of this relationship here too, the hope of resurrection still appeals with predilection to the basic idea of the old primitive religion, that the pious individual is physically akin to God the Father, is the living corporeal child of God. Thus, in myth, all natural being expresses itself in the language of human social being, and all human social being expresses itself in the language of natural being. No reduction of the one element to the other is possible here, but rather, in their thoroughgoing correlation, both initially determine the distinctive structure and complexion of mythical consciousness. It is, therefore, hardly less one side if we explain the formation, Gabilda, of myth in purely sociological terms than if we explain it in purely naturalistic terms.
The most incisive and consistent attempt at such an explanation has been undertaken by the modern French school of sociologists, particularly by its founder, Emile Durkheim. Durkheim assumes that neither animism nor naturism can be the true root of religion if they were, this would simply mean that all religious life is without solid foundation, an ensemble of mere delusions, a totality, gansa, a phantasms. Religion cannot be based on such shaky ground rather, if it can claim for itself any kind of inner truth, it must be possible to recognize it as an expression of an objective reality, realitate. This reality, realitate, is not nature but society it is not of a physical but of a social nature. The true object of religion, the sole and original object to which all religious formation, gebilda, and all religious manifestations can be traced back, is the social association, for bond, to which the individual indissolubly belongs, which wholly and thoroughly conditions the individual's being in consciousness. This societal association not only determines the form of mythology and religion but also provides the basic schema and model for all theoretical comprehension, for all cognition of reality. For all the categories in which we apprehend this reality, the concepts of space, time, substance, and causality, are products not of the individual but of social thinking and accordingly have their religious social prehistory. They lead back to this prehistory and their seemingly purely logical structure can be traced back to determine its social structures to explain these concepts and understand them in their true a priori. To the individual, everything must seem a priori, generally valid and necessary, a fact that arises not from their own activity but from the activity of the species. The real bond that links individuals with their tribe, their clan, and their family is, therefore, the ultimate demonstrable ground for the ideal unity of their world consciousness, for the religious and intellectual construction of the cosmos. We shall not take up here at any length the epistemological grounding that Durkheim has given his theory in an attempt to replace the transcendental deduction of the categories by their sociological deduction. We would, however, ask here whether the categories that Durkheim seeks to derive from the being of society are not rather the conditions for this being whether it is not the pure thought forms as well as the pure intuition forms that make possible and constitute both the consistent existence of society as well as that empirical lawfulness of the phenomena that we call nature. Even if we exclude this question, even if we limit ourselves uniquely to the ambit of the phenomena of mythical religious consciousness, on closer examination, however, even here Durkheim's theory clearly amounts to a latter before. For the form of society is not absolutely and immediately given any more than is the form of the objective objects of nature, the lawfulness of our world of perception. Just as nature comes into being through a theoretical interpretation and elaboration of sensible contents, so too is the construction of society a mediated and ideally conditioned being. It is not so much the ultimate, ontologically real cause of the spiritual, and particularly religious, categories, as it is rather decisively determined by them. If we seek to explain these categories as mere repetitions, and, as it were, as imprints of the actual shape of society, we forget that the processes and function of mythical religious configuration, gestalt tongue, have entered precisely into this actual shape, gestalt. We know of no form of society, however primitive, that does not exhibit some kind of religious imprint, pragung, and society can be regarded as a shaped, gepragged, form only if we tacitly presuppose the mode and tendency of this imprint. Durkheim's explanation of totemism, which he regards as the true test of the correctness of his basic view, indirectly confirms this interconnection. For Durkheim, totemism is nothing other than the outward projection of certain inner social bonds. Because individuals know their own life only within an encompassing social association, for bond, and because within this association, for bond, they single out particular groups that they set off against each other as characteristic unities, objective existence can be intellectually apprehended only through this basic form of livid experience it can be interpreted only through a single continuous organization of all being and all events into species and classes. Totemism does nothing more than transfer the belonging togetherness's, Zeus Simon George Caton, and kinships that the human immediately experiences as a member of the social body to the whole of nature it pictures, Abelden, the social microcosm onto the macrocosm. Thus, here too, society is for Durkheim effectively the proper object of religion, whereas the totem is regarded only as a sensible sign by which some object is stamped as socially significant and hence raised to the sphere of the religious. However, this nominalistic theory, which as it were considers the totem only as a kind of accidental, as a more or less arbitrary sign behind which stands an entirely different, mediated object of veneration, passes by the central problem of totemism. Granted, myth and religion everywhere require such images, such sensible present signs, 
But the particularity of the individual mythical religious symbols remains a question that cannot be answered based on the general function of sign bestowing. Indeed, the relation of all the configurations of being to those of certain animals or plants would appear to be unexplained as long as we are unable to precisely understand their specific determinacy from a certain basic tendency of mythical thinking and its life feeling thereby providing the signs of totemism not, to be sure, with a fixed tangible correlate. A fundamentum in re, but rather with a foundation in mythical religious consciousness. The very existence and form of human society requires such a founda tie and even where we suppose that we have society. Gesellschaft, before us in its empirically earliest and most primitive shape, it is not something originally given but something spiritually conditioned and mediated. All social, Gesellschaftlich, existence is rooted in certain concrete forms of the community, Gemeinschaft, and in the feeling of community. And the more we succeed in laying bare this root, the more clearly it can be seen that the primary feeling of community never stops at the boundaries that we posit in our highly developed biological class concepts but rather goes beyond such boundaries toward the totality totalitat, of the living. Long before the human knew itself as a determined, separated species distinguished by some specific force and singled out from the whole of nature by a specific primacy of value, the human knew itself as a link in the chain of life as a whole, within which each individual existence, Dasein, was magically connected with the whole, so that a continuous transition, a transformation of one being into another, appears not only as possible but also as necessary, as the natural form of life itself. From this, it becomes comprehensible that even in the image figures, Bilge Stalton, in which myth originally lives and is, in which it immediately and concretely embodies its essential nature, the features of the god, the human, and the animal never sharply stand out from one another. Only gradually does the preparing for a change occur, which is the unmistakable symptom of a spiritual change, of a crisis in the development of human self-consciousness. As in the Egyptian religion where the gods generally take the shape, gestalt, of animals. The heavens are shaped as a cow, the sun as a sparrowhawk, the moon as an ibis, the god of the dead as a jackal, and the water god as a crocodile in the Vedas, we still clearly find in addition to the dominant anthropomorphism traces of an older theriomorphic outlook. And even where the gods stand before us in clearly human formation, their kinship with the animal nature is often expressed in an almost unlimited ability to transform. Thus, Odin in Germanic mythology is the great magician who transforms himself into any desired shape a bird, a fish, a worm. Even the Greek primeval religion did not deny this interconnection. The great gods of the Arcadians were depicted in the shape of a horse, a bear, or a wolf Demeter and Poseidon with the head of a horse, Pan in the shape of a goat. It was only Homeric poetry that displaced this view from Arcadia. And precisely this indicates that at this point, myth may never have arrived at a sharper division, which basically conflicts with its own essential nature, its complex intuition, if other motives and other spiritual forces had not been involved art, in that it helped the human find its own image, had initially discovered, as it were, the specific idea of the human as such. The development that takes place here can be followed almost step by step in the plastic presentations of the gods. In Egyptian art, the doble and hybrid forms still consistently show the god in human formation but with the head of an animal or a snake, a frog or a sparrowhawk in another, the lived body has an animal shape, and the face bears human features. Greek sculpture, however, carries out the sharp cut here in the forming, for Mung, of the pure figure, Gestalt, of the human, it arrives at a new form of the divine itself and its relationship to the human. And in this process of humanization and individualization, poetry plays a role almost equal to that of visual art. Once again, the poetic and mythical configuration do not stand here in a relationship of cause and effect here again, one does not simply precede the other, but rather, the two are merely different exponents of one and the same spiritual development. As Schelling writes, the liberation that became the lot of consciousness through the Sisyon of the representation of the gods gave poets to the Hellenics, and conversely only the age that gave them the poets also brought with itself the completely unfolded history of the gods. Poesy did not take the lead, at least not actual poesy and properly speaking, poesy also did not produce the articulated history of the gods. Neither precedes the other. Rather, both are the mutual and simultaneous ending of an earlier state, a state of envelopment and silence. The crisis through which the world of the gods unfolds into the history of the gods is not external to the poets. It takes place in the poets themselves, forms their poems it is not them as persons who create the history of the gods but rather the crisis of the mythological consciousness within them. Of course, poetry does not only reflect this crisis but also intensified it and brought it to completion and decision, and Scheidung. In this, there is.
established anew the basic rule that governs all spiritual development spirit arrives at its true and complete inwardness only in its manifest attain. The form that the inner gives itself also determines retrospectively its nature, vasan, and its content, gehalt. In this sense, the Greek epic intervenes in the development of the history of Greek religion. It is not the technical form of the epic that is decisive here the individualization forms only a light allegorical cloak that covers a general mythical content, gehalt. The Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, for example, still bears an evident general astral character beneath the image of the deeds and sufferings of the hero Gilgamesh, we recognize a solar myth, a presentation of the annual path of the sun, of its reversal at two turning points, etc. The twelve episodes of the Gilgame Shepik hold a relation to the twelve images of the zodiac, through which the sun passes in the course of a year. Although it has often been attempted, an astral interpretation of the figures of the Homeric poetry is however doomed to failure. It is no longer a question here of the fate of the sun and the moon but of the hero and of the discovery in the hero of the individual human being as an active and suffering subject. And only with this discovery does one of the last barriers between God and the human fall away the hero enters between both and undertakes the mediation between them. Whereas the hero, the human personality, appears raised into the circle of the divine, the gods, on the other hand, are very closely interwoven in the circle of human events in which they participate not as mere observers but as fellow warriors and comrades in arms. Through their relation to the hero, the gods are fully drawn into the sphere of personal existence and effective action, in which they now acquire a new shape and a new determinacy. And what began in the Greek epic finds its conclusion and completion in the drama. The Greek tragedy also grew out of a primordial stratum of mythical religious consciousness and never completely detached itself from its proper life ground, Lebensgrund. It emerged immediately from the cultic action from the Dionysian festival and chorus. The development that it takes, however, can be more clearly recognized because it does not remain confined within the basic orgiastic Dionysiac mood in which it is rooted but instead confronts an entirely new figure, Gestalt, of the human, an entirely new feeling of the I and of the self. Like all great vegetation cults, the cult of Dionysus feels the I only as a violent breaking away from the universal originary ground of life, and what it strives for is a return to that originary ground the ecstasy by which the soul bursts the fetters of the lived body and of individuality, in order to unite again with the universal life, a Laban. All that is apprehended here of individuality is the one moment, the moment of tragic individualization, Viren's long, as it is immediately depicted in the myth of Dionysius Zagreus, who is torn to pieces and devoured by the Titans. The artistic intuition, however, beholds an individual existence not so much this individualization as rather the particularization, the combination. Sizam and Fasung, into a self-contained figure, Gestalt. For it, the specific plastic outline is only the guarantee of completion. And completion itself requires finitiveness, in truth, it requires a fixed determination and delimitation. This requirement is accomplished in the Greek tragedy, as in the epic and in sculpturae, in that initially the person of the Corypheus emerges out from the whole of the chorus and is raised to a distinct spiritual individuality. The drama cannot, however, Stop here what it requires is not so much a person but persons, the relationship of the I to the you and the conflict between the two. Thus, the second actor, the counter player is initially introduced in Aeschylus, and then in Sophocles, a third player is added. And to this dramatic progress and gradation there corresponds the progressive deepening of the feeling and consciousness of personality, and, indeed, the word person, which serves us as an expression of this consciousness, initially meant nothing other than the actor's mask. Even in the epic, the figure of the hero, the human subject, is set off from the circle of objective events however, if the hero is differentiated from this circle, the hero nevertheless confronts it, though more possibly than actively. The hero is engulfed in these events without that they immediately grow out from himself or herself and are necessarily conditioned by himself or herself the hero is still the plaything of the friendly and hostile powers and divine and demonic powers that determine and guide the course of events instead. In this respect, the Homeric epic, and particularly the Odyssey, still borders on myth and the mythical tale. The cunning, the strength, the wisdom of the hero, by which the hero seems to guide his or her destiny, are themselves demonized divine gifts bestowed on him or her from outside. Greek tragedy was the first to discover, in contrast to this passive intuition, a new source of the eye in that it takes the human being as self-active and self-responsible and thus configures the human being into a truly ethical dramatic subject. Nobody can acquit you. The chorus replies to Clytemnestra in Agamemnon by Aeschylus when she seeks to shift the guilt for her husband's murder from herself to the demonic curse on the family. The same development that dramatically presents itself here is found in Greek philosophy in its purest expression in Heraclitus saying? 
a man's character is his demon, and in the development of these words by Democritus, by Socrates and Plato. Even the gods are drawn into this development they, too, are subject to the sentence of Dyke, the supreme godhead of tragedy. In the amenities of Aeschylus, the Arrhenes themselves, the ancient goddesses of vengeance, ultimately bow to the verdict of justice. In contrast to the epic, tragedy shifts the center of events from the outside to the inside, and thus, a new form of ethical self-consciousness, by which the nature, vazen, and shape of the gods are transformed, arises. At the same time, however, this crisis in religious consciousness, which manifests itself in the individual figures, Gestalten, of the gods, points to a crisis within community consciousness, Gemein Schaffsbe was saying. Just as there is no sharp separation between the human species and the animal species and the plants in the circles of thinking and feeling in which primitive religion, such as totemism, moves, there is no clear delimit tie-in between the human group as a whole and the individual belonging to it. Individual consciousness remains bound, to the tribal consciousness and merely with it, get an eye mouth. The god itself is first and foremost the god of the tribe, not the god of the individual. Individuals who leave the tribe or are expelled by it have thereby lost their god go, serve other gods are the words spoken to the outcast. In everything it thinks and feels, in all its effective actions and suffering, the individual knows itself bound to the community, just as the community feels itself attached to the individual. Every defilement with which an individual is afflicted, every bloody deed committed by the individual, passes by immediate physical contagion to the whole of the group. For the vengeance of the soul of the slain does not stop at the murderers but extends to all who are in direct or indirect contact with them. Once, however, religious consciousness rises to the thought and shapes of personal gods, this involvement of the individual in the whole begins to dissolve. Only now does the individual receive an opposition to the life of the genus their independent character, Geprage, and, as it were, their personal face, Gazikt. And this tendency toward the individual is connected with a new tendency toward the universal, which is only seemingly in conflict with it and in truth is correlative to it. 4. Above the restricted unity of the tribe or the group, more comprehensive social unities now arise. The personal gods of Homer are also the first national gods of the Greeks, and as such, they virtually become the creators of the general Hellenic consciousness. For they are the Olympians, the general gods of the heavens, who are bound neither to a single locality, or Tlitschkeit, or countryside nor to a particular cult site. Thus, the liberation of personal consciousness and the raising up to national consciousness are carried out in one and the same basic act of religious configuration. We see here anew that the form of mythical and religious representation does not simply reflect certain facts of the social structure they also belong to one of the factors by virtue of which every living community consciousness constructs itself. The same process of differentiation by which the human arrives to determine the spiritual boundaries of its species leads the human in further progress to draw more sharply the boundaries within this species and thus attain the specific consciousness of its eye. The concept of personality and the personal gods the phases of the mythical concept of the I in the foregoing considerations, we have sought to show how the human being is able to discover the universum of its own interiority and to determine for itself its own consciousness only in that the human being thinks it in mythical concepts and intuits it in mythical images. This has, however, described only a single tendency in the development of mythical religious consciousness. Once again, the path inward finds here its completion only in that it is united with the seemingly opposite path, with the advance from the inside outward. For the most important factor in the construction of the consciousness of personality is and remains. The factor of effective action here, however, the law of equality of action and reaction is valid for effective action in a purely spiritual sense as well as in a physical sense. The effect that the human being exerts on the outside world does not simply consist in the fact that the I, as a finished thing, as a self-contained substance, draws outside things into its circle and takes possession of them. Rather, all genuine effective action is such that it proves to be formative, built and, in a twofold sense the eye does not simply impress its own form, a form given to it from the outset, onto objects but rather discovers and acquires this form only in the totality, gesamtheit, of the effects that it exerts on objects and that it receives back from them. Accordingly, the boundaries of the inner world can be determined and its ideal configuration can become visible only if the ambit of being is circumscribed in doing. The larger the circle becomes that the self fills with its activity, the more clearly the constitution of objective reality as well as the significance and function of the I emerge. When we attempt to understand this process in the mode in which it is revealed in the reflection of mythical religious consciousness, it can be seen that at the first stages of this consciousness, things only are for the I if they are emotionally effective in it if they trigger in it a certain stirring of hope or fear, desire or horror, 
satisfaction or disappointment. Long before nature can become an object of intuition, let alone an object of cognition, it, too, is given to the human only in this way. This fact already thwarts every theory that views the personification and veneration of certain natural objects or forces as the beginning of mythical consciousness. For things and forces are no more given to mythical consciousness from the beginning than they are to theoretical consciousness they constitute, rather, a relatively advanced process of objectivization. Before this objectivization has begun, before the whole of the world has been split into determinate, enduring, and unitary shapes, Gestalten, there is a phase during which it exists for the human only in vague feeling. Only those individual impressions, which because of their special intensity and force stand out from the common background, are separated out from this indeterminacy of feeling. And to them there corresponds the first mythological formations, Gebilda. They do not come into being as the products of a consideration that dwells on certain objects in order to ascertain their enduring characteristic traits, their constant essential features, but rather, they are the expression of a one-time, perhaps never identically recurring state of consciousness, coming into being out of a momentary tension and release of consciousness. Usner has shown how this distinctive and original productivity of mythical consciousness asserts itself in fair advanced stages and is continuously effective how, even in a phase that is already characterized by the working out, ausbildung, of clearly determined special gods and clearly defined figures of the personal gods, such gods of the moment can always be created anew. If this view is correct, we must think of the nature divinities and demons not as personifications of universal forces or processes of nature but as mythical objectivizations of individual impressions. The more indeterminate and more inconceivable these impressions are, the less they seem to fit into the whole course of natural events, the more they suddenly and extemporaneously strike consciousness the greater the elementary forceful power they exert on it. Folklore shows that even today, this originary force of mythical representing is immediately alive and effective. In it is rooted the belief in the immense wealth of nature demons who dwell in the field and meadows, the thicket and the woods. In the rustling of the leaves, the murmuring and roaring of the wind, in a thousand indefinable voices and tones, in the play and sparkle of light in all this, the life of the forest first becomes perceptible to mythical consciousness, perceptible as the immediate manifestation of the innumerable elemental spirits who inhabit the woods woodmen and woodwomen, male and female elves, the tree spirits and wind spirits. However, the development that the wood and field cults take shows us step by step how myth gradually grows beyond these figures, Gestalten, how without ever entirely abandoning them it adds other spirits arising from different layers of thinking and feeling. The world of the merely elementary spirits gives way to a new world to the degree that the eye passes from merely emotional reaction to the stage of action, as it comes to see its relationship to nature no longer through the medium of mere imprecision but now through the medium of its own doing. It is from the rule of this doing from its changing and yet constantly cyclically repeating phases of its effective action, that the being of nature first acquires its true, consistent existence and its fixed configuration. In particular, the transition to agriculture, to a regulated tilling of the fields, signifies a crucial turning point in the development of the vegetation myths and cults. Admittedly, even here the human does not at once stand over against, gegen überstehen and confront, Nature is a free subject but rather feels itself internally growing together and faithfully one with it. Nature's coming and ill-being and passing away, its blooming and wilting possess a continual interconnection with the human's own living and dying. All great vegetation rites rest on the feeling of this interconnection, which they express not only in mythical images but also in immediate doing the withering and revival of the plant world is depicted as a drama, a action. And this representation of a fate-like boundedness lives on in other features. The family and the individual have their tree of birth and fate, the thriving and withering of which decides their health and sickness, life and death. However, beyond this mere belonging together, Sugahurgkite, beyond this hay physical, half mythical bond, a new form of community between the human and nature is likewise made. Human beings not only feel connected with some particular existence in nature or with nature as a whole in their state, Zeus stand, but also draw nature immediately into the circle of their labor. Just as a person's demon gradually becomes their guardian spirit, their genius, so too in nature are the elementary haunting spirits transformed into guardian spirits. Folklore has preserved these figures down to our own day. Manhart writes. The Hals Fräulein in Thuringia and Franconia, the wild Loda in Baden, and the Seligan in Tyrol help the laborers at harvest time. Hals Weiber in Waldmännchen, Fangen, Selind are forever serving human beings, caring for the cattle and conferring their blessings on the stable and storeroom. 
The fact that these still living figures derive from a typical and basic view of mythical thinking and feeling and that they necessarily belong to a certain phase of it is shown by a comparison with the activity gods that we can follow from the belief of primitive peoples down to the great cultural religions. Among the Yoruba, where a totemic organization prevails, each clan has its family god from whom it is descended and whose comments regulate the whole course of its life. However, in addition to this organization, and relatively independent of it, a kind of caste organization of the world of divinities exists. The warriors, the smiths, the hunters, and the woodworkers, regardless of what totem they may belong to, worship a common god, to whom they offer sacrifices. This technical differentiation, this division of labor within the mythical world, is carried through in detail there is a god of the blacksmiths and brass founders and a god of the tinsmiths who is said to have bequeathed a certain type of alloy to human beings. This idea of the active Atai gods, each of whom is assigned and in a manner of speaking confined to a particular sphere of activity, was developed with the greatest precision in the Roman belief in gods. Every performance, in particular every individual act necessary for the cultivation of the fields has its own god and its own organized priesthood. Moreover, the pontifices ensure that in each of these acts, the god who is regarded as its guardian is called by his right name and that the totality of gods are invoked in their proper order. Without this regulation in the invocation of the gods, the doing would itself remain random and consequently, fruitless. For every action and state, special gods are created and named with clear word coinage and it is not merely actions and states as a whole that are deified in this way, but also any segments, acts, or moments of them that are in any way conspicuous. In the agricultural sacrifice the Flamins had to invoke twelve gods in addition to Telus and Ceres, and these twelve gods corresponded to as many actions of the peasant Viru actor for the first breaking of the fallow field, Uru actum, Reparator for the second ploughing, Inporsitor for the third and final ploughing in which the furrows, Liri, were drawn and the ridges, Portki, thrown up, and Cider for the sowing, Obcrater for the ploughing over after the sowing, Acator for the harrowing, Serator for the weeding, Sarire, with the hoe, Subruncinator for the pulling out of the weeds, Messer for the reaping, Canaector for the transportation of the grain from the fields, Conditor for the garnering, Prometer for the giving out of the grain from granary and barn. This construction and expansion of the world of gods from the individual impulses of relevant actions, tons, and their clearly separated tendencies discloses the same form of objectivization we found in language. Like the phonetic image, the mythical image serves not simply to designate differences already present but to first fix them for consciousness, to make them visible as such it does not simply render these differences as pre-existing but in the strict sense of the word evokes, herforufen, them. Consciousness arrives at a clear separation of the individual spheres of activity, as well as the divergent objective and subjective conditions, only by referring each of these spheres to a fixed center, to one determinate mythical figure, Gestalt. The invocation of a particular god as a guardian or helper presiding over each singular activity would certainly appear to leave unrecognized the spontaneity of doing all doing as such seems to be regarded as a mere manifestation, oisering, of the same god, hence as something coming from without rather than from within. On the other hand, it is through this medium of the act of Atai God that doing, which might otherwise be in danger of being forgotten in favor of its mere result and product, is apprehended in its pure spirituality. Through its various mythical exponents, it gradually comes to be known and understood. In the multiplicity of the figures of their gods, human beings do not merely behold the outward manifold of the objects and forces of nature but behold in these figures themselves and the concrete manifold and particularity of their functions. The abundance of divine formations, God or Jibilda, that human beings create guide them not only through the circle of objective being and events but above all through the circle of their own will and accomplishment, which these divine form at the own salumen from within. Each concrete individual activity becomes truly conscious of its distinctive tendency and guiding principle only in that it is regarded objectively in the image of its respective special God. The clear subdivision of doing, its decomposition into independent acts explicitly separated from one another, does not take place by way of an abstract discursive concept formation, but rather, inversely, it results from each of these acts being apprehended as an intuitive whole and embodied in an independent mythical figure, Gestalt. If we attempt to grasp this spiritual process from the side of its contents, it presents itself most clearly in the progress that mythical consciousness accomplishes in advancing from mere nature myths to culture myths. The question of origins, Ersprungsfrage increasingly shifts here from the ambit of things to the specifically human circle the form of mythical causality serves to explain not so much the emergence of the world or some of its objects, objecte, but the origin, herkunft, of human cultural goods. Of course, even this explanation, 
in accordance with the party chular nature of mythical representing, supports the view that these goods are not created through the force and will of human beings but have been given to them. They are not considered to be indirectly produced by human beings but received by them as finished and immediate. The use of fire and the ability to fashion certain tools, the cultivation of fields or the initiation of hunting, the knowledge of certain medicaments, and the invention of writing appear as gifts from mythical powers. Once again, the human understands here its doing, tons, only by removing it from itself and projecting it outward from this projection arises the figure, gestalt, of the god, in which the god no longer appears as a mere power of nature but rather as a culture hero, a bringer of light and salvation. The figures, gestalten, of these saviors are the first concrete mythical expressions of the awakening and advancing of the self-consciousness of culture. In this sense, the cult becomes a vehicle and transitional point of all cultural development it adheres to the element by which culture distinguishes itself from every purely technical mastery of nature and by which its specific, distinctive spiritual character takes shape, Zishas Pragan. Religious veneration does not simply follow practical usage rather, it is this usage that frequently gave human beings their practical knowledge, such as the usage of fire. In all probability, the domestication of animals developed only on a religious foundation and on certain mythical religious presuppositions, especially on totemistic presuppositions. The mythical image world, like that of language or art, serves as one of the basic means by which the setting apart, ausein andersetzung, of the eye in the world takes place. In this setting apart, ausein andersetzung, the figure, gestalt, of the god or bringer of salvation enters, as it were, between the eye and the world at once differentiating them from one another and connecting them together. For the eye, the proper self of the human being, finds itself only through the detour of the divine eye. The transition of the god from the figure, gestalt, of the mere special god, who remains confined to a certain narrowly delimited domain of activity, to the figure, gestalt, of the personal god signifies a new step on the way to the intuition of free subjectivity as such. Usner writes. From the mass of the special gods, personal gods of more inclusive scope arise only when the old concept formation congealed into a proper name and has become a fixed nucleus around which mythical representations can cluster. Only in the proper name does the fluid representation thicken into a hard core that can become the bearer of a personality. This proper name, like the forename of a person, makes it necessary to think of a specific personality to which it exclusively applies. With this the path is opened by which a flood of anthropomorphic representations can pour into an almost empty form. Only now does the concept acquire corporeity, flesh and blood as it were. It is able to act and to suffer like a human being. The representations that were self-evident predicates for the transparent concept of the special god become myths for the bearer of a proper name. However, even if we accept its general methodic presupposition, namely, the thoroughgoing reciprocal relation between language formation and myth formation, this theory contains an unsolved difficulty and a peculiar paradox. For Usner, the way myth arises from the mere special gods to the intuition of personal gods is the same path that language takes in its progress from the representation and designation of the individual to that of the universal. According to him, in both cases, the same process of abstraction, the same progress from individual perceptions to generic concepts, takes place. How, however, are we to account for the fact that precisely this turn to the universal? this tendency of generalizing abstraction, should give us the individualization, the determination, of a personal God. How can a process that, on the objective side, manifests itself in a progressive turning away from spatial and temporal individuals lead rather, seen from the side of subjective life, to the working out of the individuality and uniqueness of the person? There must therefore be another element that contributes here whose mode of effectiveness is opposed to the tendency taken by generalizing concept formation. Indeed, the progress from the particular to the universal in the world of doing and in the construction of the world of inner experience is something different from what it is in the construction of outward being, in the configuration of the object world, Sashvelt, and the thing world. The more a specific circle of action expands as it is mythically apprehended and designated in the figures, Gestalten, of a special god, the greater the manifold of objects to which the doing applies becomes, the more purely and forcefully the pure energy of doing as such is emphasized, the more purely and more forcefully does the consciousness of the active subject stand out. To be sure, this consciousness of the active subject manifests itself while still remaining in particular modes and forms of effective action it is, however, no longer bound to them and no longer simply absorbed in them. Thus, the feeling of the determinacy of the personality does not disappear with the gradual detachment from the particularity of the work but rather is increased and intensified by it. The eye now knows and apprehends itself, not as a mere abstraction, 
not as an impersonal universal that stands above and behind all particular activities, but as a self-identical concrete unity that links and holds together all the different directions of doing. In contrast to this self-identical unity, as the constant originary ground of doing, the individual particular creation seems random and accidental, because it only ever forms a partial fulfillment of it. Thus, it can be understood that the more the specialized God rises above his original narrow sphere, it becomes a medium through which the element of personality more clearly takes shape, auspragen, and more freely unfolds. According to the traditional theory of logic, in the circle of the mere intuition of things, any increase in the extension, omphong, of a concept likewise brings about a corresponding impoverishment of its contents the greater the circle of individual representations that the concept embraces, the lower its concrete determinacy. However, the extension to a larger domain signifies here at the same time an increase in the intensity and consciousness of the effective action itself. For the unity of personality can come to intuition in no other way than through its opposite, in how it expresses and asserts itself in a concrete multiplicity and diversity of forms of effective action. The further mythical feeling and thinking progress along this path, the more clearly the figure of a supreme creator god is singled out from among the mere specialized gods and from the throng of individual polytheistic gods. In the Supreme Creator God, all the multiplicity of doing seems, as it were, concentrated in a single summit mythical religious consciousness is now oriented not toward the intuition of a totality of many indeterminable individual creative forces but toward the intuition of the pure act of creation itself, which just as it has grasped itself as one so is it pushed ever more emphatically toward the apprehension of a unified subject of creation. The thought of a creator belongs to those originera motifs of myth that as such would seem to neither require nor permit any further derivation or explanation. At times, it would seem to be encountered in surprising clarity even in primitive strata of religious representing. In particular, as here with the representation of the originary father to which the clan traces back its origin, the thought of a supreme being, Vaisants, which remains clearly separate as such from the totemic ancestors, can often be followed within the totemistic circle of representation. The emergence of natural things and, on the other side, the establishment, Einsetzung, of the sacred rites, the cult ceremonies, and dances can be traced back to this being, Vazen. Ordinarily, however, it itself no longer forms the object of the cult, nor does the human enter into a direct unmediated magic relationship with it as in the case of the individual demonic forces that fill the world as a whole. Thus, it is as if, Amid the motifs of emotion and those of the will that dominate every primitive religion and that give it its characteristic imprint, Gepridge, Dash we are suddenly confronted by a purely intellectual, theoretical motif already in the earliest stages. Admittedly, on closer consideration, however, we find that the seemingly abstract representation of creation and the creator is never apprehended here in true universality but that creation can be imagined, Vorgestelt, if at all, only in the mode of some individual, concrete form of shaping and forming. Form day buildings and formans. Thus, the Australian Bayam C. Bajami, who is often cited as a typical example of the configuration of the originator thought among primitive peoples, is thought of as the carver of things he brings individual objects forth as a figure, figua, would have been brought forth from bark or a shoe from the skin of an animal. The thought of creation is based wholly on the activity of the artisan, handworker, the creator of works, workbuildner, dash, and even philosophy, even Plato is able to apprehend the supreme creator god through no other image than through the mythical image of the demiurge. In Egypt, the god Ptah was venerated as the great god of the originary beginning, as the originary god however, in his doing, he seems at the same time comparable to the human artist as he is considered as the real protector of artists and artisans. His attribute is the potter's wheel, from which, as creator god, Gottbildner, he has modeled the majesty of the gods and the figure, Gestalt, of the human, mention. In this way, however, mythical religious thinking gradually advances further. Beyond the concrete particularizations of doing toward its universal apprehension. In the Vedic religion, alongside of the pure nature gods we find quite early other deities that depict certain spheres and types of action. Beside Agni as the god of fire or Indra as the storm god, there is, for example, an instigator god or impeller, Savitar, who awakens all movement in nature and human life, a gatherer god who helps with the harvest, a retriever god, Nivarta, Nivartana, who cares for the return, of lost cattle, etc. Concerning such gods, Oldenburg remarks. In every epic in the history of language, we find side by side with elements of word formation that are no longer effective and that have been preserved only in finished formations inherited from the past authors which are in full vitality and which can be used by every speaker to the formation of new words similarly, 
from the standpoint of the religious historical mode of the formation of gods, we must, for the Vedic period and that immediately preceding it, impute extreme vitality to the method of creating gods by means of the suffix tar. There is a god tratar, guardian, a datar, maker, anatar, leader, and there are corresponding feminine forms, the goddesses virutrat, female guardians, etc. The freedom with which, under the guidance of language, the suffix that includes in itself the core representation of the doing and the actor is used to create new names of gods involves the risk of an almost unlimited fragmentation in the intuition of the doing itself on the other hand, however, formations of this kind point, by virtue of their linguistic similarity of form, to a general function of effective action itself, independent of any particular aim and object, object, of effective action. And in the Vedic religion those formations, analogous to the above group, which designate a determinate god as the lord over a certain domain, thus, for example, the figures, Gestalten, of gods such as lord of progeny, Prajapati, lord of the field, lord of the dwelling, lord of thinking and of truth, etc. progressively subordinate all these different spheres of domination to one single supreme ruler. In the Brahmana period, the lord of progeny, Prajapati, who at first was a specialized god like the authors, became the true world creator. Now he is the god in all the spaces of the world at one stroke he has transformed earth and heaven. Transformed the worlds, the poles, and the realm of light has unravived the mesh of the world order he beheld it and became it, for he was it. And in other respects as well, the Vedic texts permit us to recognize the multifarious mediations that mythical religious thought requires before it can advance to the conception of the creation of the world and the creator of the worlds. Deposit being as a whole under the category of creation is at first an unenforceable requirement for myth. Wherever it speaks of the emergence of things, of the birth of the cosmos, it grasps this birth as a mere transformation. It always presupposes a specific sensibly imagined substratum from which becoming begins and in which it proceeds. At one moment, it is the cosmic egg, welte, at another the tree of the world at one moment, it is the lotus blossom, at another the organs of the lived body of a human or animal from which the individual parts of the cosmos are brought forward and formed. In Egypt, an egg first comes forth from the originary water nun, out of which is born the god of light, the sun god Ra he came into being before any heavens had come into being and before any worm or vermin had been created no one was with him in the place where he was, and he found no place on which he could stand. This already shows that, on the one hand, to emerge in a determinate form, the mythical thought of creation must always cling to some concrete substratum but that, on the other hand, it seeks more and more to negate this substratum, to tear itself away from it. We find a progressive series of such negations in the famous hymn of the Rig Veda. The non-being, Nikt Sain, was not, the being was not then air was not, nor the heavens that is beyond. What stirred? Where? Under whose shelter? Was the deep abyss, opcurrent? Water? Death was not, immortality was not then no difference was there of day and night. It breathed, windless, by itself, only that, das. Other than that there was naught beyond. An attempt is made here to grasp the origin, urshprim, of being in a pure, unlimited, and indeterminateless that, das. On the other hand, however, cosmogonic speculation cannot refrain from determining this that more closely in some respect and from inquiring after the concrete unifying ground, Untergrund, the construction timber, bauholes, from which the all arose. The question about this ground on which the Creator stood and which served him as a support repeatedly arises. What was the resting place, what was the point of support from which Vishvakarman, the all beholder, in creating the earth, revealed the heavens by his power? And how was it constituted? What kind of timber was it, what kind of tree, from which they carved heaven and earth? Inquire, ye wise men in your minds whereon he supported himself when he held heaven and earth. The later philosophical doctrine of the Upanishads attempted to solve this question of the prima materia, the of creation, by sublating its intellectual presuppositions. In the thought of the Brahma, as the All One, the opposition between material and form, like all other oppositions, disappears. Where, however, religious development takes a different path where in place of this pantheistic dissolution of oppositions we find the thought of a creator worked out purely and clearly as such, the striving becomes more and more pronounced to transfer this thought to another demon scion, as it were, to free it from the contact and clustering of the physical material and give it a purely spiritual imprint. This progress can already be followed through the apprehension of the means that serves the creator to call the world into existence. The description of these means initially limits itself to certain sensible tangible analogies and comparisons. The oldest Egyptian texts tell us that Tamra, the creator god, formed the gods, 
who are the originary ancestors of all living beings, Vazen, in a human manner by an emission of sperm, or that he spat the first pair of gods from his mouth. However, another, more spiritual view emerges early in the pyramid texts. The act of creation is no longer designated by a single material image rather, the Creator now uses no organ other than the force of His will, which is concentrated on the force of His voice and His word. The word forms the power that brings forth the gods themselves, that brings forth the heavens and earth. As soon as language and word are as such conceived as spiritual, geistig, instruments of world creation, the act of creation itself acquires another purely spiritual, spiritual, significance. Between the world as the ensemble of physical material things and the divine force engaged and enclosed, be fastened besh loss and craft, in the CRE autor's word, an immediate transition is no longer possible the two belong to separate regions of being. The relation that religious thought nevertheless demands between the two can be only an indirect one, dependent on definite mediating links and leading through them. To produce and express this relation, a new cut must be made through the whole of being the physical existence, existence, of objects must be given as its foundation a new purely ideal form of being. This motif attained its truly spiritual formation, Dirchbildung, and unfolding only in philosophical cognition, in the creation myth of Plato's Timaeus. Unpendently of this, however, it also developed purely from the spiritual sources and problems of religion itself, and the history of religion provides us with a revealing and striking example. Of the great cultural religions, apart from Jewish monotheism, it was the Persian religion that developed the category of creation to its most complete determination and that has brought the personality of the Creator as a spiritual ethical personality to pure manifestation. The statement of faith of the Iranian Persian religion begins with an invocation of the Supreme Ruler, Ahura Mazda, who brought forth all being and all order and being, who brought forth humans as well as heaven and earth by virtue of His Holy Spirit and His good thinking. The creation that arises here from the originary source of thinking and spirit remains, however, at first entirely confined within it. Not unexpectedly, the cosmos in its material tangible constitution does not emerge directly from the divine will rather, what is first created is nothing more than its own purely spiritual form. Ahura Mazda's first creative act does not concern the sensible but rather the intelligible world, and during the first great period, for a period of three thousand years, the world remains in this immaterial, luminous, spiritual state, and only then, on the basis, grunt, of its already existing forms, is it remade into a sensible and perceptible figure, Gestalt. If we were to survey the whole series of mythical religious conceptions leading from the diverse specialized gods, all of whom are limited to a closely circumscribed ambit of effective action, down to the spiritual unconditioned activity of the one creator God, then we would find once again that the customary view that we normally have of the anthropomorphic character of this process is inadequate, then it demands a reversal in its decisive point. For the human does not simply transfer its own finished personality to the God or simply lend the God its own feeling and consciousness of self it is, rather, through the figure, Gestalt, of their gods that the human first finds this self-consciousness. Through the medium of the intuition of God, Goddess and Shoung, the human succeeds in detaching itself as an active subject from the mere content and tangible product of doing. The thought of creation from nothing to which pure monotheism ultimately rises and in which the category of creation first acquires its proper radical version may, seen from the standpoint of theoretical thinking, present a paradox, even an antinomy from the religious perspective, it nevertheless signifies an ultimate and supreme achievement, because in it, the stupendously abstracting force of religious spirit, which must sublate and negate the being of things in order to arrive at the being of pure will and pure doing, comes to full and unlimited validity. And in yet another direction. It can be followed how the working out, Ausbildung, of the consciousness of doing demands that the mere objective product of doing recede, as it were, into the distance, that it increasingly loses its sensible immediacy. In the first stages of the magical view of the world, scarcely any tension is clearly felt to exist between simple desire and the object toward which it is directed. An immediate force inheres here in desire itself it is enough to intensify its manifestation, Äußerung, to the extreme in order to discharge an efficacy, Wirksamkeit that by itself leads to the attainment of the desired goal. All magic is permitted with this belief in the real, the realizing power of human desire, this belief in the omnipotence of thought. And this belief must constantly gain new nourishment from experiences that impose themselves on the human in the closest domain of effective action in the influence that the human being exerts on its own body, on the movements of its lived body and limbs. For the theoretical analysis of the concept of causality, this influence, which would seem to be directly experienced and felt, will itself become a problem. As Hume states, 
that my will is capable of moving my arm is no more comprehensible and intelligible to me than if someone told me he could stop the moon in its orbit. However, the magical view of the world reverses this relation because my will moves my arm, there is an equally certain and equally intelligible interconnection between it and all other events in outward nature. For the mythical apprehension, which is characterized precisely by the fact that it makes no sharp separation of object, object, spheres, no approach to a causal analysis of the elements of reality, this inference has compelling force. No middle links are needed here that lead from the beginning to the end of the process of effective action in a determined ordered sequence rather, in the beginning, in the mere act of the will, consciousness likewise apprehends the end, the result, and the product of the willing, and it links the two together. Only to the degree that the two elements gradually move apart does a separating medium intervene between desire and fulfillment and awaken with it the consciousness of a certain necessary means that the desired purpose requires for its realization. Even where this intermediation to a large extent exists, however, it does not come at once to consciousness as such. Even after the human has transitioned from a magical relationship to nature to a technical one, even after the human has learned the necessity and the use of certain primitive tools, for a while these tools themselves retain for the human a magical character and efficacy. To the simplest human instrument is now attributed an independent form of effective action distinctive to it, a certain inherent demonic forceful power. The Pangwe of Spanish Guinea believe that a part of human vital force enters into the tool manufactured by humans and that this vital force now expresses itself independently of and is capable of continuing effects. This belief in the magic inherent in certain implements, certain tools or weapons, is found all over the world. The activity performed by means of such implements and tools requires certain magical supports and reinforcements without which it cannot wholly succeed. When the Zuni women kneel beside their stone baking trough to prepare bread, they intone a song that contains many subtle imitations of the sound made by the milling stone they believe that when this is done, the implement will do its work better. Accordingly, the veneration and cult of certain outstanding implements and tools forms an important element in the development of religious consciousness and technical culture. Still today at the annual festival of the yam harvest, the eve offer sacrifices to all sorts of implements and tools to the axe, the plane, the saw, and the bell. Although from a purely genetic standpoint, magic and technology cannot be separated from one another, and although it is not possible to indicate a specific temporal moment in the development of humanity when the transition took place. From the magical to the technical mastery of nature, the use of the tool as such already constitutes a decisive turning point in the progress and construction of spiritual self-consciousness. The opposition between the inner and outer worlds now begins to be more strongly accentuated the boundary between the world of desire and the world of reality begins to stand out more clearly. One world no longer intervenes directly in the other and no longer transitions into it rather, through the intuition of the mediating object, object, that is given in the tool, a consciousness of mediated doing gradually unfolds. Hegel characterizes in his philosophy of religion the most general opposition between the form of magical action and that of technical effective action. This very first form of religion is that for which we have the name magic. To be precise, it is the claim that the spiritual aspect is the power over nature however, this spiritual aspect is not yet present as spirit, is not yet present in its universality rather, the spiritual is at first only the singular, accidental empirical self-consciousness of the human which, in spite of being only sheer desire, a self-consciously knows itself to be nobler than nature, and knows that self-consciousness is a power transcending nature. This power is a direct power over nature in general and not to be compared with the indirect power that we exert Yisha by tools upon natural objects in their individuality. Such power of cultured, Jibildit, human being over individual natural things presupposes that the human has already withdrawn from the world, that the world has acquired externality in its eyes, that the human has accorded to it over against itself an independence, distinctive qualitative determination, and laws, that these things are also relative to one another in their qualitative determinacy and stand in a manifold of interconnections with one another. This really entails that human beings are inherently free. For only free persons can allow the external world, other human beings, and natural things to confront them freely. This withdrawal of the human from objects, objecte, which forms the presupposition of the human's own inner freedom, does not, however, take place only in the cultured, jubilant, in the purely theoretical consciousness rather, the first germinal approach can already be discovered. In the mythical view of the world. For in the moment, Augenblick, in which the human seeks to exert an influence on things not by mere image or name magic but through tools, even though initially this influence, Einwirkung, itself operates through the customary channels of magic, it undergoes a spiritual separation, an inner crisis. 
the omnipotence of mere desire is broken doing is now subject to certain objective conditions from which it cannot deviate. For humans, the outward world first acquires its determinate existence and its determinate organization in the separation of these conditions, since for the human, nothing belongs to the world that has not in some way been touched by its will and its doing. In that a barrier is now erected between the inner and outer that prevents any immediate leap over from the sensible drive to its fulfillment, now that every new intermediary stage is interpolated between the drive and that which it aims, a true distance between subject and object is for the first time achieved. It separates off a fixed circle of objects that are designated precisely by the fact that they have a distinctive consistent existence by which they oppose, and gegenstehen, immediate longing and desire. The consciousness of the means are indispensable for the attainment of a certain purpose that first teaches the human to comprehend inner and outer as links in a causal framework, gefuges, and to assign to each of them its own unexchangeable positian within this structure, and from this consciousness gradually grows the empirical concrete intuition of a thing world with real properties and states. Only from the mediacy of effective action does the mediacy of being result, by virtue of which being is laid out into individual, mutu ally related, and dependent elements, elementi. Thus, we see that even if we regard the tool purely in its technical aspect as the basic means for the construction of material culture, this achievement, if it is to be truly understood and appreciated in its profoundest content, gehalt, may not be taken in isolation. To its mechanical function corresponds here again a purely spiritual function that not only develops from the former but conditions it from the beginning and is indissolubly correlated with it. The tool never serves simply for the domination and mastery of the outer world, which in this case would be regarded as a finished, simply given material rather, it is only through the use of the tool that the image of this outer world, its spiritual ideal form, is established for the human. The configuration of this image and the organization of its individual elements, elementae, do not depend on mere passive sense impressions or mere receptivity of intuitions rather, it issues from the mode and tendency of the influence that the human exerts on objects. Ernest Cap coined the term organ projection in his philosophy of technology to describe and depict this process. By organ projection, he refers to all primitive tools and implements being nothing more than an extension of the efficacy that the human being exerts on things with its own organs or limbs. The hand in particular, according to Aristotle, the organ of organs, dash as a natural tool becomes a model for most artificial tools. The form and function of primitive hand tools, such as the hammer, hatchet, axe, knife, chisel, drill, saw, and tongs, are nothing more than the continuations of the hand, whose force they strengthen, and hence are other appearances of what the organ as such accomplishes and signifies. From these primitive tools, however, the concept rises to the tools of the specialized trades, to the machines of industry, to weapons to the instruments and apparatus of art and science, in short, to all the artifacts that serve any particular need belonging to the realm of mechanical technology. In all of them, the technical analysis of their structure and the historical cultural consideration of their emergence can disclose certain elements by which they are interconnected with the natural organization of the lived human body. And now this mechanism, which in the beginning was formed quite unconsciously after the organic model, can in turn serve, by a reversal of the process, as a means of explaining and understanding the human organism. Through the implements and artifacts that the human forms, it learns to understand the constitution and construction of its own lived body. The human being grasps its own physiology only in the reflection of what it has effected, gewirkt, dash the type of intermediary tools that the human has formed disclose to it a knowledge, kentness, of the laws that govern the construction of its body and the physiological achievement of its individual organs. With this, however, the true and most profound significance of organ projection is not yet exhausted. It becomes rather apparent only when we consider that here, too, a spiritual process runs parallel to the increasing knowledge of the organization of the human lived body in that the human arrives at itself, at its self-consciousness, only through this knowledge. Each new tool that the human finds signifies a new step, not only toward the forming, formung, of the outside world but toward the formation, formirung, of its self-consciousness. On the one hand, every tool in the wider sense of the word is, as a means of increasing sensible activity, the only possible way of getting beyond the immediate superficial perception of things, while on the other hand, as a work of the activity of brain and hand, it is so essentially and intimately related to the human itself that in the creation of its hand something of its own being is perceived, the human world of representations embodied in matter, a reflection and copy, niche built, of its inwardness, in short, a part of itself. Such an integration of this domain of the outer world, which encompasses the totality of cultural means, is a self-confession, Zalbstbekenntnis, of human nature, 
and through the act of retrieving the picture from exterior and restoring it to the interior, it becomes self-knowledge, Zalbsterkenntnis. The foundation of the philosophy of symbolic forms has shown that inherent in the concept that the philosophy of technology has tried to designate and to distinguish here as organ projection is a significance that extends far beyond the domain of the technical mastery and technical knowledge of nature. While the philosophy of technology deals with the immediate and mediated sensible alive and bodily organs by which the human gives the external world its determinate shape and imprint, the philosophy of symbolic forms is concerned with the question of the totality of the spiritual functions of expression. It sees them not in replicas or copies of being but in tendencies and modes of configuration, as organs not so much of mastery as of sense bestowing. And here again, the achievement of these organs takes at first a wholly unconscious form. Language, myth, and art separately bring forward from themselves their own world of formations, gebilda, which can be understood only as expressions of the self-activity, of the spontaneity of spirit. This self-activity, however, does not take place in the form of a free reflection and remains hidden from itself. Spirit produces the series of linguistic, mythical, artistic gestalts without recognizing itself in them as a creative principle. Each of these series becomes for it an independent outer world. It is not so much the case that the eye is reflected here in things, the microcosm in the macrocosm, but that the eye creates for itself a kind of opposite in its own products that seems to it wholly objective. It is able to look at, Anchauen, itself only in this kind of projection. In this sense, the divine figures of myth signify nothing other than successive self-revelations of mythical consciousness. Where this consciousness is still wholly bound to and dominated by the moment, Augenblick, where it simply succumbs to every momentary impulse and stimulus, the gods, too, are enclosed in this merely sensible preant, Gegenwart, in this one dimension of the moment, Augenblick. And only gradually, as the circle of doing broadens, as the drive ceases to be absorbed in a single moment, moment, and a single object, object, and instead anticipatorily and retrospectively embraces a manifold of different motives and different actions, does the ambit of divine effective action acquire diversity, breadth, and depth. It is first of all the objects of nature which in this way step apart from one another, which are sharply separated against one another for consciousness by virtue of each of them being taken as an expression of a unique divine force, as the self-revelation of a god or demon. However, if the series of individual gods, which can arise in this way, is capable of indefinite expansion of its mere extension, omphong, then it contains, on the other hand, the German beginnings of a limitation of content all the diversity, all the particularization and fragmentation, of divine effective action ceases as soon as mythical consciousness considers this effective action no longer from the standpoint of the objects to which it extends but from the standpoint of its origin. The manifold of mere effective action now becomes a unity of creation, in which the ever more determinate unity of the creative principle becomes more and more clearly visible. And to this transformation in the concept of God corresponds a new view of the human being and its spiritual ethical personality. Thus, it has been repeatedly established that human beings can grasp and recognize their own being only insofar as they are able to make this being visible in the image of their gods. Just as the human learns to understand the structure, gafuga, of its lived body and limbs only by becoming a creator of tools and products, so too does it draw from its spiritual formations, language, myth, and art, the objective standards by which to measure itself and learn to understand itself as an independent cosmos with its distinctive structural laws. 3. Cult and Sacrifice The reciprocal relation between the human and God that establishes itself in the progress of mythical and religious consciousness has thus far been regarded essentially in the form in which it presents itself in the mythical religious representational world. However, we must now broaden the scope of our considerations the content, gehalt, of the religious has its proper and deepest root not in the world of representation but in the world of feeling and will. Consequently, every new spiritual relationship to reality that the human acquires does not express itself uniquely in human representing and believing but also in its willing and doing, ton. In this, more clearly than in the individual figures, gestalten, and images that mythical fantasy projects, the position of human beings toward the supernatural forces that they venerate must inevitably be more clearly manifested. Consequently, we find the actual objectivization of the basic mythical religious sentiment not in the mere image of the gods but in the cult devoted to them. For the cult is the active relationship of human beings to their gods. In the cult, not only is the divine represented and presented immediately, but it also exerts an immediate influence on it. Therefore, in the forms of this influence, in the forms of ritual, the imminent progress of religious consciousness, in general, most clearly manifests itself. 
The mythical narrative is at most only a reflection of this immediate relationship. It can be clearly shown that a wealth of mythical motives originally arose not from the intuition of a natural process but from an intuition of cult process. They go back not to any physical existence or event but to an active behavior of the human being, and this behavior is explicitly depicted in them. A specific occurrence, foregoing, that is continually repeated in the cult is mythically interpreted and mythically comprehended by being connected to a unique temporal event, a rightness, and viewed as its reproduction in mirror image. In truth, however, the mirroring occurs here in the opposite direction. The doing is first, followed by the mythical explanation, the sacred account. This explanation merely presents in the form of the report what is present, Vorhanden, as immediate reality in the sacred action itself. Thus, this report offers no key to an understanding of the cult, but rather, it is the cult that forms the preliminary stage of myth and its objective foundation. Modern empirical research into myth has, in that it has exposed this interconnection in a great number of individual cases, only provided the confirmation of a thought that was first formulated in speculative universality in Hegel's philosophy of religion. For Hegel, the cult and the particular forms of the cult are always the central point for the interpretation of the religious process. In the cult, Hegel finds immediate confirmation of his view regarding the general aim and sense of this process. For if this goal consists in overcoming, ifg Hagen, the standpoint of the separation of the I from the Absolute, in positing this standpoint not as true but as one that knows itself as not true, then it is precisely the cult that progressively accomplishes this positing. It is this unity, reconciliation, restoration of the subject and its self-conscious being, the positive feeling of sharing and partaking in this absolute and actualizing one's unity with it, in this sublation of the cleavage, which constitutes the sphere of the cultus. Thus, according to Hegel, this is to be taken not only in the restricted significance of a purely external action, Handel, but as a doing that embraces the interiority as well as the external appearance. The cult is, in general the eternal process of the subject positing itself as identical with its essence. For, to be sure, in the cult, the God appears on the one side and the I, the religious subject, on the other side the determination is, however, at once the concrete unity of the two by virtue of which the I, ik, becomes conscious in God and the God becomes conscious in the I, mir. In this sense, the Hegelian philosophy of religion sees the dialectical consequence according to which it developed the particular historical religion, and it affirmed especially in the unfolding of the universal essence of the cult and of its particular forms the spiritual content, gehalt, of each individual religion and what it signifies as a necessary moment in the whole of the religious process first constitutes itself entirely in its cult forms, in which this content, gehalt, possesses its external appearance. To meet this condition, the interconnection that Hegel seeks to establish by virtue of a dialectical construction must also be demonstrable from the opposite side, from the side of purely phenomenological consideration. In the external, sensible forms of the cult itself, even if we initially seek to place them before ourselves in their empirical manifold and diversity, there is likewise disclosed a unitary spiritual tendency, a direction toward progressive internalization. Once again, we are entitled here to expect that the relationship between inner and outer that forms the guiding principle for the understanding of all spiritual forms of expression the eye finds and comprehends itself through its seeming alienation, entasserung, of the eye. To elucidate this foundation, modern empirical research into myth has, in that it has exposed this interconnection in a great number of individual cases, only provided the confirmation of a thought that was first formulated in speculative universality in Hegel's philosophy of religion. For Hegel, the cult and the particular forms of the cult are always the central point for the interpretation of the religious process. In the cult, Hegel finds immediate confirmation of his view regarding the general aim and sense of this process. For if this goal consists in overcoming, ifg Hagen, the standpoint of the separation of the I from the Absolute, in positing this standpoint not as true but as one that knows itself as not true, then it is precisely the cult that progressively accomplishes this positing. It is this unity, reconciliation, restoration of the subject and its self-conscious being, the positive feeling of sharing and partaking in this absolute and actualizing one's unity with it, in this sublation of the cleavage, which constitutes the sphere of the cultus. Thus, according to Hegel, this is to be taken not only in the restricted significance of a purely external action, Handel, but is a doing that embraces the interiority as well as the external appearance. The cult is, in general the eternal process of the subject positing itself as identical with its essence. For, to be sure, in the cult, the God appears on the one side and the I, the religious subject, on the other side the determination. Is, however, 
At once the concrete unity of the two by virtue of which the I, Ik, becomes conscious in God and the God becomes conscious in the I, Mir. In this sense, the Hegelian philosophy of religion sees the dialectical consequence according to which it developed the particular historical religion, and it affirmed especially in the unfolding of the universal essence of the cult and of its particular forms the spiritual content, Gehalt, of each individual religion and what it signifies as a necessary moment in the whole of the religious process first constitutes itself entirely in its cult forms, in which this content, Gehalt, possesses its external appearance. To meet this condition, the inner connection that Hegel seeks to establish by virtue of a dialectical construction must also be demonstrable from the opposite side, from the side of purely phenomenological consideration. In the external, sensible forms of the cult itself, even if we initially seek to place them before ourselves in their empirical manifold and diversity, there is likewise disclosed a unitary spiritual tendency, a direction toward progressive internalization. Once again, we are entitled here to expect that the relationship between inner and outer that forms the guiding principle for the understanding of all spiritual forms of expression the eye finds and comprehends itself through its seeming alienation, entasserung, of the eye. To elucidate this, awarded to the sacrifices rooted in the self-renunciation that sacrifice contains within itself. This inner connection can be pointed out even in elementary stages of religious development. The forms of asceticism that usually belong to the basic core, grundbestand, of primitive belief and primitive religious activity are rooted in the intuition that any extension and intensification of the forces of the eye are bound to a corresponding limitation. Every important undertaking must be preceded by abstinence from the satisfaction of certain natural drives. Even today, there prevails the belief among almost all natural peoples that no military campaign or hunting or fishing expedition can succeed if it is not preceded by such ascetic measures of protection, if they are not preceded by several days of fasting deprivation of sleep, and prolonged sexual abstinence. And every crucial change, every crisis in the physical spiritual life of the human being, requires such measures of protection. Anyone about to undergo initiation rites, particularly the initiation into manhood, must previously undergo painful privations and trials. Nevertheless, all these forms of renunciation and sacrifice have initially a thoroughly egocentric sense while the eye subjects itself to certain physical privations, it does so only to strengthen its mana its share of physical magical forceful power and efficacy. We, therefore, still stand here entirely within the world of magical thought and feeling amid this, however, a new motive emerges. Sensible wishes and desires no longer flow equally in all directions they no longer seek to transpose themselves immediately and unrestrictedly into reality rather, they limit themselves at certain points in order to make the withheld and, one might say, stored up force free for other purposes. Through this narrowing of the extent of desire which is expressed in the negative acts of asceticism and sacrifice, the content of desire is raised to its highest intensive condensation, tsizam and fasung, and thus to a new form of consciousness. It asserts a power, mocked, that opposes the apparent omnipotence, aljwalt, of the eye on the other hand, in that it is comprehended as such, the eye also first posits its boundary and with this begins to give it a determinate form. 4. Only when the barrier is felt and known as such is the way clear to its progressive overcoming only when the human recognizes the divine as a power superior to it that cannot be subjugated by magical means but that must be propitiated by prayer and sacrifice does the human being gradually gain a free feeling of self in confronting it. Once again, the self finds and constitutes itself here only in that it is projected outward the growing independence of the gods as the condition for the human's discovery in itself of a fixed center, a unity of will over against the diffluencing manifold of individual sensible drives. This typical turn can be followed in all forms of sacrifice. A new and freer relationship of the human to the divinity has already announced itself in the gift offering, Gaben offer, insofar as the gift, gave, appears as a free gift, Geshenk present. Once again, the human withdraws here, as it were, from the objects of immediate desire. They cease to be objects, objecte, of immediate enjoyment, Ganus instead becoming a kind of religious means of expression, the means of an association, verbindung, the human establishes between itself and the divine. The physical objects themselves thus enter into another light behind what they are in their immediate appearance, behind what they are as an object, object, of perception or as a means for the immediate satisfaction of certain drives, a general force of effective activity now becomes visible. Thus, in the vegetation rites, for example, the last ear of grain in the field is not harvested like the others but is spared, because in it the force of growth as such, the spirit of the harvest to come, is revered. On the other hand, of course, the gift offering can be followed back to a stage, stuff, 
in which it is still closely interwoven with the magical view of the world and cannot as an empirical appearance be separated from it. Thus, for example, in the sacrifice of horses, which appears in the Vedas as the supreme sacral expression of royal power, the ancient, Uralt, magical elements, elementae, that enter into it are still unmistakable. Only gradually does this magical sacrifice seem to have taken on other features that have converted it into the representational circle of gift offering. However, even where the form of the gift offering is purely developed, no decisive spiritual transformation seems at first to be executed, since the magical sensible idea of the compulsion of the gods is now replaced by the no less sensible idea of exchange give me, I give you lay down for me, I lay down for you. Present me offerings, I present you offerings. In this way does the sacrificer speak to the god in a Vedic formula. In this act of giving and receiving, therefore, only the reciprocal need connects the human and God and links the two together in equal measure and in the same sense. For just as the human is dependent here on the God, so too is the God dependent on the human. The God is, in its power, indeed in its consistent existence, dependent on the offering of sacrifice. In Indian religion, the drink offering of Soma is the life-giving source from which springs the force of gods as well as that of the human. However, a sharper and clearer transformation arises precisely here that will lend the gift offering a totally new significance and depth. This transformation takes place as soon as religious contemplation no longer limits itself exclusively to the content of the gift but concentrates instead on the form of giving, the offering itself, and sees in it the real core of sacrifice. From the mere material execution of the sacrifice advances the thought, Gadanka, of its inner motive and ground of determination. Only this motive of veneration, Upanishad, can lend the sacrifice its sense and value. It is this basic thought by which the speculation of the Upanishads and of Buddhism differs from the ritual liturgical literature of the earlier Vedas. Not only is the gift now internalized, but the interiority of the person, mensch, now appears as the only religiously valuable and significant gift. The violent sacrifices of horses, goats, cattle, and sheep cannot be fruitful rather, the desired sacrifice, as it says in a Buddhist text, is not that in which all sorts of living creatures perish but one that exists in a continuous giving. And why is that? Because, to such violence of free sacrifice comes the holy, highly yen, as those who have entered the path toward holiness, heilishkai. Whoever offers such sacrifice, salvation, heil, and not evil is damnation, unheil. With this complete concentration of the basic religious question on a single point, the way of salvation, heil's weg of the human soul is connected in Buddhism to a curious consequence. The pure turning back of everything exterior into the interior has the consequence that not only does the external being and doing vanish but even the spiritual religious opposite pole of the eye, even the gods themselves, vanish from the center of religious consciousness. Buddhism allows the gods to exist, however, with regard to one basic, essential question, the question of salvation, they no longer signify or contribute anything. And thus, they have been excluded from the truly decisive religious process in general. Only pure immersion, for Zenkun, which does not so much extend the eye into a godhead as extinguish it in nothingness, brings true deliverance, Erlozung. If the speculative force of thinking does not shrink back before the final conclusion, if it, in order to penetrate to the being, Vazen, of the self, annihilates its form, then still the basic character of the ethical monotheistic religions consists in their taking up the opposite path. In them, both the eye of the human and the personality of God are developed to their highest pregnance, pregnance, and sharpness. The more clearly the two poles are designated and distinguished from one another, however, the more clearly does the opposition and the tension between them emerge. True monotheism does not seek to resolve this tension, for, it is the expression and condition of that distinctive dynamic in which, according to monotheism, the essence of religious life and self-consciousness consists. Prophetic religion also becomes what it is through the same turning around of the concept of sacrifice that is carried out in the Upanishads and in Buddhism. This turning has another aim here to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Says God in Isaiah. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. This ethical social pathos of the prophetic preserves the I through the emphatic opposition of its counterpart the you, through which alone the I truly finds and asserts itself. And it establishes itself as a purely ethical correlation between I and you, so that now an equally strict reciprocal relation between the human and God is established. In characterizing the basic thought of the prophetic, Herman Cohen writes, It is not before the sacrifice or before the priest that the human stands to obtain purity. The correlation is ordained and concluded between the human and God, 
and no other link may be interpolated in it. Any participation by another destroys the uniqueness of God, which is more necessary for deliverance, erlosung, than for creation. For this reason, however, in its highest religious transfiguration of which it is capable, the gift-giving, Gabeifer, leads by itself into another basic motive of the sacrificial service, Ofredienst. Mediation between the sphere of the divine and the human designates the general sense of sacrifice, which recurs in all its different forms in some way. Some have attempted to define the general concept of sacrifice, which can be acquired and abstracted from a survey of the totality of the empirical historical forms of its appearance so that sacrifice aims, in each case, at producing a connection, for bindung, between the world of the sacred, highly yen, and that of the profane through the middle link of a consecrated thing, zaka, that is destroyed in the course of the sacred action. If sacrifice is indeed, however, always characterized by the striving for a connection of this sort, then the synthesis that takes place in it is capable of the most multifarious gradations. It is able to pass through all the stages and levels from mere material assimilation up to the highest forms of pure ideal community. And every new path likewise alters here the apprehension of the goal that stands at its end for a religious consciousness, it is always by means of the path itself that the intuition of the end is determined and formed. The most elementary form in which the opposition between the God and the human, and the overcoming of this opposition, can be apprehended is one in which both the separation as well as the restoration of community are understood and allegiously as basic physical relationships. And it is not enough to speak here of mere analogy rather, in accordance with the basic feature of mythical thinking, this analogy shifts everywhere into an actual identity. What originally combines the human with the god is a real bond of the community of blood. Between the tribe and its god exists an immediate relationship of blood that god is the common ancestor from whom the tribe has sprung. This basic outlook extends far beyond the circle of the actual totemistic mode of representation. And through it, the real sense of sacrifice is determined. A definite gradation seems to lead here from the basic forms of totemism up to the configurations of animal sacrifice in the highly developed cultural religions. In totemism, the totem animal must in general be spared as a religious duty, flicked, dash there are, however, also cases where, Though it is not eaten by individuals, it is consumed by the whole clan at a common sacral meal in which specific rites and usages must be observed. This common enjoyment, ganus, of the totem animal is looked upon as a means of confirming and renewing the blood kinship that unites the individual members of the clan with one another and with their totem. This renewal of its physical religious originary force, urkraft, is particularly necessary in times of urgency, when the community is endangered and its existence seems threatened. The true accent of the sacral act, however, rests on the performance by the community as a whole. In the enjoyment, ganus, of the flesh of the totem animal, the unity of the clan and the interconnection with its totemic ancestor is restored as an immediate, sensible a corporeal unity in a sense, in this enjoyment, ganus, the unity is always sealed anew. The seminal investigations of Robertson Smith seem to have demonstrated that this idea of reinforcing the community of life and community of the clan, the idea of the communion of the human with the God who passes as the father of the clan, is one of the original motives in animal sacrifice, particularly in the circle of Semitic religions. At first, this communion can be presented only as something purely material. It can be performed only through the eating and drinking in common, through a live and corporeal enjoyment, ganus, of one and the same thing, zaka. This very act, however, raises the thing, zaka, toward which it is directed likewise into a new ideal sphere. The sacrifice is the point at which the profane and the sacred not only touch but indissolubly permeate one another, whatever is present, vorhand and, in it, in a purely physical sense, and fulfills any function in it, has thereby entered the circle of the sacred, the consecrated. On the other hand, this means that sacrifice does not originally form a single doing, sharply distinguished from the everyday and profane tasks, verreitung and performances, of the human, but rather, it means that every task, verreitung performance, however sensible and practical its mere content may be, can become a sacrifice as soon as it enters into the specifically religious perspective and is determined by it. In addition to eating and drinking, the exercise of the sexual act, in particular, can take on a sacral significance, and even in advanced stages of religious development, we find prostitution as a sacrifice, as a surrender, priyaskabi, in the service of the god. The force of the religious proves itself here in the fact that it encompasses the still undivided whole of being and doing, that it excludes no circle of physical natural existence, and that it pervades this existence down to its basic and originary elements, elementing. In this reciprocal relation, Hegel sees a basic element of the pagan cult. However, 
Research into the history of religion has taught us how this interplay, in Ian Ander, this interweaving of sensible and spiritual motifs in the thought of sacrifice, asserts itself more and more strongly in the beginnings of Christianity and in its further development. And if religion gains its concrete historical efficacy in such an interweaving, then it of course finds its barrier at the same time. For the human and God, if there is to be any true unity between them, must in the final analysis be of the same flesh and blood. Thus, the spiritualization of the sensible by virtue of the act of sacrifice has the direct consequence of the sensibilization of the spiritual. The sensible is annihilated as far as its existence, existence, its physical existence, Dasein, is concerned, and only in this annihilation is its religious function fulfilled. Only by the killing and consumption of the sacrificial animal does this force acquire, as the intermediary between an individual and his or her clan and as the intermediary between the clan and its god. This force, however, is bound to the exercise of the sacramental act in its full. Sensible determinacy and with all the details and particularities that the ritual prescribes, the slightest deviation and omission therein depriving the sacrifice of its sense and effectiveness. This is also evident in another important element of the cult, which almost everywhere accompanies sacrifice and which in conjunction with it constitutes the complete cult action. Prayer, like sacrifice, is also intended to fill the gulf between the God and the human. In prayer, however, it is the force of the word, not merely physical but symbolous ideal, by which the distance between the two is to be sublated. Nevertheless, here too, there does not exist at the beginnings of mythical religious consciousness any sharp boundary between the sphere of sensible existence, existence, and that of pure significance. The power that is inherent in prayers of a magical source, Herkunft, and a magical nature it exists in the compulsion that is exerted by the magical force of words on the will of the divinity. We encounter this sense of prayer in the fullest clarity in the beginnings and further development of the Vedic religion. The activity of sacrifice and prayer, when correctly executed, are always endowed here with an infallible and irresistible forceful power the priest captivates the gods in the snare, the mesh and trap. The sacred hymns and sayings, as well as the songs and meters, form and rule being the shape of the course of the world depends on their use, on their correct or false application. The priest who sacrifices before sunrise brings with him the sun god to appearance, to be born. All things and all forces are woven into the one force of the Braham, the word of prayer which not only surpasses the barriers between the human and the god but actually tears them down. The Vedic texts expressly state that in the activity of sacrifice and prayer itself, the priest becomes the god. And again, the same basic view can be traced back to the beginnings of Christianity with the Church Fathers, the purpose of prayer also appears as the direct unification and fusion of the human with the god the further religious development progresses, however, the more and more prayer gradually passes beyond this magical circle. Taken in its purely religious sense, Prayer now rises above the sphere of mere human wishing and desire. It is no longer directed toward a relative and party chular good but toward an objective good that is equated with the will of the divinity. The philosophical prayer of Epictetus, who prays to the gods. To grant him only what is in their own will, who feels and effaces the arbitrariness of the human is null, nishtish, in comparison to the will of the divinity, has its characteristic parallels in the history of religion. In all this, sacrifice as well as prayer prove to be typical forms of religious expression that do not carry over from a predetermined and strictly delimited sphere of the eye to the sphere of the divine but rather determine both these spheres and draw progressively different boundaries between them. In what the religious process designates as the spheres of the divine and the human, it is not a question of two domains of being that are from the beginning rigidly demarcated over against one another by spatial as well as qualitative barriers rather, it is a question of an originary form of the movement of religious spirit of the permanent attraction and repulsion of its two opposite poles. Thus, what appears decisive in the development of prayer and sacrifice is not only that both appear as a medium through which the extremes of the divine and the human communicate with one another, but that they establish the content, gehalt, of these two extremes and teach the human to find it. Each new form of sacrifice and prayer opens up a new content, gehalt, of the divine as well as of the human and a new relation between them. The relationship of the reciprocal tension that arises between the human and the divine gives to each of them their character and sense. Thus, prayer and sacrifice do not merely bridge a gulf that existed for religious consciousness from the beginning rather, consciousness creates this gulf in order to close it it brings the opposition between the god and the human to increasingly sharper expression, Ausprägung, in order to find in this the means of its overcoming. This emerges above all in the fact that the movement that is taking place here almost always appears as a purely reversible one, that its sense, Shin, always likewise corresponds to a determinate and in general equivalent countersense, Jijensen opposite direction. The unification, 
The, between the God and the human that forms the aim of prayer and sacrifice, can from the beginning be grasped and delineated in two ways it is not just that the human becomes the God but also that the God becomes the human. In the language of the sacrificial service, this preansa motif whose validity and effectiveness can, be followed from the most primitive mythical representations and usages to the basic forms of our cultural religions. The sense of sacrifice is not exhausted by the sacrifice to the God rather, it appears to stand out fully and reveal itself in its true religious and speculative depth where the God itself is offered as a sacrifice or offers itself as a sacrifice. In that the God suffers and dies, in that the God enters into physical finite existence and in it is consecrated to death, this existence is raised to the divine and freed from death. All the great mystery cults revolve around the originera mystery of this liberation and rebirth, brought about by the death of the God. This motif of the God's sacrificial death is one of the truly elementary mythical religious thoughts of humanity, this has, in Teralia, been shown in the fact that it has been found again almost unmodified in the American originary religions discovered in the New World and interconnection that is well known and the Spanish missionaries were able to explain it only by the fact that the ritual sacrifices of the Aztecs were a diabolical mockery and parody of the Christian mystery of the Eucharist. What distinguishes Christianity here from the other religions is not so much the content of the motif as the new, purely spiritual, spiritual, sense that is gained from it. On the other hand, even the abstract speculations of the medieval Christian doctrine of justification move for the most part in the realm of traditional, old mythical ideas. The doctrine of satisfaction that St. Anselm of Canterbury, for example, develops in his treatise Cur Deus Homo, seeks to give this train of thought a purely concept to all. Rational scholastic form by starting from the supposition that the infinite guilt of the human can be satisfied only by an infinite sacrifice, thus through the sacrifice of God himself. The mysticism of the Middle Ages, however, goes one step further. For the mystics, the question is no longer how the gulf between God and the human can be bridged, since they know, can't, no such gulf the entire conception is contrary to their basic religious attitude. For them, in the relationship of the human being to God, there is no mere apartness, asinander, rather only with one other, mitinander, and for only another, frinander. Here God is just as necessarily and immediately referred, Bezogen, to the human as the human is referred to God. In this respect, the mystics of all peoples and all times, for example, Jalalad and Rumi and Angelus Celestius, speak the same language. As Rumi writes, I and you has ceased to exist between us. I am not I, you are not you, nor are you I. I am at once I and you, you are at once you and I. The religious movement that expressed itself in the transformation and progressive spiritualization of the concept of sacrifice has arrived at its conclusion here, what previously seemed a purely physical or ideal mediation has now been raised to a pure correlation in which for the first time the specific sense of the divine as well as the human is determined. Part 4. The Dialectic of Mythical Consciousness in accordance with the general task of the philosophy of symbolic forms, the considerations in this volume sought to present myth as a unitary energy of spirit as a self-contained form of apprehension that asserts itself in all the diverse objective materials of representation. From this standpoint, we sought to demonstrate the basic categories of mythical thinking, not as though we were dealing with a rigid schema of spirit, fixed once and for all, but in the sense that we attempted to recognize in it certain original tendencies of forming, formung. Behind the incalculable wealth of mythical formations, Gabilda, we thus sought in this way to make visible a unitary force of forming, building, and the law according to which this force operates. Myth, however, would be no truly spiritual form if its unity signified nothing else than an oppositionless simplicity. The unfolding of its basic form and its expression, Ausprägung, does not take place in new motifs and shapes in the manner of a simple natural process, it is not a kind of quiet growth of a seed that was present and preformed from the very beginning, which merely requires certain definite external conditions in order to unfold itself and to bring itself to clear appearance. The individual stages of its development do not simply follow one another but confront one another, often in a sharp, antithetical opposition. The process consists in the fact that certain basic features, certain spiritual determinations of earlier stages, are not only further formed and completed but also negated and totally annihilated. This dialectic can be demonstrated in the transformation of the contents of mythical consciousness, and it dominates its inner form. Through it, the function of mythical figures, gestalten, as such is seized and transformed from within. This function can operate only by continuously producing ever new figures, gestalten, dash as the objective expressions of the inner and external universe as it presents itself to the regard, blink, of myth. In advancing along this path, however, 
it reaches a turning point and a point of return, when the Yun Ruck Kerpunkt, dash a point at which the law that governs it becomes a problem. At first glance, this certainly seems strange, for we do not usually believe the naive mythical consciousness capable of such a separation. Indeed, it is not a question here of an act of conscious theoretical reflection, in which myth apprehends itself and in which it turns against its own fundamental principles and presuppositions. Rather, what is decisive in this turning back is that mythical consciousness also remains and is preserved within itself. It does not emerge out of its sphere, nor does it transition into a completely other principle however, in that it has completely fulfilled its own sphere, it becomes apparent that it must finally demolish it. This fulfillment, which is at the same time an overcoming, results from the position that myth takes toward its own image world. Myth cannot but reveal and express itself in this image world however, the further mythical consciousness progresses, the more this manifestation, oisering externalization, becomes something external, oiserlish, that is not wholly adequate to its own drive for expression. Here lies the ground of a conflict that gradually emerges ever more sharply, a conflict that, by splitting mythical consciousness in itself, at the same time truly uncovers in this split the ultimate ground and depths of myth. The positivistic philosophy of history and culture, as it was established by Comte in particular, assumes a hierarchy of spiritual development, by which humanity gradually rises from the primitive phases of consciousness up to theoretical cognition and with this a complete spiritual domination of reality. From the fictions, phantasms, and beliefs that imbue and characterize those first phases, the path leads more and more definitely to the scientific apprehension of reality as a reality of pure facts. Here, all the merely subjective ingredients of spirit should fall away, here, the human confronts reality, realitate, itself, which gives itself to the human as what it is, whereas previously the human being beheld it only through the deceptive medium of its own feelings and desires as well as its own images and representations. According to Comte, this progress takes place essentially in three stages the theological, the metaphysical, and the positive. In the first, subjective desires and representations of the human are transformed from the human to demons and divine beings. In the second, they are further transformed into abstract concepts. Only in the third phase is the clear separation, Scheidung, of inside and outside and the deciding on, Biskiedung, the giving facts of inner and outer experience carried through. There is here, therefore, a power alien to mythical religious consciousness and external to it by which this consciousness is gradually overcome and displaced. Once the higher stage has been reached, the earlier one, according to the positivistic schema, is no longer needed its content, Gehalt, can and must die away. Comte did not draw this consequence rather, his philosophy culminates not only in a system of positive knowledge but also in a positivist religion and indeed a positivist cult. This belated recognition, which religion and cult compel here, not only forms a significant and characteristic feature of Comte's own spiritual development but more importantly constitutes an indirect admission of an objective, Sachlik, lacuna in the positivist construction of history. The schema of the three stages, Comte's law of the Tua does not permit a purely imminent evaluation of the achievement of mythical religious consciousness. The goal at which mythical religious consciousness aims must be sought here outside of itself, in something fundamentally different. For this reason, however, the proper constituent high and the purely inner movedness, bewitched the it, of the mythical religious spirit cannot be grasped. Rather, this can truly come to light only if it can. Be shown that the mythical and religious itself has within itself its own source, Ursprung, of movement, Bewegung, that, from its beginnings just to its highest productions, it is determined by its own driving forces and nourished from its own wellsprings, Velen. Even where it passes far beyond these first beginnings, it does not abandon its spiritual native soil. Its positions do not abruptly and immediately flip over, umschlagen, into negations, rather, it can be shown that every step it takes already bears within itself a twofold ominous sign, as it were. To the continuous construction of the mythical image world corresponds a continuous drive to push out beyond it, to such an extent that both the position and the negation belong to the form of mythical religious consciousness and merge in it into a single indivisible act. Considered more deeply, the process of annihilation, Fernichtung, proves to be a process of self-assertion, as the latter takes place only by virtue of the former it is only in their constant working together that they manifest the true nature, Vazen, and true content, Gehalt, of the mythical religious form. In the development of linguistic forms, we distinguish three stages that we designated as mimetic, analogical, and symbolic expression. We found the first stage characterized by the fact that in it there is still no true tension between the linguistic sign and the intuitive content to which it refers, 
that instead both merge into one another and both strive to cover each other. The sign, as a mimetic sign, strives in its form toward an immediate rendering, Wiedergeben, of the content it strives, as it were, to take it in, to absorb it. Only gradually does a distance, a growing difference, difference, appear, and it is then that the basic characteristic phenomenon of language, the separation of sound and signification, is achieved. Only when this separation occurs is the sphere of linguistic sense constituted as such. In its beginnings, the word still belongs to the sphere of mere existence what is apprehended in it is not a signification but rather a substantial being and force of its own. It does not point to a tangible content but posits, Zetsen, itself in the place of this content it becomes a kind of originary thing, Urzika, a power that intervenes in empirical events and their causal concatenation. It requires the turning away from this first view of an insight into the symbolic function and hence into the pure ideality of the word, is to occur. And what is true of the linguistic sign is true in the same sense of the written sign. The sign of writing is also not at once apprehended as such but viewed as a part of the object world, as an extract, as it were, of all the forces that are contained in it. All writing begins as mimetic signs, image signs, where at first the image in no way infers in itself any significative or communicative character. Rather, it steps in for the object itself it replaces, a as etzen, it and stands for it. In its initial emergence and in its primary configurations, writing also belongs to the magical sphere. It serves as a means for magical acquisition or as a means of magical defense the sign impressed on the object draws it into the sphere of its own efficacy and protects it from foreign influences. The more writing resembles, gleicht, what it is intended to depict, the more it is also pure object writing, the more completely it has achieved this goal. Long before the written sign is comprehended as the expression of an object, it is feared as the substantial embodiment of effects, as it were, that emanate from it, as a kind of demonic doppelganger of the object. Only when this magical emotion has faded does contemplation turn from the real to the ideal, the tangible to the functional. From immediate image writing there unfolds a syllabic writing and ultimately a word writing and phonetic script in which the initial ideogram, the image sign, has become the pure meaning sign, or the symbol. We now see the same relationship in the image world of myth. Even the mythical image, where it first occurs, is by no means recognized as an image, as a spiritual expression. Rather, it is so thoroughly dissolved in the intuition of the world of things, Sashvelt, the intuition of objective reality and of objective events, that it appears as an integral component, B stand, of it. Once again, there is here originally no separatine between the real and the ideal, between the domain of existence and that of signification. The transition between the two domains is continuously at play, not only in the representing and believing but in the doing of the human. At the beginning of mythical doing stands the mime again nowhere does this have a merely aesthetic, merely presentational, sense. The dancer who appears in the mask of the god or daemon does not merely imitate the god or demon but assumes its nature the dancer is transformed into the god or demon and fuses with him. There is nowhere here a mere pictorial, build haft, an empty representation, representation, there is no mere thought represented, intended that is not at the same time actual and effective. In the gradual progress of the mythical view of the world, however, a separation now inserts itself here, and this separation constitutes the real beginning of specifically religious consciousness. The further back we follow it toward its origins, the less the content of religious consciousness can be distinguished from that of mythical consciousness. The two are so interwoven and interlinked that nowhere in actual reciprocal determinacy can they be separated from each other and juxtaposed in opposition to each other. If we attempt to extract and eliminate the basic mythical components from the content of religious beliefs, then we would no longer have religion in its actual, objective historical appearance rather, all that would remain would be a shadow image of it, an empty abstract ion. Despite this insoluble interweaving of the contents of myth and religion, their form is not the same and the particular nature of the religious form manifests itself in the changed taking off position, Stellung Nama, that consciousness assumes here toward the mythical image world. It cannot do without this world it cannot immediately expel it from itself. However, seen through the medium of the religious framing of the case Tion, this world gradually takes on a new sense. The new ideality, the new spiritual dimension, which is opened up, or Schlossen, through religion, not only lends the mythical and altered significance, Bedeutung, but it literally introduces the opposition between signification and existence, Bedeutung und Dasein, into the domain of myth. Religion takes the Dutch side step that is essentially alien to myth in its use of sensible images and signs it at the same time knows them as such, as the means of express sign that, though they reveal a determinate sense, 
must necessarily at the same time remain inadequate to it, which point to this sense without ever fully grasping and exhausting it. In the course of its development, every religion is brought to a point at which it must pass through this crisis and in which it must break loose from its mythical ground, grund, and soil, bodhan. In the manner of this disentanglement, however, the different religions do not proceed alike, rather, each one manifests its particular historical nature and particular spiritual nature precisely in this manner. We repeatedly find that religion, when it subsides into a new relationship to the mythical image world, enters at the same time into a new relationship to the whole of reality, to the totality of empirical existence. It cannot complete its distinctive critique of this image world without at once implicating, ein but see and involve, include, actual existence into it. For it is precisely because there is here still no detached objective actuality in the sense given by analytic theoretical cognition, because rather the intuition of reality is dissolved, Einstmolsen, into the world of mythical representation, feeling, and belief, every other position that consciousness acquires toward the mythical image world must have an effect on the comprehensive view of existence. As a consequence, the ideality of the religious does not merely degrade the totality, Gans of mythical configurations and forces to a lower order of being but also directs this form of negation toward the elements, elemente, of sensible and natural existence itself. To clarify this interconnection, we will reach back to a few pregnant examples, to some typical basic attitudes at which religious thinking has arrived in this struggle against its own mythical foundations and originary beginnings. The truly classical example of the great turning around, umkare, and turning away, abkare that takes place here will always be the form of religious consciousness in the prophetic books of the Old Testament. The entire ethical religious pathos of the prophets is summarized in this one point. It is based on the force and certainty of the religious will that lives in the prophets, of a will that drives them beyond all intuition of the given, the merely existent. This existence must descend if the new world, the world of the messianic future is to arise. The prophetic world, which is visible only in the religious idea, is to be grasped by no mere image that is oriented only toward the sensible present, Gegenwart, and in which it remains captive. Accordingly, the prohibition of idolatry, build or deenched, the prohibition against making any, picture, opbuild, or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth is therefore given an entirely new sense and a new force in prophetic consciousness it indeed becomes the constituent factor of this consciousness itself. It is as if in one stroke, a gulf is torn open of which the unreflecting, naive mythical consciousness knew nothing. The representational world of polytheism, the basic pagan view that is combated by the prophets, was not guilty of venerating a mere picture, opbuild, of the divine, since for this view, there exists no difference between the archetype, or build, and picture, opbuild, as such. In the images that it makes of the divine, this representational world still immediately possesses the divine itself precisely because it took these images never as mere signs but always as concrete as sensible revelations. In a purely formal sense, the prophetic critique of this intuition therefore rests, so to speak, on a petitio principia it imputes to this intuition a view that is not inherent in it but brought to it only through the new consideration, through the perspective in which it is placed. With passionate zeal, Isaiah turns against the absurdity that the human worships its own formations, gabilda creations, as divine something that it knows and recognizes as its own shoddy handiwork. Who fashions a god, or molds a graven image, that is profitable for nothing. The blacksmith with the tongs works in the coals, and fashions it with hammers. The carpenter stretches out his rule he marks it out with a line he fashions it with planes, and he marks it out with the compass. He burns part of it in the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, even his graven image he falls down unto it, and worships it, and prays unto it, and says, deliver me for you or my God. They have not known nor understood for he has shut their eyes, that they cannot see in their hearts, that they cannot understand. And none considers in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down to a block of wood? We see here that a new foreign tension, an opposition that mythical consciousness neither knows nor can apprehend but must be transplanted into it so that it will decompose and ruin itself from within. Yet the truly positive factor consists not in this decomposition itself but rather in the spiritual motive from which this decomposition ensues it lies in the fall, Rukgaung, into the heart of the religious by virtue of which the image world of myth comes to be recognized as something merely external, oiserlish, and tangible. Because in the basic prophetic view, there can be no other relationship between the human and the god than the spiritual ethical relationship between the I and the you everything that does not belong to this fundamental relation now loses its religious value. 
the moment, Augenblick, in which the religious functions because it has discoffered the world of pure interiority, withdraws from the world of external, natural existence, this existence loses its soul, as it were, and is degraded to the level of a dead thing, Zaka. For this reason, every image taken from this sphere is no longer an expression of the spiritual and divine but quite simply its opposite. The sensible image and the whole sphere of the sensible world of appearance must be divested of their proper sense of content. Sinchhalt, for the deepening that pure religious subjectivity experiences in the thought and belief of the prophets, which can no longer be pictured, Abelden, by anything tangible, is possible only in this way. Another way to reach the properly religious sphere of meaning from the sphere of being, the imageless, build Lozen, from the pictorial, build Haft, is taken by the Persian-Iranian religion. Herodotus notes in his account of the Persian faith that the Persians did not erect statues, build Solon, Temples, and altars but rather called it folly to do so, since they did not, like the Hellenes, believe that their gods were of the human sort. As among the prophets, the same fundamental ethical religious tendency is at work here like the god of the prophets, the Persian creator god, Ahura Mazda, is designated by no other predicate than those of pure being and ethical goodness. And yet a different attitude toward nature and the whole of concrete. Objective existence arises based on this foundation. The veneration of various natural elements and natural forces in the religion of Zoroaster is well known. The care devoted, here to fire and water, the awe, shoy, with which they are protected from all contamination and the severity with which such contamination is punished as severely as the gravest ethical transgressions, proves that here the bond that links religion with nature has by no means been severed. Here too, if instead of considering the mere dogmatic and ritual facts, we turn our attention to the religious motives underlying them, we find that a different relationship manifests itself. It is not for their own sake that the elements, elementae, of nature are venerated in the Persian fet rather, what lends them their actual significance is the position that they are assigned in the great religious ethical decision, and Shaidung, in the struggle between the good spirit and evil spirit for world domination. In this struggle, every natural existence has its specific place, plots, and its specific task. Just as the human had to decide, and Shiden, between the two basic powers, so too do the individual natural forces stand on one side or the other, serving the work of either preservation or destruction and annihilation. It is their function and not their mere physical figure, Gestalt, and their physical power that gives them their religious sanction. Thus, nature need not per se be unhallowed, and Gottern, here, for, although it may never be interpreted as an immediate picture, opbuilt, of divine being, it does stand in an immediate relation to the divine will and its ultimate goal. It may be either a relationship of antagonism to the divine will, and thus descend into the merely demonic, or a relationship of alliance with it. Nature in itself is neither good nor evil, divine nor demonic however, religious thinking makes it so, as long as it considers its contents not as mere elements, elementae, and factors of being but as factors of culture and so draws them into the sphere of the ethical religious view of the world. They belong to the heavenly hosts, which Ormazd employs in his struggle against Arman and as such are worthy of veneration. To this realm of the venerable, the Yazada, belongs fire and water as conditions of all culture and human order and ethos. The transformation of their pure physical content, Gahalt, into a determinate teleological content, Gahalt, is clearly expressed, especially in the fact that the elaborate theological system of the Persian religion takes great care to expressly negate the indifference toward good and evil that seems to be intrinsic to anything merely naturalistic, by, for example, teaching that the harmful or fatal effects that arise from fire and water should not themselves be attributed to these elements directly but that at most they only come indirectly from them. Once again, we can clearly recognize here how the purely mythical elements, elementae, which originally underlie the Iranian religion as they do every other religion, are not simply suppressed but are progressively transformed in their significance. This gives rise to a curious interpretation, a distinctive coordination and correlation of natural and spiritual potencies, of tangible concrete being and abstract forces. In certain passages of the Avesta, fire and good thought, Vohumana, appear side by side as salvation bringing forces. When the evil spirit attack the creation of the good spirit, it is taught here, Vohumana and fire and turban, protecting the good spirit and overcoming the evil spirit so that it could no longer obstruct the waters in their course and the plants in their growth. This interweaving, in the Anandagriathan, and blending together, in the Anandarubershan, of the abstract and the pictorial, build haft, constitutes one of the essential and specific features of the Persian religious doctrine. The thought of the highest god is here fundamentally monotheistic, since ultimately, he will overcome and destroy his adversaries. On the other hand, 
he is only the summit of a hierarchy to which belong natural as well as purely spiritual forces. Next to him stand the six immortal saints, Amshas Beta, whose names, the good thought and the best righteousness, etc., clearly show an abstract ethical imprint. These are followed by the Azadas, the angels of the Mazdian religion, who personify on the one hand ethical forces, such as truth, uprightness, or obedience, and on the other hand natural elements, elementae, such as fire and water. Thus, nature itself is given a twofold and religious ambiguous sense through the mediating concept of human culture, through the view of the cultural order as a religious order of salvation. For within a certain sphere, it is preserved however, to be preserved, it must likewise be annihilated, i.e. divested of its mere tangible material determinacy and through its relation to the basic opposition of good and evil assigned to an entirely different dimension of reflection. To express such fine and fluid transitions in the religious consciousness of reality, really Tate, the language of religion must and does possess a distinctive medium that is denied to the conceptual language of logic and pure theoretical cognition. For these latter, there is no middle term between reality, Verklichkeit, and semblance, between being and non-being. Here, the alternative of Parmenides is valid the decision? Is or is not. In the religious sphere, particularly at the point where it begins to delimit itself from the sphere of the merely mythical, this alternative is not, however, unconditionally valid and binding. While certain mythical figures, Gestalten, by which consciousness was previously dominated are negated and rejected, this negation does not signify that they simply vanish into nothingness. After their being overcome, the mythical formations, Gebilda, have by no means lost all their content, Gehalt, and force. Rather, they continue in existence as lower demonic powers, which appear trivial compared to the divine and yet which, even after they have in this sense been recognized as semblance, shine, are still feared as a substantial and, in a certain sense, essential semblance. The development of religious language gives characteristic indications of this process in religious consciousness. In the language of the Avesta, for example, the old name for the Aryan gods of light in the heavens has undergone a decisive change in signification the devos or devas have become the diva, which designate the evil powers, the demons in Armin's train. We see here how when religious thought rises above the elementary stratum of the mythical deification of nature, everything belonging to this stratum undergoes, as it were, a reversal of omen, fortsation. However, notwithstanding this, it lives unafflicted with this altered omen. Fortsation. The demonic world, the world of Armin, is a world of deception, semblance, and illusion. Just as the Asha, truth and justice, stand beside Ormazd in his struggle, so is Armin ruler in the realm of the lie, and in some passages, he is even identified with it. This does not simply mean, however, that he employs lies and deception as his weapons but that he remains objectively banished into the sphere of semblance and untruth, Unvarheit. He is blind, and this blindness, this non-knowing, Nichtwissen, causes him to take up the struggle with Ormazd, in which, as Ormazd knows in advance, Ahriman will meet his doom. Thus, in the end he perishes in his own untruth however, this decline, Unar Gong, is not accomplished in one stroke but only at the end of times, while in time, in the time of human history and human cultural development, in the time of struggle, he preserves his power beside and in opposition to Ormazd. Once again, the religious consciousness of the Jewish prophets goes a step further here it seeks to unmask the lower demonic world as an absolute nothing, nisht, dash as a nothing, nisht, to which, neither in representation and belief nor in the emotion of fear, any reality, really tate, however mediated, is to be attributed. For the customs of the Gentiles are nothing, says Jeremiah. Be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good as molten images falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, and the work of errors. The new divine life that is announced here cannot express itself without declaring what opposed it is absolutely unreal, delusion. And yet here too, the separation takes place in such radical sharpness only with the true religious geniuses, the great individuals, while the general religious historical development takes a different path. Again and again, the images of the mythical fantasy surge forward, even after they have lost their own life, after they have become a mere dream and shadow world. Just as in the mythical belief in the soul, the dead, still are and have an effect of shades, so the mythical image world long continues to demonstrate its old power, even when its being and its essential being are contested in the name of religious truth. Once again, as in the development of every symbolic form, light and shadow belong together here. The light manifests and establishes itself only in the shadow it casts the purely intelligible has the sensible as its opposite, but this opposite forms at the same time its necessary correlate. 
a third great example of how the mythical world gradually sinks into nothingness in the progress of religious thought and religious speculation and how this process spreads from the configurations of myth to those of empirical sensible existence may be found in the teachings of the Upanishads. It, too, achieves its final and highest goals by way of negation, verne nung, which is for it, as it were, its basic religious category. The being, seen, of the Atman, which is called here no, no, beyond this thus it is not, nished, there is nothing else higher. And it signifies a final step taken along this path when Buddhism extends the same process of negation, negation, from the object, object, to the subject. In the prophetic monotheistic religion, as religious thought and feeling are manifestly freed from everything tangible, the reciprocal relation between the I and God becomes purer and more energetic. Liberation from the image and from the objectivity of the image has no other goal than to let this reciprocal relation clearly and sharply emerge. Negation, negation, ultimately finds here a fixed boundary it leaves intact the center of the religious relationship, the person and their self-consciousness. The more the objective declines, the less it appears to be a sufficient and adequate expression of the divine, the more clearly a new form of configuration arises the configuration of will and action. Buddhism, however, passes beyond this last barrier for Buddhism, the form of the eye becomes just as accidental and external as any merely tangible form. For its religious truth strives to surpass not only the world of things but the world of will and effective action as well. For it is precisely effective action and willing that confine human beings to the circle of becoming, that chain them to the wheel of births. The act, Carmen, determines the person's path in the unceasing sequence of births and so becomes for them an inexhaustible source of suffering. Thus, True liberation lies not only beyond things but above all in doing and desiring. For whomever achieves it, it is not only the opposite tie-in between the I and the world that vanishes, but also the opposition between I and you for whomever the personality is no longer the kernel but the husk, only the last remnant of the sphere of finiteness and imagery. It possesses no persistence, no proper substantiality rather, it lives and is only in its immediate actuality, that is to say, in the coming and going, the appearing, and stehen, and disappearing, Verschwinden, of diverse and forever new elements of existence, Dacien's elementi. As a consequence, even the eye, even as a spiritual eye, belongs to the world of diffluent and deliquescent configurations the Sankara, whose ultimate cause is to be sought and unknowing, niche twisting like an ape who prowls around a thicket in the forest, who seizes a branch, lets it go, and seizes another, so that which is called spirit or thinking, and cognizing emerges and disappears, always changing day and night. Thus, the person, the self, is no more than a name that we give to a complex of transient contents of existence just as the word wagon designate is only the totality, gansa, of a yoke and frame, shafts and wheels, but not, over and above these, a particular something consistently existing for itself. Here, there is no being, vazen. From this conclusion, a basic general tendency of religious thinking is once again demonstrated with particular pregnancy and clarity. It is characteristic of this thinking that all being, the being of things as well as the being of the eye, that of the inner world as well as that of the outer world, has a continued existence and significance only insofar as it is related to the religious process at its center. Basically, this center alone is real while everything else is either null, nishtish, as such, or, as a moment in this process, only possesses a derivative being, a second order being. Depending on how the intuition of the religious process takes shape in the various historical religions, depending on the shift in the accents of religious values, different elements, elementae, are singled out and, to speak in Platonic terms, endowed with a seal of being. A religion of doing must therefore proceed differently from a religion of suffering, Leiden, a culture religion differently from a pure nature religion. For religious intuition and the religious mood of thought, only that content that receives light from its own center is called being, seen while everything else, everything that is merely indifferent from the standpoint of the central religious decision, is an indifferent, that sinks down into the darkness of nothingness nishts. For Buddhism, the I, the individual, and the individual soul must be assigned to this domain of nothingness because they do not enter into its framing of the basic religious problem. For although Buddhism, in its essential content, Gahaltan aim, is a religion of pure salvation, the salvation that it seeks is not that of the individual I but the salvation from it. What we call the soul, what we call the person, is itself nothing real but rather only the ultimate illusion, the illusion that is hardest to see through and overcome, the illusion in which we are implicated by empirical representations that cling to figure, gestalt, and name. For, whoever has left this domain of the figure, gestalt, and name totally behind, 
the semblance of an independent individuality has lost its power. And with a substantial soul, its religious correlate and country to part, the substantial divinity, must likewise vanish. Buddha did not deny the gods of popular religions for him, however, they are nothing more than individual beings, Vaisan, who, like everything individual, are subject to the law of perishability. From them no help can come, no liberation from suffering, Leiden, because they are confined within the cycle of becoming and hence that of suffering. In this respect, Buddhism becomes a type of atheistic religion not in the sense that it denies the existence of the gods but that, in a far more deep-seated and radical sense, this existence is irrelevant and meaningless in the light of its central and main problem. If for this reason, however, one attempts to deny it the title of religion and instead see in it only a practical ethical teaching, this would be an arbitrary narrowing of the concept of religion. It is not the content of a teaching but its form alone that is decisive for its classificati and under this concept what stamps a teaching as religious is not the assertion of any being but a specific order, a specific sense. Every element, elemente, of being can be negated, and for this, Buddhism is one of the most significant examples, provided the general function of religious sense bestowing is maintained. The basic act of religious synthesis points here in one direction in which ultimately only the event itself is apprehended and subjected to a certain interpretation, while every supposed substrate of this event dissolves more and more and finally completely sinks into nothing. In its whole development, Christianity also fights this battle the struggle for its own appropriate and distinctive determination of religious reality, realidade. The detachment from the mythical image world appears here all the more difficult because certain mythical intuitions are so deeply embedded in its own basic doctrines, in its consistent dogmatic existence, be stand, that they cannot be removed without endangering. This consistent existence, be stand, itself. Schelling observed this historical, historisch, relationship and concluded that natural religion is and remains the necessary presupposition even for every revealed religion. It, the revealed religion, does not itself create the matter in which it takes effect rather, it finds it is independent of itself. Its formal significance is to be the overcoming of the merely natural unfree religion but for just this reason it has this religion in itself, like that which sublates has the sublated in itself. If it was permitted to see in heathen dom distortions of revealed truths, then conversely it is impossible not to permit viewing in Christianity the heathendom that has been set in the right place. After all, the affinity of mythology and revelation showed itself already in their common external fate so that one sought to rationalize both mythology and revelation through a totally equal differentiation of form and content of what is essential and what is merely time-appropriate raiment, that is, one sought to bring both back to a reasonable sense, or what appears to most as a reasonable sense. But precisely with the excised heathen meaning would also all reality be taken from Christianity. Subsequent research into the history of religions has, to an extent and in a way that Schelling could scarcely have foreseen, confirmed his statement here. Today, Based on this research, it can be said that there is scarcely a single feature in the world of Christian belief and representations, scarcely an allegory, zinbilt, or symbol, for which mythical pagan parallels might not be shown. The entire development of the history of dogmas, from its earliest beginnings down to Luther and Zwingli, indicates a constant struggle between the historical originary sense, Urson, of symbols, according to which they still appear simply as sacraments and mysteries, and their derived, purely spiritual sense. Once again, the ideal only gradually works itself out, heraus arbaten, from the sphere of the tangible, of the real actual. In particular, baptism and the Eucharist are at first evaluated entirely in this real sense, according to their immediate efficacy. For that epoch, Harnack remarks, speaking of the early Christian period, the symbolic is not to be thought as the opposite of the objective, the real rather, it is the mysterious, the god draw it, mystery, that is opposed to the natural, profanely clear. A differentiation is expressed here that goes back to the ultimate roots of mythical thinking. And precisely in this barrier of Christianity lies a large part of its historical force. It might have succumbed in the contest with the Oriental religions for world dominati and that characterize late antiquity if it had not possessed this mythical rootedness, bod and standard that it repeatedly asserted over and over again despite all the attempts at reformation. This interconnection can be followed and demonstrated in detail in the various elements, elementae, of the Christian liturgy. Thus, the new religious tendency that characterizes Christianity, the new sense bestowing that is expressed in its demand for, repentance, could not be directly presented and implemented rather, this new form could only bring to expression and maturity the mythical material matter that played, as it were, the role of a psychological historical givenness.
The development of dogma was at every step determined by these two sets of conditions after all, every dogma is nothing more than the framing that is assumed by the pure content of religious sense, der rein religiosa sinchhold, when one attempts to express it as the content of a representation and being, ein entworst Lungs und Seinschhold. Mysticism, however, undertakes here the attempt to obtain the pure sense of religion as such, independently of all encumbrance, behaftung with the otherness of empirical sensible existence and the sensible world of the image and representation. In mysticism, the pure dynamic of religious feeling strives to cast off and annul all rigid and external givenness. The relationship of the human soul to God finds its adequate expression nay there in the image language of empirical or mythical intuition nor in the ambit of factual existence or empirically real events. Only when the eye withdraws entirely from this sphere, only when it dwells in its being, vasen, and ground, in order to let the simple being, Vazen, of God move, and rear and touch, it without the mediation of an image, is the pure truth and pure inwardness of this relationship brought to light. Accordingly, mysticism rejects from itself as the mythical also the historical elements, historischen elemente, of the content of faith. It strives to overcome dogma because in dogma, even when presented in a purely intellectual framing, the element of the pictorial, build haft, is still predominant. For all dogma is enticed by isolating and delimiting it seeks to transfer what is meaningful, sinful, and graspable only in the dynamic of religious life to the determinacy of representation and its static formations, gebilde. Thus, from the standpoint of mysticism, image and dogma, the concrete as well as the abstract expression of the religious, amount to the same thing. The incarnation of the God must no longer be taken as a mythical or historical factum it is grasped as a process that continuously takes place in human consciousness. The subsequent unification of two contradictory natures existing in themselves does not take place here rather, the duality of the elements, elementae, of this relation bursts forth from the unity of the religious relation, which for mysticism is the only known and original datum. The Father, writes Meister Eckhart, bears the Son unceasingly, and I say more he does not bear me alone his son but more he bears me for himself and himself for me. This basic thought, Grundgedank, of a polarity that strives to dissolve into a pure correlation and that must nevertheless be preserved as a polarity, determines the character and path of Christian mysticism. Once more, this path is indicated by the method of negative theology, which is realized through all the categories of looking at, anchon, and thinking. To apprehend the divine, we must first cast off all the conditions of finite and empirical being, the where, the when and the what. God, according to Eckhart and Suso, has nowhere he is a circular ring the center of the ring is everywhere and its circumference nowhere, and likewise all difference and opposition of time, past, present, and future, are effaced in him. His eternity is a present, Jejenwaradig, now, one that knows nothing of time. Thus, there remains for him only nameless nothingness, the figure of the figurelessness, Gestalt der Gestalt Lusigkeit. Christian mysticism is also constantly threatened by the danger that this nothingness and contentlessness, Chalplusig Giet, will cease being as well as the I and yet there remains in the end a barrier beyond which, unlike Buddhist speculation, it does not cross over. For in Christianity, in which the problem of the individual I, the problem of the individual soul, is the focus, the liberation from the I can be thought only ever in that it likewise signifies the liberation for the I even where Eckhart and Talair seem to approach the edge of the Buddhist nirvana, even where they extinguish the self in God, they seek, as it were, to preserve the individual form of this extinction there remains a point, a little spark, with which the I knows this very surrendering, often, of itself. Once again, the dialectic that permeates here the whole development of mythical religious consciousness stands out with particular sharpness. As we have seen, it is a basic feature of the mode of mythical thinking that wherever it posits a determinate relation between two members, it transforms this relation into a relationship of identity. The attempted synthesis leads here necessarily to a coincidence, an immediate concrescence of the linked elements, elementi. And where religious feeling and thought grow beyond their initial mythical conditionality, there always remains an echo of this form of striving for unity. Only when the difference, difference, between God and the human has vanished, when God has become human and the human God, does the goal of salvation seem to have been achieved. Even the Gnostics saw the true and supreme goal in immediate deification, apotheosis, Question mark this is the good end for those who have had the higher knowledge to become God. We stand here at the boundary that separates mythical religious apprehension from the philosophy of religion in the narrower and stricter sense. The religious philosophical perspective thinks the unity between God and the human less is a substantial than as a genuine synthetic unity a unity of differences, for Shedanen. For it, therefore, 
separation remains a necessary moment, a condition for the fulfillment of the unity itself. This is expressed with classical pregnance in Plato. In Diatima's speech in the Symposium, the relation between God and the human is produced by Eros, who as the great mediator has the task of conveying to and interpreting for the gods what comes from humans, and to humans what comes from the gods. Standing halfway between the two, she fills the gulf between them so that the all is in itself connected through her. Gods do not mix with humans they mingle, Gemeinschaft communion, and converse, for care intercourse, with us through spirits instead, whether we are awake or asleep. In this rejection of the mixture between God and the human, Plato, as a dialectician, draws the sharp cut that can be drawn neither by myth nor by mysticism. Apotheosis, the identity between God and the human, is now replaced by the demand for imitation of God, a demand that can be fulfilled only in the doing of humans, in the steady progress in the direction of the good, while the good itself remains beyond being. Although Plato is far from rejecting here the mythical image as such, and though from the standpoint of content, he seems close to certain basic mythical representations, he announces a new thought form that points beyond myth. Synopsis no longer leads to coincidence, it becomes the unity of the ideal vision, shall, that is constituted precisely by the reciprocal relation, the unsublatable, unauthlichy, correlation between connection and separation. Religious consciousness, on the other hand, is characterized by the fact that in it the conflict between the pure sense of contend, gehalt, that it grasps in itself and the pictorial, bildlich, expression of this content, gehalt, is never resolved but bursts forth anew in every phase of its development. The reconciliation between these two extremes is continuously sought without, however, ever being fully achieved. A basic moment of the religious process is situated in the striving out beyond the mythical world of images and in the indissoluble attachment to and imprisonment in this same world. Even the highest spiritual sublimation that religion undergoes does not cause this opposition to disappear it serves only to more clearly distinguish it and understand it in its imminent necessity. At this point, a comparison between the way, vague, of religion and that of language once again suggests itself. And this comparison is no mere subjective reflection that seeks to establish an artificial mediation between spiritual domains that are far removed from each other in their content, gehalt, rather, we grasp by it an inner connection to which religious speculation was frequently drawn in its own development and which it repeatedly sought to determine with its own conceptual means and modes of thinking. What appears to the common, profane, view of the world as the immediately given reality of things is transformed by religious apprehension into a world of signs. The specifically religious point of view is indeed determined by this reversal. Everything physical and material, every existence and event, now becomes a parable for the corporeal pictorial expression of something spiritual. The naive non-separateness, Hyde, of the image and the thing, Zaka, the imminence of both as they exist in mythical thinking, begins now to give way and its place there takes shape ever more clearly that form of transcendence, to speak in ontological terms, in which the new separation that religious consciousness has now undergone in itself is expressed. Things and events, aragnus, no longer simply signify themselves but had become an indication, Hinweis pointing to, of something other, something beyond, Jensatages. In this strict separation of the being of the pictorial, Abeldlich, and that of the archetypical, or Bildlich, religious consciousness breaks through to its own distinctive ideality, and likewise touches on a basic thought that philosophical thinking progressively works out by entirely different methods and based on other presuppositions. In their historical effectivity, the two forms of the ideal can immediately engage each other here. When Plato teaches that the idea of the good is beyond being and when he compares it with the sun, at which the human eye cannot look directly but can contemplate only in its reflection, in the mirror image in the water, he has provided the religious form of language with a typical and enduring means of express scion. In the history of Christianity, the development of this means of expression, its further formation and religious deepening, can be followed from the books of the New Testament down to the dogmatic and mystical speculations of the Middle Ages and from these further to the philosophy of religion of the 18th and 19th century. From St. Paul to Eckhart and Thaler, from them to Haman and Jacobi, there runs an unbroken chain of religious thought. And here the problem of religion merges again and again with the problem of language through the decisive mediating concept of the sign. As Haman writes to Lavater, To speak to you from the bottom of my soul, my whole Christianity is a taste for signs and for the elements, elemente, of water, bread, and wine. Here, there is an abundance for hunger and thirst, an Odwin dance that does not, like the law, merely cast a shadow of a future benefit but rather gives, this image of things, insofar as it can be presented and actualized through a glass darkly for the, perfect, 
lies beyond. Just as in Eckhart's basic mystical outlook, where all creatures are no thing other than the speaking of God, here the whole of creation, all natural events as well as spiritual historical events, becomes a continuous speech, read, of the Creator to the creature through the creature for one day says it to another and one night that makes known another. Their watchword runs through every climate to the end of the world and in every language their voice is heard. In Jacobi, who in his thinking seeks to fuse the basic elements, elemente, of Haman's metaphysical symbolic view of the world with Kantian elements, elemente, the objective interconnection that is here disclosed undergoes a subjective psychological transcendental turn. Language and religion are closely related to each other here and intimately interlinked through their derivation from one and the same spiritual root both are nothing more than different faculties of the mind to grasp the sensible and the supersensible, uber simlic, and the supersensible and the sensible. All human reason, vernunft, since it is a passive perception, verneckman, requires the help of the sensible. Thus, the world of images and signs is always and necessarily interpolated as an intermediary between the human spirit and the being, vazen, of things. There is always something between us and true being, vazen, feeling, image, or word. Everywhere we see only something hidden however, as hidden we see and sense, shporin, it. For what is seen and sensed we posit the word, the living word, as a sign. There lies the dignity of the word. It does not itself reveal rather, it shows revelation, consolidates it, and helps to disseminate it. Without this gift of immediate revelation and interpretation, oslagung, the use of speech, read would never have arisen among humans. With this gift the whole human species invented speech altogether, at the very beginning. Each race fashioned a tongue of its own none understands the other, but all speak, Raiden, dash all speak, because all, in like though not an identical degree, received with reason the gift of understanding and recognizing the inward from the external, the hidden from the revealed, the invisible from the visible. If in this way religious philosophical contemplation as well as linguistic philosophical contemplation thus indicate a point in which language and religion unite with one another to form, as it were, a single medium, the medium of spiritual sense, then this creates a new problem for the philosophy of symbolic forms. For it cannot, of course, strive to merge the specific difference of language and religion in some original unity, whether this unity be grasped as subjective or objective, whether it may be determined as a unity of the divine originary ground, ergrand, of things or as the unity of reason, as a unity of the human spirit. For its question is directed not toward the commonality of origin, Ursprung, but toward the commonality of structure. It does not seek a concealed unity of ground between language and religion but must ask whether between the two, as such absolutely independent and unique formations, Gabota, a unity of function may not be demonstrable. If there exists such a unity, it can be sought only in a basic tendency of symbolic expression, in an inner rule according to which it develops and unfolds. In our considerations of language, we endeavor to show how the word and the linguistic sound, before realizing their purely symbolic function, pass through a series of intermediary stages in which they hover, as it were, between the world of things and the world of significations. The sound can designate here the content at which it aims only by assimilating itself to it in some way, by entering into a relationship of immediate similarity or mediated correspondence with it. The sign must in some way fuse with the thing world, must become similar to this thing world if it is to function as its express scion. Even religious expression, in the shape in which it first emerges, is characterized by this immediate proximity to sensible existence. It would not be able to occur in being and endure in being if it did not in this way hold onto the sensible tangible with clutching organs. Of course, there is no manifestation of religious spirit, however primitive, in which, as in the speech sound, we do not recognize a tendency toward separation, toward the crisis to come that will take place in it. For even in the most elementary formations, Gabota, of the religious, a separation is always made between the world of the sacred and that of the profane. This separation of the two worlds does not, however, exclude a constant transition between them, a continuous interaction and mutual assimilation. Rather, the force of the sacred manifests itself precisely in that it dominates every single physical existence and every particular physical event with a sovereign, immediate sensible forceful power, which it is always prepared to seize on as an instrument for its own purpose. Thus, everything, however particular, accidental, and sensibly unique, possesses at the same time a magical religious significance, bedoizamkiet, of its own indeed. This particularity and accidental char actor becomes the distinguishing characteristic trait by which a thing or an occurrence is withdrawn from the sphere of the everyday and transferred to that of the sacred. 
The technique of magic and sacrifice attempts to draw certain fixed lines through this maze of accidents, attempts to introduce a certain organization and a kind of systematic order into them. In observing the flights of birds, the augur divides the whole of the heavens into different regions, which he designates in advance as sacred precincts, each inhabited and governed by a god. Even outside of such fixed schemata, which show a first approach toward universality, every individual that is in some way still isolated and detached can, however, at any moment take on the function of the symbol, Vartsaishan. Whatever is and happens belongs at the same time to a magical religious complex, the complex of significations, Bedoidangan, and Augury, Vordutung. Thus, the all-sensible being, even in its sensible immediacy, is at once sign and wonder at this level of contemplation, both belong necessarily together and are only different expressions of one and the same state of affairs. The individual becomes a sign and a wonder as soon as it is regarded not in its mere spatio-temporal existence, exes tens, but as an expression of value, as a manifestation, oiserung, of a daemonic or divine power. Here, the sign is a basic religious form, relating everything to itself and transforming everything into itself, at the same time, however, the sign itself enters into the whole of sensible a concrete existence and fuses intimately with it. However, just as language is determined in its spiritual development by the fact that it clings to the sensible and yet continually strives beyond it, to go beyond the confines of the mirror mimetic sign, the same basic characteristic opposition shows itself as well in the circle of the religious. Here too, the transition is not immediate rather, between the two extremes there lies, as it were, a kind of mediating attitude of spirit. In religion, the sensible and the spiritual by no means coincide with one another, but they nevertheless point continuously to one another. They stand to one another in a relationship of analogy, by which they are at once related to one another and separated from one another. In religious thinking, this relation occurs wherever a sharp cut separates the world of the sensible and the supersensible, the spiritual and the corporeal. On the other hand, both worlds undergo their concrete religious forming, for Hmong, by reflecting each other. Hence, analogy always bears the typical features of allegory for no religious understanding of reality flows from itself but is constrained in that it is oriented to another and in it comes accordingly to recognize its sense. This progressive spiritual process of allegorization is illustrated above all in medieval thinking. In it, all reality loses its immediate significance of being, saints Dutung to the degree that it is subordinated to a specifically religious sense bestowing. Its physical existence, be stand, remains only cloak and mask, behind which its spiritual sense is hidden. It is this sense that must be interpreted, Oslagen laid out, dash in the fourfold form of interpretation, doidung, that the medieval sources differentiate as the principle of historical, historisch, allegorical, tropological, and analogical interpretation, Oslagung. While in the first, a specific event is apprehended in its purely empirical factuality, it is the three others that disclose its proper content, Gehalt, its ethical metaphysical significance. Dante still preserved this basic medieval view unchanged and his poetics is no less rooted in it than is his theology. In this form of allegory, a new and characteristic focal point, a new relationship of distance and proximity to reality is given. The religious spirit can now immerse itself in reality, in the singular and factual without remaining confined in it, since what it beholds in reality is never its immediacy but its transcendent sense that finds its mediated presentation in this reality. The tension between the world to which the sign itself belongs and that which is expressed through it has attained an entirely new breadth and intensity here, and thus a new and intensified consciousness of the sign is also achieved. At the first stage, signs, Tsaishan, and the designated, Bezashnet, belong, as it were, to the same plane one sensible thing, one empirical event, points to another and serves as its symbol, Vardsaishan, an omen, for Abduthung. Here, however, no such direct relation prevails, but only a relation mediated by reflection. The form of tropological thinking transforms all existence into a mere trope, a metaphor, however, the interpretation, Oslogung, of this metaphor requires a distinctive art of religious hermeneutics, which medieval thinking seeks to reduce to set rules. To establish these rules and to use and apply them, one point, of course, is required where the world of spiritually transcendent sense and the world of empirical temporal reality come into contact, despite their inner diversity and antithetical opposition, and at this point, they directly permeate each other. Every allegorical tropological interpreter tie and relates to the basic problem of salvation and thus to the historical reality of the Savior as its fixed center. All temporal becoming, all natural events and human doing, 
obtain their light from this center it orders them into a meaningful cosmos by appearing as necessary links in the religious plan of salvation by taking a purposeful place in it. And from this one spiritual center, the circle of interpretation gradually broadens. The highest analogical sense of a text or a particular event is disclosed when an illusion, Hindu tongue, can be found in it to the transcendent or to its immediate historical appearance, the church. Even in the most far-reaching spiritual interpretation, Aslagung, all the spiritualization of natural being is bound here to the presupposition and opposing motive that Logos has descended into the world of the sensible, that it has incarnated in it in temporal uniqueness. However, to this form of allegory, medieval mysticism opposed another, a new sense of the basic symbols of Christian doctrine. It subladies the temporal uniqueness into the eternal, avikai, dash divesting the religious process of all mere historical content, gehalt. The process of salvation is restored to the depths of the eye, to the abyssal ground, abgarunt, of the soul, where it is enacted free from all foreign mediation in an immediate correlation of I and God, God and I and it becomes evident here that the sense of all basic religious concepts depends on the particular nature and tendency of the symbolism that lives in them, because the new orientation of this symbolism that takes place in mysticism now gives these individual concepts a new content, gehalt, and, as it were, another mood, stimmung, and tone. Everything sensible is and remains sign and likeness, however, this sign no longer has a miracle, wonder, if the character of wonder is seen in its particularity, in an individual particular revelation of the supersensible. The actual revelation no longer takes place in an individual but rather in the whole the whole of the world as well as the whole of the human soul. We stand here before a basic intuition whose full development and working out leads beyond the limits of the religious sphere. The new view of the symbol that emerges in mysticism achieves its full intellectual expression only in the history of modern philosophical idealism. Leibniz begins expressly from Eckhart's saying that all individual being is a footprint of God in our self-being, Selbstwesen, Leibniz writes in his essay on the true mystical theology, there is an infinitude, a footprint, a likeness, Ebenbild, of God's omniscience and omnipotence. And from here, his worldview of harmony is formed which rests not on some form of causal influence, not on any interaction of individual beings, Wesenen, but on their original reciprocal correspondence. Each monad is entirely independent and self-contained however, precisely in this particularity and independence it is the living mirror of the universe that it expresses, each monad according to its own perspective. There emerges here a kind of symbolism that does not exclude, but rather includes, the thought of the thoroughgoing and unbroken lawfulness of all being and events which indeed is essentially based on this very thought. The sign has once and for all been stripped of all particularity and contingency and has become the pure expression of a general order. In the system of universal harmony, there are no more miracles to be sure, however, the harmony itself signifies the enduring and general miracle that sublates and thereby absorbs all others in itself. The spiritual no longer manifests itself in the sensible, in order to create in it an individual picture, opbuild, or analogy in which it manifests itself, rather, the totality, Gesamtheit, of the sensible is the real plane of the revelation of the spiritual. Tutla nature, writes Leibniz to Boswe, est plein de miracles, made a miracles de raison. All nature is full of miracles, but the miracles of reason, thus, a new and distinctive synthesis is effected between the symbolic and the rational. The sense of the world opens up to us only when we rise to a standpoint from which we view all being and events as at once rational and symbolic, and even Leibniz's logic through the mediation of the thought of a universal characteristic is intimately bound up with his view of symbolism. Among the modern philosophers of religion, Schleiermacher has developed the systematic continuation and justification of this basic view. His speeches on religion takes up the problem just as it had been framed by Leibniz. And it is precisely this ideal and historical spiritual interconnection that raises Schleiermacher's religion of the universe above the form of a mere naturalistic pantheism. According to Schleiermacher, Religion consists of taking every individual as part of the whole, everything limited as a presentation of the infinite. Space and mass, however, do not constitute the world and are therefore not the matter of religion, to seek infinity in them is to think like a child. What in fact speaks to the religious sense in the external world is not its masses but its laws. The true and authentic, the properly religious sense of miracle, lies precisely in these laws. What then is a miracle? Tell me in what language it means anything other than a sign a trace, ondoidum. Hence, all these express signs mean, bizagen, nothing other than the immediate relation of an appearance to the infinite, to the universe. But does this preclude an equally immediate relation to the finite and to nature? Miracle is only the religious name for event, begebenhe, every event, even the most natural, 
provided the religious view of it can be the dominant one, is a miracle. We stand here at the opposite pole from the original view according to which the symbolic signified something objectively real, the immediate work of God, a mystery. For the religious significance of an event depends no longer on its content but solely on its form what gives it its character as a symbol is not what it is and whence it immediately comes but the spiritual aspect according to which it occurs, the relation to the universe that it obtains in religious feeling and thought. The movement of religious spirit that constitutes its proper form, not as a static figure, gestalt, but as a distinctive mode of configuration, gestalt tongue, consists in the back and forth, in the living oscillation between those two basic views. We find here the correlation of sense and image, as well as that conflict between them, both of which are deeply rooted in the nature, vasen, of symbolic, symbolist, sense pictorial, symbolich, expression. On the one hand, the very lowest, most primitive mythical configuratian proves to be a bearer of sense, sintrager, it already stands in the sign of that originary division, ertilung, that carves the world of the sacred out of the world of the profane and delimits the one from the other. And on the other hand, even the highest truth of religion remains attached to sensible existence, to the existence of images as well as that of things. It must continuously immerse and submerge itself in this existence whose ultimate intelligible purpose it strives to expel and eject from itself, because only in this existence does religious truth possess its form of manifestation, Aserung's form, and hence its concrete reality and efficacy. Speaking of concepts, of the world of theoretical cognition, Plato said that here the divergence of the one into the many and the return of the many to the one has neither beginning nor end but always was and is and will be as an immortal and neverging occurrence, began us. Tischleiermacher, religion consists of taking every individual as part of the whole, everything limited as a presentation of the infinite. Space and mass, however, do not constitute the world and are therefore not the matter of religion, to seek infinity in them is to think like a child. What in fact speaks to the religious sense in the external world is not its masses but its laws. The true and authentic, the properly religious sense of miracle, lies precisely in these laws. What then is a miracle? Tell me in what language it means anything other than a sign, a trace, ondoiden? Hence, all these express signs mean, bizagen, nothing other than the immediate relation of an appearance to the infinite, to the universe. But does this preclude an equally immediate relation to the finite and to nature? Miracle is only the religious name for event, begebenhe, every event, even the most natural provided the religious view of it can be the dominant one, is a miracle. We stand here at the opposite pole from the original view according to which the symbolic signified something objectively real, the immediate work of God, a mystery. For the religious significance of an event depends no longer on its content but solely on its form what gives it its character as a symbol is not what it is and whence it immediately comes but the spiritual aspect according to which it occurs, the relation to the universe that it obtains in religious feeling and thought. The movement of religious spirit that constitutes its proper form, not as a static figure, gestalt, but as a distinctive mode of configuration, gestalt tongue, consists in the back and forth, in the living oscillation between those two basic views. We find here the correlation of sense and image, as well as that conflict between them, both of which are deeply rooted in the nature, vasen, of symbolic, symbolist, sense pictorial, symbolic, expression. On the one hand, the very lowest, most primitive mythical configuratian proves to be a bearer of sense, Sintrager, it already stands in the sign of that originary division, Ertilung, that carves the world of the sacred out of the world of the profane and delimits the one from the other. And on the other hand, even the highest truth of religion remains attached to sensible existence, to the existence of images as well as that of things. It must continuously immerse and submerge itself in this existence whose ultimate intelligible purpose it strives to expel and eject from itself because only in this existence does religious truth possess its form of manifestation, Aserung's form, and hence its concrete reality and efficacy. Speaking of concepts, of the world of theoretical cognition, Plato said that here the divergence of the one into the many and the return of the many to the one has neither beginning nor end but always was and is and will be as an immortal and neverging occurrence, begenus.